folks from all over come for the best cuts and conversation in town. He's a great barber. As far as coming here, uh, it's an excellent community. Business was booming, but then came the pandemic. When COVID hit, I, um, I was frustrated because my landlord was asking for the money. I didn't know where help was going to come from. I, I have to be honest, I lost faith. Closing their doors for almost two months because they were deemed non-essential. Woods is now getting back on his feet with fewer customers. The reality of our business is does more than just cut hair. I mean, we've been a hub for uh, people's lives. He worried he wouldn't be able to make the rents or pay his staff, many of whom are former felons. Woods giving them their first job out of prison. When he offered me a job at Uzanaz, I was a little surprised. So it kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration. Then, amid a pile of unpaid bills, a message of hope. Your acceptance of all people and your overwhelming personal tragedy make you the person I want to st my stimulus check to go to. Sue Kieser, a retired school teacher, read about Woods in the local paper. When I got my check from the government, I knew that I did not need it. My income had not changed at all, and I wanted to give it to someone. He was looking for a miracle, and I wanted to help him have that miracle. It didn't stop there. Thousands pouring in from a GoFundMe page. Whether it was $10 to $5,000, it was something that people done from their heart to say, you mean something to me. An outpouring of support from the community he helped build. Not only is he a great barber, but he is a great person. One trim at a time. I appreciate money, but much more I appreciate the heart of people because that is really what lasts. <laughs> oh, thanks to Jose for that report. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, when we're hearing everybody's hearts opening up during this time, a time where we need it more than ever, and to see those kinds of gestures. And now more than ever, people appreciate their barbers and their yes. stylists, right? Well, now that's more if than you ever. had a chance to even get to them, which we have not yet in some parts of the country, definitely not. Not yet, but we're getting there and support. Slowly. Small this is early today. Your news continues. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Today in Houston, George Floyd's family and loved ones will hold a public viewing at the same time in Minneapolis. Police officer Derek Chauvin is scheduled to make his first court appearance. Over the weekend, the peaceful voices of protesters grew even louder as many pushed for change, including defunding or total dismantling of police departments. New incidents caught on camera fueling the fire for movement, including a white officer tasing a black man in the streets during a domestic call. The officer now faces assault charges. And Cristobal strikes Gulf Coast states with flooding rains, storm surge, and strong gusty winds. Janessa is tracking it all for us. A busy Monday ahead, early today, starts right now. Good to be with you. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. It has been two weeks since the death of George Floyd on a Minneapolis street by a Minneapolis police officer. And today, family, friends, and the public will say their final goodbyes to the 46-year-old at a memorial service in Houston before he's laid to rest on Tuesday. And in Minneapolis, where George died, a veto-proof majority of the city council agreed to dismantle the city's police department. At a community meeting, the president of the council called the city's relationship with the department toxic. One councilman told NBC News the council could work to disband the department in its current iteration. So far, eight or nine of the council members had agreed to that move, but police have not responded to the announcement. Meanwhile, New York City, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus, is beginning phase one of reopening, which will lead the way for some 400,000 workers to return to the city. Also happening today, President Trump, who has met backlash for his response to Black Lives Matter protests, will meet with law enforcement officials at the White House. It comes as protesters continue demonstrations across the nation demanding justice for George Floyd. Here's NBC's Jennifer Johnson. Across the country, more protests over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd, as a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 80% of Americans say things in the U.S. are out of control. The COVID-19 pandemic, America's economic crisis, and video of police brutality taking its toll. And I think it was the straw that broke the camel's back. 
and this is the real time for us to come together. With millions demanding change, two senators will release a new bill Monday banning certain police practices and demanding more accountability. This is not a system that is always explicitly done by overt racism. Uh, this is a system that's really baked. Despite the protests, the poll also shows a majority of Americans are uncomfortable attending large gatherings, including in restaurants and planes. This as President Trump faces new criticism from another U.S. general, longtime Republican Colin Powell, announcing he will back Joe Biden in November's election. The one word I have to use with respect to what he's been doing for the last several years is a word I would never have used before. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it. Powell's words come after the president was publicly criticized by Generals James Mattis and John Kelly and Admiral Mike Mullen for wanting to use U.S. military soldiers against protesters. We have a military to fight our enemies, not our own people. The president firing back, calling Powell a real stiff, responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars after previously lashing out against Mattis and other military leaders. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. It comes as the president prepares to meet with law enfor enforcement officials today. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more. From the president who declared this. I am your president of law and order. A new order. President Trump withdrawing 4,900 National Guard troops on duty in Washington, D.C., and writing, now that everything is under perfect control, they will be going home, but can quickly return if needed. Attorney General William Barr rejected what many protesters are marching to change, that racism is rooted in institutions like law enforcement. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. The president will host a meeting at the White House with law enforcement from local, state and federal agencies. This past week, the president's call to dominate the streets brought out a barrage of criticism from former four-star generals, some who even advised Mr. Trump. And now former Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell said President Trump crossed a line. We have a constitution, and we have to follow that constitution, and the president's drifted away from it. Powell, who served four presidents, three Republicans and one Democrat, endorsed Joe Biden after supporting Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in the past three contests. President Trump fired off tweets calling the decorated commander and former Bush secretary of state highly overrated and a real stiff who was very responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars. Powell's opposition to Trump is well known. His criticism was about standing up to power. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people will not hold him accountable. Democratic candidate Joe Biden flies to Houston, Texas today to meet with George Floyd's family and to offer his condolences in person. He'll also be recording a video message for Tuesday's funeral, but Biden won't be staying. His campaign says they don't want to cause disruption that would come along with the security needs for the former vice president to be there in person. Philip. All right, Kelly, thank you. Calls for justice against police brutality continue to grow across the country, and a disturbing new incident caught on video has led to assault charges against an officer in Virginia. Drew Wilder from our Washington, D.C. affiliate WRC has this report. Walking around in the middle of the street, rambling. The video starts with the victim walking circles in the street in the Alexandria area of Fairfax County. Officers and paramedics were responding for a domestic call. You want to go to detox? Yes, yes. All right, you got to get in the ambulance with them if you want to go no, to detox. No, no, no. About two and a half minutes into the video, from the left side of your screen, you see Officer Tyler Timberlake arrive. He walks straight towards the victim and draws his taser. Is he wanted? You can hear Officer Timberlake talking to the victim by name. Anthony, relax. Anthony. Fairfax County's police chief acknowledged this. Anthony. Then Officer Timberlake hits the victim with the taser, and you can hear the officer apply another electric shock as the other officers and paramedics rush in. 
Late Saturday night, Fairfax County Chief of Police Edwin Rossler saying every officer on this call is now on leave and Officer Timberlake is facing three assault and battery charges. In violation of our use of force policies and they are criminal acts which violate our oath of office and they ignore the sanctity of human life. The chief says Officer Timberlake escalated this situation, which shatters the already damaged trust with law enforcement. I righteously stand with the anger across this country, in this community, because I have righteous anger too. And that was Drew Wilder reporting. It was a, a weekend full of protests, uh, demonstrations rather, supporting Black Lives Matter in the United Kingdom. In Bristol, protesters brought down a statue honoring a 100-year-old slave trader named Edward Colton. It was then dragged into the Avon River where it sunk. Our Sarah Harmon is in London where thousands gathered outside the U.S. Embassy. The Black Lives Matter movement continues to gain momentum globally here at this protest in front of the U.S. Embassy in London. Thousands have gathered peacefully, taking the knee. and demanding that their voices be heard. They're demanding an end to police brutality, an end to racism and violence against black people. I'm sick of having to explain to my children that because they're black, they have to act a certain way, they have to behave a certain way, they have to work 10 times harder to get anywhere in life. Equal rights for everybody, no matter what the color of the skin. I think that's, that's a fundamental human right. It's, uh... This has happened so many times now, and nothing's taken traction on it. Hopefully this time, with it being widespread throughout the world, it's actually going to make some difference. There are thousands of people. This is normally two lanes of traffic here and two lanes on the other side. The crowd stretches all the way back as far as the eye can see. We saw peaceful protests in Parliament Square. These look even bigger. Sarah Herman, NBC News, London. Now, a tropical storm, Cristobal, made making landfall in the United States, hitting southeastern Louisiana just hours ago and moved along the Gulf Coast. The eye of the storm came ashore with powerful winds and driving rain to cause flooding in some areas. Many roads have been swamped and low-lying areas were evacuated. Louisiana has declared a state of emergency. NBC's Dan Sheneman has more. Cristobal made landfall as a tropical storm, packing 50-mile-per-hour winds the storm dumped inches of rain, up to six inches per hour, along the Gulf Coast, flooding parts of Mississippi and Florida and Louisiana, while water in Lake Pontchartrain near New Orleans was pushed over the shoreline. Cristobal also blamed for spawning this water spout in Alabama and Saturday's tornado in Orlando. Homes and properties were damaged. You saw my whole carport's gone, my back porch is gone. There's a roof in my backyard, which they're telling me is my roof. The storm is expected to dump heavy rain on the Gulf Coast through Monday morning. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. All right, and NBC Mirage, Janessa Webb has been tracking that storm for us overnight. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you two. It's been a very busy weekend, and to start off the week, we're going to continue to watch Cristobal. Nothing about this storm system is a sprint. It's going to be a marathon as it continues to make its way to the north. Right now, a tropical storm warning is still in place across the Gulf Coast communities with sustained winds up to 40 miles per hour. It will start to lose strength today, but then start to rev up. This storm system is likely to go into parts of the Great Lakes into the Midwest as we go into the next Next few days. Also, flash flood watches for the central U.S. throughout the afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So we still have very warm air across the Ohio Valley with daytime highs and a ton of sunshine this afternoon. In the mid 80s, lower 90s across the northern tier of the U.S. with severe weather potential throughout your afternoon. So still a very long haul for Crystal Ball, also watching severe weather. Talk about that coming up. All right, Janessa, thank you very much. Well, the new normal for a nightclub, a nightlife in Switzerland, means clubbing in masks and face shields as well. Well, clubs and bars have reopened in Geneva after the lockdown, but only until midnight and with safety precautions. The Moulin Rouge Club has been turned into a day club where customers receive special face protection, a face visor or a mask at the door and the number allowed are limited. Social distancing is not enforced on the dance floor, but personal data of each guest must be reinforced on, or recorded on a list as requested by law. I mean, if you want to take a drink, you still gotta yeah. move the mask, right?
We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against brutality. We need to stand up and say that Black Lives Matter. Utah Senator Mitt Romney marched through the streets of D.C. with protesters this weekend. He joined a large group, a large group including hundreds of evangelicals, breaking from other Republican lawmakers who have backed President Trump's hardline response to the protests. After three gruesome months, New York City will start reopening today. The city was the epicenter for COVID-19, but now the pandemic has shifted. Uh, cases are rising in states like Texas, California, North Carolina, and Florida. Our Rahima Ellis is in New York with more. Mackenzie Farquay is thrilled about reopening. It's been a very hard, challenging time for retailers. With five retail stores around the city selling everything from home goods to greeting cards, all shut down for three months, her revenue plunged by 80 percent. We had a little bit of savings going into this, and we're just, you know, busting our tail to make as many online sales as possible. And even though New York City is starting to reopen Monday, she doesn't see a return to normal anytime soon. Neither does the governor. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way we were. There's no going back in life. It's about going forward. Going forward, phase one reopening includes retail with curbside and in-person pickup, construction and manufacturing. The Transit Authority is bracing for an additional 400,000 riders on top of the one and a half million essential workers already using the system. Is it clean enough for me to come down to the subway? So the New York City subway system has never been as clean as it is now. We disinfect and clean all of the cars four, five, six, seven times a day. Social distancing encouraged and masks are required for transit workers and all riders. What happens if you come down and you don't have a mask? We're going to have masks at every station booth ready if you need one. So how much do they cost? Nothing. Free? Free. Free face mask. What about the hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer made by uh, New York State free to uh, anyone who needs one. Nationwide health officials are concerned that reopening has contributed to a spike in 18 states. And that has people worried. According to a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 66 percent of Americans say they're uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large crowd. 43 percent are very uncomfortable. Back in New York, Mackenzie is doing all she can to make customers feel safe. People can't come in. The table will stop them? Correct. So we've reworked the store and put this table as a barricade. We'll use this table to put customer purchases so they can, uh, you know, safely grab their items. And Monday, you're going to be ready like this. Monday, we will be here, smiles under our masks. And for commuter stations, none bigger than this, New York's Grand Central Station, which typically on a Monday would be packed with commuters. For the sake of social distancing, transit authorities are asking companies to do a couple of things, stagger work hours, even work days, to reduce overcrowding. Philip? Still so odd to see those New York landmarks so empty. Mm -hmm. Rahima, thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be a very different city when we step out in it. Yeah. All right. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others in the black community are heartbreaking. Are heartbreaking. Are heartbreaking and can no longer be ignored. The process begins with us listening and learning because understanding the problem is the first step in fixing it. We are committed to listening with empathy and with an open heart to better educate ourselves. We will use this education to advocate for change in our nation, our communities, and most importantly, in our own homes even after the headlines go away. All of our Ahead of Sunday's cup race in Atlanta, NASCAR drivers posted this video condemning racism with the first person to speak being NASCAR's only black driver, Bubba Wallace. And just before drivers started their engines, they participated in a powerful moment of silence for racial injustice. On the topic, NASCAR president Steve Phelps said the sport must do better in dealing with issues of race. Bubba Wallace, along with many crew members, wore I Can't Breathe Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Cars were stopped in the front stretch of the track during that moment of silence. Wonderful to see similar protests in other sports when they finally get a chance to a resume. powerful message from NASCAR and NFLs we've seen as well. Happy Monday, friends. We have severe weather that's unfortunately running through the northern tier of the U.S. and enhanced risk of these strong storms with tornadoes possible for the Dakotas this afternoon. Now, your week ahead will continue to watch Chris the Bull as it makes its way to the north, increasing winds throughout the day into tomorrow afternoon. You're watching early today. We'll be right back. 
A groundswell of athletes are teaming up to fight for racial equality. NBA legend Michael Jordan and his Nike brand are pledging $100 million over the next 10 years to organizations, quote, dedicated to ensuring racial equality, social justice, and greater access to education. And then about face in the NFL, admitting the league was wrong for not listening to players earlier. Overnight, President Trump suggested on Twitter Commissioner Roger Goodell was giving players the okay to kneel during the national anthem. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has more. A stunning reversal from NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. It's the strongest declaration on race by the NFL to date. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. The NFL's response to this viral video. What will it take for one of us to be murdered by police brutality? What if I was George Floyd? Some of football's biggest stars calling on the league to condemn racism. We admit wrong and silencing our players from peacefully protesting. Still, Goodell never mentions Colin Kaepernick. In 2016, the 49er quarterback was the first to take a knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality and racial injustice. Devin and Jason McCourty play for the Patriots. They say George Floyd's death changed the nation. I think it really opened people's eyes like we got so angry at this young man for taking a knee during the anthem and then we had to watch a black man die by that same type of image. On Friday afternoon, after President Trump criticized Saints quarterback Drew Brees, tweeting, he should not have taken back his original stance on honoring our magnificent American flag. The superstar responded, defending his apology for these comments when asked about players kneeling in protest. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. To President Trump, he wrote, this is not an issue about the American flag. It has never been. We can no longer use the flag to turn people away or distract them from the real issues that face our black communities. As thousands take to the streets, the NFL now adding its voice to the growing calls to end racism. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. A de debate years in the making, and you now know, we see the change. It's great that they yeah. apologize, but I think it's a, too little too late. You know, where were they when Colin Kaepernick right. really needed that support when he lost a job and it was never, he said, about kneeling for the flag, uh, you know, or in protest to, of U.S. troops. It's always about racial but inequality. But I think when there's calls for change and finally we're seeing it, a little too late, but I think better hey, than nothing. Better than nothing. Better than nothing. Well said. We thank you for waking up with us and starting your week with Early Today. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Please be safe out there. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Day 14, George Floyd was killed on Memorial Day. Today, a public viewing is in Houston, and the massive protests have managed to push some cities to defund or dismantle police departments, including Minneapolis. Amid huge demonstrations, New York City, the one-time epicenter of the coronavirus, prepares to open up today. Tropical storm Cristobal is slowly moving north as a storm surge hits the Gulf Coast states, along with flooding rains and high winds. We got the latest. Now meet the baker who is delivering food for the soul to hard-hit communities across the country, including her hometown. Early Today starts right now. Good Monday morning. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Glad you're with us. Well, there are signs now, major signs in Minneapolis. The protests are making a difference. As calls grow for justice after the fatal arrest of George Floyd, the majority of the city council has agreed to dismantle the police department. The council president says they will recreate systems of public safety. A service was held for Floyd this weekend in North Carolina, the state where he was born, and a public viewing will be held this afternoon in Houston, where Floyd spent most of his life before a funeral tomorrow. According to reporting by The Hill, George Floyd's brother, Philonis, will testify before the House Judiciary Committee during a hearing on June 10th about police brutality. And Democrats are expected to reveal new police reform legislation today, and a Republican senator is joining those calls for change. 
We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against brutality. We need to stand up and say that black lives matter. Utah Senator Mitt Romney marched with protesters in D.C. this weekend, joining a group of hundreds of evangelicals. Protests have persisted for nearly two weeks now, and they show no signs of slowing down. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is following the demonstrations on the West Coast. Aaron, what are you seeing? Thousands of people have gathered here in Hollywood, people of all ages and races, to send the message that Black Lives Matter. Similar scenes have played out across the United States. Calls for change spreading across the United States and around the world. Think about a new beginning and a new tomorrow. In Washington, D.C., for eight minutes, 46 seconds, thousands of protesters lying down across the Black Lives Matter plaza in memory of George Floyd. In New York City, demonstrators swarm Times Square. NBC's Yasmin Vesugian is there. All right, so I'm standing just below Times Square, below 42nd Street. Thousands of folks gathered here. The police are uptown of us, protesting peacefully here, demanding racial justice. In Denver, protesters marched across the Capitol. In Austin, thousands cried, no justice, no peace. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, demonstrators closing down a bridge. Stand against racism. And at the NASCAR Speedway, a moment of silence for racial justice. Anger at police brutality spread across the globe. Protests in Rome, Madrid and Osaka, Japan. In Dortmund, Germany, soccer players take a knee. And in London, protesters gathered near the U.S. Embassy. NBC's Sarah Harmon is there talking to demonstrators. We need to integrate and work as a community to dismantle the system and rebuild it. This is new, shocking incidents involving police come to light, including this alarming video out of Fairfax, Virginia. It shows a police officer on Friday tasing an African-American man. Striking him in the head. The officer now faces three charges of assault. And in Alameda, California, another controversial takedown. Police released this video of an arrest in late May. I can stand up myself. After four officers responded to a call of a man dancing in the street. The incident now under investigation. But for protesters this weekend, investigations are not enough. In Seattle, flashbangs and pepper spray fired after police say several officers were injured by improvised explosives. And police dispersed protesters in Portland. In New York, protests interrupted when a car drove through a small crowd. The driver was later arrested to cheers. And in Richmond, Virginia, a Confederate statue pulled from its pedestal. Yet near the White House, prayers amidst the protest. At St. John's Episcopal Church, site of a now infamous presidential photo op, people gathered for Sunday service. Protesters stood in solidarity, capping off a weekend full of symbolism for a nation perhaps forever changed. Well, so far we've seen minimal security presence at this protest. In fact, the National Guard is expected to leave Los Angeles overnight. So far, things here are looking peaceful. Francis. All right, Aaron, thank you. As protests continue growing, so do the calls for police reform, with many protesters demanding police departments be defunded. Here's Steve Patterson. So with this national movement now shifting from protest to policy, there are more calls to action to defund police departments across the country. Already, we're seeing mayors in major cities join on board with that, and pressure is now mounting here in Minneapolis. But we wanted to ask what it all means and why so many are passionate about it. With a mounting national chorus decrying police brutality against black Americans, there's a new call for deep structural reform of policing across the country. Many are now demanding departments be defunded, dismantled, or outright abolished. I want people to understand that we are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a plan to defund the NYPD by shifting money in the city budget from policing to social services. The move joins with Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, who recently agreed to slash up to $150 million from the police budget. At its core, defunding simply means divesting a chunk from a city's policing budget and rerouting it to community programs. Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garcia says reinvestment could be a turning point. But what we do need 
is increased funding for housing. We need increased funding for education. We need increased funding for the quality of life of communities who are over-policed and over-surveilled. In Minneapolis, the city council is considering a move to reform the department. At a rally, Mayor Jacob Frey was booed for saying no to dismantling the police department. But policing can be dangerous. Saturday in Santa Cruz, California, a sheriff's deputy was shot and killed during an ambush. In my 32-year career, this is the worst day that I've ever experienced. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. And that's going to be made worse because of the coronavirus economic impact that all states and cities are beginning to feel. But as the outrage over the death of George Floyd and the plight of millions of black Americans shifts from protest to change, the calls to defund are only growing louder. And yesterday, nine council members committed, committed to disbanding the police department. But again, that is all rhetorical. The member on that council says it will take at least a year for them to take any meaningful action or meaningful vote. Back to you. All right, Steve, thank you. After three gruesome months, New York City will start reopening today. Yeah, New York was the epicenter for COVID-19, but now the pandemic has shifted. Cases are rising in states like Texas, California, North Carolina, and Florida. Our Rahima Ellis is in New York with more. Mackenzie Farquay is thrilled about reopening. It's been a very hard, challenging time for retailers. With five retail stores around the city selling everything from home goods to greeting cards, all shut down for three months, her revenue plunged by 80 percent. We had a little bit of savings going into this, and we're just, you know, busting our tail to make as many online sales as possible. And even though New York City is starting to reopen Monday, she doesn't see a return to normal anytime soon. Neither does the governor. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way we were. There's no going back in life. It's about going forward. Going forward, phase one reopening includes retail with curbside and in-person pickup, construction and manufacturing. The Transit Authority is bracing for an additional 400,000 riders on top of the one and a half million essential workers already using the system. Is it clean enough for me to come down to the subway? So the New York City subway system has never been as clean as it is now. We disinfect and clean all of the cars four, five, six, seven times a day. Social distancing encouraged and masks are required for transit workers and all riders. What happens if you come down and you don't have a mask? We're going to have masks at every station booth ready if you need one. So how much do they cost? Nothing. Free? Free. Free face mask. What about the hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer made by uh, New York State free to uh, anyone who needs one. Nationwide health officials are concerned that reopening has contributed to a spike in 18 states. And that has people worried. According to a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 66 percent of Americans say they're uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large crowd. 43 percent are very uncomfortable. Back in New York, Mackenzie is doing all she can to make customers feel safe. People can't come in. The table will stop them? Correct. So we've reworked the store and put this table as a barricade. We'll use this table to put customer purchases so they can, uh, you know, safely grab their items. And Monday, you're going to be ready like this. Monday, we will be here, smiles under our masks. And for commuter stations, none bigger than this, New York's Grand Central Station, which typically on a Monday would be packed with commuters. For the sake of social distancing, transit authorities are asking companies to do a couple of things, stagger work hours, even work days, to reduce overcrowding. Philip? I ready or not, today's the day. Rahima, thank you. Tropical storm Cristobal made landfall in the U.S., hitting Louisiana last night and created dangerous conditions as it moved along the Gulf Coast. The storm, packing 50 mile per hour winds, dumped heavy rain up to six inches per hour. Some roads in New Orleans have been swamped and low-lying areas were also affected. Cristobal also caused flooding in Mississippi, swamped parts of an Alabama island town and spawned a tornado in Florida. According to authorities, the tornado uprooted trees and caused damage to homes, but there are no reports of injuries. The storm is expected to dump heavy rain on the Gulf Coast throughout the day. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking that storm for us. Janessa, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. It has definitely been a busy weekend with Tropical Storm Cristobal, and it will continue on its track well to the north. This is going to make its way to the Midwest and even parts of the Great Lakes. Right now, we're seeing sustained winds to 40 miles per hour. It is starting to lose its force, but it will start to intensify uh, as we step into the next few days. As you can see the track, it does turn into possibility of a tropical depression, then increases back into a tropical storm later on this week. We're we're talking about a ton of rain with flash flood watches in place across the central U.S. That's a look at the big weather storm today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Ohio Valley to the northeast, a ton of sunshine this afternoon. Hopefully you can get outside for a nice walk or jog, and we're going to be watching that severe weather across the northern tier with highs in the lower 90s. So a lot of hot air for the northern tier, and we'll talk about the severe weather update coming up. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Janessa. While the United States addresses nationwide protests against systemic racism, a black woman is blazing the trail to the New Jersey Supreme Court. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy nominated Fabiana Pierre-Louise to the state's Supreme Court. She plans to use her experience as a first-generation American to bring new perspective to the role. And if the state confirms her nomination, she'll be the first black woman to hold the post. Be sure to watch her interview this morning on The Today Show. In today's quick hits, two Buffalo police officers were charged with felony assault after a video showed the officers shoving a 75-year-old protester. They pleaded not guilty and were released on personal recognizance. The city of Minneapolis has agreed to ban the use of chokeholds by police. Officers will be required to report and intervene anytime they see unauthorized use of force by another officer. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a call for the passage of the Say Their Name agenda. It includes transparency of prior disciplinary records, banning chokeholds, classifying race-based 911 reports as hate crimes, and designating the Attorney General as an independent prosecutor for police murders. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Crowds have continued to swell in D.C., calling for change. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, the president prepares to meet with law enforcement officials later today. Yeah, the, that meeting today, Francis, with law enforcement is a roundtable uh, based on what we've been able to gather. They're supposed to be discussing the difficulties and the challenges of racial inequalities and in trying to get the job done. This, as President Trump continues to take criticism for calling out active duty troops into D.C., uh, the attorney general now saying in an interview over the weekend that they were called, but they were not used, even though uh, they were seen clearing peaceful protests near the White House. Our new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 80% of Americans polled think that the country is out of control and a majority say they are still not comfortable going out in crowds despite these growing demonstrations that we're seeing. They are expected to continue today as Houston, Texas gives a final farewell to George Floyd, the man whose death at the hands of police in Minnesota started all of this, all of these demonstrations, that service happening in Houston, uh, Vice President, former Vice President and presidential contender Joe Biden expected to fly down to Houston to meet with the family, not attend the service. There were lots of security issues that they didn't want to disrupt from, but he is expected to meet with the family and tape a message for that service. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. Artist Prince Estate re-released the artist's 2015 song, Baltimore, with a new video. The song was originally written as a response to the death of Freddie Gray. The video ends with a Prince quote saying, the system is broken. It's going to take the young people to fix it this time. And what, what a, just a treasure to have this re-released. It was supposed to be Prince's birthday yesterday. Mm, really? So they released it as a tribute to his birthday and with everything going on in the world today. And also uh, they released also a handwritten note that Prince mm -hmm. had about intolerance. 
Just yeah, so, so he had a, yeah, he had a stance on that. You know, we, we see this time and time again, right? But, you know, nothing changed after Tulsa 100 years ago, the 60s, Ferguson. And I'm hopeful that this could be different, you know. But, hey, M Prince's music still as powerful as ever. Yeah, and bringing everybody together, at least in this case. That's right. We sure do miss him, too. Good morning, everyone. This is going to be a good dose of rain for the central U.S. throughout Tuesday afternoon. Look at this. We're talking about up to three inches in some spots. But for the Pacific Northwest, a lot more heat that's building across Southern California. You need to get there. Los Angeles, a high of 90 degrees. We're watching the severe weather threat for the northern plains. It's going to be a wonderful day in New York City. Boston, we're back in the upper 70s with a ton of sunshine. Yes. Nice. Great way to start the week. Yeah, we had a good weekend, too, as well. Just before NASCAR drivers started their engines, they participated in a moment of silence for racial injustice. On the topic, NASCAR President Steve Phelps said the sport must do better in dealing with issues of race. Bubba Wallace, along with many crew members, wore I Can't Breathe Black Lives Matter t-shirts. In Minneapolis, a baker is serving up hope one slice at a time. She's delivering comfort pies to help cities heal in the wake of tragedy. NBC's Kate Snow has more. In Minneapolis, Rose McGee is on a mission. This is what I did. I put the hearts on each one. She and volunteers are baking sweet potato comfort pies and delivering them to neighbors, offering a shoulder to cry on and a sweet dessert. The sweet potato comfort pies are meant to be this catalyst for caring and building community. Her mission started in 2014. Moved by protests in Ferguson, Missouri, she and her son loaded her trunk full of pies and headed there, and then to the shootings in Charleston and Pittsburgh. There have just been too many. I'm sorry for the pain that our country is feeling right now. I wish there was a pie big enough to serve the whole human race. Now it's her own city that needs healing. Watching Rose in the kitchen is magical, but what's more magical really is watching that connection happen. Hi there. Did you get a pie? No. Sweet potato pie. Would you like one? Sure. That's what we brought out today. That's my favorite. And her pies not only bring comfort in tragedy, but honor those doing good, like these volunteers at a local food bank. You all are out here serving. Your first liners. I felt appreciative because we gave out to the community and like they came back and gave back to us. Like we both contributed somehow. Like we both came together. She's even encouraging others to bake their own pies at home and help spread joy. With these pies that you're making tonight, that secret ingredient will be your love. Opening her kitchen and her heart to all those around her. We all have something that we can do, and we want to find what that is and tap into that in a, in a positive way. No, no, thanks to Kate Snow for that report. So filling hearts in that community yeah. and filling bellies, too. Wouldn't you love to taste one of those? I love it when people can use their talent <laughs> yeah. and their time to spread love and joy. Uh, Rose McGee, she's walking the walk. What a right. great neighbor to have. And for everybody else who's tried those pies, <laughs> <laughs> jelly gels, yeah, well, they were able to do it. Yeah, we're jelly. All right, thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Be safe. Have a great Monday. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Today, thousands will descend on the city of Houston to pay their last respects to George Floyd, while the ex-officer charged with second-degree murder will face the judge for the first time. The new demand from protesters to defund the police is gaining traction in Minneapolis, New York City, and elsewhere. A state of emergency as the Gulf Coast is pounded by tropical storm Cristobal, widespread flooding, possible tornadoes, and what's ahead today. Coming together, how a community outpouring of kindness is helping one man overcome a crisis. Some good news as we start this pivotal week. Early today starts right now. Good Monday morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. America continues to be rocked by crisis as the coronavirus pandemic and racial tensions sweep through the nation. It has been two weeks since the death of George Floyd on a Minneapolis street by a Minneapolis police officer. 
And today, friends and the public will say their final goodbyes to the 46-year-old at a memorial service in Houston before he is laid to rest on Tuesday. Meanwhile, in the Big Apple, some 400,000 workers will return to New York City, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus, as it begins phase one of reopening today, after more than three months under lockdown. It makes way for retail curbside pickup, construction, and outdoor graduations. Speaking of graduations, YouTube held a special online celebration for the class of 2020. The virtual ceremony featured addresses from former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama. Performers Beyonce, Lizzo, Alicia Keys, Taylor Swift, and many more also made appearances. Well, it comes as many people, young and old, continue to protest for police reform. Like this scene in Portland, where police shut down a large crowd of demonstrators who gathered downtown, calling it an unlawful assembly. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has more. Thousands of people have gathered here in Hollywood, people of all ages and races, to send the message that Black Lives Matter. Similar scenes have played out across the United States. Calls for change spreading across the United States and around the world. Think about a new beginning and a new tomorrow. In Washington, D.C., for eight minutes, 46 seconds, thousands of protesters lying down across the Black Lives Matter plaza in memory of George Floyd. In New York City, demonstrators swarm Times Square. NBC's Yasmin Vesugian is there. All right, so I'm standing just below Times Square, below 42nd Street. Thousands of folks gathered here. The police are uptown of us, protesting peacefully here, demanding racial justice. In Denver, protesters marched across the Capitol. In Austin, thousands cried, no justice, no peace. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, demonstrators closing down a bridge. Stand against racism. And at the NASCAR the Speedway, racism. a moment of silence for racial justice. Anger at police brutality spread across the globe. Protests in Rome, Madrid and Osaka, Japan. In Dortmund, Germany, soccer players take a knee. And in London, protesters gathered near the U.S. Embassy. NBC's Sarah Harmon is there talking to demonstrators. We need to integrate and work as a community to dismantle the system and rebuild it. Come on. This is new, shocking incidents involving police come to light, including this alarming video out of Fairfax, Virginia. It shows a police officer on Friday tasing an African-American man. Striking him in the head. The officer now faces three charges of assault. And in Alameda, California, another controversial takedown. Police released this video of an arrest in late May. I can stand up myself. After four officers responded to a call of a man dancing in the street. The incident now under investigation. But for protesters this weekend, investigations are not enough. In Seattle, flashbangs and pepper spray fired after police say several officers were injured by improvised explosives and police dispersed protesters in Portland. In New York, protests interrupted when a car drove through a small crowd. The driver was later arrested to cheers. And in Richmond, Virginia, a Confederate statue pulled from its pedestal. Yet near the White House, prayers amidst the protest. At St. John's Episcopal Church, site of a now infamous presidential photo op, people gathered for Sunday service. Protesters stood in solidarity, capping off a weekend full of symbolism for a nation perhaps forever changed. Well, so far we've seen minimal security presence at this protest. In fact, the National Guard is expected to leave Los Angeles overnight. So far, things here are looking peaceful. Francis. All right, Aaron, thank you. Utah Senator Mitt Romney joins the chorus calling for racial equality, marching in D.C. with protesters this weekend. We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against brutality. We need to stand up and say that black lives matter. He joined a large group that included hundreds of evangelicals breaking from other Republican lawmakers who have backed President Trump's hardline response to the protests. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Crowds have continued to swell in D.C., calling for change. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, the president prepares to meet with law enforcement officials later today.
Francis, that meeting today, a roundtable with law enforcement officers, and from what we've been able to gather, the president will talk to them about the challenges of dealing with racial inequality on the job. This, as President Trump continues to be criticized for calling out active duty troops to deal with some of those demonstrations in D.C. Now, a group of Democrats, the House Oversight Committee, wants a list of all the law enforcement officers that were called out. The Attorney General, Bill Barr, uh, is saying in an interview over the weekend that many of these uh, troops were called out, but they were not used. They were called, uh, but they didn't actually clash with protesters, even though some were seen clearing peaceful protesters near the White House. There's a new poll, our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, where 80 percent believe the country is out of control and the majority say they don't feel comfortable going out into crowds, despite what we're seeing with these demonstrations. Also happening today, presidential contender Joe Biden, the former vice president, going down to Houston, Texas to meet with the family of George Floyd uh, as they prepare a final memorials there. That funeral happening in Houston. Biden won't be there, but he is expected to tape a message for the service after he meets with the family. Francis. Okay, Tracy Potts for us. Tracy, thank you. Tropical storm Cristobal has made landfall in the U.S., hitting so southeastern Louisiana just hours ago, moving along the Gulf Coast. The eye of the storm came ashore with powerful winds and driving rain, causing flooding in some areas. Many roads in New Orleans have been swamped and low-lying areas were evacuated. Louisiana has declared a state of emergency. NBC's Carrie Sanders has more. Francis, New Orleans was ready for Tropical Storm Cristobal. If nothing else, this was a warm-up for what's expected to be a very busy hurricane season. In New Orleans, extensive flooding along the lakefront. The city's massive flood control system, much of it rebuilt after Hurricane Katrina, now being tested. I've got a feeling that for, for New Orleanians, the hurricane season's always on our mind once June rolls around. So you don't need Cristobal to remind you what you're up against? No, absolutely not. Tropical storm Cristobal, an unprecedented third named storm this early in the hurricane season, now only seven days old. The impact spread wide, stretching along the Gulf Coast from Tampa to New Orleans. In Orlando, cleanup. After an F1 tornado spawned by tropical storm Cristobal ripped through a neighborhood. Oh my God. The twister began as a water spout Saturday evening. Oh, thrown roof pieces off. Once over land, the tornado, packing winds of up to 105 miles per hour, ripped roofs, downed power lines, smashed cars. As many as 50 people displaced, but fortunately, no one seriously injured. It's hard to see in the morning and night, that's for sure. Very hard. Despite wind gusts up to 50 miles per hour, the real threat from the rain in those clouds, up to a foot forecast. In some low-lying areas of Louisiana, voluntary evacuations. With the nation's attention consumed by the economy, a pandemic, and nationwide protests, emergency officials say tropical storm Cristobal is a good reminder we are now in hurricane season. In New Orleans, most residents doing as they have done for months, hold up at home. Electric company crews remain on alert. We're ready to restore power as soon as it's safe, safe to do so. Francis, you see the shutters up, but they're not up for weather, and you might think they were also perhaps put up because of protests that they've had here. But they actually went up in March when coronavirus hit here, and this city essentially shut down. Francis? All right, Carrie, thank you. And who'd have thought boarding up for those three different reasons? <laughs> Coronavirus, protests, weather, and rioting. Yeah. 2020, at least the weather we were expecting, right? Yeah. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, she's been tracking Cristobal for us. Hey, Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We've been talking about Cristobal for about a week now, and it's going to be another seven days that we're talking about this storm system. It is going to be well-traveled to the north. Right now, it's losing some of its energy as it interacts with that land. We're seeing sustained winds about 40 miles per hour. I do think this storm system will decrease to a tropical depression, possibility of even a surface low before it really starts to gain steam going into the Midwest, even parts of Canada. 
Canada for late week. So wind gusts by Thursday afternoon up to at least 45 miles per hour. It's the ton of rain that we continue to see with this storm system from the central U.S. flash flood watches and warnings in place throughout the afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So it's going to be a prime time day across the Northeast and the Ohio Valley, a ton of sunshine. Hopefully you can enjoy this, but I am watching the severe weather threat for the northern tier, upper 80s to lower 90s. Going to be watching the upper Midwest with possible tornadoes. Talk about that more coming up. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. Leading the news, former National Security Advisor John Bolton is moving forward with his tell-all. Bolton plans to release his White House memoir in late June. He is moving forward despite the administration's attempt to block the publication. Back in January, President Trump tweeted about the book calling it nasty and untrue. Bolton served as National Security Advisor from April of 2018 to September of 2019. As protests continue across the country, we're seeing supporters take a stand. These healthcare workers took a knee in solidarity in New York. Many doctors and nurses have joined in, despite warnings that large gatherings could spread the coronavirus. Here's Katie Beck. From New York to Minneapolis, Atlanta to Seattle, healthcare workers take a knee for racial injustice. Many crossing from the front line of a pandemic to the forefront of a national protest. On days when Dr. Brian Leva isn't working in a hospital, he's wearing his white coat on Minneapolis streets. This isn't just a black issue, this is a human rights issue, and it is also a public health crisis. Providing protesters with band-aids for blisters, water to stay hydrated. I carry an epinephrine pen in case somebody has an allergy attack. I carry aspirin, you know, I carry gloves, and because of the pandemic, I also carried a mask. Health experts warn protests could be the perfect recipe for spreading the deadly virus. Massive crowds, a lack of social distancing, many without masks could spark a second wave. It's a risk registered nurse Anna Maria Ruiz is willing to take. She's treating COVID-19 patients in Austin, Texas, and says marching is an essential job, too, for saving future lives. Everybody needs to take part. Everybody needs to participate because that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take every single person to, to bring about this change. Dr. Natalia dorf Biderman came in on her day off to be part of this moment with her Minneapolis colleagues. I felt so compelled to be part of um, the, uh, the voice of healthcare. And in New York City, nurse practitioner Julius Johnson marches in between treating patients. While he protects against COVID exposure, he believes police brutality is an equal public health risk. I work alongside physicians, um, physician assistants, certified nursing assistants. Any of these people that hear this, I can't breathe, are going to go help. Are you at all worried about the repercussions of what might come? Absolutely. The problem is, is that if we decided to just stay home and COVID didn't kill us, then the situation that you see with George Floyd, situation that you see with Ahmaud Aubrey, situations you see with all of these people repeatedly, it may happen. Providers working to heal a national pain, this time outside the halls of medicine. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, those messages are powerful, and that shirt said it all. What color am I when I save your life? Yeah, there you go. You're right. Powerful really, words really there. Powerful. Protesters in Britain toppled the statue of a 17th century slave trader. After painting it red and pulling it through the town, they finally threw it in the river. It had been standing since the late 1800s. The May job numbers brought a glimmer of hope to millions of Americans suffering through this economic crisis. But for African Americans, the anguish of unemployment only got worse. NBC's Morgan Radford reports. The latest jobless numbers, good news for the country, adding two and a half million jobs in the month of May. But for black Americans, unemployment rose to 16.8 percent, its highest rate in a decade. For human resources executive Victor Patterson, his six-month job search has brought uncertainty. What needs to change? We have to get back to the point where we are identifying talent through a very broad spectrum versus the narrow one that may exist today. 
Kanisha Mayweather left her job at a clothing distribution center in April because she couldn't risk exposing her three children to COVID-19. Her eldest daughter diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, and she says her youngest has breathing problems. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. Mayweather says she filed for unemployment, her first check arriving just this week. It's been real crazy stressful, very stressful. It's been plenty of nights I've cried. Some small business owners hit first by the virus and then by looters. To be honest, <laughs> that was a long night. <laughs> In Tampa, Florida, co-owner Karif Johnston says his shoe store lost over $100,000 in damages and stolen merchandise. Security footage showing not even a locked gate could stop looters. Being a Black-owned business and, you know, always trying to do our best to take care of our safe community, we, we don't hold anything against anybody. We forgive everybody. A community in pain after the killing of George Floyd, now beginning the long road towards healing. Morgan Radford, NBC News. Good morning, everyone. We are starting off this week with a lot of rain. We're going to be talking about all week long across the central U.S., upper Midwest as well, up to three to four inches, some spots up to six inches in isolated areas. Pacific Northwest, lots of sunshine today. T- today, highs in the 60s. We'll be right back. While protests continue, many people are also trying to make a difference by supporting Black-owned companies. Yelp is making the process easier. They're adding a new feature to allow businesses to add a Black-owned label to their listings. Yelp says there were 25 more searches for these types of businesses over the last week compared to the same time last year. At a time when so many are divided, this is a story about one community uniting in kindness to save a beloved barbershop. Jose diaz Pilart has more. At Ooze and Oz Barbershop in Columbus, Ohio, Byron Woods has been serving up trims and teachings for almost 30 years. Folks from all over come for the best cuts and conversation in town. He's a great barber. As far as coming here, uh, it's an excellent community. Business was booming, but then came the pandemic. When COVID hit, I, um, I was frustrated because my landlord was asking for the money. I didn't know where help was going to come from. I have to be honest, I lost faith. Closing their doors for almost two months because they were deemed non-essential. Woods is now getting back on his feet with fewer customers. The reality of our business is does more than just cut hair. I mean, we've been a hub for uh, people's lives. He worried he wouldn't be able to make the rents or pay his staff, many of whom are former felons. Woods giving them their first job out of prison. When he offered me a job at Uzanaz, I was a little surprised. So it kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration. Then, amid a pile of unpaid bills, a message of hope. Your acceptance of all people and your overwhelming personal tragedy make you the person I want to, my stimulus check to go to. Sue Keezer, a retired school teacher, read about Woods in the local paper. When I got my check from the government, I knew that I did not need it. My income had not changed at all, and I wanted to give it to someone. He was looking for a miracle, and I wanted to help him have that miracle. It didn't stop there. Thousands pouring in from a GoFundMe page. Whether it was $10 to $5,000, it was something that people done from their heart to say, you mean something to me. An outpouring of support from the community he helped build. Not only is he a great barber, but he is a great person. One trim at a time. I appreciate money, but much more I appreciate the heart of people because that is really what lasts. Oh, thanks to Jose for that report. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, when we're hearing everybody's hearts opening up during this time, a time where we need it more than ever, and to see those kinds of gestures. And now more than ever, people appreciate their barbers and their yes. stylists, right? Well, now that's if you ever. had a chance to even get to them, which we have not yet in some parts of the country, definitely not. Not yet, but we're getting there and support Slowly. This is Early Today. Your news continues. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Today in Houston, George Floyd's family and loved ones will hold a public viewing at the same time in Minneapolis. 
Police officer Derek Chauvin is scheduled to make his first court appearance. Over the weekend, the peaceful voices of protesters grew even louder as many pushed for change, including defunding or total dismantling of police departments. New incidents caught on camera fueling the fire for movement, including a white officer tasing a black man in the streets during a domestic call. The officer now faces assault charges. And Cristobal strikes Gulf Coast states with flooding rains, storm surge, and strong gusty winds. Janessa is tracking it all for us. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good to be with you. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. It has been two weeks since the death of George Floyd on a Minneapolis street by a Minneapolis police officer. And today, family, friends, and the public will say their final goodbyes to the 46-year-old at a memorial service in Houston before he's laid to rest on Tuesday. And in Minneapolis, where George died, a veto-proof majority of the city council agreed to dismantle the city's police department. At a community meeting, the president of the council called the city's relationship with the department toxic. One councilman told NBC News the council could work to disband the department in its current iteration. So far, eight or nine of the council members had agreed to that move, but police have not responded to the announcement. Meanwhile, New York City, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus, is beginning phase one of reopening, which will lead the way for some 400,000 workers to return to the city. Also happening today, President Trump, who has met backlash for his response to Black Lives Matter protests, will meet with law enforcement officials at the White House. It comes as protesters continue demonstrations across the nation demanding justice for George Floyd. Here's NBC's Jennifer Johnson. Across the country, more protests over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd, as a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 80% of Americans say things in the U.S. are out of control. The COVID-19 pandemic, America's economic crisis, and video of police brutality taking its toll. And I think it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And this is the real time for us to come together. With millions demanding change, two senators will release a new bill Monday banning certain police practices and demanding more accountability. This is not a system that is always explicitly done by overt racism. Uh, this is a system that's really baked. Despite the protests, the poll also shows a majority of Americans are uncomfortable attending large gatherings, including in restaurants and planes. This as President Trump faces new criticism from another U.S. general, longtime Republican Colin Powell, announcing he will back Joe Biden in November's election. The one word I have to use with respect to his what he's been doing for the last several years is a word I would never have used before. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it. Powell's words come after the president was publicly criticized by Generals James Mattis and John Kelly and Admiral Mike Mullen for wanting to use U.S. military soldiers against protesters. We have a military to fight our enemies, not our own people. The president firing back, calling Powell a real stiff, responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars after previously lashing out against Mattis and other military leaders. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. It comes as the president prepares to meet with law enfor enforcement officials today. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more. From the president who declared this. I am your president of law and order. A new order. President Trump withdrawing 4,900 National Guard troops on duty in Washington, D.C., and writing, Now that everything is under perfect control, they will be going home, but can quickly return if needed. Attorney General William Barr rejected what many protesters are marching to change, that racism is rooted in institutions like law enforcement. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. The president will host a meeting at the White House with law enforcement from local, state and federal agencies. This past week, the president's call to dominate the streets brought out a barrage of criticism from former four-star generals, some who even advised Mr. Trump. And now former Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell said President Trump crossed a line. We have a constitution, and we have to follow that constitution, and the president has drifted away from it. 
Powell, who served four presidents, three Republicans and one Democrat, endorsed Joe Biden after supporting Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in the past three contests. President Trump fired off tweets calling the decorated commander and former Bush secretary of state highly overrated and a real stiff who was very responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars. Powell's opposition to Trump is well known. His criticism was about standing up to power. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people would not hold him accountable. Democratic candidate Joe Biden flies to Houston, Texas today to meet with George Floyd's family and to offer his condolences in person. He'll also be recording a video message for Tuesday's funeral, but Biden won't be staying. His campaign says they don't want to cause disruption that would come along with the security needs for the former vice president to be there in person. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. Calls for justice against police brutality continue to grow across the country. And a disturbing new incident caught on video has led to assault charges against an officer in Virginia. Drew Wilder from our Washington, D.C. affiliate WRC has this report. Walking around in the middle of the street, rambling. The video starts with the victim walking circles in the street in the Alexandria area of Fairfax County. Officers and paramedics were responding for a domestic call. You want to go to detox? Yes, yes. All right, yes. you got to get in the ambulance with them if you want to go no, to detox. No, no, no. About two and a half minutes into the video, from the left side of your screen, you see Officer Tyler Timberlake arrive. He walks straight towards the victim and draws his taser. Is he wanted? You can hear Officer Timberlake talking to the victim by name. Anthony, relax. Fairfax County's police chief acknowledged this. Anthony. Then Officer Timberlake hits the victim with the taser, and you can hear the officer apply another electric shock as the other officers and paramedics rush in. Late Saturday night, Fairfax County Chief of Police Edwin Rossler saying every officer on this call is now on leave and Officer Timberlake is facing three assault and battery charges. In violation of our use of force policies and they are criminal acts which violate our oath of office and they ignore the sanctity of human life. The chief says Officer Timberlake escalated this situation, which shatters the already damaged trust with law enforcement. I righteously stand with the anger across this country, in this community, because I have righteous anger too. And that was Drew Wilder reporting. It was a, a weekend full of protests, uh, demonstrations rather, supporting Black Lives Matter in the United Kingdom. In Bristol, protesters brought down a statue honoring a 100-year-old slave trader named Edward Colton. It was then dragged into the Avon River where it sunk. Our Sarah Harmon is in London where thousands gathered outside the U.S. Embassy. The Black Lives Matter movement continues to gain momentum globally here at this protest in front of the U.S. Embassy in London. Thousands have gathered peacefully, taking the knee. and demanding that their voices be heard. They're demanding an end to police brutality, an end to racism and violence against black people. I'm sick of having to explain to my children that because they're black, they have to act a certain way, they have to behave a certain way, they have to work 10 times harder to get anywhere in life. Equal rights for everybody, no matter what the color of your skin. I think that's, that's a fundamental human right. It's, uh... This has happened so many times now and nothing's taken traction on it. Hopefully this time with it being widespread throughout the world, it's actually going to make some difference. There are thousands of people. This is normally two lanes of traffic here and two lanes on the other side. The crowd stretches all the way back as far as the eye can see. We saw peaceful protests in Parliament Square. These look even bigger. Sarah Herman, NBC News, London. Now to tropical storm Cristobal made, making landfall in the United States, hitting southeastern Louisiana just hours ago and moved along the Gulf Coast. The eye of the storm came ashore with powerful winds and driving rain to cause flooding in some areas. Many roads have been swamped and low-lying areas were evacuated. Louisiana has declared a state of emergency. NBC's Dan Sheneman has more. Cristobal made landfall as a tropical storm. Packing 50 mile per hour winds, the storm dumped inches of rain up to six inches per hour along the Gulf Coast, flooding parts of Mississippi. 
and Florida and Louisiana, while water in Lake Pontchartrain near New Orleans was pushed over the shoreline. Cristobal also blamed for spawning this water spout in Alabama and Saturday's tornado in Orlando. Homes and properties were damaged. You saw my whole carport's gone, my back porch is gone. There's a roof in my backyard, which they're telling me is my roof. The storm is expected to dump heavy rain on the Gulf Coast through Monday morning. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. All right, and NBC Mirage, Janessa Webb has been tracking that storm for us overnight. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. It's been a very busy weekend, and to start off the week, we're going to continue to watch Crystal Bowl. Nothing about this storm system is a sprint. It's going to be a marathon as it continues to make its way to the north. Right now, a tropical storm warning is still in place across the Gulf Coast communities with sustained winds up to 40 miles per hour. It will start to lose strength today, but then start to rev up. This storm system is likely to go into parts of the Great Lakes into the Midwest as we go into the next next few days. Also flash flood watches for the central U.S. throughout the afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So we still have very warm air across the Ohio Valley with daytime highs and a ton of sunshine this afternoon. In the mid 80s, lower 90s across the northern tier of the U.S. with severe weather potential throughout your afternoon. So still a very long haul for Crystal Ball, also watching severe weather. Talk about that coming up. All right, Janessa, thank you very much. Well, the new normal for a nightclub, a nightlife in Switzerland, means clubbing in masks and face shields as well. Well, clubs and bars have reopened in Geneva after the lockdown, but only until midnight and with safety precautions. The Moulin Rouge Club has been turned into a day club where customers receive special face protection, a face visor or a mask at the door and the number allowed are limited. Social distancing is not enforced on the dance floor, but personal data of each guest must be reinforced on, or recorded on a list as requested by law. I mean, if you want to take a drink, you still got to yeah. move the mask, right? We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against peace. brutality. Justice. We need no to stand peace. up and say that Black Lives Matter. No peace. Utah Senator Mitt Romney marched through the streets of D.C. with protesters this weekend. He joined a large group, a large group, including hundreds of evangelicals, breaking from other Republican lawmakers who have backed President Trump's hardline response to the protests. After three gruesome months, New York City will start reopening today. The city was the epicenter for COVID-19, but now the pandemic has shifted. Uh, cases are rising in states like Texas, California, North Carolina, and Florida. Our Rahima Ellis is in New York with more. Mackenzie Farquay is thrilled about reopening. It's been a very hard, challenging time for retailers. With five retail stores around the city selling everything from home goods to greeting cards, all shut down for three months, her revenue plunged by 80 percent. We had a little bit of savings going into this, and we're just, you know, busting our tail to make as many online sales as possible. And even though New York City is starting to reopen Monday, she doesn't see a return to normal anytime soon. Neither does the governor. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way we were. There's no going back in life. It's about going forward. Going forward, phase one reopening includes retail with curbside and in-person pickup, construction and manufacturing. The Transit Authority is bracing for an additional 400,000 riders on top of the one and a half million essential workers already using the system. Is it clean enough for me to come down to the subway? So the New York City subway system has never been as clean as it is now. We disinfect and clean all of the cars four, five, six, seven times a day. Social distancing encouraged and masks are required for transit workers and all riders. What happens if you come down and you don't have a mask? We're going to have masks at every station booth ready if you need one. So how much do they cost? Nothing. Free? Free. Free face mask. What about the hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer made by uh, New York State free to uh, anyone who needs one. Nationwide health officials are concerned that reopening has contributed to a spike in 18 states. And that has people worried. According to a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 66 percent of Americans say they're uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large crowd. 43 percent are very uncomfortable. 
Back in New York, Mackenzie is doing all she can to make customers feel safe. People can't come in. The table will stop them? Correct. So we've reworked the store and put this table as a barricade. We'll use this table to put customer purchases so they can uh, you know, safely grab their items. And Monday, you're going to be ready like this. Monday, we will be here, smiles under our masks. And for commuter stations, none bigger than this, New York's Grand Central Station, which typically on a Monday would be packed with commuters. For the sake of social distancing, transit authorities are asking companies to do a couple of things, stagger work hours, even work days, to reduce overcrowding. Philip? Still so odd to see those New York landmarks so empty. Mm -hmm. Rahima, thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be a very different city when we step out in it. Yeah. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others in the black community are heartbreaking. Are heartbreaking. Are heartbreaking and can no longer be ignored. The process begins with us listening and learning. Because understanding the problem is the first step in fixing it. We are committed to listening with empathy and with an open heart to better educate ourselves. We will use this education to advocate for change in our nation, our communities, and most importantly, in our own homes even after the headlines go away. All of our Ahead of Sunday's cup race in Atlanta, NASCAR drivers posted this video condemning racism with the first person to speak being NASCAR's only black driver, Bubba Wallace. And just before drivers started their engines, they participated in a powerful moment of silence for racial injustice. On the topic, NASCAR President Steve Phelps said the sport must do better in dealing with issues of race. Bubba Wallace, along with many crew members, wore I Can't Breathe that Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Cars were stopped in the front stretch of the track during that moment of silence. Wonderful. See similar protests in other sports when they finally get a chance a to resume. powerful message from NASCAR and NFLs we've seen as well. Happy Monday, friends. We have severe weather that's unfortunately running through the northern tier of the U.S. and enhanced risk of these strong storms with tornadoes possible for the Dakotas this afternoon. Now, your week ahead will continue to watch Chris the Bull as it makes its way to the north, increasing winds throughout the day into tomorrow afternoon. You're watching early today. We'll be right back. A groundswell of athletes are teaming up to fight for racial equality. NBA legend Michael Jordan and his Nike brand are pledging $100 million over the next 10 years to organizations, quote, dedicated to ensuring racial equality, social justice, and greater access to education. And then about face in the NFL, admitting the league was wrong for not listening to players earlier. Overnight, President Trump suggested on Twitter Commissioner Roger Goodell was giving players the okay to kneel during the national anthem. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has more. A stunning reversal from NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. It's the strongest declaration on race by the NFL to date. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. The NFL's response to this viral video. What will it take for one of us to be murdered by police brutality? What if I was George Floyd? Some of football's biggest stars calling on the league to condemn racism. We admit wrong and silencing our players from peacefully protesting. Still, Goodell never mentions Colin Kaepernick. In 2016, the 49er quarterback was the first to take a knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality and racial injustice. Devin and Jason McCourty play for the Patriots. They say George Floyd's death changed the nation. I think it really opened people's eyes like we got so angry at this young man for taking a knee during the anthem and then we had to watch a black man die by that same type of image. On Friday afternoon, after President Trump criticized Saints quarterback Drew Brees, tweeting, he should not have taken back his original stance on honoring our magnificent American flag. The superstar responded, defending his apology for these comments when asked about players kneeling in protest. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. To President Trump, he wrote, This is not an issue about the American flag. It has never been. We can no longer use the flag to turn people away or distract them from the real issues that face our black communities. As thousands take to the streets, the NFL now adding its voice to the growing calls to end racism. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles.
A de- debate years in the making, and you now know, we see the change. It's great that they apologize, yeah. but I think it's a, too little too late. You know, where were they when Colin Kaepernick right. really needed that support when he lost a job and it was never, he said, about kneeling for the flag, uh, you know, or in protest to, of U.S. troops. It's always about racial but inequality. But I think when there's calls for change and finally we're seeing it, a little too late, but I think better hey, than nothing. Better than nothing. Better than nothing. Well said. We thank you for waking up with us and starting your week with Early Today. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Please be safe out there. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Day 14, George Floyd was killed on Memorial Day. Today, a public viewing is in Houston, and the massive protests have managed to push some cities to defund or dismantle police departments, including Minneapolis. Amid huge demonstrations, New York City, the one-time epicenter of the coronavirus, prepares to open up today. Tropical storm Cristobal is slowly moving north as a storm surge hits the Gulf Coast states, along with flooding rains and high winds. We got the latest. And meet the baker who is delivering food for the soul to hard-hit communities across the country, including her hometown. Early Today starts right now. Good Monday morning. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Glad you're with us. Well, there are signs now, major signs in Minneapolis. The protests are making a difference. As calls grow for justice after the fatal arrest of George Floyd, the majority of the city council has agreed to dismantle the police department. The council president says they will recreate systems of public safety. A service was held for Floyd this weekend in North Carolina, the state where he was born. And a public viewing will be held this afternoon in Houston, where Floyd spent most of his life before a funeral tomorrow. According to reporting by The Hill, George Floyd's brother, Philonis, will testify before the House Judiciary Committee during a hearing on June 10th about police brutality. Democrats are expected to reveal new police reform legislation today. And a Republican senator is joining those calls for change. We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against brutality. We need to stand up and say that black lives matter. Utah Senator Mitt Romney marched with protesters in D.C. this weekend, joining a group of hundreds of evangelicals. Protests have persisted for nearly two weeks now, and they show no signs of slowing down. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is following the demonstrations on the West Coast. Aaron, what are you seeing? Thousands of people have gathered here in Hollywood, people of all ages and races, to send the message that Black Lives Matter. Similar scenes have played out across the United States. Calls for change spreading across the United States and around the world. Think about a new beginning and a new tomorrow. In Washington, D.C., for eight minutes, 46 seconds, thousands of protesters lying down across the Black Lives Matter plaza in memory of George Floyd. In New York City, demonstrators swarm Times Square. NBC's Yasmin Vesugian is there. All right, so I'm standing just below Times Square, below 42nd Street. Thousands of folks gathered here. The police are uptown of us, protesting peacefully here, demanding racial justice. In Denver, protesters marched across the Capitol. In Austin, thousands cried, no justice, no peace. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, demonstrators closing down a bridge. Stand against racism. And at the NASCAR Speedway, a moment of silence for racial justice. Anger at police brutality spread across the globe. Protests in Rome, Madrid and Osaka, Japan. In Dortmund, Germany, soccer players take a knee. And in London, protesters gathered near the U.S. Embassy. NBC's Sarah Harmon is there talking to demonstrators. We need to integrate and work as a community to dismantle the system and rebuild it. This is new, shocking incidents involving police come to light, including this alarming video out of Fairfax, Virginia. It shows a police officer on Friday tasing an African-American man. Striking him in the head. The officer now faces three charges of assault. And in Alameda, California, another controversial takedown. Police released this video of an arrest in late May. I can stand up myself. After four officers responded to a call of a man dancing in the street. The incident now under investigation. But for protesters this weekend, investigations are not enough. 
in Seattle, flashbangs and pepper spray fired after police say several officers were injured by improvised explosives. And police dispersed protesters in Portland. In New York, protests interrupted when a car drove through a small crowd. The driver was later arrested to cheers. And in Richmond, Virginia, a Confederate statue pulled from its pedestal. Yet near the White House, prayers amidst the protest. At St. John's Episcopal Church, site of a now infamous presidential photo op, people gathered for Sunday service. Protesters stood in solidarity, capping off a weekend full of symbolism for a nation perhaps forever changed. Well, so far we've seen minimal security presence at this protest. In fact, the National Guard is expected to leave Los Angeles overnight. So far, things here are looking peaceful. Francis. All right, Aaron, thank you. As protests continue growing, so do the calls for police reform, with many protesters demanding police departments be defunded. Here's Steve Patterson. So with this national movement now shifting from protest to policy, there are more calls to action to defund police departments across the country. Already, we're seeing mayors in major cities join on board with that, and pressure is now mounting here in Minneapolis. But we wanted to ask what it all means and why so many are passionate about it. With a mounting national chorus decrying police brutality against black Americans, there's a new call for deep structural reform of policing across the country. Many are now demanding departments be defunded, dismantled, or outright abolished. I want people to understand that we are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a plan to defund the NYPD by shifting money in the city budget from policing to social services. The move joins with Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, who recently agreed to slash up to $150 million from the police budget. At its core, defunding simply means divesting a chunk from a city's policing budget and rerouting it to community programs. Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garcia says reinvestment could be a turning point. But what we do need is increased funding for housing. We need increased funding for education. We need increased funding for the quality of life of communities who are over-policed and over-surveilled. In Minneapolis, the city council is considering a move to reform the department. Shame, 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 shame. At a rally, Mayor Jacob Frey was booed for saying no to dismantling the police department. But policing can be dangerous. Saturday in Santa Cruz, California, a sheriff's deputy was shot and killed during an ambush. In my 32-year career, this is the worst day that I've ever experienced. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. And that's going to be made worse because of the coronavirus economic impact that all states and cities are beginning to feel. But as the outrage over the death of George Floyd and the plight of millions of black Americans shifts from protest to change, the calls to defund are only growing louder. And yesterday, nine council members committed, committed to disbanding the police department. But again, that is all rhetorical. The member on that council says it will take at least a year for them to take any meaningful action or meaningful vote. Back to you. All right, Steve, thank you. After three gruesome months, New York City will start reopening today. Yeah, New York was the epicenter for COVID-19, but now the pandemic has shifted. Cases are rising in states like Texas, California, North Carolina, and Florida. Our Rahima Ellis is in New York with more. Mackenzie Farquay is thrilled about reopening. It's been a very hard, challenging time for retailers. With five retail stores around the city selling everything from home goods to greeting cards, all shut down for three months, her revenue plunged by 80 percent. We had a little bit of savings going into this, and we're just, you know, busting our tail to make as many online sales as possible. And even though New York City is starting to reopen Monday, she doesn't see a return to normal anytime soon. Neither does the governor. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way we were. There's no going back in life. It's about going forward. Going forward, phase one reopening includes retail with curbside and in-person pickup, construction and manufacturing. The Transit Authority is bracing for an additional 400,000 riders on top of the one and a half million essential workers already using the system. Is it clean enough for me to come down to the subway? 
So the New York City subway system has never been as clean as it is now. We disinfect and clean all of the cars four, five, six, seven times a day. Social distancing encouraged and masks are required for transit workers and all riders. What happens if you come down and you don't have a mask? We're going to have masks at every station booth ready if you need one. So how much do they cost? Nothing. Free? Free. Free face mask. What about the hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer made by uh, New York State, free to uh, anyone who needs one. Nationwide health officials are concerned that reopening has contributed to a spike in 18 states. And that has people worried. According to a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 66 percent of Americans say they're uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large crowd. 43 percent are very uncomfortable. Back in New York, Mackenzie is doing all she can to make customers feel safe. People can't come in. The table will stop them? Correct. So we've reworked the store and put this table as a barricade. We'll use this table to put customer purchases so they can uh, you know, safely grab their items. And Monday, you're going to be ready like this. Monday, we will be here, smiles under our masks. And for commuter stations, none bigger than this, New York's Grand Central Station, which typically on a Monday would be packed with commuters. For the sake of social distancing, transit authorities are asking companies to do a couple of things, stagger work hours, even work days, to reduce overcrowding. Philip? I read it or not, today's the day. Rahima, thank you. Tropical storm Cristobal made landfall in the U.S., hitting Louisiana last night and created dangerous conditions as it moved along the Gulf Coast. The storm, packing 50 mile per hour winds, dumped heavy rain up to six inches per hour. Some roads in New Orleans have been swamped and low-lying areas were also affected. Cristobal also caused flooding in Mississippi, swamped parts of an Alabama island town and spawned a tornado in Florida. According to authorities, the tornado uprooted trees and caused damage to homes, but there are no reports of injuries. The storm is expected to dump heavy rain on the Gulf Coast throughout the day. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking that storm for us. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. It has definitely been a busy weekend with Tropical Storm Cristobal, and it will continue on its track well to the north. This is going to make its way to the Midwest and even parts of the Great Lakes. Right now, we're seeing sustained winds to 40 miles per hour. It is starting to lose its force, but it will start to intensify uh, as we step into the next few days. As you can see the track, it does turn into possibility of a tropical depression, then increases back into a tropical storm later on this week. We're talking about a ton of rain with flash flood watches in place across the central U.S. That's a look at the big weather storm today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Ohio Valley to the northeast, a ton of sunshine this afternoon. Hopefully you can get outside for a nice walk or jog. And we're going to be watching that severe weather across the northern tier with highs in the lower 90s. So a lot of hot air for the northern tier. And we'll talk about the severe weather update coming up. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Janessa. While the United States addresses nationwide protests against systemic racism, a black woman is blazing the trail to the New Jersey Supreme Court. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy nominated Fabiana Pierre-Louise to the state's Supreme Court. She plans to use her experience as a first-generation American to bring new perspective to the role. And if the state confirms her nomination, she'll be the first black woman to hold the post. Be sure to watch her interview this morning on The Today Show. In today's quick hits, two Buffalo police officers were charged with felony assault after a video showed the officers shoving a 75-year-old protester. They pleaded not guilty and were released on personal recognizance. The city of Minneapolis has agreed to ban the use of chokeholds by police. Officers will be required to report and intervene anytime they see unauthorized use of force by another officer. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a call for the passage of the Say Their Name agenda. It includes transparency of prior disciplinary records, banning chokeholds, classifying race-based 911 reports as hate crimes, and designating the Attorney General as an independent prosecutor for police murders. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Crowds have continued to swell in D.C., calling for change. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, the president prepares to meet with law enforcement officials later today. 
Yeah, the, that meeting today, Francis, with law enforcement is a roundtable. Uh, based on what we've been able to gather, they're supposed to be discussing the difficulties and the challenges of racial inequalities and in trying to get the job done. This, as President Trump continues to take criticism for calling out active duty troops into D.C., uh, the attorney general now saying in an interview over the weekend that they were called, but they were not used, even though uh, they were seen clearing peaceful protests near the White House. Our new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 80 percent of Americans polled think that the country is out of control and a majority say they are still not comfortable going out in crowds despite these growing demonstrations that we're seeing. They are expected to continue today as Houston, Texas gives a final farewell to George Floyd, the man whose death at the hands of police in Minnesota started all of this, all of these demonstrations. That service happening in Houston, uh, Vice President, former Vice President and presidential contender Joe Biden expected to fly down to Houston to meet with the family, not attend the service. There were lots of security issues that they didn't want to disrupt from, but he is expected to meet with the family and tape a message for that service. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. We're tired of crying and people dying. Let's take all the guns away. Artist Prince Estate re-released the artist's 2015 song, Baltimore, with a new video. The song was originally written as a response to the death of Freddie Gray. The video ends with a Prince quote saying, the system is broken. It's going to take the young people to fix it this time. And what, what a, just a treasure to have this re-released. It was supposed to be Prince's birthday yesterday. Mm, really? So they released it as a tribute to his birthday and with everything going on in the world today. And also, uh, they released also a handwritten note that Prince mm -hmm. had about intolerance. Yeah, so, so he had, a, yeah, he had a stance on that. You know, we we see this time and time again, right? But you know, nothing changed after Tulsa 100 years ago, the 60s, Ferguson, and I'm hopeful that this could be different. You know, but hey, Prince's music still as powerful as ever. Yeah, I'm bringing everybody together, at least in this case. That's right. We sure do miss him too. Good morning, everyone. This is going to be a good dose of rain for the central U.S. throughout Tuesday afternoon. Look at this. We're talking about up to three inches in some spots. But for the Pacific Northwest, a lot more heat that's building across Southern California. You need to get there. Los Angeles, a high of 90 degrees. We're watching the severe weather threat for the Northern Plains. It's going to be a wonderful day. New York City, Boston. We're back in the upper 70s with a ton of sunshine. Yes. Nice. Great way to start the week. Yeah, we had a good weekend, too, as well. Just before NASCAR drivers started their engines, they participated in a moment of silence for racial injustice. On the topic, NASCAR President Steve Phelps said the sport must do better in dealing with issues of race. Bubba Wallace, along with many crew members, wore I Can't Breathe Black Lives Matter t-shirts. In Minneapolis, a baker is serving up hope one slice at a time. She's delivering comfort pies to help cities heal in the wake of tragedy. NBC's Kate Snow has more. In Minneapolis, Rose McGee is on a mission. This is what I did. I put the hearts on each one. She and volunteers are baking sweet potato comfort pies and delivering them to neighbors, offering a shoulder to cry on and a sweet dessert. The sweet potato comfort pies are meant to be this catalyst for caring and building community. Her mission started in 2014. Moved by protests in Ferguson, Missouri, she and her son loaded her trunk full of pies and headed there, and then to the shootings in Charleston and Pittsburgh. There have just been too many. I'm sorry for the pain that our country is feeling right now. I wish there was a pie big enough to serve the whole human race. Now it's her own city that needs healing. Watching Rose in the kitchen is magical, but what's more magical really is watching that connection happen. Hi there. Did you get a pie? No. Sweet potato pie. Would you like one? Sure. That's what we brought out today. That's my favorite. And her pies not only bring comfort in tragedy, but honor those doing good, like these volunteers at a local food bank. You all are out here serving, 
your first liners. I felt appreciative because we gave out to the community and then like they came back and gave back to us. Like we both contributed somehow, like we both came together. She's even encouraging others to bake their own pies at home and help spread joy. With these pies that you're making tonight, that secret ingredient will be your love. Opening her kitchen and her heart to all those around her. We all have something that we can do. And we want to find what that is and tap into that in a, in a positive way. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that report. So filling hearts in that community yeah. and filling bellies too. Wouldn't you love to taste one of those? I love it when people can use their talent <laughs> yeah. and their time to spread love and joy. Uh, Rose McGee, she's walking the walk. What a right. great neighbor to have. And for everybody else who's tried those pies <laughs> and jelly gels, yeah, well, they were yeah. able to do it. Yeah, we're jelly. All right, thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Be safe. Have a great Monday. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Day 14, George Floyd was killed on Memorial Day. Today, a public viewing is in Houston, and the massive protests have managed to push some cities to defund or dismantle police departments, including Minneapolis. Amid huge demonstrations, New York City, the one-time epicenter of the coronavirus, prepares to open up today. Tropical storm Cristobal is slowly moving north as a storm surge hits the Gulf Coast states, along with flooding rains and high winds. We got the latest. And meet the baker who is delivering food for the soul to hard-hit communities across the country, including her hometown. Early Today starts right now. Good Monday morning. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Glad you're with us. Well, there are signs now, major signs in Minneapolis. The protests are making a difference. As calls grow for justice after the fatal arrest of George Floyd, the majority of the city council has agreed to dismantle the police department. The council president says they will recreate systems of public safety. A service was held for Floyd this weekend in North Carolina, the state where he was born. And a public viewing will be held this afternoon in Houston, where Floyd spent most of his life before a funeral tomorrow. According to reporting by The Hill, George Floyd's brother, Philonis, will testify before the House Judiciary Committee during a hearing on June 10th about police brutality. Democrats are expected to reveal new police reform legislation today. And a Republican senator is joining those calls for change. We need a voice against racism. We need many voices against racism and against brutality. We need to stand up and say that black lives matter. Utah Senator Mitt Romney marched with protesters in D.C. this weekend, joining a group of hundreds of evangelicals. Protests have persisted for nearly two weeks now, and they show no signs of slowing down. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is following the demonstrations on the West Coast. Aaron, what are you seeing? Thousands of people have gathered here in Hollywood, people of all ages and races, to send the message that Black Lives Matter. Similar scenes have played out across the United States. Calls for change spreading across the United States and around the world. Think about a new beginning and a new tomorrow. In Washington, D.C., for eight minutes, 46 seconds, thousands of protesters lying down across the Black Lives Matter plaza in memory of George Floyd. In New York City, demonstrators swarm Times Square. NBC's Yasmin Vesugian is there. All right, so I'm standing just below Times Square, below 42nd Street. Thousands of folks gathered here. The police are uptown of us, protesting peacefully here, demanding racial justice. In Denver, protesters marched across the Capitol. In Austin, thousands cried, no justice, no peace. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, demonstrators closing down a bridge. Stand against racism. And at the NASCAR Speedway, a moment of silence for racial justice. Anger at police brutality spread across the globe. Protests in Rome, Madrid and Osaka, Japan. In Dortmund, Germany, soccer players take a knee. And in London, protesters gathered near the U.S. Embassy. NBC's Sarah Harmon is there talking to demonstrators. We need to integrate and work as a community to dismantle the system and rebuild it. This is new, shocking incidents involving police come to light, including this alarming video out of Fairfax, Virginia. It shows a police officer on Friday tasing an African-American man. Roll over. Roll over. 
striking him in the head. The officer now faces three charges of assault. And in Alameda, California, another controversial takedown. Police released this video of an arrest in late May. I can stand up myself. After four officers responded to a call of a man dancing in the street. The incident now under investigation. But for protesters this weekend, investigations are not enough. In Seattle, flashbangs and pepper spray fired after police say several officers were injured by improvised explosives. And police dispersed protesters in Portland. In New York, protests interrupted when a car drove through a small crowd. The driver was later arrested to cheers. And in Richmond, Virginia, a Confederate statue pulled from its pedestal. Yet near the White House, prayers amidst the protest. At St. John's Episcopal Church, site of a now infamous presidential photo op, people gathered for Sunday service. Protesters stood in solidarity, capping off a weekend full of symbolism for a nation perhaps forever changed. Well, so far we've seen minimal security presence at this protest. In fact, the National Guard is expected to leave Los Angeles overnight. So far, things here are looking peaceful. Francis. All right, Aaron, thank you. As protests continue growing, so do the calls for police reform, with many protesters demanding police departments be defunded. Here's Steve Patterson. So with this national movement now shifting from protest to policy, there are more calls to action to defund police departments across the country. Already, we're seeing mayors in major cities join on board with that, and pressure is now mounting here in Minneapolis. But we wanted to ask what it all means and why so many are passionate about it. With a mounting national chorus decrying police brutality against black Americans, there's a new call for deep structural reform of policing across the country. Many are now demanding departments be defunded, dismantled, or outright abolished. I want people to understand that we are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a plan to defund the NYPD by shifting money in the city budget from policing to social services. The move joins with Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, who recently agreed to slash up to $150 million from the police budget. At its core, defunding simply means divesting a chunk from a city's policing budget and rerouting it to community programs. Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garcia says reinvestment could be a turning point. But what we do need is increased funding for housing. We need increased funding for education. We need increased funding for the quality of life of communities who are over-policed and over-surveilled. In Minneapolis, the city council is considering a move to reform the department. Shame! 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 At a rally, Mayor Jacob Frey was booed for saying no to dismantling the police department. But policing can be dangerous. Saturday in Santa Cruz, California, a sheriff's deputy was shot and killed during an ambush. In my 32-year career, this is the worst day that I've ever experienced. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, have already significantly underfunded. And that's going to be made worse because of the coronavirus economic impact that all states and cities are beginning to feel. But as the outrage over the death of George Floyd and the plight of millions of black Americans shifts from protest to change, the calls to defund are only growing louder. And yesterday, nine council members committed, committed to disbanding the police department. But again, that is all rhetorical. The member on that council says it will take at least a year for them to take any meaningful action or meaningful vote. Back to you. All right, Steve, thank you. After three gruesome months, New York City will start reopening today. Yeah, New York was the epicenter for COVID-19, but now the pandemic has shifted. Cases are rising in states like Texas, California, North Carolina, and Florida. Our Rahima Ellis is in New York with more. Mackenzie Farquay is thrilled about reopening. It's been a very hard, challenging time for retailers. With five retail stores around the city selling everything from home goods to greeting cards, all shut down for three months, her revenue plunged by 80 percent. We had a little bit of savings going into this, and we're just, you know, busting our tail to make as many online sales as possible. 
And even though New York City is starting to reopen Monday, she doesn't see a return to normal anytime soon. Neither does the governor. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way we were. There's no going back in life. It's about going forward. Going forward, phase one reopening includes retail with curbside and in-person pickup, construction and manufacturing. The Transit Authority is bracing for an additional 400,000 riders on top of the one and a half million essential workers already using the system. Is it clean enough for me to come down to the subway? So the New York City subway system has never been as clean as it is now. We disinfect and clean all of the cars four, five, six, seven times a day. Social distancing encouraged and masks are required for transit workers and all riders. What happens if you come down and you don't have a mask? We're going to have masks at every station booth ready if you need one. So how much do they cost? Nothing. Free? Free. Free face mask. What about the hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer made by uh, New York State free to uh, anyone who needs one. Nationwide health officials are concerned that reopening has contributed to a spike in 18 states. And that has people worried. According to a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 66% of Americans say they're uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large crowd. 43% are very uncomfortable. Back in New York, Mackenzie is doing all she can to make customers feel safe. People can't come in. The table will stop them? Correct. So we've reworked the store and put this table as a barricade. We'll use this table to put customer purchases so they can, uh, you know, safely grab their items. And Monday, you're going to be ready like this. Monday, we will be here, smiles under our masks. And for commuter stations, none bigger than this, New York's Grand Central Station, which typically on a Monday would be packed with commuters. For the sake of social distancing, transit authorities are asking companies to do a couple of things, stagger work hours, even work days, to reduce overcrowding. Philip? I ready or not, today's the day. Rahima, thank you. Tropical storm Cristobal made landfall in the U.S., hitting Louisiana last night and created dangerous conditions as it moved along the Gulf Coast. The storm, packing 50 mile per hour winds, dumped heavy rain up to six inches per hour. Some roads in New Orleans have been swamped and low-lying areas were also affected. Cristobal also caused flooding in Mississippi, swamped parts of an Alabama island town and spawned a tornado in Florida. According to authorities, the tornado uprooted trees and caused damage to homes, but there are no reports of injuries. The storm is expected to dump heavy rain on the Gulf Coast throughout the day. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking that storm for us. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. It has definitely been a busy weekend with Tropical Storm Cristobal, and it will continue on its track well to the north. This is going to make its way to the Midwest and even parts of the Great Lakes. Right now, we're seeing sustained winds to 40 miles per hour. It is starting to lose its force, but it will start to intensify uh, as we step into the next few days. As you can see the track, it does turn into possibility of a tropical depression, then increases back into a tropical storm later on this week. We're talking about a ton of rain with flash flood watches in place across the central U.S. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Ohio Valley to the northeast, a ton of sunshine this afternoon. Hopefully you can get outside for a nice walk or jog, and we're going to be watching that severe weather across the northern tier with highs in the lower 90s. So a lot of hot air for the northern tier, and we'll talk about the severe weather update coming up. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Janessa. While the United States addresses nationwide protests against systemic racism, a black woman is blazing the trail to the New Jersey Supreme Court. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy nominated Fabiana Pierre-Louise to the state's Supreme Court. She plans to use her experience as a first-generation American to bring new perspective to the role. And if the state confirms her nomination, she'll be the first black woman to hold the post. Be sure to watch her interview this morning on The Today Show. In today's quick hits, two Buffalo police officers were charged with felony assault after a video showed the officers shoving a 75-year-old protester. They pleaded not guilty and were released on personal recognizance. The city of Minneapolis has agreed to ban the use of chokeholds by police. Officers will be required to report and intervene anytime they see unauthorized use of force by another officer. 
New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the call for the passage of the Say Their Name agenda. It includes transparency of prior disciplinary records, banning chokeholds, classifying race-based 911 reports as hate crimes, and designating the Attorney General as an independent prosecutor for police murders. In the nation's capital, the new fence surrounding the White House is now a memorial wall. Protesters have plastered over the barricade with artwork and signs supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Crowds have continued to swell in D.C., calling for change. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. And Tracy, the president prepares to meet with law enforcement officials later today. Yeah, the, that meeting today, Francis, with law enforcement is a roundtable uh, based on what we've been able to gather. They're supposed to be discussing the difficulties and the challenges of racial inequalities and trying to get the job done. This, as President Trump continues to take criticism for calling out active duty troops into D.C., uh, the attorney general now saying in an interview over the weekend that they were called, but they were not used, even though uh, they were seen clearing peaceful protests near the White House. Our new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 80% of Americans polled think that the country is out of control and a majority say they are still not comfortable going out in crowds despite these growing demonstrations that we're seeing. They are expected to continue today as Houston, Texas gives a final farewell to George Floyd, the man whose death at the hands of police in Minnesota started all of this, all of these demonstrations, that service happening in Houston, uh, Vice President, former Vice President and presidential contender Joe Biden expected to fly down to Houston to meet with the family, not attend the service. There were lots of security issues that they didn't want to disrupt from, but he is expected to meet with the family and tape a message for that service. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. Artist Prince Estate re-released the artist's 2015 song, Baltimore, with a new video. The song was originally written as a response to the death of Freddie Gray. The video ends with a Prince quote saying, the system is broken. It's going to take the young people to fix it this time. And what, what a, just a treasure to have this re-released. It was supposed to be Prince's birthday yesterday. Mm, really? So they released it as a tribute to his birthday and with everything going on in the world today. And also uh, they released also a handwritten note that Prince mm -hmm. had about intolerance. Yeah, so, so he had a, yeah he had a stance on that you know we we see this time and time again right but you know nothing changed after Tulsa 100 years ago the 60s Ferguson and I'm hopeful that this could be different you know but hey Prince's music still as powerful as ever yeah, I'm bringing everybody together at least in this case that's right we sure do miss him good morning everyone this is gonna be a good dose of rain for the central US throughout Tuesday afternoon. Look at this. We're talking about up to three inches in some spots. But for the Pacific Northwest, a lot more heat that's building across Southern California. You need to get there. Los Angeles, a high of 90 degrees. We're watching the severe weather threat for the Northern Plains. It's going to be a wonderful day. New York City, Boston. We're back in the upper 70s with a ton of sunshine. Yes. Nice. Right. Great way to start the week. Yeah, we had a good weekend too as well. Just before NASCAR drivers started their engines, they participated in a moment of silence for racial injustice. On the topic, NASCAR President Steve Phelps said the sport must do better in dealing with issues of race. Bubba Wallace, along with many crew members, wore I Can't Breathe Black Lives Matter t-shirts. In Minneapolis, a baker is serving up hope one slice at a time. She's delivering comfort pies to help cities heal in the wake of tragedy. NBC's Kate Snow has more. In Minneapolis, Rose McGee is on a mission. This is what I did. I put the hearts on each one. She and volunteers are baking sweet potato comfort pies and delivering them to neighbors, offering a shoulder to cry on and a sweet dessert. The sweet potato comfort pies are meant to be this catalyst for caring and building community. Her mission started in 2014. Moved by protests in Ferguson, Missouri, she and her son loaded her trunk full of pies and headed there, and then to the shootings in Charleston and Pittsburgh. There have just been too many. I'm sorry. 
for the pain that our country is feeling right now. I wish there was a pie big enough to serve the whole human race. Now it's her own city that needs healing. Watching Rose in the kitchen is magical, but what's more magical really is watching that connection happen. Hi there. Did you get a pie? No. Sweet potato pie. Would you like one? Sure. That's what we brought out today. That's my favorite. And her pies not only bring comfort in tragedy, but honor those doing good, like these volunteers at a local food bank. You all are out here serving your first liners. I felt appreciative because we gave out to the community and like they came back and gave back to us. Like we both contributed somehow, like we both came together. She's even encouraging others to bake their own pies at home and help spread joy. With these pies that you're making tonight, that secret ingredient will be your love. Opening her kitchen and her heart to all those around her. We all have something that we can do. And we want to find what that is and tap into that in a, in a positive way. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that report. So filling hearts in that community yeah. and filling bellies, too. Wouldn't you love to taste one of those? I love it when people can use their talent <laughs> yeah. and their time to spread love and joy. Uh, Rose McGee, she's walking the walk. What a right. great neighbor to have. And for everybody else who's tried those pies, <laughs> <laughs> jelly gels, yeah, well, they were yeah. able to do it. Yeah, we're jelly. All right, thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Phil Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Be safe. Have a great Monday. See you. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Good morning. Facing justice, Derek Chauvin, the officer charged with murdering George Floyd in court for the first time today. This morning, what the case against him may look like. One of the junior officer's attorneys speaking exclusively to NBC News. You ask your sergeant, should we do something? He says, no. Are you going to say, well, no, I'm going to do it anyway? I don't think so. The very latest, including the final public memorial being held in Floyd's hometown today. Defund the police, the controversial idea gaining momentum across the country. The city council in Minneapolis voting to dismantle its entire department. Nationwide demonstrations growing stronger over the weekend. No justice, no peace. The largest peaceful protest yet. Opening up, New York City, the nation's coronavirus epicenter, starting its road back this morning. Hundreds of thousands returning to work for the first time in three months. Straight ahead, the latest on the pandemic, including the worrisome spike in cases in other spots around the country. Slamming ashore. Tropical storm Cristobal makes landfall in Louisiana, packing high winds, flooding rain, and a dangerous storm surge. Millions in its path as it pushes inland. Al has the latest forecast. Breaking overnight, the Justice Department ratchets up the pressure on Prince Andrew, demanding he cooperate with the criminal investigation into Jeffrey Epstein. Will he finally talk with prosecutors? All that plus, dear class of 2020. Hold your heads high and celebrate. And go ahead and do a little dance. <laughs> Stars from all walks of life come together for a special commencement ceremony for students around the world. Every obstacle is really an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to change. You are graduates in three, two, one. Today, Monday, June 8th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to you today. It is nice to have you with us on a Monday morning. Hoda, I know you love commencement mm. speeches. You must have been watching and throwing your cap up in the air. I am beaming ear to ear. Like, if if that doesn't put you in a good mood in this Hold tiny moment, nothing will. So uh, and Carson's going to mm. kind of recap all of those, and it's going to be really great. But we do have a really busy morning, a lot to get to, including another weekend of mass protests across America that show no signs of stopping, Savannah. 
That's right. And at the same time uh, in Minneapolis, the former police officer charged with George Floyd's murder will go before a judge for the first time today. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is there again for us. Hi, Gabe. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. Former officer Derek Chauvin is set to appear before a judge on second degree murder and manslaughter charges. And George Floyd's death is now reigniting a larger conversation across the country about the role of policing. Here in Minneapolis, many city council members now say they want to disband the department. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. All this as more disturbing videos emerge of police arresting black men. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an officer is seen using a stun gun on a man Friday, later hitting him on the head. The officer is now charged with assault. In Alameda, California, police have released this video of an arrest last month, which is also under investigation. The man says he was dancing outside his home. In Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says Gabe, no. Uh, back to this uh, notion about disbanding the police, and that's the vote at the uh, Minneapolis City Council. What would that actually look like? What would the next steps be? Well, Savannah, that is a major question right now. And the city council members say they want input from the public, and it could take up to a year to figure out exactly how much how this will work. The mayor here says that he wants to reform the department, not abolish it. But one of the ideas being tossed around is perhaps hire more counselors to deal with mental health calls instead of relying solely on police. Savannah. All right. Gabe Gutierrez in Minneapolis for us. Gabe, thank you. Hoda? All right. Meantime, the weekend saw some of the largest peaceful protests yet all across the nation. And today, George Floyd will be remembered at a memorial service in his hometown of Houston. NBC's Morgan Chesky is there for us this morning. Hey, Morgan, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. And it is a bittersweet homecoming for the family of George Floyd. Today, thousands of friends, family, and those touched by his story expect to enter this Houston church to pay their final respects. Everyone inside wearing masks, gloves, and maintaining that social distancing. All this just one day after mostly peaceful protests. Overnight, chaos in Seattle. Witnesses say a man was shot after a suspect drove through a crowd of protesters. Video showing the driver get out of his car and brandish what appears to be a gun. Authorities say that suspect is now in custody. The 27-year-old victim in stable condition. The growing scenes of unrest coming amid another night of mostly peaceful protests over the killing of George Floyd. His remains now back in his childhood home of Houston. American flags lining the route to the church or a memorial service will be held in just a few hours. 
Pastor Mia Wright. Our desire and the Floyd family desire is really to see people come together and to heal our nation. The service open to all, but with coronavirus still a threat, masks and social distancing required. On Saturday, a public viewing in Rayford, North Carolina, where Floyd was born, drew thousands. His family's emotions overflowing. I'll never hear his voice. I'll never hear his laughter. I'll never have his hugs. I'll be able to tell him that I love him again. Bystanders eager for a glimpse of the casket of the man whose name has become a rallying cry for justice. I want to give him a good home going and let him know that his death was not in vain, that we will do something about it. With demonstrations stretching into the 13th day in a row. From D.C. to New York, Denver and Los Angeles, even at NASCAR. And to stand against racism. The protests now mainly peaceful after some early nights of violence. I can't breathe. Also in Houston today, former Vice President Joe Biden planning to meet privately with Floyd's family to offer his condolences in person. Following the public memorial, tomorrow's funeral service will be private. All expenses covered by boxer Floyd Mayweather. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. And as he did in Minneapolis on Friday, the Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy before George Floyd is laid to rest next to his mother, reuniting with the person he so desperately called out for in his final moments of life. A number of politicians and celebrities expected to be in attendance today, including Floyd Mayweather, who is funding that funeral for the Floyd family. In the meantime, tonight, a candlelight vigil will be held on the very football field where Floyd was once a standout player. His former teammates expected to attend. Savannah. All right, Morgan, thank you. And now to the morning's other big news. This is, of course, about the coronavirus. New York City, the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, is taking its first major steps forward toward reopening today. But the move also comes with new concerns, a surge in cases in other cities that have eased restrictions and those mass protests we've seen for nearly two weeks. What does that mean for the outbreak? NBC's Morgan Radford is in Times Square with all the latest. Morgan, good morning. Savannah, good morning. It's been a hundred days since that first confirmed coronavirus case here in New York City. And since then, all the dramatic steps we've all taken to help flatten the curve have worked. But the reality of it is, with protests now leading to possible concerns about a resurgence, experts say these first steps are also tentative. This morning, for the first time in three months, New York City is cautiously opening back up. We bent the curve. The city hit hardest by the pandemic is entering the first phase of reopening today. Retail stores open for pickups. Construction and manufacturing can resume. And subways return to regular weekday service. You did the hard work to fight back the coronavirus so we could get to phase one. Just weeks ago, the city was at a breaking point. With hospitals overwhelmed and more than 16,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City alone. But after a strict shutdown, widely available free testing, and increased contact tracing, the city has met the criteria needed to start reopening. Phase one may bring as many as 400,000 people back to work in the Big Apple. Companies reopening must limit capacity, frequently clean shared surfaces, screen workers for symptoms, and create social distance markers to help customers and employees stay six feet apart. It's been soul crushing. Mackenzie uh, Farquay I shut down her five shops in March. This morning, she's back open for business with hand sanitizer at the ready and items up front so customers can shop from the sidewalk. I hope it'll be super busy. But nationwide, officials worry loosened restrictions have contributed to a new spike in 18 states. And reopening efforts are complicated by the sweeping protests following the death of George Floyd. We're certainly going to see transmission coming out of these gatherings. There's no question about that. In New York, there will be 15 specific testing sites for protesters. If you were at a protest, act responsibly, get a test. Get a test. A city working hard to move forward and find its new normal. So some good news. The governor says that school graduations of up to 150 people will be allowed as early as June 26th. 
But the bad news, one of the most big, one of the biggest challenges the city is still facing is mass transit. Ridership has decreased 90 percent since the pandemic began, and it's still really difficult to socially distance in New York City's enclosed buses and trains. Hoda? Yeah, it sure is. All right. Morgan in Times Square. Morgan, thank you. Craig joins the table now with another story tied to those protests that we've been following. Indeed, right? Hoda, good morning. The National Guard is now withdrawing from Washington, D.C. at the direction of President Trump. That move coming as the White House faces new questions this morning about its overall response to the demonstrations. NBC's Kristen Walker joins us from the White House with more, with, with more on that this morning. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Craig, good morning to you. President Trump will meet with law enforcement officials later today with his response to the crisis surrounding George Floyd's death coming under new scrutiny. Now, it comes as he is locked in an increasingly competitive race with the presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe Biden. This morning, President Trump is facing a growing chorus of criticism from former military leaders. We have a constitution and we have to follow the constitution. And the president's drifted away from it. Over the weekend, retired Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell joining that list and blasting the president. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people will not hold him accountable. Powell, a frequent Trump critic who served four presidents, three Republican and one Democrat, and who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, endorsed Joe Biden over the weekend, getting and emotional when talking about how he says the world now views the United people. States. Are we insulting everybody? Are we going after immigrants? Um, they don't understand this. I'm the son of immigrants. I wouldn't be here if my parents couldn't come here in banana boats in the 1920s. This is America. This is who we are. And the world doesn't understand. Mr. Trump fired back, calling Powell highly overrated. As for the 2020 race, in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, Biden leads President Trump nationally by seven points among all registered voters, 49 percent to 42 percent. That's unchanged from April's poll. While Biden is up eight points against the president among voters in the top battleground states, 50 to 42. As for the state of the nation, 80 percent of Americans say the country is out of control amid the aftermath of the the death of George Floyd and the coronavirus pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr out front over the weekend, defending the use of force to clear Lafayette Park last Monday night, which set the stage for President Trump's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church. They were not peaceful protests. But witnesses say the protesters were peaceful. Barr also rejecting what many protesters see as the root of the problem. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. Now, overnight, 4,900 National Guard troops started to leave Washington, D.C. at President Trump's order. The president tweeting the troops can, quote, return quickly if needed. The president also saying the protests have been under perfect control, his words. Joining those protests over the weekend, one of his biggest Republican critics, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who told NBC News Black Lives Matter. Romney is also signaling he likely won't support Mr. Trump in the fall. Hoda. All right. Kristen Welker for us at the White House. Kristen, thank you. Another major story this morning, Crystal Ball. It roared ashore in Louisiana as a tropical storm overnight with high winds, and it was soaking parts of the south with heavy rains. As it pushes inland, its threat is expected to last for days. We're going to bring in Mr. Roker, get the very latest on this one. Hey, Al Morning. Good morning, Hoda. Good morning, everybody. And this is the latest on Cristobal. We are looking at it now. It has made landfall, and it is 40 miles north of Baton Rouge, 35 mile per hour winds. It's moving north northwest at 10 miles per hour. As the system pushes to the north, we are going to be watching this make its way. In fact, it's the second earliest landfall on record. The record was uh, Tropical Storm Arlene back in 1959. Now, this system will push to the north, bringing soaking rains to the Mississippi River Valley, making its way through Wisconsin and on into the UP of Michigan. And look at this. The, it's only twice, there's only twice before had a tropical remnant low pass across Wisconsin and only once before over Michigan. So this is a rare situation indeed. Heavy rain, especially as you get up into the mid-Mississippi River Valley locally, five inches of rain. But as you look at this, as you get into the upper Midwest, we're going to be seeing anywhere from two to three inches and locally they could have five inches as well. So we're going to feel the effects of Cristobal all the way up into the Midwest. 
As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. Oh, come on, that makes you feel good. We're back with some of the fun and surprises from YouTube's Dear Class of 2020. Y'all, it was a virtual graduation ceremony. It was star-studded. It was a celebration of this year's college and high school graduates. And our pal Carson has rounded it all up. He's going to put a bow on it and give us our graduation package. So we look forward to that. Yes, we do. Yeah, it looks like a good one. We're going to start this half hour, though, with your 7.30 headlines. If you're just waking up on a Monday morning... The former police officer charged with George Floyd's murder set to make his first appearance in court this morning. Derek Chauvin will appear before a judge on second degree murder and manslaughter charges. In the meantime, nine members of the Minneapolis City Council agreed yesterday to dismantle the police department and replace it with a community based public safety model. This comes amid growing demands to defund the police in cities across the country. A major milestone for New Zealand this morning. Officials say the country has eliminated the coronavirus and is lifting all domestic restrictions. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said today that she did a little dance upon hearing that, that the country had no active cases. Public and private events can resume without social distancing requirements, along with the retail and hospitality industries. Strict border controls will remain in place, though. Breaking overnight, hundreds of firefighters battled a massive structure fire in downtown Phoenix. You could see a ball of flames, a huge plume of smoke from several miles away. Officials say the four-story apartment complex was still under construction, so it's unlikely there was anybody inside. Still, though, no word on the cause of that fire. And another major headline this morning, millions feeling the impact of once tropical storm Cristobal. We're going to bring in Mr. Roker and get the latest on that storm. Hey, Al. Hey, guys. Well, you know, the good news is it is now moving to the north. It is going to affect a lot of the upper Mississippi River Valley. We're also talking about a lot of summertime heat. Santa Ana winds out west. Wind advisories for L.A. this morning. Red flag warnings, heat advisories with temperatures 10 to 20 degrees above average. Then we get into the Midwest. Minneapolis today, 95 degrees. Chicago will be 91. Dallas, 96. Midland, Texas, 106. And that east, that heat starts to move east. Buffalo tomorrow, 88 degrees. Cleveland will be 92. Charleston, 92. New York City up into the low 80s. And as we move into the latter part of the week, that heat continues from Chicago, Jackson, New York, Norfolk, and down into Columbia. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. And that's your latest weather. Poda? Grab it. Uh, when we're talking about the reaction that's pouring in, Hoda, to that new message from the NFL. Yeah, the league is uh, taking the debate over protests in a new direction with its strongest statement yet in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. The move following a call from prominent players to take a stance. NBC's Stephanie Goss joins us with the latest on this one. Hey, Steph, morning. Good morning, Hoda. Well, the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, is apologizing for how the league failed to support players who are protesting police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. For many, this is an about face that was a long time coming, but it has also caught the attention of Kneeling's fiercest and most vocal critic, the president. We are listening. I am listening. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is changing the league's message, releasing this video statement late Friday. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier 
and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. The exact same language star NFL players asked the league to use the day before. We will not be silenced. We assert our right to peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. Goodell's message of unity comes after comments made by one of the NFL's biggest stars exposed the league's deep divisions. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Drew Brees apologized twice after he said players shouldn't protest police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. I am sorry, and I will do better. The New Orleans Saints quarterback also promising to listen more and be part of the solution. President Trump now weighing in, going after Goodell overnight, tweeting, could it be even remotely possible that Goodell was intimating that it would now be okay for players to kneel? And Brees over the weekend, posting, he should not have taken back his original stance. Bree's hitting back, posting on Instagram, to Donald Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. The president echoing his comments in 2016, when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee protesting police brutality. Kaepernick never played in the NFL again after that season. Knees usually taken out of reverence, Former Green Beret and Seattle Seahawks player Nate Boyer is the person responsible for suggesting kneeling as a protest to Kaepernick. Kneeling was born out of a, a middle ground, you know, um, two people that disagreed on a lot, but it's two people that were willing to just have a conversation and listen. So, Steph, uh, Goodell didn't directly address the kneeling during the anthem, but what do you think is going to happen with the upcoming season and those protests? What will we see? Yeah, Hoda, his statement is vague, although a lot of people have interpreted it as a green light for kneeling. You know, there have been a handful of players who say when they come back, that's exactly what they're, do they're going to do, including running back Adrian Peterson. He thinks that kneeling could potentially save lives and create change. Hoda? All right, Stephanie Gosk. Steph, uh, thank you. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. We are back 740 now with in-depth today. Some breaking news this morning tied to the Jeffrey Epstein case, Savannah. Yeah, it's significant. The U.S. Justice Department is applying new pressure on Prince Andrew this morning to testify as part of its criminal investigation. Today's senior international correspondent Keir Simmons is in London with these breaking details. Hi, Keir. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. A sensational front page to the Sun newspaper here this morning. Yanks, hand Andy over, perhaps inevitably being a British tabloid. That headline is a little exaggerated, but U.S. investigators are formally asking to speak to Prince Andrew and for such a high-profile figure, particularly a member of the British royal family. Well, that is rare. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. Prince Andrew was seen on social media in May when his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson posted this Instagram picture with the caption, so proud of our loving family. But in an interview in December, Virginia Jufri claimed she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and abused by Prince Andrew when she was 17, just days after this picture was taken. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Prince Andrew says he has no recollection of meeting her. His own interview last year was widely criticised for the way he talked about Epstein. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And he would only say he might talk to authorities. If push came to shove and the legal, <coughs> the legal advice was to do so, then I would be duty-bound to do so. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. 
And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew, since he stepped down as a working royal. So, so Kier, if Prince Andrew doesn't have anything to hide, why, why not just agree to that interview with authorities here? <laughs> That's a great question, Craig, not least because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give uh, evidence under uh, oath. Uh, But that said, you and I both know that uh, you should be careful when you're talking about legal conversations that are taking place behind closed doors, private conversations. We don't know the details. That said, the optics are terrible for the royal family, aren't they? Uh, One final uh, note, uh, Craig. Prince Andrew's interview, television interview last year, widely believed to have gone really, really badly. Perhaps his legal advisers are concerned about how it would go if he did sit down in front of seasoned prosecutors. Yeah, no, that interview was a disaster. Keir Simmons there in London. Keir. Th- As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. 749 with Today Celebrates the Class of 2020. Carson's got the highlights from, I think, one of the largest ceremonies of the year. Hey, Carson, morning. Hi, Hoda. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. With many high schools and colleges obviously forced to cancel graduations because of coronavirus, some of the world's biggest stars decided to do something about it. This is a who's who from the worlds of movies, music and politics all coming together over the weekend for a mega graduation party seniors will never forget. Class of 2020, you are graduates in three, two, one. Over the weekend, a star-studded virtual tribute for 7 million high school and college students nationwide. YouTube's Dear Class of 2020 commencement had a little something for everyone. More than 70 pop stars, celebrities, and public figures participated, expressing their support for graduating seniors as they take their next big step. You all have done something great. Hold your heads high and celebrate. And go ahead and do a little dance. (laughs) The cool dance. You've worked your whole life in pursuit of your dreams and nothing, not even a global pandemic, is going to keep you from the futures you've imagined for yourself. Every obstacle is really an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to change. Performances included a rendition of U2's Beautiful Day. and a Zoom bomb by Mariah Carey, as the cast of Schitt's Creek performed her song, Hero. Social media lit up with messages from the class of 2020 praising the event. Although some of the speeches were recorded before the death of George Floyd, several artists addressed the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement and encouraged graduates to rise up and advocate for change. We've seen that our collective hearts, when put to positive action, could start the wheels of change. Real change has started with you. You are the seeds that will grow into a new and different forest that is far more beautiful and loving than the one we live in today. Our own Jenna Bush Hager had these words of encouragement. And when the world opens up again, we can all be a little better than before. The world will be better because of you. While Alicia Keys urged the grads to strive for greatness. You are graduates in the most powerful time to be coming of age. And there's nothing and no one that can stop you from changing the world. Guys, one of the things that that sticks out about the Dear Class of 2020 is that when was the last time social media pretty much unanimously all agreed something was amazing? Uh, It doesn't happen often. (laughs) So that's just small proof of how impressive this over four-hour production was. And guys, I'll tell you what, even if you're not a senior, it is worth going back to YouTube to revisit as the messages of hope and camaraderie and inspiration were abundant and it was very powerful very well done oh that sounds awesome i felt like we should play alicia keys song good job because man they did a great job that was awesome carson they sure did as the nation remembers george floyd lester holt reports live from minneapolis 
to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. As the nation remembers George Floyd, Lester Holt reports live from Minneapolis to take a deeper look at the push for justice, how we got here, and how we begin to heal the divide. A primetime special, tonight at 10 on NBC. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, day in court. The officer charged with George Floyd's murder set to face a judge today as calls to defund the police grow across the country. No justice, no peace. We break it all down this morning. Plus, tomorrow's leaders, Hoda's candid conversation with young children about racism. The moment that we're living in is kind of frustrating because it feels as though it's an attack on people that look like me. Just to have their powerful message and the hope they'll give you for the future. And one man's treasure. After years of searching for a real life million dollar mystery, the hunt may be over. We'll take you inside the overnight developments on the famous search today, Monday, June 8th, 2020. Sugar high. Waking up with today from Clayton, California. Today's my 10th birthday and I'm starting it off by watching today. Good morning from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm coming from Columbia, South Carolina, wishing my husband, Jeffrey Dyer, a happy 33rd wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, Jeff. My name is Trey and I'm turning eight today. <laughs> Love it. Hi, everybody. Morning. Welcome back to you today. It's Monday morning. Lots to smile about mm -hmm. this morning. If you're just waking up, we're glad to have you start your day with us. You know, today, I don't like to celebrate half birthdays, but my three and a half year old <laughs> says we have to celebrate his birthday today, Char -char. half birthday, and our executive Arley. producer, yeah, Tom Mazzarelli, it's also his half birthday today, so oh my gosh. much to celebrate. There's a lot of half birthdays yes. going on, including, by the way, Savannah, <laughs> our big wall, man, we got the class of 2020 on My Today Plaza, they are here, they are in force, we're going to chat with some of them coming up a little later in the show. So. Savannah, Savannah, you have a new graduate in your house as well, right? Oh, that's true. Yes, Vale graduated from kindergarten on Friday. So, good, good yeah, like we said, lots to smile about and be grateful for this morning. Mm -hmm. We do have a busy one to get to. Let's go to your news at 8 o'clock. And in Minneapolis, the former police officer charged with murdering George Floyd makes his first court appearance today. His actions two weeks ago touched off those nationwide protests. And now some calls to defund police departments and spend the money in a different way. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Minneapolis with the very latest. Gabe, good morning. 
Savannah, good morning. That former officer, Derek Chauvin, is expected to go before a judge today on second-degree murder and manslaughter charges. And George Floyd's death has now reignited a larger conversation across the country about the role of police. Many members of the Minneapolis City Council now say they want to disband the department. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. Back in Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says no. The tensions fueling peaceful protest over the weekend. Forever. We're going to keep marching as long as we Forever. have to. From New York's Union Square to the streets of Hollywood to Washington, D.C.'s newly dubbed Black Lives Matter Plaza to Philadelphia, where amid the demonstrations another kind of unity. And that was quite an emotional scene. Back here in Minneapolis, there are still many questions about how defunding the police will work. The city council says it is asking for input from the public, but it could take up to a year before they figure out exactly how that would work. Hoda. All right, Gabe Gutierrez for us in Minneapolis. All right, now let's go to the pandemic. The overall numbers of new COVID-19 cases has dropped in the U.S., but at least 20 states have seen an alarming uptick in recent weeks. NBC Sam Brock is in Miami Beach with more on that and what may be causing that. Hey, Sam, good morning. Hoda, good morning. You know, there's been more testing. That could partly explain the higher numbers, but businesses have been reopening. And ever since Memorial Day, we've seen large gatherings of crowds across the country, including massive protests for George Floyd. Hoda, here in Florida, the last five days have brought the biggest spike in cases since mid-April. After months of trying to beat back Hoda, coronavirus, I appreciate you guys. a wave of businesses reopening, beaches buzzing, and most recently protests erupting, are taking a toll. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the large gatherings pose a significant threat. It's a delicate balance because the reasons for demonstrating are valid, and yet the demonstration itself puts one at an additional risk. This morning, 20 states showing an upward swing in cases over the last two weeks. Texas, California, Florida, and Missouri among them. A rise stretching back to a very social Memorial Day holiday. The weather got nice outside, people start to go back outside. We did relax a lot of our social distancing in those states, and here we go. Cases start to pick up. No justice! Massive demonstrations in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death, only heightening concerns. A new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 66 percent of respondents are uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large group. Even as some health care workers step out into the streets to protest injustice. I don't know that COVID is really in the back of my mind when I'm out there. I'm really thinking about the issue at hand, which is making sure that 
justice is served, and something like this never happens again. A powerful movement sweeping the nation as New York City reopens its economy for the first time today. We're going to open 15 sites that are dedicated just to protesters to get a test so you can get it on an expeditious basis. But please get a test. Testing in college sports also raising red flags as athletes return for preseason training. According to multiple reports, several University of Alabama football players have the virus, and Auburn University acknowledges three of its players tested positive too. An Oklahoma State linebacker even tweeting, after attending a protest and being well protective of myself, he has COVID-19. And that player also tweeting he was completely asymptomatic. Now the University of Alabama is arguably the most prominent football program in the country they have not confirmed yet those cases of coronavirus, but have said the health and safety of student athletes is their top priority, and they're ensuring that those players, student athletes, get the best possible medical care when they return to campus. Craig? Sam Brockforce there in Miami. Sam, thank you this morning. There has been a huge development in the search for a hidden treasure that we've been telling you about for years. Someone has apparently claimed the Forest Finn treasure worth millions. NBC's Gotti Schwartz had actually spent some time looking for it as well. Clearly, it wasn't Gotti that found the treasure because he joins us this morning <laughs> in L.A. with the very latest. Hey, Gotti. Hey, Craig, thanks for rubbing it in. Yeah, we, we still don't know how someone was able to solve all nine clues in that cryptic poem that Forrest Finn wrote that led directly to his chest. But when I spoke to Forrest Finn over the phone, he said he was partly relieved, partly saddened, but there is no doubt in his mind that his treasure has been found. Somewhere deep in the mountains north of Santa Fe, an 11th century treasure box filled with millions worth of gold, emeralds, and antiquities has finally been found. And online, a community of treasure hunters is going wild. The unfindable has been found. Forrest Finn is an 89-year-old art collector who stashed the treasure more than 10 years ago in an effort to get people off their couches and into the great outdoors. Now telling me over the phone, a man from back east has finally deciphered the secret clues he left in a poem. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. But so far, Forrest has been mum on the man's identity, saying he learned the search was over when the man emailed him a picture of the treasure and in a post describing the secret location under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. The discovery coming after years of hundreds of thousands of people trying to find the chest that for me started as a local reporter nearly a decade ago in Santa Fe as one of the first to cover the modern day treasure hunt. Since then, thousands have shared their own quests, like Ray and Chloe Harp, who say it's brought them closer as a family. It's brought us together out in nature, out in sunshine. I mean, I think that was what Forrest wanted, and it gave us a perspective of, of the world that our children will never forget. And Today, hearing the news is bittersweet. It yeah. feels like the last page of our favorite book. <laughs> but the story hasn't been without significant danger. There have been countless rescues and at least five people have died while searching in treacherous terrain. Authorities long urging Finn to call off the search, despite Finn's insistence the treasure was hidden in a spot that a 70-year-old man would be able to reach. But today, that exact location, still a mystery. Finn saying the treasure hunter wishes to remain anonymous, and now it's his secret to keep. And I got to tell you, this whole treasure hunt was very close to my heart. Over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time looking from New Mexico all the way up to Yellowstone. I was convinced that it would be out there for centuries, even though one time Forrest told me I came within a couple of miles of the box. I thought that it was going to be out there and I could take my, my grandkids out there. But now the entire mystery has shifted to who found it and how they solved all those clues. Savannah? Mm, Gotti, I'm sorry you didn't get your pot of gold, but on the plus side, <laughs> we get to keep you. So thank you for the update. That's true. Appreciate Very it. Very true. I'll, it's, yeah. Yeah. Silver lining for us. Also this morning, we're keeping an eye on the storm Cristobal, which made landfall as a tropical storm in Louisiana yesterday. 50 mile an hour winds to the National Hurricane Center has now downgraded the storm to a tropical depression as it heads north and now inland. The storm is expected to cause heavy rain and flooding as far north as Wisconsin over the next few days. 12 minutes after the hour, there's only one thing to do now. A couple of morning boosts, Hoda. Let's do it, let's do it. Okay, a high school student named Jared was not gonna let the coronavirus ruin the highlight of his senior year, which is of course graduation. So when it was canceled, he decided to hold a little ceremony of his own. Check it out. <laughs> Go. 
Go, go, go. <laughs> Neighbors were honking their horns. Jared had a red carpet rolled out. He could show off his celebration oh. dance. He was practicing that. He even had a little stage on the front lawn. He put on a good show. I mean, come on. He earned that cafe down. <laughs> and he's not going to let anybody forget that. <laughs> no, he, he knows how to put on a moment. Uh -huh. All right, Craig, you're going to like this one. It's a dad story. You know, sometimes your kid gives you a chance to create a lifetime memory, and you just have to go with it no matter how messy. Take uh -oh. a look. Come here. Come here. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Oh. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. How cute is that? Yep, the shoes are probably a little soggy. And the pants are going to have to go through the laundry like uh, twice. But one day, all that little girl's going to remember is that daddy jumped in the muddy puddle. Yes, right yes there he did. Her. How That's cute a is good that? one. That's a good daddies. one. One of the first installment of our new series across the platforms of NBC News, focusing on inequality in America. More than 50 million kids go to public school in this country, but the education they receive, it varies widely, sometimes from town to town and often for the wrong reasons. NBC senior investigative and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden has our report this morning. Hey, Cynthia, good morning. Good morning. Well, public schools are used to making do. As one superintendent wrote recently, he'd never seen a bake sale for a bank or an airline. And yet schools often operate on just fumes. You know, in Wayne County, Michigan, when the coronavirus hit, once again, the difference between the haves and the have-nots came into sharp view. Wayne County, the sixth hardest hit country in the country when it came to corona, it became clear quickly some kids had computers, many did not. Kennedy Kane is a fighter. And that's lucky, because at 16, she's not only a straight-A student at Cass Tech, one of the best public high schools in Detroit, she's running a makeshift school on a single borrowed computer for her four siblings. Kenneth, Keenan, Kenye, and Kendall. After nearly a month without any assignments, her school launched an online platform, but Kennedy says that hasn't made it easier. Not only is this new to us, but it's new to the teachers as well. And sometimes the teachers have difficulties when they're trying to program it, and then they assign it as if they know that everyone has availability or the opportunity to have technology in their home when that's not the case. So it's kind of frustrating. When schools closed, only 10% of Detroit public school students had access to a computer and the internet, which is deeply troubling to Dr. Nikolai Viti. Three years ago, he became superintendent, inheriting a system long on promise and short on resources. So Dr. Viti, what was the state of the Detroit public school system before the coronavirus? Enrollment was up for the first time in over a decade. Uh, student achievement defined by state and national test scores showed improvement. Equally important, the teacher vacancy rate, which had dogged the city, had improved by 75 percent. God put me on this earth to teach. I absolutely love it. Detroit native Casey Edgar teaches 11th grade math at King High, and she says most of her nearly 150 students are less and less committed to school. How come your camera is not on? The first week I was in touch with, I would say 50 to 60 percent. And now it's about running at about 20 percent. What percentage of your students do you think are actually doing the work? Like right about 10 percent. That's not very many. No, not very many at all. Like many places around the country, little learning has taken place for Detroit public school students since March. So instead of adding and subtracting, we're going to be multiplying. Okay. There's no denying there is a digital divide in America. Just seven miles from downtown Detroit, the Gross Point South High School had a computer in every kid's hands who needed one almost immediately after the shutdown. So before COVID-19, I did not have a laptop. I was issued a laptop uh, right after its school ended. Xavier Prater is a dedicated student. We just log in and then go to our remote learning resources. Xavier will be a senior next year and dreams of going to UCLA. He is well on his way with lots of support.
Little surprise, participation in online classes in Gross Point is 95%, much higher than it is just a zip code away in Detroit, where it's only 50%. A reflection, some say, of deeply rooted systemic racism. The numbers tell at least part of the story. In Detroit, median household income is about $30,000. The population is nearly 80% black. In Gross Point, median income is just over $100,000, with a black population of 2%. So is the digital divide in Detroit a racial divide as well? Absolutely. The haves are receiving more than the have-nots. We already know children are coming in at a disadvantage with fewer resources than middle-class, upper-middle-class students, but our public school system should be the great equalizer in giving an equal opportunity for children, but in, instead it actually exacerbates the divide that already exists. Detroit is getting a big boost with a $23 million gift from local businesses to give every student a laptop. But that won't happen until summer, long after the school year ends. We can anticipate most students losing six months of where they would have been had we been in school. Six months behind can be a knockout punch for kids already struggling with an achievement gap. Not because they aren't as smart, not because they aren't willing to work as hard, just because of where they live. Gross Point is right next to us. And they have, they got resources the second this pandemic started. Their educational system isn't lacking as much as we are. And it's just like, wow, why can't we be like that? Or why can't we step in and uh, give to our students like they are? Because our students are no different from theirs. So I asked Kennedy where her incredible courage and her wisdom came from. She says her working mother, who she calls a superhero. And one final point, Brown and Harvard did a study uh, after the coronavirus hit of math around the country, looking at just under a million students. And here's what they found. In the most, the poor zip codes, the math learning had, had been reduced by about 50%. And in the wealthiest zip codes, no learning loss. So the, if, even if the kids get these laptops, though, what about what about the digital divide as it pertains to, to Internet access as well? Yeah, that's part of it. And in fact, the, these laptops are going to come with Internet access Excellent. because that is absolutely a problem. Craig. Yeah. And I remember we did that story of that family that actually got in their car, remember, and drove to where there was Internet access. But you can't believe that people live blocks apart and have that disparity. That was fascinating. Cynthia, thank you. Thank Again, you. that's just the uh, first mm -hmm. in a series here, inequality in this country. 8.30 now on a Monday morning. It is the eighth day of June 2020. And just ahead in this half hour, young people who are really wise beyond their years. I had a conversation with some really remarkable kids on race in America and making sense of everything that's happening. These kids are ages 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 15. You'll want to hear how they are putting things into perspective, Savannah. I think we've got some stuff to learn from them for sure. And then I cannot wait to chat with Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She is the first black woman ever nominated to be a justice on New Jersey's Supreme Court. She has an incredible story to tell, and we are looking forward to sharing it with you. We've got an inspirational half hour lined mm -hmm. up. But before we get to all of that, Mr. Roker, how about a final check of that weather? Good, sir. All right, let's look at the week ahead, and we're starting off today, of course, with what's going on down through the lower Gulf with Cristobal. It makes its way up to the north. Santa Ana winds out west. Sunshine in the Pacific Northwest, sunny and pleasant here in the northeast. Then we're looking for the midweek period. Severe storms start to make their way into the eastern Great Lakes. Wait, wet weather all the way down into Florida, nice and dry out through the plains. The warmth continues along the west coast, and then as we move on toward the end of the week, coastal storms develop down along the southeast. Atlantic coast, hot and humid from Texas all the way into the mid-Mississippi River Valley, cool and damp into the Pacific Northwest. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods.
And that's your latest weather. Hoda? All right, Al, thank you. Coming up next, the new voices joining the conversation on race in America. We need to understand that it's okay to be black. It's okay to be white. It's okay to be Pacific Islander. And all these differences is what, in fact, makes this country beautiful and amazing and makes us the people that we are. How impressive is Marley? We're going to talk to some awesome young people I got to speak with who will give us all hope for the future. But first, this is today on NBC. And welcome back on this Monday morning. And Hoda, you've got uh, you've got some interesting perspectives on all of the events that we've seen play out in our country over the past. Yeah, years. I've been especially struck by the images of the real young people who are protesting and calling for change because a lot of adults lose lose sight of the big picture. So we like to take lessons from kids. These are kids who are ages 10, 11, all the way up to 15, who have a way of seeing things more clearly. Across the country, Americans are rising up and taking a stand, demanding change. No justice, no Alongside them, new voices, kids who understand the simple truth that all men and women are created equal. To better hear those voices, I asked a few of tomorrow's leaders to talk to me about what we can do to help fix things today. Hi, guys. First of all, I want to thank you. You are smart people, smart kids, and we need smart kids right now. So we need you all to help us out of this mess that we're in. Okay? Can you all help us? Yes. First, there's 11-year-old Rosalie, whose favorite sweatshirt says it all. (laughs) Seventh grade buddies Logan, Josh, and Aiden have a friendship that's colorblind. (laughs) And then there's Marley, a 15-year-old activist who campaigned to get thousands of books about black girls into schools. Okay, Marley, I'm going to start with you. Just give me your reaction to what you see going on outside right now. Well, the moment that we're living in is kind of frustrating because it feels as though it's an attack on people that look like me, which is really scary and disappointing. Aiden, when you look out at what's going on on the streets, how does it make you feel about yourself? I feel endangered, like I'm being hunted for, because I'm different. And I find that just just unacceptable. Why do you feel that way, honey? because people are being brutally murdered for no reason. Aiden, do your parents ever talk to you about the way you should act when you're in public? They always say, be careful, know your rights, and never disrespect the police officer. Be careful, know your rights, never disrespect a police officer. Have you ever felt intimidated when you were walking around? Yes. Like, give me an example. 
like when I was watching my dog Phineas, I felt like it was night, so I didn't want anybody to come and be like, oh, he's an African American boy at night. He must be doing something bad. Doesn't that make you sick? Yeah, exactly. It's like, why? We're all the same. What are we why? Logan, when you look at everything that's going on, do you know what everybody's fighting about? I think they're fighting about police brutality. Also, yesterday my dad said, you don't know what it's like to be black until you walk a mile in my shoes. And he said it because I really didn't understand what was going on. And what he means by that is, you don't know what it's like to see people clenching their bags when you're walking down the street. He says it happens every day. One of the first times that I personally like saw or witnessed inequity was with my own hair when I got to elementary school. A lot of the kids at school would say that it was like taking up too much space and they wanted me to sit in the back or that it was dirty. Um, and these things were like super frustrating because I felt like it was completely out of my control. Well, your hair is gorgeous. I love your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Rosalie, did something happen at camp that... Yes. Tell me about that. I saw some people from a different cabin. They were talking, they were saying how they didn't want to play with someone because of their race. And at the time, I didn't really say anything to them at the time, but I talked to my counselors. And sometimes, like, I kind of regret not saying anything, but I also at the same time don't because I could have made things worse. So, Morley, if people are... A aren't sure whether or not they should speak out. What's your best advice to them? I think the best thing you can say is, how much do I know about the situation? So I think Rosalie did a great job in knowing that, oh, I don't know 100% enough to just go in and try and stop something that I can ask an adult who may know more than me. So it is finding that balance, and I think she did a great job. Thank you. Josh, tell me what we should do to end racism. What would you say? I would say that... We are all the same, we are all people. I say that it's gonna be okay and soon we'll all be like friends and it'll be over. Do you think we just need to make our circles bigger to have people around us who are different from us? I 100% agree with that. I think people need to understand that racism exists and that we need to understand that it's okay to be black, it's okay to be white, it's okay to be Pacific Islander. And all of these differences is what in fact makes this country beautiful and amazing and makes us the people that we are. And, wow. uh, aren't, aren't they amazing kids? Out, and, out of the mouths of babes. Right? Wow. And by the way, uh, Marley, who's the, she's the older one in the group. She's the one who's 15. She said she loved hearing everybody because all the other kids kept saying, we're the same, we're the same. And she said, they're so young. They don't really see everything yet, but they will. But I, feel, I felt so much better after the interview. I felt like those are the guys who are yes. going to kind of be in charge eventually. And I, I sort of liked hearing them. We're in the middle of a bit of a mess right now yeah. in this country. But if those five voices <laughs> yeah. are any indication the future yeah we're we're in good shape <laughs> we're in fine shape and the church oh, we are back 842 now with an inspiring groundbreaker savannah Yes, she is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She's a former prosecutor, a mother, and once confirmed, she will make history as the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court. We're going to talk with her in just a moment, but first her story. 39-year-old Fabiana Pierre-Louis wasn't always sure she wanted to be a lawyer, but now she's a judicial trailblazer. It is extremely humbling to be nominated, and I am beyond excited and enthusiastic. Governor Phil Murphy nominating Pierre-Louis to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey, the first black woman in its history. There is no better meeting of an individual and the times. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, the first black woman to hold statewide office in New Jersey, singing her praises. She is proof of what is possible when one does not limit themselves to what others think they can do because of their station in life. Pierre Louis has traveled a long road to reach the state's highest bench. Her parents, Joseph and Claire, emigrated from Haiti. He worked as a cab driver. She worked in a hospital. Pierre-Louis started life in a cramped Brooklyn apartment, shared with seven relatives, before her family moved to New Jersey. There, she graduated Rutgers Law School and became an assistant U.S. attorney, heading up offices in Trenton and Camden. And on Friday, she walked into history. Standing here today, I know that I have truly lived 
and continue to live the American dream that my parents came to this country in search of. And Fabiana Pierre-Louis joins us now. Good morning. I feel like I should call you Madam Justice, but I know you have to wait and get confirmed first. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What was it like to get that call from Governor Murphy and, and when it really soaked in what this means to be the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court? Well, it was, it's such an honor to be nominated to the state's highest court. Um, I, it's in, in, I feel incredibly blessed, and I am fortunate that Governor Murphy um, saw in me the, 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 the experience and had the faith in me to nominate me to the court. Um, I pri practiced private practice, public service, and I think, you know, it's, it's such a phenomenal opportunity to serve the state of New Jersey. I began my career with the Supreme Court of New Jersey as a law clerk to Justice John Wallace Jr. And the idea that I may one day sit in the same seat that he occupied is just unbelievable. I was thinking about that. I wondered if you in your law clerk days, if you ever even let yourself dream of something like this. And how about your parents? You know, here they are. They're immigrants from Haiti. They really embody the American dream. You embody the American dream. What did they think when you told them the news? My parents were speechless. <laughs> they, they're so <laughs> overjoyed and so happy and so proud. And I think there were just so many emotions that they, they are, they continue to experience after realizing the magnitude of this nomination. So uh, they're just extremely proud and, and happy. You know, this nomination was in the works long before this particular cultural moment that we're in. But you are, as the governor said, so well suited to it. You worked as a federal prosecutor. You worked and were in charge of the criminal division in, in some of the toughest cities in New Jersey. What do you think this movement will mean to the system? So, again, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly humbling. Um, and an honor to be nominated to the Supreme Court. You know, if confirmed, um, if I do break that barrier and become the first black woman to sit on the court, I just hope to be an inspiration to future generations. I know how important it is for young people to see people that look like them, who have similar backgrounds as them, in leadership positions. So I, I just truly hope to be an inspiration to others and, and I look to bring a diverse perspective to the court. Well, uh, we know you're a hard worker. You're a mom of two young sons. <laughs> um, you, as I said, you've been practicing law all these years. What, are your, what do your kids think about mom becoming a Supreme Court justice? So my, my sons, Robbie and Mark, they're seven and four, so they don't quite understand the particulars <laughs> of the judiciary system, but they, they were thrilled to meet the governor on Friday, and they thought it was really cool to <laughs> see themselves on the news. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have a concept of what a judge is, so they, they, they think it's pretty exciting. Uh, it is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis, thank you so much. I was going to say, maybe, as a, I know I'm a mom of little kids, it would be nice to have that gavel. Bring a gavel home and see if you need, sometimes, sometimes moms need to lay down the law, too. <laughs> It's that's funny. We actually have a, a couple of foam gavels at home, so they often joke and bang the foam gavels and say order in the court. So that's how I explain to them that I might be becoming a judge. <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. We'll continue to follow your incredible story. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus. The enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Good morning. Facing justice, Derek Chauvin, the officer charged with murdering George Floyd in court for the first time today. This morning, what the case against him may look like. One of the junior officer's attorneys speaking exclusively to NBC News. You ask your sergeant, should we do something? He says, no. Are you going to say, well, no, I'm going to do it anyway? I don't think so. The very latest, including the final public memorial being held in Floyd's hometown today. Defund the police, the controversial idea gaining momentum across the country. The city council in Minneapolis voting to dismantle its entire department. Nationwide demonstrations growing stronger over the weekend. No justice, no peace. The largest peaceful protest yet. Opening up. New York City, the nation's coronavirus epicenter, starting its road back this morning. Hundreds of thousands returning to work for the first time in three months. Straight ahead, the latest on the pandemic, including the worrisome spike in cases in other spots around the country. Slamming ashore. Tropical storm Cristobal makes landfall in Louisiana, packing high winds, flooding rain, and a dangerous storm surge. Millions in its path as it pushes inland. Al has the latest forecast. Breaking overnight, the Justice Department ratchets up the pressure on Prince Andrew, demanding he cooperate with the criminal investigation into Jeffrey Epstein. Will he finally talk with prosecutors? All that plus, dear class of 2020. Hold your heads high and celebrate. Go ahead and do a little dance. <laughs> Stars from all walks of life come together for a special commencement ceremony for students around the world. Every obstacle is really an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to change. You are graduates in three, two, one. Today, Monday, June 8th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to you today. It is nice to have you with us on a Monday morning. Hoda, I know you love commencement mm. speeches. You must have been watching and throwing your cap up in the air. I am beaming ear to ear. Like, if if that doesn't put you in a good mood in this Hold tiny moment, time. nothing will. So uh, and Carson's going to mm. kind of recap all of those, and it's going to be really great. But we do have a really busy morning, a lot to get to, including another weekend of mass protests across America that show no signs of stopping, Savannah. 
That's right. And at the same time uh, in Minneapolis, the former police officer charged with George Floyd's murder will go before a judge for the first time today. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is there again for us. Hi, Gabe. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. Former officer Derek Chauvin is set to appear before a judge on second degree murder and manslaughter charges. And George Floyd's death is now reigniting a larger conversation across the country about the role of policing. Here in Minneapolis, many city council members now say they want to disband the department. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. All this as more disturbing videos emerge of police arresting black men. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an officer is seen using a stun gun on a man Friday, later hitting him on the head. The officer is now charged with assault. In Alameda, California, police have released this video of an arrest last month, which is also under investigation. The man says he was dancing outside his home. In Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says Gabe, no. Uh, back to this uh, notion about disbanding the police, and that's the vote at the uh, Minneapolis City Council. What would that actually look like? What would the next steps be? Well, Savannah, that is a major question right now. And the city council members say they want input from the public, and it could take up to a year to figure out exactly how much how this will work. The mayor here says that he wants to reform the department, not abolish it. But one of the ideas being tossed around is perhaps hire more counselors to deal with mental health calls instead of relying solely on police. Savannah. All right. Gabe Gutierrez in Minneapolis for us. Gabe, thank you. Hoda? All right. Meantime, the weekend saw some of the largest peaceful protests yet all across the nation. And today, George Floyd will be remembered at a memorial service in his hometown of Houston. NBC's Morgan Chesky is there for us this morning. Hey, Morgan, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. And it is a bittersweet homecoming for the family of George Floyd. Today, thousands of friends, family, and those touched by his story expect to enter this Houston church to pay their final respects. Everyone inside wearing masks, gloves, and maintaining that social distancing. All this just one day after mostly peaceful protests. Overnight, chaos in Seattle. Witnesses say a man was shot after a suspect drove through a crowd of protesters. Video showing the driver get out of his car and brandish what appears to be a gun. Authorities say that suspect is now in custody. The 27-year-old victim in stable condition. The growing scenes of unrest coming amid another night of mostly peaceful protests over the killing of George Floyd. His remains now back in his childhood home of Houston. American flags lining the route to the church or a memorial service will be held in just a few hours. 
Pastor Mia Wright. Our desire and the Floyd family desire is really to see people come together and to heal our nation. The service open to all, but with coronavirus still a threat, masks and social distancing required. On Saturday, a public viewing in Rayford, North Carolina, where Floyd was born, drew thousands. His family's emotions overflowing. I'll never hear his voice. I'll never hear his laughter. I'll never have his hugs. I'll be able to tell him that I love him again. Bystanders eager for a glimpse of the casket of the man whose name has become a rallying cry for justice. I want to give him a good home going and let him know that his death was not in vain, that we will do something about it. With demonstrations stretching into the 13th day in a row. From D.C. to New York, Denver and Los Angeles, even at NASCAR. And to stand against racism. The protests now mainly peaceful after some early nights of violence. I can't breathe. Also in Houston today, former Vice President Joe Biden planning to meet privately with Floyd's family to offer his condolences in person. Following the public memorial, tomorrow's funeral service will be private. All expenses covered by boxer Floyd Mayweather. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. And as he did in Minneapolis on Friday, the Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy before George Floyd is laid to rest next to his mother, reuniting with the person he so desperately called out for in his final moments of life. A number of politicians and celebrities expected to be in attendance today, including Floyd Mayweather, who is funding that funeral for the Floyd family. In the meantime, tonight, a candlelight vigil will be held on the very football field where Floyd was once a standout player. His former teammates expected to attend. Savannah. All right, Morgan, thank you. And now to the morning's other big news. This is, of course, about the coronavirus. New York City, the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, is taking its first major steps forward toward reopening today. But the move also comes with new concerns, a surge in cases in other cities that have eased restrictions and those mass protests we've seen for nearly two weeks. What does that mean for the outbreak? NBC's Morgan Radford is in Times Square with all the latest. Morgan, good morning. Savannah, good morning. It's been a hundred days since that first confirmed coronavirus case here in New York City. And since then, all the dramatic steps we've all taken to help flatten the curve have worked. But the reality of it is, with protests now leading to possible concerns about a resurgence, experts say these first steps are also tentative. This morning, for the first time in three months, New York City is cautiously opening back up. We bent the curve. The city hit hardest by the pandemic is entering the first phase of reopening today. Retail stores open for pickups. Construction and manufacturing can resume. And subways return to regular weekday service. You did the hard work to fight back the coronavirus so we could get to phase one. Just weeks ago, the city was at a breaking point. With hospitals overwhelmed and more than 16,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City alone. But after a strict shutdown, widely available free testing, and increased contact tracing, the city has met the criteria needed to start reopening. Phase one may bring as many as 400,000 people back to work in the Big Apple. Companies reopening must limit capacity, frequently clean shared surfaces, screen workers for symptoms, and create social distance markers to help customers and employees stay six feet apart. It's been soul crushing. Mackenzie uh, Farquay shut I down her five shops in March. This morning, she's back open for business with hand sanitizer at the ready and items up front so customers can shop from the sidewalk. I hope it'll be super busy. But nationwide, officials worry loosened restrictions have contributed to a new spike in 18 states. And reopening efforts are complicated by the sweeping protests following the death of George Floyd. We're certainly going to see transmission coming out of these gatherings. There's no question about that. In New York, there will be 15 specific testing sites for protesters. If you were at a protest, act responsibly, get a test. Get a test. A city working hard to move forward and find its new normal. So some good news. The governor says that school graduations of up to 150 people will be allowed as early as June 26. 
But the bad news, one of the most big, one of the biggest challenges the city is still facing is mass transit. Ridership has decreased 90% since the pandemic began, and it's still really difficult to socially distance in New York City's enclosed buses and trains. Hoda? Yeah, it sure is. All right, Morgan in Times Square. Morgan, thank you. Craig joins the table now with another story tied to those protests that we've been following. Indeed, right? Hoda, good morning. The National Guard is now withdrawing from Washington, D.C. at the direction of President Trump. That move coming as the White House faces new questions this morning about its overall response to the demonstrations. NBC's Kristen Walker joins us from the White House with more, with, with more on that this morning. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Craig, good morning to you. President Trump will meet with law enforcement officials later today with his response to the crisis surrounding George Floyd's death coming under new scrutiny. Now, it comes as he is locked in an increasingly competitive race with the presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe Biden. This morning, President Trump is facing a growing chorus of criticism from former military leaders. We have a constitution and we have to follow that constitution. And the president's drifted away from it. Over the weekend, retired Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell joining that list and blasting the president. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because... People would not hold him accountable. Powell, a frequent Trump critic who served four presidents, three Republican and one Democrat, and who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, endorsed Joe Biden over the weekend, getting and, emotional and when talking about how he says the world now views the United people. States. Are we insulting everybody? Are we going after immigrants? Um, they don't understand this. I'm the son of immigrants. I wouldn't be here if my parents couldn't come here in banana boats in the 1920s. This is America. This is who we are, and the world doesn't understand. Mr. Trump fired back, calling Powell highly overrated. As for the 2020 race, in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, Biden leads President Trump nationally by seven points among all registered voters, 49 percent to 42 percent. That's unchanged from April's poll. While Biden is up eight points against the president among voters in the top battleground states, 50 to 42. As for the state of the nation, 80 percent of Americans say the country is out of control amid the aftermath of the the death of George Floyd and the coronavirus pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr out front over the weekend, defending the use of force to clear Lafayette Park last Monday night, which set the stage for President Trump's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church. They were not peaceful protests. But witnesses say the protesters were peaceful. Barr also rejecting what many protesters see as the root of the problem. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. Now, overnight, 4,900 National Guard troops started to leave Washington, D.C. at President Trump's order. The president tweeting the troops can, quote, return quickly if needed. The president also saying the protests have been under perfect control, his words. Joining those protests over the weekend, one of his biggest Republican critics, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who told NBC News Black Lives Matter. Romney is also signaling he likely won't support Mr. Trump in the fall. Hoda. All right. Kristen Welker for us at the White House. Kristen, thank you. Another major story this morning, Crystal Ball. It roared ashore in Louisiana as a tropical storm overnight with high winds, and it was soaking parts of the south with heavy rains. As it pushes inland, its threat is expected to last for days. We're going to bring in Mr. Roker, get the very latest on this one. Hey, Al Morning. Good morning, Hoda. Good morning, everybody. And this is the latest on Cristobal. We are looking at it now. It has made landfall, and it is 40 miles north of Baton Rouge, 35-mile-per-hour winds. It's moving north-northwest at 10 miles per hour. As the system pushes to the north, we are going to be watching this make its way. In fact, it's the second earliest landfall on record. The record was uh, Tropical Storm Arlene back in 1959. Now, this system will push to the north, bringing soaking rains to the Mississippi River Valley, making its way through Wisconsin and on into the UP of Michigan. And look at this. The, it's only twice, there's only twice before had a tropical remnant low pass across Wisconsin and only once before over Michigan. So this is a rare situation indeed. Heavy rain, especially as you get up into the mid-Mississippi River Valley locally, five inches of rain. But as you look at this, as you get into the upper Midwest, we're going to be seeing anywhere from two to three inches and locally they could have five inches as well. So we're going to feel the effects of Cristobal all the way up into the Midwest. Nice. Like, yeah.
hero that a hero lies in you. Oh, come on. That makes you feel good. We're back with some of the fun and surprises from YouTube's Dear Class of 2020. Y'all, it was a virtual graduation ceremony. It was star-studded. It was a celebration of this year's college and high school graduates. And our pal Carson has rounded it all up. He's going to put a bow on it and give us our graduation package. So we look forward to that. Yes, we do. Yeah, it looks like a good one. We're going to start this half hour, though, with your 7.30 headlines. If you're just waking up on a Monday morning... The former police officer charged with George Floyd's murder set to make his first appearance in court this morning. Derek Chauvin will appear before a judge on second degree murder and manslaughter charges. In the meantime, nine members of the Minneapolis City Council agreed yesterday to dismantle the police department and replace it with a community based public safety model. This comes amid growing demands to defund the police in cities across the country. A major milestone for New Zealand this morning. Officials say the country has eliminated the coronavirus and is lifting all domestic restrictions. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said today that she did a little dance upon hearing that, that the country had no active cases. Public and private events can resume without social distancing requirements, along with the retail and hospitality industries. Strict border controls will remain in place, though. Breaking overnight, hundreds of firefighters battled a massive structure fire in downtown Phoenix. You could see a ball of flames, a huge plume of smoke from several miles away. Officials say the four-story apartment complex was still under construction, so it's unlikely there was anybody inside. Still, though, no word on the cause of that fire. And another major headline this morning, millions feeling the impact of once tropical storm Cristobal. We're going to bring in Mr. Roker and get the latest on that storm. Hey, Al. Hey, guys. Well, you know, the good news is it is now moving to the north. It is going to affect a lot of the upper Mississippi River Valley. We're also talking about a lot of summertime heat. Santa Ana winds out west. Wind advisories for L.A. Monday this morning. Red flag warnings. Heat advisories with temperatures 10 to 20 degrees above average. Then we get into the Midwest. Minneapolis today, 95 degrees. Chicago will be 91. Dallas, 96. Midland, Texas, 106. And that, east, that heat starts to move east. Buffalo tomorrow, 88 degrees. Cleveland will be 92. Charleston, 92. New York City up into the low 80s. And as we move into the latter part of the week, that heat continues from Chicago, Jackson, New York, Norfolk, and down into Columbia. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. And that's your latest weather. Poda? Grab it up when we're talking about the reaction that's pouring in, Hoda, to that new message from the NFL. Yeah, the league is uh, taking the debate over protests in a new direction with its strongest statement yet in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. The move following a call from prominent players to take a stance. NBC's Stephanie Goss joins us with the latest on this one. Hey, Steph, morning. Good morning, Hoda. Well, the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, is apologizing for how the league failed to support players who were protesting police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. For many, this is an about face that was a long time coming, but it has also caught the attention of Kneeling's fiercest and most vocal critic, the president. We are listening. I am listening. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is changing the league's message, releasing this video statement late Friday. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. 
The exact same language star NFL players asked the league to use the day before. We will not be silenced. We assert our right to peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. Goodell's message of unity comes after comments made by one of the NFL's biggest stars exposed the league's deep divisions. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Drew Brees apologized twice after he said players shouldn't protest police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. I am sorry, and I will do better. The New Orleans Saints quarterback also promising to listen more and be part of the solution. President Trump now weighing in, going after Goodell overnight, tweeting, could it be even remotely possible that Goodell was intimating that it would now be okay for players to kneel? And Brees over the weekend, posting, he should not have taken back his original stance. Breeze hitting back, posting on Instagram, to Donald Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. The president echoing his comments in 2016, when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee protesting police brutality. Kaepernick never played in the NFL again after that season. Knees usually taken out of reverence, Former Green Beret and Seattle Seahawks player Nate Boyer is the person responsible for suggesting kneeling as a protest to Kaepernick. Kneeling was born out of a a middle ground, you know, Um, two people that disagreed on a lot, but two people that were willing to just have a conversation and listen. So, Steph, uh, Goodell didn't directly address the kneeling during the anthem, but what do you think is going to happen with the upcoming season and those protests? What will we see? Yeah, Hoda, his statement is vague, although a lot of people have interpreted it as a green light for kneeling. You know, there have been a handful of players who say when they come back, that's exactly what they're do- they're going to do, including running back Adrian Peterson. He thinks that kneeling could potentially save lives and create change. Hoda? All right, Stephanie Gosk. Steph, uh, thank you. We are back 740 now with in-depth today. Some breaking news this morning tied to the Jeffrey Epstein case, Savannah. Yeah, it's significant. The U.S. Justice Department is applying new pressure on Prince Andrew this morning to testify as part of its criminal investigation. Today's senior international correspondent, Keir Simmons, is in London with these breaking details. Hi, Keir. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. A sensational front page to the Sun newspaper here this morning. Yanks, hand, Andy over, perhaps inevitably being a British tabloid. That headline is a little exaggerated, but U.S. investigators are formally asking to speak to Prince Andrew, and for such a high-profile figure, particularly a member of the British royal family, well, that is rare. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. Prince Andrew was seen on social media in May when his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson posted this Instagram picture with the caption, so proud of our loving family. But in an interview in December, Virginia Jufri claimed she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and abused by Prince Andrew when she was 17, just days after this picture was taken. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Prince Andrew says he has no recollection of meeting her. His own interview last year was widely criticised for the way he talked about Epstein. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And he would only say he might talk to authorities. If push came to shove and the (coughs) the legal advice was to do so, then I would be duty-bound to do so. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew, since he stepped down as a working royal. So, so Keir, if Prince Andrew doesn't have anything to hide, why, why not just agree to that interview with authorities here? <laughs> 
That's a great question, Craig, not least because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give uh, evidence under uh, oath. Uh, but that said, you and I both know that uh, you should be careful when you're talking about legal conversations that are taking place behind closed doors, private conversations. We don't know the details. That said, the optics are terrible for the royal family, aren't they? Uh, one final uh, note, uh, Craig. Prince Andrew's interview, television interview last year, widely believed to have gone really, really badly. Perhaps his legal advisers are concerned about how it would go if he did sit down in front of seasoned prosecutors. Right? Yeah, no, that interview was a disaster. Keir Simmons there in London. Keir 749 with today celebrates the class of 2020. Carson's got the highlights from, I think, one of the largest ceremonies of the year. Hey, Carson, morning. Hi, Hoda. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. With many high schools and colleges obviously forced to cancel graduations because of coronavirus, some of the world's biggest stars decided to do something about it. This is a who's who from the worlds of movies, music, and politics all coming together over the weekend for a mega graduation party seniors will never forget. Class of 2020, you are graduates in three, two, one. Over the weekend, a star-studded virtual tribute for seven million high school and college students nationwide. YouTube's Dear Class of 2020 commencement had a little something for everyone. It was pretty much. More than 70 pop stars, celebrities, and public figures participated, expressing their support for graduating seniors as they take their next big step. You all have done something great. Hold your heads high and celebrate. And go ahead and do a little dance. <laughs> the cool dance. You worked your whole life in pursuit of your dreams and nothing, not even a global pandemic, is going to keep you from the futures you've imagined for yourself. Every obstacle is really an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to change. Performances included a rendition of U2's Beautiful Day. And a Zoom bomb by Mariah Carey, as the cast of Schitt's Creek performed her song, Hero. Social media lit up with messages from the class of 2020 praising the event. Although some of the speeches were recorded before the death of George Floyd, several artists addressed the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement and encouraged graduates to rise up and advocate for change. We've seen that our collective hearts, when put to positive action, could start the wheels of change. Real change has started with you. You are the seeds that will grow into a new and different forest that is far more beautiful and loving than the one we live in today. Our own Jenna Bush Hager had these words of encouragement. And when the world opens up again, we can all be a little better than before. The world will be better because of you. While Alicia Keys urged the grads to strive for greatness. You are graduates in the most powerful time to be coming of age, and there's nothing and no one that can stop you from changing the world. Guys, one of the things uh, that, that sticks awesome. out about the Dear Class of 2020 is that when was the last time social media pretty much unanimously all agreed something was amazing? Uh, it doesn't happen often. So that's just small proof of how impressive this over four-hour production was. And guys, I'll tell you what, even if you're not a senior, it is worth going back to YouTube to re revisit as the messages of hope and camaraderie and inspiration were abundant, and it was very powerful. Very well done. Oh, that sounds awesome. I felt like we should play yeah. Alicia Keys' song, Good Job, because, man, they did a great job. That was awesome, Carson. They sure did. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt. And for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. 
It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, day in court. The officer charged with George Floyd's murder set to face a judge today as calls to defund the police grow across the country. No justice, no peace. We break it all down this morning. Plus, tomorrow's leaders, Hoda's candid conversation with young children about racism. The moment that we're living in is kind of frustrating because it feels as though it's an attack on people that look like me. Just to have their powerful message and the hope they'll give you for the future. And one man's treasure. After years of searching for a real life million dollar mystery, the hunt may be over. We'll take you inside the overnight developments on the famous search today, Monday, June 8th, 2020. What a moon sugar high. Waking up with today from Clayton, California. Today's my 10th birthday and I'm starting it off by watching today. Good morning from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm coming from Columbia, South Carolina, wishing my husband, Jeffrey Dyer, a happy 33rd wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, Jeff. My name is Trey and I'm turning eight today. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hi, everybody. Morning. Welcome back to you today. It's Monday morning. Lots to smile about mm -hmm. this morning. If you're just waking up, we're glad to have you start your day with us. You know, today, I don't like to celebrate half birthdays, but my three and a half year old <laughs> says we have to celebrate his birthday today. Char -char. Half birthday. And our executive Arley. producer. Yeah, Tom Mazzarelli, it's also his half birthday today. So oh my gosh. much to celebrate. There's a lot of half birthdays yes. going on, including, by the way, Savannah, <laughs> our big wall, man. We got the class of 2020 on My Today Plaza. They are here. They are in force. We're going to chat with some of them coming up a little later in the show. So. Savannah, Savannah, you have a new graduate in your house as well, right? Oh, that's true. Yes, Vale graduated from kindergarten on Friday. So, Good yeah, like we said, lots to smile about and be grateful for this morning. Mm -hmm. We do have a busy one to get to. Let's go to your news at 8 o'clock. And in Minneapolis, the former police officer charged with murdering George Floyd makes his first court appearance today. His actions two weeks ago touched off those nationwide protests. And now some calls to defund police departments and spend the money in a different way. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Minneapolis with the very latest. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. That former officer, Derek Chauvin, is expected to go before a judge today on second-degree murder and manslaughter charges. And George Floyd's death has now reignited a larger conversation across the country about the role of police. Many members of the Minneapolis City Council now say they want to disband the department. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Hey, hey, go, go. These 
Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. Back in Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says no. The tensions fueling peaceful protest over the weekend. Forever. We're going to keep marching as long as we Forever. have to. From New York's Union Square to the streets of Hollywood to Washington, D.C.'s newly dubbed Black Lives Matter Plaza to Philadelphia, where amid the demonstrations, another kind of unity. And that was quite an emotional scene. Back here in Minneapolis, there are still many questions about how defunding the police will work. The city council says it is asking for input from the public, but it could take up to a year before they figure out exactly how that would work. Hoda. All right, Gabe Gutierrez for us in Minneapolis. All right, now let's go to the pandemic. The overall numbers of new COVID-19 cases has dropped in the U.S., but at least 20 states have seen an alarming uptick in recent weeks. NBC Sam Brock is in Miami Beach with more on that and what may be causing that. Hey, Sam, good morning. Hoda, good morning. You know, there's been more testing. That could partly explain the higher numbers, but businesses have been reopening. And ever since Memorial Day, we've seen large gatherings of crowds across the country, including massive protests for George Floyd. Hoda, here in Florida, the last five days have brought the biggest spike in cases since mid-April. After months of trying to beat back coronavirus, I appreciate you guys. a wave of businesses reopening, beaches buzzing, and most recently protests erupting, are taking a toll. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the large gatherings pose a significant threat. It's a delicate balance because the reasons for demonstrating are valid, and yet the demonstration itself puts one at an additional risk. This morning, 20 states showing an upward swing in cases over the last two weeks. Texas, California, Florida, and Missouri among them. A rise stretching back to a very social Memorial Day holiday. The weather got nice outside, people start to go back outside. We did relax a lot of our social distancing in those states, and here we go. Cases start to pick up. No justice! Massive demonstrations in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death, only heightening concerns. A new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 66 percent of respondents are uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large group. Even as some health care workers step out into the streets to protest injustice. I don't know that COVID is really in the back of my mind when I'm out there. I'm really thinking about the issue at hand, which is making sure that justice is served and something like this never happens again. A powerful movement sweeping the nation as New York City reopens its economy for the first time today. We're going to open 15 sites that are dedicated just to protesters to get a test so you can get it on an expeditious basis. But please get a test. Testing in college sports also raising red flags as athletes return for preseason training. According to multiple reports, several University of Alabama football players have the virus, and Auburn University acknowledges three of its players tested positive too. An Oklahoma State linebacker even tweeting, after attending a protest and being well protective of myself, he has COVID-19. And that player also tweeting he was completely asymptomatic. Now the University of Alabama is arguably the most prominent football program in the country 
They have not confirmed yet those cases of coronavirus, but have said the health and safety of student athletes is their top priority, and they're ensuring that those players, student athletes, get the best possible medical care when they return to campus. Craig? Sam Brockforce there in Miami. Sam, thank you this morning. There has been a huge development in the search for a hidden treasure that we've been telling you about for years. Someone has apparently claimed the Forest Finn treasure worth millions. NBC's Gotti Schwartz had actually spent some time looking for it as well. Clearly, it wasn't Gotti that found the treasure because he joins us this morning <laughs> in L.A. with the very latest. Hey, Gotti. Hey, Craig, thanks for rubbing it in. Yeah, we, we still don't know how someone was able to solve all nine clues in that cryptic poem that Forrest Finn wrote that led directly to his chest. But when I spoke to Forrest Finn over the phone, he said he was partly relieved, partly saddened, but there is no doubt in his mind that his treasure has been found. Somewhere deep in the mountains north of Santa Fe, an 11th century treasure box filled with millions worth of gold, emeralds, and antiquities has finally been found. And online, a community of treasure hunters is going wild. The unfindable has been found. Forrest Finn is an 89-year-old art collector who stashed the treasure more than 10 years ago in an effort to get people off their couches and into the great outdoors. Now telling me over the phone, a man from back east has finally deciphered the secret clues he left in a poem. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. But so far, Forrest has been mum on the man's identity, saying he learned the search was over when the man emailed him a picture of the treasure and in a post describing the secret location under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. The discovery coming after years of hundreds of thousands of people trying to find the chest that for me started as a local reporter nearly a decade ago in Santa Fe as one of the first to cover the modern day treasure hunt. Since then, thousands have shared their own quests, like Ray and Chloe Harp, who say it's brought them closer as a family. It's brought us together out in nature, out in sunshine. I mean, I think that was what Forrest wanted, and it gave us a perspective of, of the world that our children will never forget. And Today, hearing the news is bittersweet. It yeah. feels like the last page of our favorite book. <laughs> but the story hasn't been without significant danger. There have been countless rescues, and at least five people have died while searching in treacherous terrain. Authorities long urging Finn to call off the search, despite Finn's insistence the treasure was hidden in a spot that a 70-year-old man would be able to reach. But today, that exact location, still a mystery. Finn saying the treasure hunter wishes to remain anonymous, and now it's his secret to keep. And I got to tell you, this whole treasure hunt was very close to my heart. Over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time looking from New Mexico all the way up to Yellowstone. I was convinced that it would be out there for centuries, even though one time Forrest told me I came within a couple of miles of the box. I thought that it was going to be out there and I could take my, my grandkids out there. But now the entire mystery has shifted to who found it and how they solved all those clues. Savannah? Mm, Gotti, I'm sorry you didn't get your pot of gold, but on the plus side, <laughs> we get to keep you. So thank you for the update. That's true. Appreciate Very it. Very true. I'll, it's, yeah. Yeah, silver lining for us. Also this morning, we're keeping an eye on the storm Cristobal, which made landfall as a tropical storm in Louisiana yesterday. 50 mile an hour winds too. the National Hurricane Center has now downgraded the storm to a tropical depression as it heads north and now inland. The storm is expected to cause heavy rain and flooding as far north as Wisconsin over the next few days. 12 minutes after the hour, there's only one thing to do now. A couple of morning boosts, Soda. Let's do it, let's do it. Okay, a high school student named Jared was not gonna let the coronavirus ruin the highlight of his senior year, which is of course graduation. So when it was canceled, he decided to hold a little ceremony of his own. Check it out. Go, go, go. Neighbors were honking their horns. Jared had a red carpet rolled out. He could show off his celebration dance. He was practicing that. He even had a little stage on the front lawn. He put on a good show. I mean, come on. He earned that cafe down. And he's not going to let anybody forget that. No. He knows how to put on a moment. Uh -huh. All right, Craig, you're going to like this one. It's a dad story. You know, sometimes your kid gives you a chance to create a lifetime memory. And you just have to go with it no matter how messy. Take uh -oh. a look. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Hey. Hold my hand. Oh. This is so How cute is that? Yeah, the shoes are probably a little soggy. 
<laughs> and the pants are going to have to go through the laundry like uh. twice, but one day all that little girl's going to remember is that daddy jumped in the muddy puddle. Yes, right yes there he did. Her. How That's cute a is good that? one. That's all a good daddies. one. Out of the first installment of our new series across the platforms of NBC News, focusing on inequality in America. More than 50 million kids go to public school in this country, but the education they receive, it varies widely, sometimes from town to town and often for the wrong reasons. NBC senior investigative and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden has our report this morning. Hey, Cynthia, good morning. Good morning. Well, public schools are used to making do. As one superintendent wrote recently, he'd never seen a bake sale for a bank or an airline. And yet schools often operate on just fumes. You know, in Wayne County, Michigan, when the coronavirus hit, once again, the difference between the haves and the have-nots came into sharp view. Wayne County, the sixth hardest hit country in the country when it came to corona, it became clear quickly some kids had computers, many did not. Kennedy Kane is a fighter. And that's lucky, because at 16, she's not only a straight-A student at Cass Tech, one of the best public high schools in Detroit, she's running a makeshift school on a single borrowed computer for her four siblings. Kenneth, Keenan, Kenye, and Kendall. After nearly a month without any assignments, her school launched an online platform, but Kennedy says that hasn't made it easier. Not only is this new to us, but it's new to the teachers as well. And sometimes the teachers have difficulties when they're trying to program it, and then they assign it as if they know that everyone has availability or the opportunity to have technology in their home when that's not the case. So it's kind of frustrating. When schools closed, only 10% of Detroit public school students had access to a computer and the internet, which is deeply troubling to Dr. Nikolai Viti. Three years ago, he became superintendent, inheriting a system long on promise and short on resources. So Dr. Viti, what was the state of the Detroit public school system before the coronavirus? Enrollment was up for the first time in over a decade. Uh, student achievement defined by state and national test scores showed improvement. Equally important, the teacher vacancy rate, which had dogged the city, had improved by 75 percent. God put me on this earth to teach. I absolutely love it. Detroit native Casey Edgar teaches 11th grade math at King High, and she says most of her nearly 150 students are less and less committed to school. How come your camera is not on? The first week I was in touch with, I would say 50 to 60 percent. And now it's about running at about 20 percent. What percentage of your students do you think are actually doing the work? Like right about 10 percent. That's not very many. No, not very many at all. Like many places around the country, little learning has taken place for Detroit public school students since March. So instead of adding and subtracting, we're going to be multiplying. Okay. There's no denying there is a digital divide in America. Just seven miles from downtown Detroit, the Gross Point South High School had a computer in every kid's hands who needed one almost immediately after the shutdown. So before COVID-19, I did not have a laptop. I was issued a laptop uh, right after its school ended. Xavier Prater is a dedicated student. We just log in and then go to our remote learning resources. Xavier will be a senior next year and dreams of going to UCLA. He is well on his way with lots of support. Little surprise, participation in online classes in Gross Point is 95 percent, much higher than it is just a zip code away in Detroit, where it's only 50 percent. A reflection, some say, of deeply rooted systemic racism. The numbers tell at least part of the story. In Detroit, median household income is about $30,000. The population is nearly 80% black. In Gross Point, median income is just over $100,000, with a black population of 2%. So is the digital divide in Detroit a racial divide as well? Absolutely. The haves are receiving more than the have-nots. We already know children are coming in at a disadvantage with fewer resources than middle class, upper middle class students, but our public school system should be the great equalizer 
and giving an equal opportunity for children, but in, instead it actually exacerbates the divide that already exists. Detroit is getting a big boost with a $23 million gift from local businesses to give every student a laptop. But that won't happen until summer, long after the school year ends. We can anticipate most students losing six months of where they would have been had we been in school. Six months behind can be a knockout punch for kids already struggling with an achievement gap. Not because they aren't as smart, not because they aren't willing to work as hard, just because of where they live. Gross Point is right next to us. And they have, they got resources the second this pandemic started. Their educational system isn't lacking as much as we are. And it's just like, wow, why can't we be like that? Or why can't we step in and uh, give to our students like they are? Because our students are no different from theirs. So I asked Kennedy where her incredible courage and her wisdom came from. She says her working mother, who she calls a superhero. And one final point, Brown and Harvard did a study uh, after the coronavirus hit of math around the country, looking at just under a million students. And here's what they found. In the most, the poor zip codes, the math learning had, had been reduced by about 50%. And in the wealthiest zip codes, no learning loss. So the, if, even if the kids get these laptops, though, what about what about the digital divide as it pertains to, to Internet access as well? Yeah, that's part of it. And in fact, the, these laptops are going to come with Internet access Excellent. because that is absolutely a problem. Craig. Yeah. And I remember we did that story of that family that actually got in their car, remember, and drove to where there was Internet access. But you can't believe that people live blocks apart and have that disparity. That was fascinating. Cynthia, thank you. Thank Again, you. that's just the uh, first in a series here, inequality in this country. 8.30 now on a Monday morning. It is the eighth day of June 2020. And just ahead in this half hour, young people who are really wise beyond their years. I had a conversation with some really remarkable kids on race in America and making sense of everything that's happening. These kids are ages 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 15. You'll want to hear how they are putting things into perspective, Savannah. I think we've got some stuff to learn from them for sure. And then I cannot wait to chat with Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She is the first black woman ever nominated to be a justice on New Jersey's Supreme Court. She has an incredible story to tell, and we are looking forward to sharing it with you. We've got an inspirational half hour lined mm -hmm. up. But before we get to all of that, Mr. Roker, how about a final check of that weather? Good, sir. All right, let's look at the week ahead, and we're starting off today, of course, with what's going on down through the lower Gulf with Cristobal. It makes its way up to the north, Santa Ana winds out west, sunshine in the Pacific Northwest, sunny and pleasant here in the northeast. Then we're looking for the midweek period, severe storms start to make their way into the eastern Great Lakes, wet, wet weather all the way down into Florida, nice and dry out through the plains. The warmth continues along the west coast, and then as we move on toward the end of the week, coastal storms develop down along the southeast. Atlantic coast, hot and humid from Texas all the way into the mid-Mississippi River Valley, cool and damp into the Pacific Northwest. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. And that's your latest weather. Hoda? All right, Al, thank you. Coming up next, the new voices joining the conversation on race in America. We need to understand that it's okay to be black, it's okay to be white, it's okay to be Pacific Islander. And all of these differences is what in fact makes this country beautiful and amazing and makes us the people that we are. How impressive is Marley? We're gonna to talk to some awesome young people I got to speak with who will give us all hope for the future. But first, this is today on NBC.
And welcome back on this Monday morning. And Hoda, you've got uh, you've got some interesting perspectives on all of the events that we've seen play out in our country over the past year. Yeah, I've been especially struck by the images of the real young people who are protesting and calling for change because a lot of adults lose, lose sight of the big picture. So we like to take lessons from kids. These are kids who are ages 10, 11, all the way up to 15, who have a way of seeing things more clearly. Across the country, Americans are rising up and taking a stand, demanding change. Alongside them, new voices, kids who understand the simple truth that all men and women are created equal. To better hear those voices, I asked a few of tomorrow's leaders to talk to me about what we can do to help fix things today. Hi, guys. First of all, I want to thank you. You are smart people, smart kids, and we need smart kids right now. So we need you all to help us out of this mess that we're in. Okay? Can you all help us? Yes. First, there's 11-year-old Rosalie, whose favorite sweatshirt says it all. (laughs) Seventh grade buddies Logan, Josh, and Aiden have a friendship that's colorblind. (laughs) And then there's Marley, a 15-year-old activist who campaigned to get thousands of books about black girls into schools. Okay, Marley, I'm going to start with you. Just give me your reaction to what you see going on outside right now. Well, the moment that we're living in is kind of frustrating because it feels as though it's an attack on people that look like me, which is really scary and disappointing. Aiden, when you look out at what's going on on the streets, how does it make you feel about yourself? I feel endangered, like I'm being hunted for, because I'm different. And I find that just just unacceptable. Why do you feel that way, honey? because people are being brutally murdered for no reason. Aiden, do your parents ever talk to you about the way you should act when you're in public? They always say, be careful, know your rights, and never disrespect the police officer. Be careful, know your rights, never disrespect a police officer. Have you ever felt intimidated when you were walking around? Yes. Like, give me an example. Like when I was walking my dog Phineas, I felt like it was night, so I didn't want anybody to come up to me like, oh, he's an African-American boy at night. He must be doing something bad. Doesn't that make you sick? Yeah, exactly. It's like, why? We're all the same. What are we doing? Logan, when you look at everything that's going on, do you know what everybody's fighting about? I think they're fighting about police brutality. Also, yesterday, my dad said, you don't know what it's like to be black until you walk a mile in my shoes. And he said it because I really didn't understand what was going on. And what he means by that is, you don't know what it's like to see people clenching their bags when you're walking down the street. He says it happens every day. One of the first times that I personally like saw or witnessed inequity was with my own hair when I got to elementary school. A lot of the kids at school would say that it was like taking up too much space and they wanted me to sit in the back or that it was dirty. Um, And these things were like super frustrating because I felt like it was completely out of my control. Well, your hair is gorgeous. I love your hair. Yeah. (laughs) Rosalie, did something happen at camp that... Yes. Tell me about that. I saw some people from a different cabin. They were talking, they were saying how they didn't want to play with someone because of their race. And at the time, I didn't really say anything to them at the time, but I talked to my counselors. And sometimes, like, I kind of regret not saying anything, but I also at the same time don't because I could have made things worse. So Morley, if people are, uh, aren't sure whether or not they should speak out, what's your best advice to them? I think the best thing you can say is, how much do I know about the situation? So I think Rosalie did a great job in knowing that, oh, I don't know 100% enough to just go in and try and stop something that I can ask an adult who may know more than me. So it is finding that balance, and I think she did a great job. Josh, tell me what we should do to end racism. What would you say? I would say that we are all the same. We are all people. I say that it's going to be okay, and soon we'll all be like friends, and it'll be over. Do you think we just need to make our circles bigger to have people around us who are different from us? I 100% agree with that. I think people need to understand that racism exists, 
and that we need to understand that it's okay to be black, it's okay to be white, it's okay to be Pacific Islander. And all of these differences is what in fact makes this country beautiful and amazing and makes us the people that we are. And, wow. uh, aren't, aren't they amazing kids? Out, and, out of the mouths of babes. Right? Wow. And by the way, uh, Marley, who's the, she's the older one in the group. She's the one who's 15. She said she loved hearing everybody because all the other kids kept saying, we're the same, we're the same. And she said, they're so young. They don't really see everything yet, but they will. But I, feel, I felt so much better after the interview. I felt like those are the guys who are yes. going to kind of be in charge eventually. And I, I sort of liked hearing them. We're in the middle of a bit of a mess right now yeah. in this country. But if those five voices yeah. are any indication the future yeah we're we're in good shape <laughs> we're in fine shape and the church oh, we are back 842 now with an inspiring groundbreaker savannah Yes, she is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She's a former prosecutor, a mother, and once confirmed, she will make history as the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court. We're going to talk with her in just a moment, but first her story. 39-year-old Fabiana Pierre-Louis wasn't always sure she wanted to be a lawyer, but now she's a judicial trailblazer. It is extremely humbling to be nominated, and I am beyond excited and enthusiastic. Governor Phil Murphy nominating Pierre-Louis to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey, the first black woman in its history. There is no better meeting of an individual and the times. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, the first black woman to hold statewide office in New Jersey, singing her praises. She is proof of what is possible when one does not limit themselves to what others think they can do because of their station in life. Pierre Louis has traveled a long road to reach the state's highest bench. Her parents, Joseph and Claire, emigrated from Haiti. He worked as a cab driver. She worked in a hospital. Pierre Louis started life in a cramped Brooklyn apartment, shared with seven relatives before her family moved to New Jersey. There, she graduated Rutgers Law School and became an assistant U.S. attorney, heading up offices in Trenton and Camden. And on Friday, she walked into history. Standing here today, I know that I have truly lived and continue to live the American dream that my parents came to this country in search of. And Fabiana Pierre-Louis joins us now. Good morning. I feel like I should call you Madam Justice, but I know you have to wait and get confirmed first. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What was it like to get that call from Governor Murphy and, and when it really soaked in what this means to be the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court? Well, it was it's such an honor to be nominated to the state's highest court. Um, I, it's in, in, I feel incredibly blessed, and I am fortunate that Governor Murphy um, saw in me the the, the 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 experience and had the faith in me to nominate me to the court. Um, I pri practiced private practice, public service, and I think you know it's it's such a phenomenal opportunity to serve the state of New Jersey. I began my career with the Supreme Court of New Jersey as a law clerk to Justice John Wallace Jr. And the idea that I may one day sit in the same seat that he occupied is just unbelievable. I was thinking about that. I wondered if you in your law clerk days, if you ever even let yourself dream of something like this. And how about your parents? You know, here they are. They're immigrants from Haiti. They really embody the American dream. You embody the American dream. What did they think when you told them the news? My parents were speechless. <laughs> they, they're so <laughs> overjoyed and so happy and so proud. And I think there were just so many emotions that they, they are. Never again should the world be subjected to witnessing what we saw on the streets in Minneapolis, the slow murder of an individual by a uniformed police officer. The world is witnessing the birth of a new movement in our country. This movement has now spread to many nations around the world with thousands marching to register their horror at hearing the cry, I can't breathe. People marching to demand not just change, but transformative change that ends police brutality, that ends racial profiling, and ends the practice of denying Americans the right to have the ability to sue when they have been injured by an officer, that denies local jurisdictions the power to fire or prosecute offending officers. Black communities have sadly been marching for over 100 years against police abuse, but four 
the police to protect and serve our communities like they do elsewhere. In the 1950s, news cameras exposed the brutal horror of legalized racism in the form of segregation. The news cameras of the 1950s exposed the brutal treatment of people who dared to challenge the system. News cameras exposed to the world that black people did not have the same constitutional protections that freedom of speech, the right to assemble and protest were not rights extended to African Americans. Seventy years <coughs> later, it is the cell phone camera that has exposed the continuation of violence directed at African Americans by the police and exposed the reality that the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not guaranteed to all African Americans at all times. Now the movement for police accountability has become a rainbow movement, reflecting the wonderful diversity of our nation and the world. The power of this movement will help move Congress to act, to pass legislation that not only holds police accountable and increases transparency, but assists police departments to change the culture. Now I know that change is difficult, but I am certain that police officers, professionals who risk their lives every day, are deeply concerned about their profession and do not want to work in an environment that requires their silence when they know a fellow officer is abusing the public. I am certain police officers would like to be free to intervene and stop an officer from using deadly force when it is not necessary. And I am certain that police officers want to make sure they are trained in the best practices in, police, in policing. A profession where you have the power to kill should be a profession that requires highly trained officers who are accountable to the public. Embarking on a journey toward a new vision for policing in America is only possible because of the incredible leadership in the House of Representatives. We now have over 200 co-sponsors in the House and the Senate. Speaker Pelosi has said she wants to see a bold transformative effort and that is exactly what justice in policing will do. Join me in welcoming the most powerful woman in Congress and the nation, Madam Speaker Pelosi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen Bass, for your tremendous leadership. Uh, under the leadership of Karen Bass, many of us had the privilege last year of going to Ghana to observe the 400th anniversary of the first slaves going across the Atlantic, America really was, there was no United States, but going across the Atlantic. It was a horrible, the, the kidnapping, the purchase of those slaves, the dungeons in which they were kept, and if they survived that, to be on a slave ship, and if they survived that, to be sold into slavery. And then everything that came from that. When we were in Selma, only just a, uh, in, in March, uh, we saw at, uh, at Brian Stevenson's, one of his museums, a beautiful display, heartbreaking display, but children, little children saying, Mama, Mama, has anyone seen our mother? These children separated from their mothers. The cruelty of that. And that's why when George Floyd called out for his mother, when he was subjected to that knee in the neck, it was just a continuation of some horror that has existed in our country for a very long time. So, so Mr. Clyburn, Mr. Mr. Hoyer, our distinguished leader, Mr. Clyburn, our whip, join Karen Bass, Leader Schumer, uh, the two senators, uh, leaders on this issue, Mr. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Harris, Congressman, Senator, did I say Senator? Senator Harris, Senator Booker, uh, uh, in the Emancipation Hall, aptly named for those who built the capital of the United States in their honor. We built, were there for eight minutes and 46 seconds on our knees. My members will attest, it's a very long time. Amen. It's a very Amen. long time. And I graciously led them in falling over when it was <clears> over <throat> so that they could do the same thing. But here we are, the martyrdom of George Floyd gave American, exper American experience a moment of national anguish as we grieve for the black Americans killed by police brutality. Today, this movement of that moment of national anguish is being transformed into a movement of national action as Americans from across the country peacefully protest to demand an end to injustice. 
Today, with the Justice and Policing Act, the Congress is standing with those fighting for justice and taking action. Let us, my colleagues, just go over some of those names of martyrdom. George Floyd, Jackson Davis, Oscar Grant. So sad, Breonna Taylor, Armand Arbery, Botham John, Terrence Crutcher, Philandro Castle, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Trevon Martin, my colleagues, any other names you want to add? Emmett Till, Charlie Bell, I'm in the Allen. Thank you. We cannot settle for anything less than transformative structural change, which is why the Justice in Policing Act will remove barriers to pr prosecuting police misconduct and covering damages by addressing the quality immunity doctrine. It will end to will demilitarize the police by limiting the transfer of military weaponry to state and local police departments. It will combat police br brutality by requiring body and dashboard cameras, banning chokeholds, no-knock warrants in drug cases, and end raci racial profiling. Uh, it will, uh, will finally make lynching Mr. Hoyer, a federal hate crime. And I salute uh, Chair Chairwoman Bass and Representative Bobby Smith and our two distinguished Senators, Harrison Booker and others, uh, for their work in helping to pass H.R. 35 this year. Police brutality is heartbreaking reflection of an entrenched system of racial injustice in America. True justice can only be achieved with full, comprehensive action. That's what we are doing today. This is a first step. There is more to come. In the coming weeks, the bill, the House will hold hearings, mark up the bill. Once the House passes it, the House, uh, the Justice and Policing Act, Leader McConnell will hopefully. He must swiftly take it up. Leader in the Congress, uh, the President must not stand in the way of justice. The Congress and the country will not relent until this legislation is made into law. My colleague, Mr. Clyburn, is always getting awards for liberty and justice for all. That's what this is about. That's what our distinguished leader, Mr. Schumer, talked about in Emancipation Hall. I'm pleased to yield to the distinguished leader of the United States Senate. Democratic leader, Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer. Well, thank you, Speaker Pelosi, and I'm so proud to be joined by so many of my colleagues, Leader Hoyer, Senators Booker and Harris, Representatives Bass, Clyburn, Nadler, and Jeffries for joining us in speaking this morning, and all the support that we have from so many wonderful people behind us. Over the past week, hundreds of thousands of Americans have engaged in peaceful demonstrations against police violence and systemic racism. This large, diverse group, so many of them young, gives us hope that Americans are prepared to march and fight to make this a more perfect union once and for all. And so today, we are taking the first of many steps, many necessary steps, to respond to this national pain with bold action. As my colleagues will explain, the Justice in Policing Act proposes crucial reforms to combat racial violence and excessive force by law enforcement through strong accountability measures, increased data and transparency, and important modifications to police training and practices. This has never been done before at the federal level. In the Senate, Democrats are going to fight like hell to make this a reality. Americans who took to the streets this week have demanded change. With this legislation, Democrats are heeding their calls. Now we must collectively, all Americans, raise our voices and call on Leader McConnell to put this reform bill on the floor of the Senate before July to be debated and voted on. Now some Senate Republicans have acknowledged the egregious wrongs, but few have expressed a need for floor action. Too many have remained silent. Maybe they're hoping the issue goes away. I promise them it will not. Democrats will not let this go away, and we will not rest until we achieve real reforms. Leader McConnell, let's have the debate, not just on TV and Twitter, 
but on the floor of the United States Senate. A divided nation cannot wait for healing, for solutions. The poison of racism affects more than our criminal justice system. It runs much deeper than that. There are racial disparities in housing, in health care, education, the economy, jobs, income, wealth. And COVID has only placed a magnifying glass on them. It is our job, our job as representatives of an imperfect union to right those wrongs, bring the reality and promise of America into closer alignment. Equal justice under law is one such promise. That's what this morning and the Justice and Policing Act is all about. The centuries-long struggle to make those words actually true for black Americans and every American. Senator Hoyer, uh, Congressman Hoyer. <laughs> These are serious times. I have walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge 15 times, hand in hand with my brother John Lewis. My grandchildren have been there, my daughters have been there. In Selma in 2015, President Obama asked us this. What greater form of patriotism is there than the belief that America is not yet finished, that we are strong enough to be self-critical, that each successive generation can look upon our imper imperfections and decide that is in our power to remake this nation, to more closely align with our highest ideals. That is what the Boston Tea Party was about a demonstration. Some Britons would say a violation of law to redress rights. We remain a nation of imperfections, calling out to us to be addressed with the seriousness and determination to make good on the promise that all are created equal, all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the right to breathe, the right to have their lives matter. We've heard our people cry out, I can't breathe. We've heard our people speak out, black lives matter. Black lives matter. The protests we've seen in recent days are an expression of rage born of despair. Today, Democrats in the House and Senate are saying, we see you, we hear you, we are acting. Thank you, Karen Bass. Thank you, Congressional Black Caucus. Thank you, Leader Pelosi and Leader Schumer. The killing must stop. The carnage must end. That begins with transparency and accountability. Among other provisions, this bill will increase transparency and accountability of law enforcement nationwide by, one, requiring state and local law enforcement agencies to collect and report data. Secondly, incentivizing the creation of independent investigation structures for police involved in deaths and creating best practice recommendations based on the Obama administration's 21st Century Policing Task Force. This legislation makes it clear that police departments are serving and are answerable to all the residents in their communities, including African Americans. I want to thank my colleagues who have been leading this effort in the House, Chairwoman Bass, Chairman Nadler, Chairman Jeffries, and Whip Clyburn and Senator Harris. We keep in our minds today the word of our dear departed colleague, Elijah Cummings. We are better than this. And now, it's my privilege to introduce a former mayor of a great city in our country, a representative of the state of New Jersey, 
and a leader in this effort, Senator Cory Booker. We are better than this. We in America are one precious same nation, but we have a wildly different set of experiences with the police, where black Americans live in fear of police interactions, disproportionately having our common ideals of fairness trampled, where black Americans disproportionately have our rights violated, where black Americans disproportionately and unjustifiably have violence, experience violence at the hands of the police. And where black Americans unarmed are killed by police at grievous and wretched rates. In this moment in America, knowledge of this and acknowledgement of this is necessary, but it is not enough. Empathy and sympathy and words of caring for those who have died and suffered are necessary, but it's not enough. Having a nation that in all 50 states, millions of Americans of all ages, religious and racial backgrounds, are standing up in nonviolent protest has made this moment possible, but it's not enough. We must change laws and systems of accountability. We must pass legislation that makes our common values and our common ideals real in the law of our land. This bill focuses on accountability and transparency in polices. Specifically, the federal statute that governs police misconduct, Section 242. It changes the difficult stat uh, statutory standard of willfulness, willfulness, making it holding, make that makes holding police accountable too difficult. And it changes that standard from being willful to being reckless disregard. It also establishes transparency making certification requirements that now vary by location, where cities and towns do not share critical information with each other, making it far too easy for problematic officers to be fired in one town and easily hired in another. This bill, bill closes a dangerous loophole by creating the first ever national registry of policemen's conduct to better record and track police abuses to give transparency to local citizens, helping to create the necessary accountability. I want to thank the leadership of Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer. I want to thank the head of the Congressional Black Caucus and all the members of the Black Caucus. I want to thank my partner, Kamala Harris, for her leadership in making a real piece of legislation sweeping and historic. And now we must deal with the work of making it the law of the land, of transforming the energy and the power, the empathy and the love of this moment into actual changes in American federal law. I'm honored to bring up my colleague, my friend, my sister, and my partner, Senator Kamala Harris. Thank you, Brother Corey. <laughs> Thank you to Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, Leader Hoyer, Whip Clyburn, CBC Chair Karen Bass, my brother Cory Booker, Chairman Nadler, Chair and Chairman Jeffries, and everyone uh, for the work that so many of you have been doing for decades. For decades. Mm -hmm. Shouting and, and passing or, or writing legislation and requiring that America take seriously this issue of policing and take seriously the issue that when the people are marching in the streets, it is because they are fully aware of the history of this issue in America, and they've had enough. So I thank all the leaders here for what you do. And here, we're here because black Americans want to stop being killed. Just last week, we couldn't even pass an anti-lynching bill in the United States Senate. 
So when we look at where we are now with this piece of legislation, we have to understand, yes, as a country, we've seen great progress, but just last week in the year of our Lord, 2020, we could not get an anti-lynching bill passed in the United States Senate. But we are here today with common sense solutions to hold, at, at least at the federal level, to hold police accountable. But we know this is an issue that is not just at the federal level. It is at the state and local level as well. But we are here today to say in our position as leaders in our federal government, that reform and change must happen, and it must happen now. And let's be clear, reforming policing is in the best interest of all Americans. It is literally in the best interest of all Americans. Because this is a basic matter of fairness, and as so many have said, justice. But to be clear also, there is a broader issue that is not being addressed in this bill, and that is, what we must do as a nation to truly achieve safe and healthy communities. Part of what has been upside down in policing policy in America is that we have confused having safe communities with hiring more cops on the street, as though that is the way to achieve safe communities, when in fact, the real way to achieve safe and healthy communities is to invest in those communities, in affordable housing, in the ability for home ownership, jobs, funding our public schools, giving people access to capital so they can go grow those small businesses that are part of the leadership and the health of these communities. So ours is a bill that addresses a very specific matter under a larger umbrella of all that must be addressed when we talk about the need for safety and safe and health communities in America. This specifically is a bill about accountability and consequence for bad behaviors by those who have been invested by society and the people with the ability to wear a badge and carry a gun. And let's be clear, many in America right now already live in places with minimal police presence. Go to any middle and upper class suburb, and you will not see the kind of presence of police that you see in other neighborhoods. But you will also see in those communities that those families have jobs that allow them to pay the bills and keep a roof over their head. You will also see in those communities thriving schools. You will also see in those communities access to affordable health care or families that can afford access to health care. So what we are doing today is saying that we need to have consequence and accountability in America for policing, but we also know that this is not the way that we are going to achieve healthy and safe communities. It is but a part of a much bigger issue that we still must address. So in closing, I'll just mention a few of the other points that are in the bill that are very important. And I say this as a former prosecutor. We need a national use of force standard. Right now, the question asked if there is police misconduct and excessive force is to ask of that use of force, was it reasonable? Well, as we all know, we can reason away just about anything. The appropriate and fair question to ask is, was it necessary? So part of what our bill will address is a national use of force standard, independent investigations. Again, as a former prosecutor, I can say. No matter how well-intentioned the prosecutor of a DA's office, when they are confronted with dealing with misconduct by a police officer who serves in a department they work with every day, at the very least there will be an appearance of conflict even when none is intended. If a justice system is going to be robust and real, it must not only do justice, there must be an appearance of justice and confidence by the public that justice is being done in that place. So independent investigations, and then the last piece that I'll add is the pattern and practice investigations. Under President Obama, under General Holder, these were robust. Where when there was a finding or an accusation that there was a pattern and practice within a law enforcement agency, the federal government would do investigations. Well, those under this current administration have practically been shut down. 
They need to be reinstated, but also what we are saying is to give it teeth in addition to what has been done in the past. We will grow on that progress by giving the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice subpoena power. So when police departments do not comply with requests, they will be required to by responding to a subpoena. And so my final point is, again, that it is time for this. And I am so heartened by all of the colleagues we have in the United States Senate, like Leader Schumer, who have banded together in support of this. And there's more work to be done, but I applaud all of the leaders on the stage. Thank you. And I will now introduce oh, uh, Karen. 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 Go ahead. You go. Okay. But I'd like to bring up the majority whip, Mr. Jim Clyburn. Thank you, Madam Chair, to Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, Leader Hoyer, Chair Leader Bass, and all the other members who are here today with liberty and justice for all. When I was a kid growing up in the little town of Sumter, South Carolina, we said the pledge every morning, and it ends with that phrase with liberty and justice for all. A vision that we all knew in that little town was simply a vision. And when we were trying to put together our response, what was then kids package, I said on the telephone uh, call that this gives us a tremendous opportunity to restructure things in that vision. I was mocked for that. I was attacked for wanting liberty and justice for all by various media. I don't back away from that. We're here today in search of that vision, liberty and justice for all. Now, you've heard what's going to be in this legislation. I want to say two things. First, to those who are responsible for writing it. And secondly, to those who are responsible for writing about it. Let me say this. With few exceptions, white people came to this country willingly in search of a new world full of liberty and justice for all. With few exceptions, black people came to this country against their will, chained shackled and came to these shores enslaved and stayed that way for 244 years. Think about how long that is, how many generations that is. It's a long time, eight minutes and 46 seconds. That was a long time to be on one knee. But for 244 years, there were plenty of knees on the necks of blacks who came to this country. And so as we write this legislation, and as you write about this legislation, please keep those two divergent sets of experiences in mind. We are still in search of a more perfect union. We will always be in search of a more perfect union. We must not allow any force in whatever office one may hold to, to turn the clock back on that pursuit. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce and present the chair of judiciary Jerry Nadler, my classmate.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to begin by thanking my dear friend Karen Bass, the chair of the Black Caucus and chair of the Crime Subcommittee, along with Senators Booker and Harris and our distinguished leadership for their tremendous partnership in producing this important legislation. It has been inspiring to work alongside all of them throughout this whole process. We have heard the terrifying words, I can't breathe, from George Floyd, from Eric Garner, from the millions of Americans in the streets calling out for revenge, for change. Our hearts ache for the loss of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Amadou Diallo, and the many other victims of police violence over the years. For every incident of excessive force that makes headlines, the ugly truth is that there are countless others that we never hear about. We value and respect the many brave and honorable police officers who put their lives on the line every day to protect us and our communities. But we cannot be blind to the structural racism and injustice that pervades far too many of our law enforcement agencies. This is a, system, this is a systemic problem that requires a comprehensive solution. It has been an honor to work in lockstep with the Congressional Black Caucus and the other sponsors to craft the Justice in Policing Act, a historic piece of legislation. This bold, transformative, and responsible legislation will finally ban chokeholds at the federal level and incentivize states to do the same, help end racial profiling, get weapons of war off our streets, hold police accountable in a meaningful way, increase transparency, and require and encourage greater use of body cameras. It does all of this while also addressing issues on the front end by ensuring that our law enforcement agencies adhere to the very highest standards in training, hiring, and de-escalation strategies to address systemic racism and bias, to change the culture of law enforcement in America, and ultimately, to save lives. It creates the first ever national accreditation standard for the operation of police departments, and it creates law enforcement development and training programs to establish best practices based on President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. It also reinvests in our communities and empowers them to shape the future of policing through grants to community-based organizations for task forces on policing innovation. On Wednesday of this week, the House Judiciary Committee will hold a hearing on the crisis of racial profiling, police brutality, and the lost trust between police departments and the communities they serve. I expect that what we learn during that hearing will only strengthen the case for this legislation, which we hope to take up in the committee in the coming weeks. The streets are flooded with protesters across the nation and around the world right now. They are outraged. They observe moments of silences. They take the knee. They are tired of empty promises. They are demanding justice, and they are demanding action. And I say to them, we hear you. We are inspired by you. We are taking action with you. And together we will change laws because of you, and we will make a difference. Thank you. And I now uh, have the great pleasure of introducing the uh, chair of the Democratic Caucus, uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries. Thank you, Jerry. To Chairwoman Bass, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, all of my colleagues in government, I'm appreciative of your leadership and of what this moment represents. Racism is a cancer that poisons our society. And today we take a step toward addressing it by trying to eradicate the malignant tumor of police brutality, far too often disproportionately directed at unarmed, innocent, law-abiding African-American men and women. The chokehold and other police tactics, such as a knee to the neck, which cut off breathing and result in asphyxiation is a procedure 
that is unnecessary, unacceptable, uncivilized, unconscionable, and un-American. This legislation will make it unlawful under our nation's civil rights laws. A significant number of police departments already <coughs> prohibit the use of the chokehold and tactics such as a knee to the neck as a matter of policy. But it still continues to be deployed through this very moment. And that's why we need to address it, prohibit it, outlaw it, criminalize it as a matter of law. Like any profession, there are very good police officers, and there are bad ones. We embrace those police officers who are in the community to protect and serve. But violent police officers, brutal police officers, abusive police officers must be held accountable. The Justice in Policing Act will reform the doctrine of qualified immunity in order to make sure that victims of police brutality can vindicate their full rights under Section 1983 and our nation's civil rights laws. Unless there's accountability, there will never be change. Unless there's change, brutality will continue, and then we'll be trapped in a vicious cycle of anguish and despair. Lastly, African Americans have been in this country since before there was a country. We arrived on these shores in 1619 in shackles, and as a result, of our blood, our sweat, our tears, our intellect, our ingenuity, our hard work, we help to build this great country. And all we've ever wanted is to be treated equally. Not better, not worse, equally. Why has that been so difficult to achieve? That's all we've ever wanted equal protection under the law, liberty and justice for all, treated with courtesy, perfection, professionalism, and respect by law enforcement. All we've ever wanted is to be treated equally. The Justice and Policing Act represents a strong, necessary, bold step in that direction, and I thank my colleagues for their leadership. I now yield uh, to the distinguished chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Karen Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next year will be the 50th anniversary of the Congressional Black Caucus. 50 years ago, there were 13 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and one of them, Representative Metcalf, he was the one that came up with policies related to police abuse over almost 50 years ago. So it is in their history, their legacy, that we stand today and to continue on. And I just want to thank all of my colleagues that are here today because we're not in session today. And you came in specifically for this. And I just want to thank you for being here and for standing in solidarity with this legislation. Let me say also that one of the beauties of this bill is that many members of the Congressional Black Caucus have legislation, individual bills that are a part of the larger bill because they've been working on it for so long. I just want to briefly mention their names and open up for questions. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Hank Johnson, Representative Clay, Bonnie Watson Coleman, John Lewis, Representative Butterfield, and Presley. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yes. Thank you, Bass. Uh, because there are so many of you here today who believe in this legislation, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe with a show of hands demonstrate how many of you are confident 
that this legislation can actually cross the finish line, that it can actually become law in this current political environment. You want us to raise our hands? Sure. There you go. Can I just say that one of the things that gives us confidence is the fact that there are thousands of people around this country marching. There is a movement that has caught fire, that is multiracial, and that has also spread around the world. And we need to think about how the United States appears around the world when we go out and promote human rights. The world is looking at us. That's going to help us over the finish line. Yes. Chair, I'm going to follow up on that. Um, the president tweeted, law and order, not defund and abolish the police. The radical left Democrats have gone crazy. I'm not asking you to respond to the president's tweet. Really? But, but that, Why? that is the narrative oh, that... Oh, you're not going to. Good. Yeah, no, that okay. is the narrative that the president and Republicans could very well likely create around this legislation. So how do you respond to that? And also, can you also just on camera tell us why you're, why you're wearing the kente cloth, the significance of today, why well, you're wearing it? the significance of the kente cloth is our African heritage, and for those of you without that heritage who are acting in solidarity, that is the significance of the kente cloth, our origins in respecting our past. Mm -hmm. uh, would anybody, I mean, I'm happy to respond to that, but if anybody else would like to. You know, I, I think for, uh, for us, especially when it comes to this legislation, we feel it is transformative, that it will transform the relationships that our communities have with the police. And I think that in terms of the law and order message that the president is spewing out of there, there's nothing new about that message, and I do not believe it will be successful. Yes. Yes, uh, Senator Tom Cotton called for uh, an overwhelming show of force, suggested maybe the 101st Airborne, 82nd Airborne should be brought in. Uh, he also told Politico that he doesn't believe you can say that there is systemic racism in the criminal justice system. I wonder if you can respond to those two ideas. Yeah, I can, I can, you want, would somebody like to respond? Mr. Whipcomb. Well, many of you uh, have heard me go to, to Tocqueville's description of what makes this country great. And he wrote in his two-volume book, Democracy in America, that America is not great because it's more enlightened than any other nation, but rather because it has always been able to repair its faults. That's what makes this country great. And most right-thinking Americans know that the greatness of this country is at stake. We have unveiled, for whatever reason, some faults that need to be repaired, faults in our health care system, faults in our judicial system. So let me say to Mr. Cotton, <laughs> pick up in the history book of America. I would ask him to please just read the history of Isaac Woodard, a black man who came home from World War II on the bus from Fort Gordon, Georgia, trying to get to South Carolina. And he was stopped, taken off a bus in Batesburg, South Carolina by a deputy sheriff. He was in his uniform. And that deputy sheriff took his billy stick and punched his eyes out. Is that institutional in law enforcement? And that has been the foundation upon which law enforcement in many parts of this country have been established. Cotton is from Arkansas. He ought to be ashamed of himself. I represent the heartland of America. Missouri is just north. Oh, I'm, I'm Lacey Clay from St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri is just north of Arkansas. And I would suggest to any local, state, or federal official, uh, sometimes we have to follow 
the will and wishes of the American people. Now, I've seen millions in my state and around the country, in small towns in Missouri and throughout this nation, who know there is an injustice throughout this nation that we have been treated unequally. So I suggest Senator Cotton and others follow the lead of the people, the American people, and get on board with this effort. Thank you. Yes. I think uh, you know, both Republicans in both the House and Senate said that a compromise can be reached. But you know, in order to do this, House lawmakers need to be called back to the House. So people to address that. Uh, That's what uh, Senator McCarthy has said. Okay. <laughs> I've heard Leader McCarthy's comments. We are working. We're here on behalf of the American people, not just African Americans, but the American people. Committees are working today. And I've said I'm going to call the House back as soon as this legislation is ready to hit the floor. And we're going to vote on it. And I'm confident it's going to pass the House. But sadly, I'm not confident that a body that has not been able to pass the Emmett Till lynching bill will pass this bill. I hope so. And I hope the President doesn't adopt your premise. I hope he adopts a premise of justice for all. And if he does, America will be better. Yes. Uh, Congressman, the Minneapolis City Council has done a sort of, people are calling it defund the police. Is that something that your caucus supports? Is it something that could happen in a federal way? Or is that just up to Well, I can't imagine that happening in a federal way, but let me just tell you that part of that cry is a desire for there to be significant higher investment in communities. Looking at why police are needed, what happens, what are the root causes of the problems in communities. And a lot of people feel when it comes to the defense budget, maybe that money could be used in different ways. And I think that that's a similar issue. But the part about having a comprehensive investment in communities, on behalf of the Black Caucus, let me just say that obviously we're focusing on this bill right now, but we do have other legislation coming along the lines in the form of jobs and justice, which gets at a lot of issues uh, in the community. Congressman Bass. Yes. To follow up, Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer, do you support the defund the police movement that we're seeing on the ground? I think the Congresswoman answers your question very clearly. Uh, but it, the fact is, is that we do have a great deal of legislation coming down the pike that addresses some of the concerns of our communities across the country. One of them that I wish the Senate would pass right away is the HEROES Act. Uh, in the HEROES Act, we support community, state and local governments. We support the disparity in the coronavirus out of the tax communities of color. And we would hope that the Senate would not ignore that and would pass the legislation. And we would hope that we'd put more money into the pockets of people who really need that now. Uh, and so we have that. And then following that, Mr. Hoyer has on the schedule that before 4th of July, hopefully, we will pass the Affordable Care Act Stabilization Act, which will provide more fairness and access to affordable health care in our country. As Mr. Clyburn mentioned earlier, that's a, ch a challenge, as well as our uh, build the uh, infrastructure legislation that will build America in a green way, providing jobs. That's what we said when we ran in 2012. We were going to, for the people, lower the cost of health care by lowering the cost of prescription drugs and keeping the pre-existing condition benefit. We were going to lower health care costs, bigger paychecks by building infrastructure in a green way, and third, cleaner government. Uh, with Mr. Lewis's provisions in there that are about voter suppression, any voter suppression and the rest. So these are all kinds of ways uh, that we come at this. 
uh, the fact that the distinguished chairwoman mentioned uh, this isn't we and as she has said and others have said we want to work with our uh, police departments there are many who take pride in their work and we want to be able to make sure that the focus is on them but there are many things we call upon our police departments to deal with mental health issues policing in schools and the rest that we could rebalance some of our funding to address some of those issues more directly. Uh, but this isn't about that, and that should not be the story that leaves here. The story that leaves here is, as Mr. Clavin said, liberty and justice for all. Mr. Mr. Um, Schumer has mentioned that as well here and in the uh, Emancipation Hall. Mr. Hoyer mentioned, uh, quoting our distinguished former president, Mr. Obama, as to uh, what modesty or humility or patriotism says we know we have to do better in certain respects. So let's focus on what Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. With it you can accomplish almost anything, without it practically nothing. The public sentiment could not be clearer. We need to make some transformative change, not incremental, transformative change. And as we do so, uh, we will change policy as we do in this legislation. We will use uh, all the tools, tools at our disposal to make sure that we are moving toward a more perfect union with liberty and justice for all and have those debates at the local level as they, that is a local decision, a local level. Uh, but to do so, that doesn't say we're going to pile more money on to, put, to further militarize the police. No, we're going to address mental health issues, education issues in our communities as well. And I don't want anyone to get the impression that but for some of the stuff we are doing now, many of these people would be not uh, uh, productive members of society. They will. We just want to make it easier for them in the communities to be able to, uh, to be treated equally, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Jeffries mentioned. And I think, where did he go? Our, our chairman of the Judiciary Committee spent his life on these issues about fairness. Thank you, Mr. Nadler, for that. So everyone here knows what they're talking about and what they're doing. And the safety of the American people is an oath that we take to protect and defend. That's our responsibility. We know uh, that their safety is important. And to do so in a constitutional way and not in some slogan ear tweeting way that the president may put forth. So we feel very confident about the path that we're on, not only with this legislation, but what will come next. And we'll do so listening. As Denny said, we hear you, we see you, and, and your, your views are important to us uh, as, as we go forward. It's a pretty exciting time. This is a transformational piece of legislation. This is an important day. The martyrdom, the martyrdom of George Floyd and by Tuesday, by tomorrow, may he rest in peace, has made a change in the world. So let's not get into these questions that uh, may be from the small minds of some, uh, but uh, 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 as far as safety is concerned, but look at it um, writ large. With that, um, I will yield back to the distinguished chair. Uh, two, two things very quickly. One, the bill does not provide any new money for policing, and two, there is a provision in the bill for grants to communities to have projects that begin to re-envision what policing might be, by, might be about in a particular neighborhood. And let me also say, as the speaker said, public sentiment. So the polling for public sentiment is 80% in support of peaceful protests where people now recognize the challenges in our, in our policing system. Let me bring up Lisa Blunt Rochester from the great state of Delaware. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and to all of the leadership here. Um, John Lewis is not here, but he is our colleague, and he has been the conscience of the conscience of the Congress. And what he probably would say is, let's keep our eyes on the prize. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Everybody in this country can do something that nobody else can do. We are the Congress. And what we're doing here today is our role. There will be state and local governments that will call for things in their areas. But there was a question at the beginning. 
where we were asked to raise our hand about our belief in whether this could happen or not. Well, I looked at some of my colleagues like Bobby Scott and Rosa DeLauro and others here. When I started three years ago, three and a half years ago, I would not have believed that we would have had paid family leave or, or sick time. But the times called for it because of COVID-19. This is the time. This is the time. As Fannie Lou Hamer said, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so that's why you see us flying in from across the country, because we're doing our job. And so for all the distractors out there, masters of distraction, we're keeping our eyes on the prize. We're keeping our eyes on the prize. And we need that to be the story. State and local will do what state and local needs to do. Those folks, those young people, those old people, those black, white, native people who this country, if we really want to go deep, we're trying to rebuild the foundation. That's all. So keep our eyes on the prize. <laughs> Well, with that, I think that's a great close. And let me just end by saying that as we address the question of police abuse, we understand that it impacts many different communities, not just the African-American community, the Latino community, the Asian community, the Native American community. And we are united in getting justice in policing passed. Thank you very much. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. All this is more disturbing videos emerge of police arresting black men. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an officer is seen using a stun gun on a man Friday, later hitting him on the head. The officer is now charged with assault. In Alameda, California, police have released this video of an arrest last month, which is also under investigation. The man says he was dancing outside his home. In Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. 
he was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says Dean, no. Uh, back to this uh, notion about disbanding the police, and that's the vote of the uh, Minneapolis City Council. What would that actually look like? What would the next steps be? Well, Savannah, that is a major question right now. And the city council members say they want input from the public, and it could take up to a year to figure out exactly how much how this will work. The mayor here says that he wants to reform the department, not abolish it. But one of the ideas being tossed around is perhaps hire more counselors to deal with mental health calls instead of relying solely on police. Overnight, chaos in Seattle. Witnesses say a man was shot after a suspect drove through a crowd of protesters. Video showing the driver get out of his car and brandish what appears to be a gun. Authorities say that suspect is now in custody. The 27-year-old victim in stable condition. The growing scenes of unrest coming amid another night of mostly peaceful protests over the killing of George Floyd. His remains now back in his childhood home of Houston. American flags lining the route to the church or a memorial service will be held in just a few hours. Pastor Mia Wright. Our desire and the Floyd family desire. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, for the first time in three months, New York City is cautiously opening back up. We bent the curve. The city hit hardest by the pandemic is entering the first phase of reopening today. Retail stores open for pickups. Construction and manufacturing can resume. And subways return to regular weekday service. You did the hard work to fight back the coronavirus so we could get to phase one. Just weeks ago, the city was at a breaking point. With hospitals overwhelmed and more than 16,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City alone. But after a strict shutdown, widely available free testing, and increased contact tracing, the, safe of the city has met the criteria needed to start reopening. Phase one may bring as many as 400,000 people back to work in the Big Apple. Companies reopening must limit capacity, frequently clean share hoods where the COVID ravaged are the neighborhood, neighborhoods that had less health care to begin with. That's not a coincidence. That's, that's the fundamental cause of the injustice. And that's what we should be in addressing along with policing issues. And there is a moment to do this. There's a global moment, there's or, or certainly a national moment for that change. Carpe diem, carpe momentum. Seize the moment, there's a moment. Change comes in a moment. When did we pass gun safety? Right after Sandy Hook. Why? Because people said enough is enough. People are saying enough is enough again. Seize the moment and end the systemic injustice inequality. Education, health care, housing, policing, criminal justice. Reopening of New York City. We did it all based on data and facts. There was no political ideology at work here. We're talking about a virus. Uh, the virus doesn't do Democrat, Republican, doesn't do liberal, conservative. Uh, it's based on facts, and we have followed the facts. You look at where we are now with our testing results. On Sunday, we did 58,000 tests across the state. We're at 1.2% positive, the lowest level in the state since March 16th. That's a fact. Uh, over the past, uh, past few days, 58,000 tests we did on Sunday, 1.2% statewide. 
Saturday, 60,000 tests, 1.3. Friday, 77,000 tests, 1.4. Thursday, 66,000 tests. Why are we reopening? Because these numbers say we can. It's no guess. There's no ideology. Based on the numbers, we can reopen. We are doing more tests than any state in the United States. We're doing more tests than any country on the globe per capita. That's why I have confidence saying to 19 million people, we can do this. Based on yesterday, 58,000 tests. That is a lot of tests. That is a large sample. And I feel confident making a decision on these numbers. Now, we can change the numbers, just like we changed the numbers the first time and reduced them. New Yorkers get sloppy. You can see those numbers go back up because they're purely a function of behavior. You tell me what New Yorkers do today, I'll tell you that number tomorrow. And we literally study it on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look uh, at yesterday's numbers, just yesterday, across the state, New York City, nine weeks ago, 59% were testing positive. Four weeks ago, 10% were testing positive. Two weeks ago, 4% were testing positive. Yesterday, 2%. Just yesterday. And you see the other numbers for the other regions. Mid-Hudson, 1%. Long Island, 1%. Western New York, 2%. Capital Region, 1%. That's how we're making decisions. Westchester, Rockland, Hudson Valley will enter phase two tomorrow. Long Island is on track to enter phase two on Wednesday. Uh, what does phase one reopening mean? It means companies, businesses can reopen pursuant to specific guidelines. This is not reckless uh, reopening. We know what happens when that is done. This is by the guidelines. Construction and manufacturing, wear masks, uh, no congregate meetings. On, in terms of businesses, curbside pickup, uh, how curbside pickups happen, in-store in pickup only if curbside is not practical, and that has to be with prearranged orders. You're just going into the store to pick up an order. That's because you can't do curbside. That's all that is. Curbside, obviously, in New York City is a different phenomenon than curbside uh, in other markets with less traffic. Uh, but that's what uh, store shopping is. These guidelines work. They have been enacted in every other region in the state. Those other regions have entered phase one, followed these guidelines, and there has been no spike. We know that it works if it's followed. So the same guidelines apply to New York City. Uh, and if we follow those guidelines in New York City, there should not be a spike, just like there hasn't been a spike across the rest of the state. Uh, we're also going to keep a special eye on New York City to see what happens. We'll do 35,000 tests per day in New York City. Take a snapshot every day. If you see any increase in the infection rate, then react immediately. And 35 tests, 35,000 tests per day is a healthy snapshot, a healthy sample. Uh, and then watch it literally every day and calibrate what you're doing. Again, I'm asking all the protesters to please get tests. That is a new question that has been dropped into the mix. We had all these at-home measures, and then we had thousands of people show up for protests. Did that, inf did that affect the spread of the virus? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, so I'm asking the protesters, please go get a test. It's free. It's available. But there is a chance that you uh, were in proximity to people Again, we've gone through this, what they call a super spreader. One person in a crowd of 100 people can infect dozens. We've seen it. 
so please, we have 15 testing sites in the New York City area that are prioritized just for protesters. We're also focusing on the hotspot neighborhoods in New York. Uh, these are zip codes where we know uh, there is a much higher infection rate than other parts of the city, and it's dramatically high. Overall, the infection rate in New York City is about 19 percent. Some of these communities are over 50 percent. So we're targeting these hot spots, more testing, more treatment in these hot spots, and more awareness. We're also setting up additional testing. Thank you very much, Northwell Health and SOMOS Community Care. More testing sites in those zip code areas for people in those zip codes to get tested. So uh, 240 testing sites alone in New York City. So you can get a test. It doesn't cost anything, and there are 240 sites available, so there's no reason not to do it. There's a website where you can go to the website, punch in your address, find the availability, call, uh, and set it up. I'm asking the protesters to get tested and uh, take as a precaution, act as if you have been exposed, and you may want to tell people that who you're interacting with. Uh, stay away from people who are in a vulnerable population until you take a test and you know that you're not infected. Uh, people in those zip codes where you have that high infection rate, get tested. Get tested. And that's all on that website. Uh, also, as we're working through this, we're going to extend the deadline for filing property taxes, tax abatements by 90 days to give small businesses some assistance. We're going to restart elective surgery and ambulatory care in New York City. Uh, the MTA is reopening. Uh, Romatori asked me on an interview, uh, well, how do you know the subway is going to be safe on reopening day? I said, because if it wasn't safe, I wouldn't ask anyone to go on the subway. I make these decisions, and for me, it's very simple. I just I just assume I'm making the decision for myself and for my children. Uh, and I said to Roma, if uh, the subway isn't safe for me, then I wouldn't ask anyone else to go on the subway. Uh, and today I took a ride on the 7 train. The MTA has done phenomenal work. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, the bad old days in New York City. Uh, and when we would talk about how dirty the cars were and uh, the garbage that was in the subway cars and the stench, frankly, that was in the subway cars, the subway cars are cleaner than they have ever been in my lifetime. I mean, they had to disinfect the subway cars. Just think about it. I mean, it's almost a bizarre task, right? We're going to disinfect a subway car. Uh, so many years, they couldn't figure out how to get the newspapers and the coffee cups out of a subway car. Now they're disinfecting. And they are disinfecting the cars and the stations. Uh, they've done 30,000 station cleaning disinfection, 500,000 subway car cleaning disinfections. They've applied antimicrobial treatment to the surfaces in the subway cars and the stations. They're using UV light technology. Uh, to clean facilities, so they are doing everything they can. We are giving them an additional million masks and 25,000 gallons of, the, of hand sanitizer that we make in the state, 500,000 two-ounce bottles. I think after the ride on the subway, I have about 10 two-ounce bottles that I collected. Uh, masks are mandatory when you are riding public transportation, subway, bus, you're in a station. Stay six feet away when possible. Use the hand sanitizer. Use the hand sanitizer uh, and observe the guidance that is on the trains, et cetera. The MTA is also launching the It's Up to Us New York campaign. Uh, you'll see this if you're riding the subways or the buses. It's up to us. How do you stop the spread? It's what we do. Uh, are the subways safe? It's how we act. Are the sidewalks safe? It's how we act. Right? Uh, if you're wearing the mask, if you're keeping distance, yes, it's safe. But it is a function of us, each one of us. 
and us as a collective. While the ridership has been reduced, uh, there was also an opportunity in the reduced ridership, right? One of the ongoing challenges the MTA has on construction is to do construction, you have to reduce the train usage. You reduce the train usage, you inconvenience commuters. When the ridership was reduced, the MTA smartly increased their construction because the ridership was reduced, so fewer riders were inconvenienced by the construction. Uh, and they accelerated $2 billion in capital projects, uh, rehabilitating the F train, using the lessons they learned in the L train, where I want to applaud Jan Lieber and his team for literally setting a record in smart government construction. Smart government construction does not have to be an oxymoron. You can have smart government construction. Uh, and General Lieber showed that. Uh, they're accelerating 11 ADA stations, 24 new elevators, rehabbing the 130 street, 138th Street Grand Concourse Station, accelerating steel and concrete defects and leaks on the 2345 Eastern Parkway line in Brooklyn. New Yorkers did what many experts told me was impossible, 100 days. I don't think I've had a good night's sleep in 100 days, uh, knowing some of the things they've told me. New Yorkers bent the curve by being smart. We're celebrating, we're back, we're reopening, we're excited, our mojo's back, our energy's back, great. Stay smart, stay smart. Look at facts around us. Other states, the spike is going up. California, the numbers are going up. Florida, the numbers are going up. Texas, the numbers are going up. Look at the reopening date and look at when, what happened after they reopened. That is the cautionary tale, my friends. Gentleman on the subway car just said to me he has family in Arizona, they reopened and they're seeing a spike. He's right. Look at the spike in Arizona. You have to stay smart after the reopening because if you don't, you can see a spike. That is the last thing that we want to see. But I don't believe we will because we are New York tough, smart, right there. Second word, Andrew, smart, right after tough. Smart, united, disciplined. Last word is for me, loving. Questions? Governor, the other states that saw a spike, they don't even have mass transit. They don't have people on the subways. So by definition, given the <coughs> congregate setting of the subway, as clean as it is, don't you expect New York to see a spike in the next two years? Are you a cynic, my friend? Are you a pessimist, my friend? I am not. The subway has been open all during this time. For 100 days, the subway has been open. We had the highest infection rate in the country. We had the highest number of cases in the country. We had the highest hospitalization rate in the country. Subways were opened. We went from that point 100 days ago to now one of the lowest infection rates and one of the best downward spirals with the subway. If we stay as smart as disciplined as we've been for the past 100 days, we will be fine. If we change our behavior, if we revert, if we get sloppy, if we get cocky, if we get a little arrogant, then we'd have a problem. But we're not going to do that because we're smart. But even good behavior, people in masks on a train, <coughs> if the ridership ticks up just a little bit, they're not six feet apart. People are in the same car and they're unable to maintain If they're the using the sanitizer, they're using the masks, it will be okay. Governor, Governor I wanted to ask you about taking the lead the, now in terms of passing police reform. Excuse me one second. If we're going to have a problem, the variable here is, did the protests have an effect? I don't know. Uh, and I don't want to speculate. That's why I'm asking them to actually get 
tests. But uh, we'll have the masks, masks for all essential workers, and if we keep the discipline and the intelligence, we'll be fine. I'm sorry, Zach. No, the, the state finally taking the lead passing these bills, as you know, some of which have been bottled up for many years, but they've, but they've been available. They're now actually going to pass them probably by Wednesday, I'm told. Do you think the department itself has to do its own internal reforms? Would you like to see changes <clears throat> within the NYPD itself to go a step further? And you think the current leadership team there is up to doing that? The Look, mayors run their local police departments. I think this is a wake-up call, or not a wake-up call, this is a transition, transformation moment across the country. Uh, people are saying it has to stop, we have to change, right? When they're saying defund the police, what are they saying? They're saying we want fundamental, basic change when it comes to policing. Uh, and they're right. They are right. They're saying, Mr. Floyd, Mr. Garner, Mr. Luima, Mr. Diallo, enough is enough. Uh, so they're right. Our state legislative packages will do that. But I also believe you'll see that in every police department that is now operating. They understand they're operating in a different reality. Uh, with different perceptions and different mandates. So I think you will see a shift all across police departments. I think police departments that don't hear it and don't get it are going to have a real problem. And the political leadership of that police department will have a problem, right? Uh, and those local mayors, you look at what's happening in, in Minneapolis now. Uh, so I think the mayor, as the elected official, uh, they will they will get the message and then it's going to be up to them whether or not their police department has done it now I would like to see us actually go further than that Zach because yes there's discrimination institutionalized in society and it's manifested in the policing criminal justice system but it's worse than that it's actually worse than that education is where it starts Housing is where it starts. Health care is where it starts. You want to make a difference in America. You want to live up to the American promise, the American dream. Let America be America again. Every child is, has a quality education. Not two educations separate but equal, separate but unequal. Equal education for every child. Not the poor children, even in this state. Poor schools, $13,000 per student. Rich schools, $36,000 per student. How? How? Equal opportunity. We have equal opportunity. Oh, really? My child starts out $13,000 for education. Your child starts out $36,000 for education. My child comes from a poor zip code less social services, more problems in the community, often more problems in the household, and that child gets less education and less services. Equal opportunity. No, and look, we have been talking about this for decades, and that's where it starts. And the, the fundamental insanity, you're spending $50,000 a year on a prison cell it's more than the tuition in Harvard University. I mean, how long have we been talking about this? It's a reverse set of priorities. Governor, I want to ask you about police reform and mainly how the police unions factor into that. Do you view police, the police unions as being more of a, making it more difficult, hindering police reform? Look, every union argues the interest of their employees, their workforce, right? Uh, when you go to make education reform, you hear from the teachers union. When you, go to hear reform, when you go to reform the mental health system, you hear from CSEA, right? When you go to reform government, you hear from PEF. Uh, you go to reform construction labor, you hear from the uh, construction and labor unions. So they're arguing from <coughs> Uh, their their employees point of view I understand that 
uh, 58, police unions are saying if you release personnel records, you may jeopardize their privacy. That's a point. Uh, and uh, the bill has privacy protection in it. But uh, my point on 50A, uh, which I know the police unions are not happy about, look, all it's, all it's doing is reversing an exemption on police records. So now a police employee, police officer, is like a school teacher, is like a DC 37 worker, is like a CSEA worker. It's just parity and equality with every other public employee. It's nothing punitive to police. You know, they're saying, well, in that file, uh, it will release just complaints. If I just sent a complaint letter about a police officer, it'll be released. Yes. But if I sent a complaint letter about uh, a toll taker, if I sent a complaint, complaint letter about a school teacher, it's going to be released. So it's just fairness and equity across the board. What would you say about other unions across the country, not just in New York, not just tethered to 50A? Do you think that that sort of reverberates through other unions? Do you think other unions pose any sort of difficulty, or is there a role for them in police reform? Well, of course there's a role in police reform for the unions. And I think the unions will bring the perspective of the police officer to the table, as they should, because when you make any decision, when you're going through reform, you want to make sure you understand all the issues and all the perspectives and then pick the right path. But everybody has a perspective here, right? Uh, everybody has an interest. Uh, so listen to all voices and pick the right, just path. Now, this is a hyper, uh, hyper emotional issue. I get that. But, uh, and people have very strong opinions, but that's the art form of government, right? We passed uh, gun safety reform. People were, we had thousands of protesters. I had hundreds of death threats on gun safety. Everybody has a point. Everybody has an argument. You can't make everybody happy, but it's not about making everybody happy. But it is about hearing all sides. That's what it is about. Yes. Thank you, Governor. My question is about the protest. Um, we hear you adamantly ask the protesters to get tested. You even put special sites for the protesters. Is your message uh, as adamant to police officers? Because we've seen every day that there's a lot of police officers who are not wearing masks. Um, the police officers, <coughs> police officers should be wearing masks. Uh, the police officers are getting tested. I encourage them to get tested. We have testing available for essential workers where they're prioritized. Uh, so yes, the same message to the protesters is the message to the police. Uh, I've had these conversations with the police, however, several times. Uh, because the police were out there uh, as essential workers early on all through this. So we started a tremendous amount of testing with the police force weeks ago when this first started. Governor, Governor, can I ask you about reopening? When do you expect phase two in the city? And you say New York is back. There are boarded up stores across the city. How will they affect New York actually coming back to what it was? Look, we had a terrible night. Uh, the night of looting in this city. It was terrible. It was destructive. It was frightening. Uh, it was bad for the city in a number of ways. I think it scared city residents. And that it scared city residents at a bad time because we're already going through COVID and people were nervous about the city, about the density, about the numbers. And then you see this night of looting, which just looked like the city was out of control. Uh, and it was bad for the communities we're trying to help. You know, people see the pictures of, of looters uh, running up and down Madison Avenue in Manhattan. There weren't as many pictures, but there was just as much activity on, in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and in Queens. 
destroying mom and pop businesses that ha are struggling on a good day, uh, destroying businesses that are providing needed services to poor communities. Uh, so the looting was very bad. It wasn't the fault of the protesters. Some people try to put the protesters as looters. Yeah, that would be a way to dismiss the protesters, but it's not true. It's not the fault of the police officers, right? Uh, the police officers, uh, it's not their issue. Police officers in this city are the best police organization in the country, I believe, 36,000 strong. They've handled many difficult nights in this city. I said it was the management of the police. It was the management and the deployment. You have to have enough police deployed. Uh, I don't send state police somewhere unless I have enough state police to do the job. Otherwise, it's dangerous for, for everyone. So I said it was about the management and deployment. It wasn't the protesters. It wasn't the, uh, the police uh, officers themselves. Uh, but it's over. It was a bad night. Uh, I took action. The mayor took action. It's over. And it hasn't happened again. And the protests have been largely peaceful. There's been some issues. But there's been no looting, right? There's protesters and the issues around protesters, and then there's looting. There has been no looting. So the boarded up stores from the looting, that was one night. It was arrested, it stopped, it's over. Governor, can that fear, that lingering fear, impacts a comeback, a full comeback? I think the looting was one night. It was a bad night, but it was one night, right? And I think New Yorkers know how to calibrate this. Uh, and look, uh, also, you know, honesty works, right? <laughs> You can't, you can't get away with uh, inauthenticity in this city. It was a bad night, bad two nights. There was some looting actually two nights. Yeah, it was bad, but I said it was bad. And I said it had to stop and it had to stop now. And it was a management deployment issue of the police uh, and the management uh, acted differently, and the deployment was different, and it stopped. So it wasn't good, but I think it was addressed honestly. It was addressed effectively. And uh, over the past several nights, we haven't seen any looting. So I think New Yorkers are past that. Governor, Governor can you tell us about your evolution and thinking on 50A? You've in the past somewhat resisted calls to reform or repeal or amend it. I asked you a question about this uh, about a week ago, and uh, you weren't obviously nowhere near as definitive as you are today and, and in the last couple of days. So tell me what, what it's taken to get you What forward. did I say to you when you asked me the first time? I said, there's no need to change 50A because 50A does not do what the local governments say that it does. That's true. Uh, Remember, New York City used to release the disciplinary records. They released them. Then they stopped. When they stopped, they said, oh, it's illegal because of 50A. No, because 50A was in existence when you released them. Well, how did you release them if 50A stopped you? But you're thinking, so that is, that's a very good paraphrase of what you said. We yes. But, and then I said the council's letter saying 50A doesn't stop you. But it was clear that they're not going to do it. Do I believe 50A is a straw man to, for local governments? Yes. But even as a straw man, okay, we'll knock it down as a straw man. Governor, two on the MTA. Um, one, one Ask you, Jano a tough question. Yeah, well, this one's for you. Uh, one, one uh, what's, when it are never you going works. to send the mayor's board appointees or nominees to the As Senate? soon as the Senate starts taking up confirmations, I'll send them. Okay, so you're intending to do that in the coming month, week? What's the 
Yeah, as soon as they take up uh, confirmations. Confirmations are a different function for the State Senate. Uh, but as soon as they start confirming, I'll send them. I have a batch of confirmations that are backed up. And then the Blasio today announced 20 miles of bus lanes. MTA has called for 60 miles. Uh, when it comes to reopening and re you know, seizing the moment on the city streets like other cities across the world have done, do you think that the mayor is doing enough? Do you think city officials are doing enough to not just get buses moving, but open up spaces for restaurants and really reform the way that the street space looks in the city? Well, look, you're factually right. The MTA estimated and requested 60 miles of bus lanes. I haven't heard the mayor's announcement, uh, but obviously uh, there's a disparity between what the MTA asked for and uh, what the mayor's doing. You want to comment on that? No, I think we are, are, from the MTA standpoint, tw 20, miles is a 20 miles of bus lanes is a step in the right direction, but we asked for 60 for a reason which is that we really want to speed service so everybody can get more frequent service and we can accommodate the growth as the governor sets the economy back in motion and to maintain social distance to the extent possible. And then if I may, uh, you announced that Jano is, Jano's team is accelerating a lot of projects at the MTA, but the whole capital plan that we're entering hinges on congestion pricing. Is there any update on that and whether or not we're going to move that across the finish line this year? Who's we? You. Pale face. The uh, federal government has to, has to approve the congestion pricing plan. Uh, I have spoken to the federal government about it. MTA has spoken to the federal government about it. Uh, the MTA has not approved the congestion pricing plan. Uh, why not? You'd have to ask the federal government. I don't believe they have a bona fide reason. Uh, but why haven't they approved congestion pricing? I have no idea. Why haven't they approved the Hudson, Cross Hudson tunnels? Why haven't they approved the air train from LaGuardia? Why haven't they approved the extension of the Second Avenue subway to 125th Street? Why did they pass SALT, which penalized New Yorkers and increased the ta taxes of New Yorkers, who were already contributing more to the federal government than anyone else? I don't know. Okay, guys, thank you. We're going to work. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, President Trump is facing a growing chorus of criticism from former military leaders. We have a constitution and we have to follow that constitution. And the president's drifted away from it. Over the weekend, retired Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell joining that list and blasting the president. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people would not hold him accountable. Powell, a frequent Trump critic who served four presidents, three Republican and one Democrat, and who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, endorsed Joe Biden over the weekend, getting and, emotional and when talking about how he says the world now views the United people. States. Are we insulting everybody? Are we going after immigrants? Um, they don't understand this. I'm the son of immigrants. I wouldn't be here if my parents couldn't come here in banana boats in the 1920s. This is America. This is who we are. And the world doesn't understand. Mr. Trump fired back, calling Powell highly overrated. As for the 2020 race, in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, Biden leads President Trump nationally by seven points among all registered voters, 49 percent to 42 percent. That's unchanged from April's poll. While Biden is up eight points against the president among voters in the top battleground states, 50 to 42. As for the state of the nation, 80 percent of Americans say the country is out of control amid the aftermath of the the death of George Floyd and the coronavirus pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr out front over the weekend, defending the use of force to clear Lafayette Park last Monday night, which set the stage for President Trump's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church. They were not peaceful protests. But witnesses say the protesters were peaceful. Barr also rejecting what many protesters see as the root of the problem. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. 
Now, overnight, 4,900 National Guard troops started to leave Washington, D.C. at President Trump's order. The president tweeting the troops can, quote, return quickly if needed. The president also saying the protests have been under perfect control, his words. Joining those protests over the weekend, one of his biggest Republican critics, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who told NBC News Black Lives Matter. Romney is also signaling he likely won't support Mr. Trump in the fall. We are listening. I am listening. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is changing the league's message, releasing this video statement late Friday. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. The exact same language star NFL players asked the league to use the day before. We will not be silenced. We assert our right to peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. Goodell's message of unity comes after comments made by one of the NFL's biggest stars exposed the league's deep divisions. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Drew Brees apologized twice after he said players shouldn't protest police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. I am sorry, and I will do better. The New Orleans Saints quarterback also promising to listen more and be part of the solution. President Trump now weighing in, going after Goodell overnight, tweeting, could it be even remotely possible that Goodell was intimating that it would now be okay for players to kneel? And Brees over the weekend, posting... He should not have taken back his original stance. Bree's hitting back, posting on Instagram, To Donald Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. The president echoing his comments in 2016, when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee protesting police brutality. Kaepernick never played in the NFL again after that season. Knees usually taken out of reverence. Former Green Beret and Seattle Seahawks player Nate Boyer is the person responsible for suggesting kneeling as a protest to Kaepernick. Kneeling was born out of a, a middle ground, you know, um, two people that disagreed on a lot, but it's two people that were willing to just have a conversation and listen. So, Steph, uh, Goodell didn't directly address the kneeling during the anthem, but what do you think is going to happen with the upcoming season and those protests? What will we see? Yeah, Hoda, his statement is vague, although a lot of people have interpreted it as a green light for kneeling. You know, there have been a handful of players who say when they come back, that's exactly what they're, do they're going to do, including running back Adrian Peterson. He thinks that kneeling could potentially save lives and create change. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. Prince Andrew was seen on social media in May when his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson posted this Instagram picture with the caption, so proud of our loving family. But in an interview in December, Virginia Jufri claimed she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and abused by Prince Andrew when she was 17, just days after this picture was taken. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Prince Andrew says he has no recollection of meeting her. His own interview last year was widely criticised for the way he talked about Epstein. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And he would only say he might talk to authorities. If push came to shove and the legal, <coughs> the legal advice was to do so, then I would be duty-bound to do so. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ the are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew since he stepped down as a working royal.
So, so Kier, if Prince Andrew doesn't have anything to hide, why, why not just agree to that interview with authorities here? Uh-huh. That's a great question, Craig, not least because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give uh, evidence under uh, oath. Uh, But that said, you and I both know that uh, you should be careful when you're talking about legal conversations that are taking place behind closed doors, private conversations. We don't know the details. That said, the optics are terrible for the royal family, aren't they? Uh, One final uh, note, uh, Craig. Prince Andrew's interview, television interview last year, widely believed to have gone really, really badly. Perhaps his legal advisers are concerned about how it would go if he did sit down in front of seasoned prosecutors. Yeah, no. After months of trying to beat back coronavirus, a wave of businesses reopening, beaches buzzing, and most recently protests erupting are taking a toll. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the large gatherings pose a significant threat. It's a delicate balance because the reasons for demonstrating are valid, and yet the demonstration itself puts one at an additional risk. This morning, 20 states showing an upward swing in cases over the last two weeks. Texas, California, Florida, and Missouri among them. A rise stretching back to a very social Memorial Day holiday. The weather got nice outside, people start to go back outside. We did relax a lot of our social distancing in those states, and here we go. Cases start to pick up. No justice! Massive demonstrations in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death, only heightening concerns. A new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 66% of respondents are uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large group. Even as some healthcare workers step out into the streets to protest injustice. I don't know that COVID is really in the back of my mind when I'm out there. I'm really thinking about the issue at hand, which is making sure that justice is served and something like this never happens again. A powerful movement sweeping the nation as New York City reopens its economy for the first time today. We're going to open 15 sites that are dedicated just to protesters to get a test so you can get it on an expeditious basis. But please get a test. Testing in college sports also raising red flags as athletes return for preseason training. According to multiple reports, several University of Alabama football players have the virus, and Auburn University acknowledges three of its players tested positive too. An Oklahoma state linebacker even tweeting, after attending a protest and being well protective of myself, he has COVID-19. And that player also tweeting he was completely asymptomatic. Now the University of Alabama is arguably the most prominent football program in the country They have not confirmed yet those cases of coronavirus, but have said the health and safety of student athletes is their top priority. And they ensuring that those players, student athletes, get the best possible medical care when they return to campus. Kennedy Kane is a fighter. And that's lucky because at 16, she's not only a straight A student at Cass Tech, one of the best public high schools in Detroit, she's running a makeshift school on a single borrowed computer for her four siblings. Kenneth, Keenan, Kenye, and Kendall. After nearly a month without any assignments, her school launched an online platform. But Kennedy says that hasn't made it easier. Not only is this new to us, but it's new to the teachers as well. And sometimes the teachers have difficulties when they're trying to program it. And then they assign it as if they know that everyone has availability or the opportunity to have technology in their home when that's not the case. So it's kind of frustrating. When schools closed, only 10% of Detroit public school students had access to a computer and the internet, which is deeply troubling to Dr. Nikolai Viti. Three years ago, he became superintendent, inheriting a system long on promise and short on resources. So, Dr. Vitti, what was the state of the Detroit public school system before the coronavirus? Enrollment was up for the first time in over a decade. Uh, Student achievement defined by state and national test scores showed improvement. Equally important, the teacher vacancy rate, which had dogged the city, had improved by 75 percent. 
God put me on this earth to teach. I absolutely love it. Detroit native Casey Edgar teaches 11th grade math at King High, and she says most of her nearly 150 students are less and less committed to school. How come your camera is not on? The first week I was in touch with, I would say 50 to 60%, and now it's about running at about 20%. What percentage of your students do you think are actually doing the work? Like right about 10%. That's not very many. No, not very many at all. Like many places around the country, little learning has taken place for Detroit public school students since March. So instead of adding and subtracting, we're going to be multiplying. Okay. There's no denying there is a digital divide in America. Just seven miles from downtown Detroit, the Gross Point South High School had a computer in every kid's hands who needed one almost immediately after the shutdown. So before COVID-19, I did not have a laptop. I was issued a laptop uh, right after its school ended. Xavier Prater is a dedicated student. We just log in and then go to our remote learning resources. Xavier will be a senior next year and dreams of going to UCLA. He is well on his way with lots of support. Little surprise, participation in online classes in Gross Point is 95% much higher than it is just a zip code away in Detroit, where it's only 50%. A reflection, some say, of deeply rooted systemic racism. The numbers tell at least part of the story. In Detroit, median household income is about $30,000. The population is nearly 80% black. In Gross Point, median income is just over $100,000, with a black population of 2%. So is the digital divide in Detroit a racial divide as well? Absolutely. The haves are receiving more than the have-nots. We already know children are coming in at a disadvantage with fewer resources than middle class, upper middle class students, but our public school system should be the great equalizer in giving an equal opportunity for children, but in, instead it actually exacerbates the divide that already exists. Detroit is getting a big boost with a $23 million gift from local businesses to give every student a laptop. But that won't happen until summer, long after the school year ends. We can anticipate most students losing six months of where they would have been had we been in school. Six months behind can be a knockout punch for kids already struggling with an achievement gap. Not because they aren't as smart, not because they aren't willing to work as hard, just because of where they live. Gross Point is right next to us, and they, have, they got resources the second this pandemic started. Their educational system isn't lacking as much as we are. And it's just like, wow, why can't we be like that? Or why can't we step in and uh, give to our students like they are? Because our students are no different from theirs. So I asked Kennedy where her incredible courage and her wisdom came from. She says her working mother, who she calls a superhero. And one final point, Brown and Harvard did a study uh, after the coronavirus hit of math around the country, looking at just under a million students. And here's what they found. In the most, the poor zip codes, the math learning had, had been reduced by about 50%. And in the wealthiest zip codes, no learning loss. So the, if, even if the kids get these laptops, though, what about what about the digital divide as it pertains to, to Internet access as well? Yeah, that's part of it. And in fact, the, these laptops are going to come with Internet access Excellent. because that is absolutely a problem. Craig. Yeah. And I remember we did that story of that family that actually got in their car, remember, and drove to where there was Internet access. But you can't believe that people live blocks apart and have that disparity. That was fascinating. Cynthia, thank you. Welcome back to the third hour of today. Hard to believe, but it's been more than three months since 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery was shot and killed while his family said he was out for a jog in Georgia. Chanel? Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan are all charged with murder. The McMichaels told police they thought Arbery was a burglary suspect and claimed they acted in self-defense. Last week, prosecutors made some troubling new claims and a judge ruled there is enough evidence now for a trial. This morning, we're joined by Ahmad Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper-Jones, and her lawyer, Lee Merritt. Good morning to both of you. 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's dig in here. Uh, Wanda, last week or during the testimony, uh, the, the judge revealed or they revealed that one of the defendants, Travis McMichael, uttered a racial slur after Ahmad was killed. And of course, this is getting a lot of buzz because of the implications of that. You were in that courtroom. What did you think uh, when you heard that? And how significant is this finding to you? It was it, it was shocking to know that someone could actually take a life and still not have any remorse in the last minutes of their life. Well, Lee, Lee, let me ask you a question. Georgia, to that point, Georgia is one of the few states in the country that does not have a hate crime statute. So, so how does that affect this case? Well, it moves us closer to the intent that we need for to meet the standard for the, the murder charge that he, these men are charged with. Each man in this case is charged with felony murder. And so if they have some sort of justification defense, it's undermined by the use of a racial slur while standing over the dead body. And, and when an arrest was made in Ahmad's case almost three months after he was killed. A Waycross district attorney recused himself from the case uh, because of his ties to the McMichaels, the accused. But in a letter, he stated there was insufficient probable cause to issue arrest warrants and that under, quote, Georgia law, Travis McMichael was allowed to use deadly force to protect himself. Well, now the current state's attorney general has requested an investigation into how the case was handled. What are your thoughts about all this? It seems like there's a lot going on here. Yeah, well, the state attorney, George Barnhill, uh, he, he obviously, uh, he tried to paint this as just some men trying to protect their neighborhood and, and really went a long way to, to normalize the behavior. But now that there's a second set of eyes on it, now that there's overview from the DOJ and the family has worked very closely with Bobby Christine from the Southern U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District. Uh, and they're really looking at the federal hate crime protections for the family and the uh, and other federal protections, not only for the men who assaulted Ahmad, assaulted and murdered Ahmad, but also for the system, the district attorneys, the Glen County Police Department that seem to cover it up for them. And, and Wanda, you and Lee are headed to uh, Houston to attend George Floyd's funeral tomorrow. Uh, Wanda, what, what do you want to say to the Floyd family? The worst would be that I'm sorry that this has happened. I was hoping when this happened to Ahmad back in February that this would bring an end to some of this, some of these type of events. But unfortunately, it happened again so quickly. It wasn't even three months and we had the same type of situation again. And this must and this must stop. Wanda, on that note, I know on Friday you reached out to Brianna's uh, Taylor's mother on what would have been her 27th birthday. Uh, of course, Brianna was shot and killed when Louisville police officers executed a no knock warrant uh, back in March. Why is it so important for you to reach out? And what was that conversation like with Brianna's mom? Basically, I shared a video. I didn't have the conversation that I wanted to have. But it was very important to me to reach out because I know her pain, because I share the same pain. I mean, we lost our child. That type of pain, you don't know that pain until you experience it firsthand. Ahmad had a birthday back in May. And it, it, it was very difficult. And I had to reach out because I knew Friday was going to be very difficult for Ms. Taylor. There have been a lot of tears, Wanda. I can understand, uh, you know, I can't understand how you guys are feeling, but I know uh, a lot of us have, have cried a lot over the past couple of weeks. I'm interested on your take when you see the news headlines and you see these powerful pictures. You have demonstrators around the country and frankly, not even around the country, around the world, standing up against police brutality, racial inequality. They're chanting the names of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and your son, Ahmaud Arbery. What do you think of when you see the crowds and crowds of people around the world? And are you hopeful for change today? Very, very hopeful. 
Um, seeing the demonstrations, it, it offers strength. Um, it lets me know that I'm not standing alone. Um, it shows me that someone cared. In the beginning, in the first stages of this, I I had I was the only voice that, that spoke of Ahmad. And now I have people that that are chanting his name. It really gives basically it gives me strength. Mm. Wanda, you know, we've seen these pictures. We've seen the, that lovely portrait of your son, and then we've seen the struggle right before the end of his life. And that, that's pretty much what we know about him. Can you share with us what you'd like us to know about Ahmad? Ahmad was loved. Ahmad loved, and he was loved by many. Ahmad was caring. Ahmad was kind. Ahmad had goals, he had ambitions. And back in February, that was all taken away from him. Uh, Lee, let me ask you a question. With, with everything that's going on, uh, and, and we're talking about uh, systemic change, hopefully, and that there's there's been talk about dismantling of, of or the reimagining of police departments. Do you see some good coming out of this uh, when, when all is said and done? Absolutely. And in particular, in the case of Ahmad, it, the, the tragedy of Ahmad's case is not only what happened to him, but at the hands of evil men, but the system that seemed to justify this behavior. So it's causing people all over the country to say, maybe we really need to look back at the laws, look at the systems that we have in place, and to ensure that nothing like this actually happens again. It's important that all these cases are tied together, because now we can go further up the river and look at the systematic change that needs to take place from, from new laws to new policies to new elected officials. It, it's a really important revolutionary time. Well, we want to thank both of you for being with us this morning. Uh, it's uh, I know this is going to be a difficult couple of days. You'll be reliving that, Wanda, as you go to visit uh, George Floyd's uh, funeral. But uh, we appreciate it, and we thank you for taking time. We're joined now by former NBA player Stephen Jackson, a close friend of George Floyd. Uh, he joins us from Houston, Texas. Stephen, good to see you again. Thanks for your time this morning. Morning, my guy. How you doing? Doing okay. Doing okay. But before we start talking about what's going to happen in Houston, I want to ask you about uh, Gianna, George Floyd's six-year-old daughter. Of course, that image uh, that we saw last week of her on your shoulders is as she's shouting, "Daddy changed the world." How's she doing? She's doing as good as possible. Um, for a six years old, for a six-year-old, she's very intelligent and she knows everything that's going on. And we, need, she needs a lot of prayer. Um, She's definitely scarred. She did what? See that? Everybody. Uh, it's been frustrating even for me, and she she's not doing too well. But for a six years old, she's strong as possible. She's got uh, she's got quite the village around her too. Um, we have seen over the last 13 days massive protests, not just here in, in, in this country, but, but really all over the world. You and George Floyd, you weren't just friends. You guys look so much alike. Uh, you called him your twin. What, what do you think your twin would, would say about what we've seen play out over, over the world over, the, over nearly two weeks now? Well, I know he would be saying this right now. Y'all put your knee on my neck and kill me, but you didn't know I had a twin who was a celebrity and that was going to ride for me to the end. The world didn't know that. The police didn't know that. They didn't know he had a friend like me that was a celebrity and that was a twin brother that was going to ride for him. Now I got the world behind me. And I just I said it earlier, I got more power than Joe Biden and Trump right now because people know I stand for love. I done told every race I loved them and meant it, and every race has told me the same, and I believe it. And I got everybody standing side by side, spreading love and trying to push out and trying to get justice for my brother. And people seen that. And people seen the cruelty and the hate from that man. And there's more people that stand for love than hate. And as you see that now, 50 states, 18 countries coming together, we can't be stopped. You mentioned uh, President Trump. The president uh, talked about George Floyd on Friday in that Rose Garden address. And I want to make sure I get, get it right. The president said, quote, hopefully George is looking down right now and saying this is a great thing that's happening uh, for our country. When the president said that, what did you think? I just thought he could have picked a better choice of words. Um, it's, it's more than going on than, than thinking my brother's looking down happy at this. But 
he should be saying more things on how to bring this country together, how to help policing, how to help get justice for 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 for, for black folks and for and equal rights. It's a lot of things he could be, he could be talking about instead of making jokes. This is the same president that said, "Next time y'all putting them in the car, move your hands so they can hit their head." Like. He, the world has lost common sense, and I think the president, just as well as other people, need to be more cautious of their words at this time. Show, show more, show more empathy for the family, and uh, and uh, and use your words carefully. But the things he's saying right now is not what you need to be saying. I'm no, I'm not the only person that was upset with that. There, there have been, as you know now, um, a number of, of policy suggestions. Among them, calls to defund police departments uh, all over this country. Minneapolis over the weekend voting to disband their police department. I know that George's brother is going to be testifying before Congress later this week. Specifically, Stephen, what what kinds of policies would you like to see put in place? Well, first, I want people to come back to common sense. The world has lost common sense. It's easy to see when somebody is being treated wrong. And we just want equality. It's, it's, there's a lot of policies in place that give these policemen the comfortability to just murder people and do things because they don't they don't deal with the repercussions or they don't deal with the same punishments that we deal with. Obviously, we need to change that, and we and, and we need to put more people um, from from neighborhoods that they police. And they need to be from these neighborhoods. A lot of times, when you get police that's from these neighborhoods, they they will be slow to act in violent ways. They can easily call somebody from their family because they went to school with them. We need more police that 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 police the areas that they grew up in. And we won't have as much violence because they know people and they're familiar with the areas. You are there in Houston right now. There's going to be a, a public memorial uh, today, a private funeral tomorrow. H- how is your friend going to be remembered there in Houston? Oh, um, man, I, I, I've been right in the neighborhood, right on the, on the corner where he's uh, where he grew up and where he's been all his life for the last two to three days. And the, the, the cry, outcry of support is unbelievable. Everybody knew George. He was a great guy. Uh, he was a legend in this city, man. And this way, he needs to be laid to rest. Um, it's, it's, it's a crazy feeling because a lot of people that he grew up with, went to high school with, I don't know if they're going to be able to make it to the funeral. But George is love. George, George is a hood guy, man. They love George here because of his heart and how much love he showed around the city, man. And, and people just want to get this done the right way. But one thing about it. I'm not done. We're not done. We're going to continue to fight for justice. We got a march in Minnesota Thursday. My brother's name is going to be the name of change. When you hear George Floyd, it will be the name of change. Stephen Jackson uh, on his friend George Floyd. Stephen, thank you. Thank you for your time. We are back 842 now with an inspiring groundbreaker, Savannah. Yes, she is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She's a former prosecutor, a mother, and once confirmed, she will make history as the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court. We're going to talk with her in just a moment. But first, her story. 39-year-old Fabiana Pierre-Louis wasn't always sure she wanted to be a lawyer, but now she's a judicial trailblazer. It is extremely humbling to be nominated, and I am beyond excited and enthusiastic. Governor Phil Murphy nominating Pierre Louis to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey, the first black woman in its history. There is no better meeting of an individual and the times. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, the first black woman to hold statewide office in New Jersey, singing her praises. She is proof of what is possible when one does not limit themselves to what others think they can do because of their station in life. Pierre Louis has traveled a long road to reach the state's highest bench. Her parents, Joseph and Claire, emigrated from Haiti. He worked as a cab driver. She worked in a hospital. Pierre Louis started life in a cramped Brooklyn apartment, shared with seven relatives before her family moved to New Jersey. There, she graduated Rutgers Law School and became an assistant U.S. attorney, heading up offices in Trenton and Camden. And on Friday, she walked into history. Standing here today, I know that I have truly lived and continue to live the American dream that my parents came to this country in search of. And Fabiana Pierre-Louis joins us now. Good morning. I feel like I should call you Madam Justice, but I know you have to wait and get confirmed first. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What was it like to get that call from Governor Murphy and and when it really soaked in what this means to be the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court? 
Well, it was, it's such an honor to be nominated to the state's highest court. Um, I, in, in, I feel incredibly blessed, and I am fortunate that Governor Murphy um, saw in me the, 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 the experience and had the faith in me to nominate me to the court. Um, I pri practiced private practice, public service, and I think, you know, it's, it's such a phenomenal opportunity to serve the state of New Jersey. I began my career with the Supreme Court of New Jersey as a law clerk to Justice John Wallace Jr. And the idea that I may one day sit in the same seat that he occupied is just unbelievable. I was thinking about that. I wondered if you in your law clerk days, if you ever even let yourself dream of something like this. And how about your parents? You know, here they are. They're immigrants from Haiti. They really embody the American dream. You embody the American dream. What did they think when you told them the news? My parents were speechless. <laughs> they, they're so <laughs> overjoyed and so happy and so proud. And I think there were just so many emotions that they, they are, they continue to experience after realizing the magnitude of this nomination. So uh, they're just extremely proud and, and happy. You know, this nomination was in the works long before this particular cultural moment that we're in. But you are, as the governor said, so well suited to it. You worked as a federal prosecutor. You worked and were in charge of the criminal division in, in some of the toughest cities in New Jersey. What do you think this movement will mean to the system? So again, you know, it, it's it's incredibly humbling um, and an honor to be nominated to the Supreme Court. You know, if confirmed, um, if I do break that barrier and become the first black woman to sit on the court, I just hope to be an inspiration to future generations. I know how important it is for young people to see people that look like them, who have similar backgrounds as them, in leadership positions. So I, I just truly hope to be an inspiration to others and, and I look to bring a diverse perspective to the court. Well, uh, we know you're a hard worker. You're a mom of two young sons. <laughs> um, you, as I said, you've been practicing law all these years. What, are your, what do your kids think about mom becoming a Supreme Court justice? So my, my sons, Robbie and Mark, they're seven and four, so they don't quite understand the particulars <laughs> of the judiciary system, but they, they were thrilled to meet the governor on Friday, and they thought it was really cool to <laughs> see themselves on the news. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have a concept of what a judge is, so they, they, they think it's pretty exciting. Uh, it is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis, thank you so much. I was going to say, maybe, as I'm, I know, I'm a mom of little kids. It would be nice to have that gavel. Bring a gavel home and see if you need. Sometimes, sometimes moms need to lay down the law, too. <laughs> It's that's funny. We actually have a, a couple of foam gavels at home, so they often joke and bang the foam gavels and say order in the court. So that's how I explain to them that I might be becoming a judge. <laughs> Oh, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. We'll continue to follow your incredible story. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. From New York to Minneapolis, Atlanta to Seattle, healthcare workers take a knee for racial injustice. Many crossing from the front line of a pandemic to the forefront of a national protest. On days when Dr. Brian Leva isn't working in a hospital, he's wearing his white coat on Minneapolis streets. This isn't just a black issue, this is a human rights issue. And it is also a public health crisis. Providing protesters with band-aids for blisters, water to stay hydrated. I carry an epinephrine pen in case somebody has an allergy attack. I carry aspirin. You know, I carry gloves. And because of the pandemic, I also carried a mask. Health experts warn protests could be the perfect recipe for spreading the deadly virus. Massive crowds, a lack of social distancing, many without masks could spark a second wave. It's a risk registered nurse Anna Maria Ruiz is willing to take. She's treating COVID-19 patients in Austin, Texas, and says marching is an essential job, too, for saving future lives. Everybody needs to take part. Everybody needs to participate because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take every single person to to bring about this change. Dr. Natalia Dorf Biderman came in on her day off to be part of this moment with her Minneapolis colleagues. I felt so compelled to be part of um, the, uh, the voice of healthcare. And in New York City, nurse practitioner Julius Johnson marches in between treating patients. Not While he me. protects against COVID exposure, Not he believes police brutality Not is an me. equal public health risk. Not I work alongside physicians, um, physician assistants, certified nursing assistants. Any of these people that hear this, I can't breathe, are going to go help. Are you at all worried about the repercussions of what might come? Absolutely. The problem is, is that if we decided to just stay home and COVID didn't kill us, then the situation that you see with George Floyd, situation that you see with Ahmaud Aubrey, situations you see with all of these people repeatedly, it may happen. Providers working to heal a national pain, this time outside the halls of medicine. Katie Beck, NBC News. From the president who declared this. I am your president of law and order. A new order. President Trump withdrawing 4,900 National Guard troops on duty in Washington, D.C. And writing, now that everything is under perfect control, they will be going home, but can quickly return if needed. New today, Attorney General William Barr rejected what many protesters are marching to change. That racism is rooted in institutions like law enforcement. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. Tomorrow, the president will host a meeting at the White House with law enforcement from local, state and federal agencies. This past week, the president's call to dominate the streets brought out a barrage of criticism from former four-star generals, some who even advised Mr. Trump. And now former Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell said President Trump crossed a line. We have a constitution and we have to follow that constitution and the president's drifted away from it. 
Powell, who served four presidents, three Republicans and one Democrat, today endorsed Joe Biden after supporting Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in the past three contests. President Trump fired off tweets calling the decorated commander and former Bush Secretary of State highly overrated and a real stiff who was very responsible for getting us into the disastrous Middle East wars. Powell's opposition to Trump is well known. Today, his criticism was about standing up to power. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people will not hold him accountable. And Kelly joins us now. Kelly, Joe Biden is going to meet with the family of George Floyd. Tomorrow, he is going to fly to Houston, Texas, to offer his condolences in person. He'll also be making a video message for Tuesday's funeral, but he won't be staying himself. The Biden campaign says they don't want to cause any disruption that would come with the security required for the former vice president to stay for that funeral. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14 day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. And welcome back on this Monday morning. And Hoda, you've got uh, you've got some interesting perspectives on all of the events that we've seen play out in our country over the past year. Yeah, I've been especially struck by the images of the real young people who are protesting and calling for change because a lot of adults lose, lose sight of the big picture. So we like to take lessons from kids. These are kids who are ages 10, 11, all the way up to 15, who have a way of seeing things more clearly. Across the country, Americans are rising up and taking a stand, demanding change. No justice, no Alongside them, new voices, kids who understand the simple truth that all men and women are created equal. To better hear those voices, I asked a few of tomorrow's leaders to talk to me about what we can do to help fix things today. Hi guys, first of all, I wanna thank you. You are smart people, smart kids, and we need smart kids right now. So we need y'all to help us out of this mess that we're in, okay? Can you all help us? Yes. Yeah. First, there's 11-year-old Rosalie, whose favorite sweatshirt says it all. <laughs> Seventh grade buddies Logan, Josh, and Aiden have a friendship that's colorblind. <laughs> And then there's Marley, a 15-year-old activist who campaigned to get thousands of books about black girls into schools. Okay, Marley, I'm going to start with you. Just give me your reaction to what you see going on outside right now. Well, the moment that we're living in is kind of frustrating because it feels as though it's an attack on people that look like me, which is really scary and disappointing. Aiden, when you look out at what's going on on the streets, how does it make you feel about yourself? I feel endangered, like I'm being hunted for, because I'm different. 
And I find that just, just unacceptable. Why do you feel that way, honey? Because people are being brutally murdered for no reason. Aiden, do your parents ever talk to you about the way you should act when you're in public? They always say, be careful, know your rights, and never disrespect the police officer. Be careful, know your rights, never disrespect a police officer. Have you ever felt intimidated when you were walking around? Yes. Like, give me an example. Like, when I was walking my dog, Phineas, I felt like it was night, so I didn't want anybody to come up to me like, oh, he's an African-American boy at night. He must be doing something like that. Doesn't that make you sick? Yeah, exactly. It's like, why? We're all the same. What do we want? Jackson! Logan, when you look at everything that's going on, do you know what everybody's fighting about? I think they're fighting about police brutality. <laughs> Also, yesterday, my dad said, you don't know what it's like to be black until you walk a mile in my shoes. And he said it because I really didn't understand what was going on. And what he means by that is, you don't know what it's like to see people clenching their bags when you're walking down the street. He says it happens every day. One of the first times that I personally like saw or witnessed inequity was with my own hair when I got to elementary school. A lot of the kids at school would say that it was like taking up too much space and they wanted me to sit in the back or that it was dirty. Um, and these things were like super frustrating because I felt like it was completely out of my control. Well, your hair is gorgeous. I love your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Rosalie, did something happen at camp that... Yes. Tell me about that. I saw some people from a different cabin. They were talking, they were saying how they didn't want to play with someone because of their race. And at the time, I didn't really say anything to them at the time, but I talked to my counselors. And sometimes, like, I kind of regret not saying anything, but I also at the same time don't because I could have made things worse. So Morley, if people are, uh, aren't sure whether or not they should speak out, what's your best advice to them? I think the best thing you can say is, how much do I know about the situation? So I think Rosalie did a great job in knowing that, oh, I don't know 100% enough to just go in and try and stop something that I can ask an adult who may know more than me. So it is finding that balance, and I think she did a great job. Thank you. Josh, tell me what we should do to end racism. What would you say? I would say that we are all the same. We are all people. I say that it's going to be okay, and soon we'll all be like friends, and it'll be over. Do you think we just need to make our circles bigger to have people around us who are different from us? I 100% agree with that. I think people need to understand that racism exists, and that we need to understand that it's okay to be black, it's okay to be white, it's okay to be Pacific Islander, and all of these differences is what in fact makes this country beautiful and amazing and makes us the people that we are. And, wow. uh, aren't, aren't they amazing kids? Out, and, out of the mouths of babes. Right? Wow. And by the way, uh, Marley, who's the, she's the older one in the group. She's the one who's 15. She said she loved hearing everybody because all the other kids kept saying, we're the same, we're the same. And she said, they're so young. They don't really see everything yet, but they will. But I, feel, I felt so much better after the interview. I felt like those are the guys who are yes. going to kind of be in charge eventually. And I, I sort of liked hearing them. We're in the middle of a bit of a mess right now yeah. in this country. But if those five voices yeah. are any indication the future yeah we're, we're in good shape <laughs> we're in fine shape class of 2020 you are graduates in three two one over the weekend a star-studded virtual tribute for seven million high school and college students nationwide really youtube's delivered. dear class of 2020 oh, commencement crazy. had a little something yeah. for everyone it was pretty well. More than 70 pop stars, celebrities, and public figures participated, expressing their support for graduating seniors as they take their next big step. You all have done something great. Hold your heads high and celebrate. And go ahead and do a little dance. <laughs> the cool dance. You worked your whole life in pursuit of your dreams and nothing, not even a global pandemic, is going to keep you from the futures you've imagined for yourself. Every obstacle is really an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to change. Performances included a rendition of U2's Beautiful Day. Beautiful day. 
and a Zoom bomb by Mariah Carey as the cast of Schitt's Creek performed her song, Hero. Social media lit up with messages from the class of 2020 praising the event. Although some of the speeches were recorded before the death of George Floyd, several artists addressed the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement and encouraged graduates to rise up and advocate for change. We've seen that our collective hearts, when put to positive action, could start the wheels of change. Real change has started with you. You are the seeds that will grow into a new and different forest that is far more beautiful and loving than the one we live in today. Our own Jenna Bush Hager had these words of encouragement. And when the world opens up again, we can all be a little better than before. The world will be better because of you. While Alicia Keys urged the grads to strive for greatness. You are graduates in the most powerful time to be coming of age. And there's nothing and no one that can stop you from changing the world. Guys, one of the things uh, that, that sticks awesome. out about the Dear Class of 2020 is that when was the last time social media pretty much unanimously all agreed something was amazing? Uh, it doesn't happen often. So that's just small proof of how impressive this over four-hour production was. And guys, I'll tell you what, even if you're not a senior, it is worth going back to YouTube to re revisit as the messages of hope and camaraderie and inspiration were abundant, and it was very powerful. Very well done. Oh, that sounds awesome. I felt like we should play yeah. Alicia Keys' song, Good Job, because, man, they did a great job. That was awesome, Carson. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. All this as more disturbing videos emerge of police arresting black men. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an officer is seen using a stun gun on a man Friday, later hitting him on the head. The officer is now charged with assault. In Alameda, California, police have released this video of an arrest last month, which is also under investigation. The man says he was dancing outside his home. In Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says Dave, no. Uh, back to this uh, notion about disbanding the police, and that's the vote of the uh, Minneapolis City Council. What would that actually look like? What would the next steps be? Well, Savannah, that is a major question right now. And the city council members say they want input from the public, and it could take up to a year to figure out exactly how much how this will work. The mayor here says that he wants to reform the department, not abolish it. But one of the ideas being tossed around is perhaps hire more counselors to deal with mental health calls instead of relying solely on police. 
Overnight, chaos in Seattle. Witnesses say a man was shot after a suspect drove through a crowd of protesters. Video showing the driver get out of his car and brandish what appears to be a gun. Authorities say that suspect is now in custody. The 27-year-old victim in stable condition. The growing scenes of unrest coming amid another night of mostly peaceful protests over the killing of George Floyd. His remains now back in his childhood home of Houston. American flags lining the route to the church or memorial service will be held in just a few hours. Pastor Mia Wright. Our desire and the Floyd family desire is really to see people come together and to heal our nation. The service open to all, but with coronavirus still a threat, masks and social distancing required. On Saturday, a public viewing in Rayford, North Carolina, where Floyd was born, drew thousands. His family's emotions overflowing. I'll never hear his voice. I'll never hear his laughter. I'll never have his hugs. I'll be able to tell him that I love him again. Bystanders eager for a glimpse of the casket of the man whose name has become a rallying cry for justice. We want to give him a good home going and let him know that his death was not in vain, that we will do something about it. With demonstrations stretching into the 13th day in a row. Black lives matter! From D.C. to New York, Denver and Los Angeles, even at NASCAR and to stand against racism. The protests now mainly peaceful after some early nights of violence. I can't breathe. Also in Houston today, former Vice President Joe Biden planning to meet privately with Floyd's family to offer his condolences in person. Following the public memorial, tomorrow's funeral service will be private. All expenses covered by boxer Floyd Mayweather. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. And as he did in Minneapolis on Friday, the Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy before George Floyd is laid to rest next to his mother, reuniting with the person he so desperately called out for in his final moments of life. A number of politicians and celebrities expected to be in attendance today, including Floyd Mayweather, who is funding that funeral for the Floyd family. In the meantime, tonight, a candlelight vigil will be held on the very football field where Floyd was once a standout player. His former teammates expected to attend. This morning, for the first time in three months, New York City is cautiously opening back up. We bent the curve. The city hit hardest by the pandemic is entering the first phase of reopening today. Retail stores open for pickups. Construction and manufacturing can resume. And subways return to regular weekday service. You did the hard work to fight back the coronavirus so we could get to phase one. Just weeks ago, the city was at a breaking point. With hospitals overwhelmed and more than 16,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City alone. But after a strict shutdown, widely available free testing, and increased contact tracing, the, safe the city has met the criteria needed to start reopening. Phase one may bring as many as 400,000 people back to work in the Big Apple. Companies reopening must limit capacity, frequently clean shared surfaces, screen workers for symptoms, and create social distance markers to help customers and employees stay six feet apart. It's been soul crushing. Mackenzie Farquay uh, shut down her five shops in March. This morning, she's back open for business with hand sanitizer at the ready and items up front so customers can shop from the sidewalk. I hope it'll be super busy. But nationwide, officials worry loosened restrictions have contributed to a new spike in 18 states. And reopening efforts are complicated by the sweeping protests following the death of George Floyd. We're certainly going to see transmission coming out of these gatherings. There's no question about that. In New York, there will be 15 specific testing sites for protesters. If you were at a protest, act responsibly, get a test. Get a test a city working hard to move forward and find its new normal. So some good news. The governor says that school graduations of up to 150 people will be allowed as early as June 26. But the bad news, one of the most big, one of the biggest challenges the city is still facing is mass transit. Ridership has decreased 90% since the pandemic began, and it's still really difficult to socially distance in New York City's enclosed buses and trains. 
This morning, President Trump is facing a growing chorus of criticism from former military leaders. We have a constitution and we have to follow that constitution. And the president's drifted away from it. Over the weekend, retired Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell joining that list and blasting the president. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people will not hold him accountable. Powell, a frequent Trump critic who served four presidents, three Republican and one Democrat, and who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, endorsed Joe Biden over the weekend, getting and, emotional and when talking about how he says the world now views the United people. States. Are we insulting everybody? Are we going after immigrants? Um, they don't understand this. I'm the son of immigrants. I wouldn't be here if my parents couldn't come here in banana boats in the 1920s. This is America. This is who we are, and the world doesn't understand. Mr. Trump fired back, calling Powell highly overrated. As for the 2020 race, in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, Biden leads President Trump nationally by seven points among all registered voters, 49 percent to 42 percent. That's unchanged from April's poll. While Biden is up eight points against the president among voters in the top battleground states, 50 to 42. As for the state of the nation, 80 percent of Americans say the country is out of control amid the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and the coronavirus pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr out front over the weekend, defending the use of force to clear Lafayette Park last Monday night, which set the stage for President Trump's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church. They were not peaceful protests. But witnesses say the protesters were peaceful. Barr also rejecting what many protesters see as the root of the problem. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. Now, overnight, 4,900 National Guard troops started to leave Washington, D.C. at President Trump's order. The president tweeting the troops can, quote, return quickly if needed. The president also saying the protests have been under perfect control, his words. Joining those protests over the weekend, one of his biggest Republican critics, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who told NBC News Black Lives Matter. Romney is also signaling he likely won't support Mr. Trump in the fall. We are listening. I am listening. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is changing the league's message, releasing this video statement late Friday. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. The exact same language star NFL players asked the league to use the day before. We will not be silenced. We assert our right to peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. Goodell's message of unity comes after comments made by one of the NFL's biggest stars exposed the league's deep divisions. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Drew Brees apologized twice after he said players shouldn't protest police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. I am sorry, and I will do better. The New Orleans Saints quarterback also promising to listen more and be part of the solution. President Trump now weighing in, going after Goodell overnight, tweeting, could it be even remotely possible that Goodell was intimating that it would now be okay for players to kneel? And Brees over the weekend, posting... He should not have taken back his original stance. Bree's hitting back, posting on Instagram, To Donald Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. The president echoing his comments in 2016, when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee protesting police brutality. Kaepernick never played in the NFL again after that season. Knees usually taken out of reverence. Former Green Beret and Seattle Seahawks player Nate Boyer is the person responsible for suggesting kneeling as a protest to Kaepernick. Kneeling was born out of a a middle ground, you know, Um, two people that disagreed on a lot, but two people that were willing to just have a conversation and listen. So, Steph, uh, Goodell didn't directly address the kneeling during the anthem, but what do you think is going to happen with the upcoming season and those protests? What will we see? 
Yeah, Hoda, his statement is vague, although a lot of people have interpreted it as a green light for kneeling. You know, there have been a handful of players who say when they come back, that's exactly what they're, do- they're going to do, including running back Adrian Peterson. He thinks that kneeling could potentially save lives and create change. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. Prince Andrew was seen on social media in May when his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson posted this Instagram picture with the caption, so proud of our loving family. But in an interview in December, Virginia Jufri claimed she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and abused by Prince Andrew when she was 17, just days after this picture was taken. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Prince Andrew says he has no recollection of meeting her. His own interview last year was widely criticised for the way he talked about Epstein. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And he would only say he might talk to authorities. If push came to shove and the (coughs) the legal advice was to do so, then I would be duty-bound to do so. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew, since he stepped down as a working royal. So, so Kier, if Prince Andrew doesn't have anything to hide, why, why not just agree to that interview with authorities here? <laughs> That's a great question, Craig, not least because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give uh, evidence under uh, oath. Uh, But that said, you and I both know that uh, you should be careful when you're talking about legal conversations that are taking place behind closed doors, private conversations. We don't know the details. That said, the optics are terrible for the royal family, aren't they? Uh, One final uh, note, uh, Craig. Prince Andrew's interview, television interview last year, widely believed to have gone really, really badly. Perhaps his legal advisers are concerned about how it would go if he did sit down in front of seasoned prosecutors. After months of trying to beat back coronavirus, a wave of businesses reopening, beaches buzzing, and most recently protests erupting are taking a toll. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the large gatherings pose a significant threat. It's a delicate balance because the reasons for demonstrating are valid, and yet the demonstration itself puts one at an additional risk. This morning, 20 states showing an upward swing in cases over the last two weeks. Texas, California, Florida, and Missouri among them. A rise stretching back to a very social Memorial Day holiday. The weather got nice outside, people start to go back outside. We did relax a lot of our social distancing in those states, and here we go. Cases start to pick up. No justice! Massive demonstrations in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death, only heightening concerns. A new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 66% of respondents are uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large group. Even as some healthcare workers step out into the streets to protest injustice. I don't know that COVID is really in the back of my mind when I'm out there. I'm really thinking about the issue at hand, which is making sure that justice is served and something like this never happens again. A powerful movement sweeping the nation as New York City reopens its economy for the first time today. We're going to open 15 sites that are dedicated just to protesters to get a test so you can get it on an expeditious basis. But please get a test. Testing in college sports also raising red flags as athletes return for preseason training. According to multiple reports, several University of Alabama football players have the virus, and Auburn University acknowledges three of its players tested positive too. 
An Oklahoma State linebacker even tweeting, after attending a protest and being well protective of myself, he has COVID-19. And that player also tweeting, he was completely asymptomatic. Now, the University of Alabama is arguably the most prominent football program in the country. They have not confirmed yet those cases of coronavirus, but have said the health and safety of student athletes is their top priority. And they ensuring that those players, student athletes, get the best possible medical care when they return to campus. Kennedy Kane is a fighter. And that's lucky. Because at 16, she's not only a straight-A student at Cass Tech, one of the best public high schools in Detroit, she's running a makeshift school on a single borrowed computer for her four siblings. Kenneth, Keenan, Kenye, and Kendall. After nearly a month without any assignments, her school launched an online platform. But Kennedy says that hasn't made it easier. Not only is this new to us, but it's new to the teachers as well. And sometimes the teachers have difficulties when they're trying to program it. And then they assign it as if they know that everyone has availability or the opportunity to have technology in their home when that's not the case. So it's kind of frustrating. When schools closed, only 10 percent of Detroit public school students had access to a computer and the Internet, which is deeply troubling to Dr. Nikolai Viti. Three years ago, he became superintendent, inheriting a system long on promise and short on resources. So, Dr. Vitti, what was the state of the Detroit public school system before the coronavirus? Enrollment was up for the first time in over a decade. Uh, Student achievement defined by state and national test scores showed improvement. Equally important, the teacher vacancy rate, which had dogged the city, had improved by 75 percent. God put me on this earth to teach. I absolutely love it. Detroit native Casey Edgar teaches 11th grade math at King High, and she says most of her nearly 150 students are less and less committed to school. How come your camera is not on? The first week I was in touch with, I would say 50 to 60 percent, and now it's about running at about 20 percent. What percentage of your students do you think are actually doing the work? Like right about 10 percent. That's not very many. No, not very many at all. Like many places around the country, little learning has taken place for Detroit public school students since March. So instead of adding and subtracting, we're going to be multiplying. Okay. There's no denying there is a digital divide in America. Just seven miles from downtown Detroit, the Gross Point South High School had a computer in every kid's hands who needed one almost immediately after the shutdown. So before COVID-19, I did not have a laptop. I was issued a laptop uh, right after its school ended. Xavier Prater is a dedicated student. We just log in and then go to our remote learning resources. Xavier will be a senior next year and dreams of going to UCLA. He is well on his way with lots of support. Little surprise, participation in online classes in Gross Point is 95% much higher than it is just a zip code away in Detroit, where it's only 50 percent. A reflection, some say, of deeply rooted systemic racism. The numbers tell at least part of the story. In Detroit, median household income is about $30,000. The population is nearly 80 percent black. In Gross Point, median income is just over $100,000, with a black population of 2 percent. So is the digital divide in Detroit a racial divide as well? Absolutely. The haves are receiving more than the have-nots. We already know children are coming in at a disadvantage with fewer resources than middle-class, upper-middle-class students, but our public school system should be the great equalizer in giving an equal opportunity for children, but instead it actually exacerbates the divide that already exists. Detroit is getting a big boost with a $23 million gift from local businesses to give every student a laptop. But that won't happen until summer, long after the school year ends. We can anticipate most students losing six months of where they would have been had we been in school. Six months behind can be a knockout punch for kids already struggling with an achievement gap. Not because they aren't as smart, not because they aren't willing to work as hard, just because of where they live. 
Gross Point is right next to us. And they have they got resources the second this pandemic started. Their educational system isn't lacking as much as we are. And it's just like, wow, why can't we be like that? Or why can't we step in and uh, give to our students like they are? Because our students are no different from theirs. So I asked Kennedy where her incredible courage and her wisdom came from. She says her working mother, who she calls a superhero. And one final point, Brown and Harvard did a study uh, after the coronavirus hit of math around the country, looking at just under a million students. And here's what they found. In the most, the poor zip codes, the math learning had, had been reduced by about 50%. And in the wealthiest zip codes, no learning loss. So the, if, even if the kids get these laptops, though, what about what about the digital divide as it pertains to, to Internet access as well? Yeah, that's part of it. And in fact, that these laptops are going to come with Internet access Excellent. because that is absolutely a problem. Craig. Yeah. And I remember we did that story of that family that actually got in their car, remember, and drove to where there was Internet access. But you can't believe that people live blocks apart and have that disparity. That was fascinating. Cynthia, thank you. Welcome back to the third hour of today. Hard to believe, but it's been more than three months since 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery was shot and killed while his family said he was out for a jog in Georgia. Chanel? Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan are all charged with murder. The McMichaels told police they thought Arbery was a burglary suspect and claimed they acted in self-defense. Last week, prosecutors made some troubling new claims and a judge ruled there is enough evidence now for a trial. This morning, we're joined by Ahmad Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, and her lawyer, Lee Merritt. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's dig in here. Uh, Wanda, last week or during the testimony, uh, the, the judge revealed or they revealed that one of the defendants, Travis McMichael, uttered a racial slur after Ahmad was killed. And of course, this is getting a lot of buzz because of the implications of that. You were in that courtroom. What did you think uh, when you heard that? And how significant is this finding to you? It was it, it was shocking to know that someone could actually take a life and still not have any remorse in the last minutes of their life. Well, Lee, Lee, let me ask you a question. Georgia, to that point, Georgia is one of the few states in the country that does not have a hate crime statute. So, so how does that affect this case? Well, it moves us closer to the intent that we need for to meet the standard for the, the murder charge that each, these men are charged with. Each man in this case is charged with felony murder. And so if they have some sort of justification defense, it's undermined by the use of a racial slur while standing over the dead body. And, and when an arrest was made in Ahmad's case almost three months after he was killed. A Waycross district attorney recused himself from the case uh, because of his ties to the McMichaels, the accused. But in a letter, he stated there was insufficient probable cause to issue arrest warrants and that under, quote, Georgia law, Travis McMichael was allowed to use deadly force to protect himself. Well, now the current state's attorney general has requested an investigation into how the case was handled. What are your thoughts about all this? It seems like there's a a lot going on here. Yeah, well, the state attorney, George Barnhill, uh, he, he obviously, uh, he tried to paint this as just some men trying to protect their neighborhood and, and really went a long way to, to normalize the behavior. But now that there's a second set of eyes on it, now that there's overview from the DOJ and the family has worked very closely with Bobby Christine from the Southern U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District. Uh, and they're really looking at the federal hate crime protections for the family and the uh, and other federal protections, not only for the men who assaulted Ahmad, assaulted and murdered Ahmad, but also for the system, the district attorneys, the Glen County Police Department that seemed to cover it up for them. And, and Wanda, you and Lee are headed to uh, Houston to attend George Floyd's funeral tomorrow. Uh, Wanda, what, what do you want to say to the Floyd family? The worst would be that I'm sorry that this has happened. I was hoping when this happened to Ahmad back in February that this would bring an end to some of this, some of these type of events. 
But unfortunately, it happened again so quickly. It wasn't even three months and we had the same type of situation again. And this must and this must stop. Wanda, on that note, I know on Friday you reached out to Brianna's uh, Taylor's mother on what would have been her 27th birthday. Uh, of course, Brianna was shot and killed when Louisville police officers executed a no knock warrant uh, back in March. Why is it so important for you to reach out? And what was that conversation like with Brianna's mom? Basically, I shared a video. I didn't have the conversation that I wanted to have. But it was very important to me to reach out because I know her pain, because I share the same pain. I mean, we lost our child. That type of pain, you don't know that pain until you experience it firsthand. Amon had a birthday back in May. And it, it, it was very difficult. And I had to reach out because I knew Friday was going to be very difficult for Ms. Taylor. There have been a lot of tears, Wanda. I can understand, uh, you know, I can't understand how you guys are feeling, but I know uh, a lot of us have, have cried a lot over the past couple of weeks. I'm interested on your take when you see the news headlines and you see these powerful pictures. You have demonstrators around the country and frankly, not even around the country, around the world, standing up against police brutality, racial inequality. They're chanting the names of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and your son, Ahmaud Arbery. What do you think of when you see the crowds and crowds of people around the world? And are you hopeful for change today? Very, very hopeful. Um, seeing the demonstrations, it, it offers strength. Um, it lets me know that I'm not standing alone. Um, it shows me that someone cared. In the beginning, in the first stages of this, I I had I was the only voice that that spoke of my mind, and now there are people that that are chanting his name. It really gives, basically, it gives me strength. Mm. Wanda, you know we've seen these pictures, we've seen the that lovely portrait of your son, and then we've seen the struggle right before the end of his life, and that's that's pretty much what we know about him. Can you share with us? what you'd like us to know about Ahmad? Ahmad was loved. Ahmad loved and he was loved by many. Ahmad was caring. Ahmad was kind. Ahmad had goals. He had ambitions. And back in February, that was all taken away from him. Uh, Lee, let me ask you a question. With, with everything that's going on, uh, and, and we're talking about uh, systemic change, hopefully, and that there's, there's been talk about dismantling of, of or the reimagining of police departments. Do you see some good coming out of this uh, when, when all is said and done? Absolutely. And in particular, in the case of Ahmad, it, the, the tragedy of Ahmad's case is not only what happened to him, but at the hands of evil men, but the system that seemed to justify this behavior. So it's causing people all over the country to say, maybe we really need to look back at the laws, look at the systems that we have in place, and to ensure that nothing like this actually happens again. It's important that all these cases are tied together, because now we can go further up the river and look at the systematic change that needs to take place from, from new laws to new policies to new elected officials. It, it's a really important revolutionary time. Well, we want to thank both of you for being with us this morning. Uh, it's uh, I know this is going to be a difficult couple of days. You'll be reliving that, Wanda, as you go to visit uh, George Floyd's uh, funeral. But uh, we appreciate it, and we thank you for taking time. We're joined now by former NBA player Stephen Jackson, a close friend of George Floyd. Uh, he joins us from Houston, Texas. Stephen, good to see you again. Thanks for your time this morning. Good morning, my guy. How you doing? Doing okay. Doing okay. But before we start talking about what's going to happen in Houston, I want to ask you about uh, Gianna, George Floyd's six-year-old daughter. Of course, that image 
uh, that we saw last week of her on your shoulders is as she's shouting, Daddy changed the world. How's she doing? She's doing as good as possible. Um, for a six years old, for a six year old, she's very intelligent and she knows everything that's going on. And we need, she needs a lot of prayer. Um, she's definitely scarred. She did what? See that? Everybody in the world. Uh, it's been frustrating even for me, and she she's not doing too well. But for a six years old, she's strong as possible. She's got uh, she's got quite the village around her too. Um, we have seen over the last 13 days massive protests, not just here in, in in this country, but but really all over the world. You and George Floyd, you weren't just friends. You guys look so much alike. Uh, you called him your twin. What what do you think your twin would would say about what we've seen play out over? over the world over the over nearly two weeks now well i know he will be saying this right now y'all put your knee on my neck and kill me but you didn't know i had a twin who was a celebrity and that was gonna ride for me to the end the world didn't know that the police didn't know that they didn't know he had a friend like me that was a celebrity and that was a twin brother that was gonna ride for him now i got the world behind me and i just i said it earlier i got more power than joe biden and trump right now because people know i stand for love I done told every race I loved them and meant it, and every race has told me the same, and I believe it. And I got everybody standing side by side, spreading love and trying to push out and trying to get justice for my brother. And people seen that, and people seen the cruelty and the hate from that man. And there's more people that stand for love than hate. And as you see that now, 50 states, 18 countries coming together, we can't be stopped. You mentioned uh, President Trump. The president uh, talked about George Floyd on Friday in that Rose Garden address, and I want to make sure I get, get it right. The president said, quote, hopefully George is looking down right now and saying this is a great thing that's happening uh, for our country. When the president said that, what did you think? I just thought he could have picked a better choice of words. Um, it's, it's more than going on than, than thinking my brother's looking down happy at this, but he should be saying more things on how to bring this country together, how to help policing how to help get justice for, 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 for black folks and for and equal rights. It's a lot of things he could, be, he could be talking about instead of making jokes. This is the same president that said, next time y'all putting them in the car, move your hands so they can hit their head. Like, he, the world has lost common sense, and I think the president, just as well as other people, need to be more cautious of their words at this time. Show, show, more, show more empathy for the family and, uh, and, uh, and use your words carefully. But the things he's saying right now is not what you need to be saying. I know I'm not the only person that was upset with that. There, there have been, as you know now, um, a number of, of policy suggestions, among them calls to defund police departments uh, all over this country. Minneapolis over the weekend voting to disband their police department. I, I know that George's brother is going to be testifying before Congress later this week. Specifically, Stephen, what, what kinds of policies would you like to see put in place? Well, first, I want people to come back to common sense. <laughs> the world has lost common sense. It's easy to see when somebody is being treated wrong. And we just want equality. There's it's, it's a lot of policies in place that give these policemen the comfortability to just murder people and do things because they don't, they don't deal with the repercussions or they don't deal with the same punishments that we deal with. Obviously, we need to change that. And we, and, and we need to put more people... Um, from, from neighborhoods that they police, and they need to be from these neighborhoods. A lot of times when you get police that's from these neighborhoods, they, they will be slow to act in violent ways. They can easily call somebody from their family because they went to school with them. We need more police that, that, that police the areas that they grew up in, and we won't have as much violence because they know people and they're familiar with the areas. You are there in Houston right now. There's going to be a, a public memorial uh, today, a private funeral tomorrow. How is your friend going to be remembered there in Houston? Oh, man, I, I, I've been right in the neighborhood, right on the, on the corner where he's uh, where he grew up and where he's been all his life for the last two to three days. And the, the, the cry, outcry of support is unbelievable. Everybody knew George. He was a great guy. Uh, he was a legend in this city, man. And this way he needs to be laid to rest. Um, it's, it's, it's a crazy feeling because a lot of people that he grew up with, went to high school with, I don't know if they're going to be able to make it to the funeral, but George is love. George, George is a hood guy, man. They love George here because of his heart and how much love he showed around the city, man. And, and people just want to get this done the right way. But one thing about it, I'm not done. We're not done. We're going to continue to fight for justice. We got a march in Minnesota Thursday. My brother's name is going to be the name of change. When you hear George Floyd, it will be the name of change. Stephen Jackson uh, on his friend George Floyd. Stephen, thank you. Thank you for your time.
We are back 842 now with an inspiring groundbreaker, Savannah. Yes, she is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis. She's a former prosecutor, a mother, and once confirmed, she will make history as the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court. We're going to talk with her in just a moment. But first, her story. 39-year-old Fabiana Pierre-Louis wasn't always sure she wanted to be a lawyer, but now she's a judicial trailblazer. It is extremely humbling to be nominated, and I am beyond excited and enthusiastic. Governor Phil Murphy nominating Pierre-Louis to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey, the first black woman in its history. There is no better meeting of an individual and the times. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, the first black woman to hold statewide office in New Jersey, singing her praises. She is proof of what is possible when one does not limit themselves to what others think they can do because of their station in life. Pierre Louis has traveled a long road to reach the state's highest bench. Her parents, Joseph and Claire, emigrated from Haiti. He worked as a cab driver. She worked in a hospital. Pierre Louis started life in a cramped Brooklyn apartment shared with seven relatives before her family moved to New Jersey. There, she graduated Rutgers Law School and became an assistant U.S. attorney, heading up offices in Trenton and Camden. And on Friday, she walked into history. Standing here today, I know that I have truly lived and continue to live the American dream that my parents came to this country in search of. And Fabiana Pierre-Louis joins us now. Good morning. I feel like I should call you Madam Justice, but I know you have to wait and get confirmed first. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What was it like to get that call from Governor Murphy and, and when it really soaked in what this means to be the first black woman to serve on New Jersey's Supreme Court? Well, it was it's such an honor to be nominated to the state's highest court. Um, I, it's in, in, I feel incredibly blessed and I am fortunate that Governor Murphy um, saw in me the, 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 the experience and had the faith in me to nominate me to the court. Um, I pri practiced private practice, public service, and I think, you know, it's, it's such a phenomenal opportunity to serve the state of New Jersey. I began my career with the Supreme Court of New Jersey as a law clerk to Justice John Wallace Jr. And the idea that I may one day sit in the same seat that he occupied is just unbelievable. I was thinking about that. I wondered if you and you, your law clerk days, if you ever even let yourself dream of something like this. And how about your parents? You know, here they are. They're immigrants from Haiti. They really embody the American dream. You embody the American dream. What did they think when you told them the news? My parents were speechless. <laughs> they, they're they so <laughs> overjoyed and so happy and so proud. And I think there were just so many emotions that they they are, they are continue to experience after realizing the magnitude of this nomination. So uh, they're just extremely proud and, and happy. You know, this nomination was in the works long before this particular cultural moment that we're in. But you are, as the governor said, so well suited to it. You worked as a federal prosecutor. You worked in, were in charge of the criminal division in, in some of the toughest cities in New Jersey. What do you think this movement will mean to the system? So again, you know, it, it's it's incredibly humbling um, and an honor to be nominated to the Supreme Court. You know, if confirmed, um, if I do break that barrier and become the first black woman to sit on the court, I just hope to be an inspiration to future generations. I know how important it is for young people to see people that look like them, who have similar backgrounds as them, in leadership positions. So I, I just truly hope to be an inspiration to others and, and I look to bring a diverse perspective to the court. Well, uh, we know you're a hard worker. You're a mom of two young sons. <laughs> um, you, as I said, you've been practicing law all these years. What are your, what do your kids think about mom becoming a Supreme Court justice? 
So my, my sons, Robbie and Mark, they're seven and four. So they don't quite understand the particulars <laughs> of the judiciary system, but they they were thrilled to meet the governor on Friday and they thought it was really cool to see themselves on the news. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have some concept of what a judge is. So they 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 think it's pretty exciting. Uh, it is. Fabiana Pierre-Louis, thank you so much. I was going to say, maybe, as I'm, I know, I'm a mom of little kids. It would be nice to have that gavel. Bring a gavel home and see if you need. Sometimes, sometimes moms need to lay down the law, too. <laughs> it's That's funny. We actually have a, a couple of foam gavels at home, so they often <laughs> joke and bang the foam gavels and say, order in the court. So that's how I explain to them that I might be becoming a judge. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. We'll continue to follow your incredible story. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Welcome back. And this week, we are bringing you a Consumer Confidential series all about the coronavirus, talking about counterfeit goods and food hacks in the kitchen. But we start this morning with your money. CNBC's senior personal finance correspondent, Sharon Epperson, has some advice as states reopen for business. She's also the lead contributor for CNBC's Invest in You. Good morning, Sharon. It's always nice to talk to you. It's always great to see you, too. OK, so let's start off here because the employment rate just passed 40 million. Um, is there still time to apply for unemployment benefits related to COVID at this point? Absolutely. Right away. That should be the first step. You want to go to your state employment agency and apply for unemployment benefits. You want to make sure that you do that soon because there may be a little lag time. And also keep in mind that that extra six hundred dollars a week that you can get based on the federal government's stimulus plan, you want to be able to get that um, before 
it ends July 31st. Right now, people are nervous. They're scared. What are you counseling folks on when it comes to finance and how to get through this? Focus on what you can control. Make mm-hmm. sure you have an understanding of where you are right now with your finances. And that requires a hard look at your net worth. What? How much do you actually have? How much do you own? And how much do you owe? How much is left over after that? And also, what are you spending your money on? What are you spending your money on in terms of those basic necessities and those essential items? And how much savings do you actually have? How much savings do you have in cash? How much taxable investments might you have? And how much do you have in retirement savings, which should be, of course, the last resort to touch, but you do want to know where all of your assets are. Is there some benefit to us not having spent money over the past 12 weeks relative to normal? Well, ideally you should be saving that money you're not spending. And ideally you should be putting that money in an account that gets you a little bit more interest. It's not gonna be a lot, but just a little bit in a high interest savings account, which would probably be an online bank account. But you also want to make sure you're not tempted to dip into that for something. So having that money in an account that's separate from your checking account and separate from the institution where your checking account is may force that discipline upon you. But it is really important to think about, I would have spent this much money commuting. I would have spent this much money every week um, in terms of eating out for lunch or going out to dinner. And now I'm not. Am I saving that money? And if you already have adequate savings, Am I giving that money, donating that money and providing some type of, you know, philanthropic effort to really help with many people that are in need? And through all this, the bills keep coming in. And I'm sure there are many who are struggling to pay these bills. How do you prioritize them? Which ones should you be paying and which can you push off a little bit? What do you need to survive right now? What do you need in terms of paying for food? paying for your housing, utilities, uh, health insurance, internet service, what are those essential items that you must pay for right now? That is what you're dealing with. But this might be a time that you have to figure out what you need to really live on and to survive. You may have to say, I'm not gonna deal with those credit card payments right this month. I need to figure out how I'm gonna put food on the table for my family. Are there free services being offered right now that people can just reach out to someone to get some help? Absolutely. So many financial advisors and credit counselors are available now for free. I would urge people to go to the Financial Planning Association, to their pro bono services, as well as the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. You can find these organizations online. There are experts out there who are willing and very able to help you. And you mentioned it briefly. So many, I'm sure, are tempted to dip into the 401k. I know that's a last resort. What can you do to not have to do that? And and what's your advice for folks who just really have run out of options? The great thing about a 401k is the tax advantages that you have to it and also that it's set up for long-term savings. And so you really don't want to dip in there first. If you have to, if there's no other resource that you have, there is more flexibility and there is more of a, a ability to get that money based on hardships that you may be facing due to the pandemic. So use that as a last resort. And, you know, if you do have money in a 401k, pat yourself on the back for ha- for being a saver for the time that you work and try to save what you have. You may not be adding to it right now, but just preserve and protect the money that you have right now. Well, Sharon, you certainly take the stress out of it. Thank you so much for talking with us this morning. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Graduates from the class of 2020 are entering an America in crisis. We've got COVID-19, a struggling economy, and now civil rights protests taking place all across the country. Charlotte Alter spoke to many of these graduates for a Time Magazine cover story titled Generation Pandemic. She's also been covering the protest in the wake of George Floyd's death. And Charlotte's also the author of The Ones We've Been Waiting For. Charlotte, welcome. Charlotte, it's so good to see you. When we originally wanted to talk to you, it was all about COVID-19 and the impact it was having on the graduating class and the economics of it. And then, obviously, in the past several weeks, a lot has changed out there. And I was curious what, you, what you're learning from graduates, the, the young kids out there, about what, what's going on. What's their perception of the police, the protesters, and the rest? Well, you have to remember that Gen Z is the most racially diverse generation in U.S. history. And they're much more likely than older generations to say that racial diversity is good for society, to understand uh, how police often treat black people and white people differently. Uh, and so they, what I'm really hearing out there is a really sophisticated understanding of structural racism in America right now, and also this sense that protesting for these young people is only the first step. Nearly every young person that I've spoken to out on the streets over the last couple weeks has said that they are out here marching, they're out here demonstrating, but it's just the beginning of what they're going to try to do to address the systemic racism in this country. So researchers, Charlotte, say that major historical events have a different impact mm -hmm. on young people. And we talked about this with you a couple weeks ago between the ages of 14 and 24 and that those people, the, the events will have a major effect on their worldview. Mm -hmm. So how is everything that's going on going to shape Gen Z's outlook? So I think that this is really important to understand. So th think about it kind of like how what happens to you when you're a kid shapes your psychology into adulthood. That happens on a broad generational level as well. Um, and what I'm hearing from many of these young people is that like school shootings, like climate change, these police killings of black Americans have been kind of a drumbeat through their early adulthood. And many of them, you know, they remember when Trayvon Martin was killed. They remember when Eric Garner was killed. They remember when Michael Brown was killed. This is something that they've been aware of their entire uh, young adult lives, which is kind of different than um, than the way older people feel about it. You know, one, one stat that I saw that uh, really illustrates the generational difference here is that 43% of Generation Z Republicans say that there's systemic racism in this country, while only 20% of baby boomer Republicans agree. So there's a broad generational understanding of this that older generations might not have. It takes a lot to take a sign, paint something on it, and stand out there and hold it up. Do you find that that generation you're talking to, are they kind of on the front lines of this Black Lives Matter? Because you really have to care inside to do that? And if they are, do they feel like they're being heard? So, yeah, I mean, I think that Black Lives Matter has always been a movement of and by young people. This is a movement mm -hmm. that started on social media. Um, it is very much of the digital generation. And, you know, part of that is that oftentimes older people who maybe live through the civil rights movement look at Black Lives Matter and they say, OK, where's Martin Luther King? Where's Malcolm X? Um, they expect for there to be one singular figure to stand for the whole movement. And I think what is one of the generational issues here is that 
younger people don't need for there to be one single figure. This is a leaderful movement. And that's something that really resembles the way young people have kind of begun to live their lives on social media in this networked way. Mm -hmm. So we see how social media can help bring people to get together and how it can really start movements, help start movements. But you also say in this article that, you know, for this generation, it is a double-edged sword. It can also be hard on um, on their mental health, social media, and, and, and kind of prevent people from getting out there. Although I would say with these protests, we see that people are coming out um, in real life in large numbers. But talk to us about that. Yeah, so what researchers have found, have found about social media and Gen Z is that it's not actually necessarily the presence of social media that makes so many young people feel so anxious and depressed right now. It's when social media replaces other things that young people typically do in life that make them happy, like going to hang out with their friends or going to a party or going to the movies or any sort of real life social engagement out in the world. And one of the reasons that um, Gen Z has been experiencing these sky high levels of depression mm -hmm. and anxiety is that uh, for many young people, social media has come to replace mm -hmm. some of those real mm -hmm. world interactions mm -hmm. that they might have been having. Well, um, and especially with COVID, it's even more exasperated. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, thank you. Your cover story, The Class of 2020, and your latest article on protests that is in Time Magazine. Charlotte, thanks for hanging with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Graduates from the class of 2020 are entering an America in crisis. We've got COVID-19, a struggling economy, and now civil rights protests taking place all across the country. Charlotte Alter spoke to many of these graduates for a Time Magazine cover story titled Generation Pandemic. She's also been covering the protest in the wake of George Floyd's death. And Charlotte's also the author of The Ones We've Been Waiting For. Charlotte, welcome. Charlotte, it's so good to see you. When we originally wanted to talk to you, it was all about COVID-19 and the impact it was having on the graduating class and the economics of it. And then, obviously, in the past several weeks, a lot has changed out there. And I was curious what, you, what you're learning from graduates, the, the young kids out there, about what, what's going on, what's their perception of the police, the protesters, and the rest? Well, you have to remember that Gen Z is the most racially diverse generation in U.S. history. And they're much more likely than older generations to say that racial diversity is good for society, to understand uh, how police often treat black people and white people differently. Uh, and so they, what I'm really hearing out there is a really sophisticated understanding of structural racism in America right now, and also this sense that protesting for these young people is only the first step. Nearly every young person that I've spoken to out on the streets over the last couple weeks has said that they are out here marching, they're out here demonstrating, but it's just the beginning of what they're going to try to do to address the systemic ra racism in this country. So researchers, Charlotte, say that major historical events have a different impact mm -hmm. on young people. And we talked about this with you a couple of weeks ago between the ages of 14 and 24 and that those people, the, the events will have a major effect on their worldview. Mm -hmm. So how is everything that's going on going to shape Gen Z's outlook? So I think that this is really important to understand. So th think about it kind of like how what happens to you when you're a kid shapes your psychology into adulthood. That happens on a broad generational level as well. Um, and what I'm hearing from many of these young people is that like school shootings, like climate change, these police killings of black Americans have been kind of a drumbeat through their early adulthood. And many of them, you know, they remember when Trayvon Martin was killed. They remember when Eric Garner was killed. They remember when Michael Brown was killed. This is something that they've been aware of their entire uh, young adult lives, which is kind of different than, um, than the way older people feel about it. You know, one, one stat that I saw that uh, really illustrates the generational difference here is that 43% of Generation Z Republicans 
say that there's systemic racism in this country, while only 20% of baby boomer Republicans agree. So there's a broad generational understanding of this that older generations might not have. It takes a lot to take a sign, paint something on it, and stand out there and hold it up. Do you find that that generation you're talking to, are they kind of on the front lines of this Black Lives Matter? Hello, everyone. The transition to greatness has officially begun. Friday's jobs report was encouraging, to say the absolute least. The jobs in this country, we had more than 2.5 million added. The prediction was that 7.5 million jobs would be lost. This was a 10 million swing toward the positive side. And in fact, the greatest number of jobs created in a single month on record. Uh, that is extraordinary. 225,000 manufacturing jobs. 464,000 construction jobs, and 1.2 million leisure and hospitality jobs were all added in May. Beyond that, the number of workers who reported being on temporary layoffs decreased by 2.7 million in May. Um, and more than that, and, and this was a great number that was pointed out to me today by the CEA, 300 300,000 jobs were created for black Americans in particular. Um, that's in May, and that was a 1.7% increase, so very encouraging numbers there from the CEA uh, that they highlighted for me, uh, BLS numbers that they highlighted. May's jump in average weekly hours um, also is an encouraging sign because increasing hours is a sign that employees need to hire, employers need to hire more workers to meet demand. For all private sector employees, average weekly hours increased by 0.5% to 34.7 hours, the highest level since the series began in 2006. 73 percent of small businesses are open. That is up from the 52 percent right before the April jobs report reference period. Also, workplace visits are up roughly 40 percent from its pandemic low. The stock market is absolutely soaring. We saw with the S&P that it had its greatest 50-day rally in history. The Dow, likewise, is also booming. The markets clearly have confidence in President Trump, the jobs president who created the hottest economy in modern history once and will do it again. Also, commentators and economists have noted how great this jobs report was. Yesterday, we saw Mohamed El Arian, the chief economic advisor at Allianz, say this will go down in history as the biggest positive data shock for the markets and the economy, and you saw how surprised the markets were. They surged on Friday, capping a strong week with the Nasdaq closing at a record high. He said it was also very surprising to the economists. Not a single one thought that we would create jobs. Everybody expected the unemployment rate would go up. It did not. Also, senior economic correspondent at The New York Times, Neil Irwin noted that we have to think that the May, unemployment, the May employment numbers count as a strong win for PPP supporters. Obviously, the president signed that into law and has been a, been a big cheerleader of the PPP. Typical economists missed it by 10 million, as I noted at the top of the briefing. 10 million. That's bigger than the entire state of Michigan, nearly. And that's how much economists were off. Why is this happening? Well, it's happening because America has taken note of the fact that we have a president who ushered in the hottest economy in modern history, record low unemployment for black Americans, for Hispanic Americans, for the disabled, for our veterans. Paychecks were beginning to, to rise under the President Donald Trump economy. Uh, we have the great jobs creator in office, and America clearly has confidence in this president. Uh, you have a president who fundamentally understands how to put this country back to work, and we saw that in action with the Friday jobs report. And with that, I'll take questions. Okay. So we'll start with John. Kelly, what, what's the president's thinking on this growing movement to either defund or de dismantle police forces across the country? And what reforms does the president think would be appropriate in the wake of the George Floyd killing? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, the president is appalled by the defund the police movement. The fact that you have sitting Congresswomen wanting to defund the police, notably Rashida Tlaib, notably Biden advisor AOC Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a former Clinton and Eric Holder spokesperson Brian Fallon, wanting to defund our police across this country, it is extraordinary. And when you think the left has gone far and they couldn't possibly go farther, because we all remember the defund ICE movement, they want to def defund immigration and custom enforcement, and now they want to defund the police, this is extraordinary. This is rolling back the 
the protective layers that protect Americans in their homes and in their places of business. He's appalled by it. And it's uh, remarkable to hear this coming from today's Democrat Party. As for solutions, um, he's talking through a number of proposals, no announcements on that, but he definitely, as he's noted, recognizes the horrid injustice done to George Floyd and is taking a look at various proposals. Does the president agree with any of the mayors across the country who are saying, I think we could take some of the money from policing and put it toward other programs that could be effective in community development, which could lead to the potential for a, less, a lesser need for police. Well, let's be clear. If the mayor of L.A. wants to defund police, take money away from police, Mayor de Blasio, the mayor of New York, wants to take money away from police, that means cutting of police. That means reducing police departments. That means defunding police departments, if not getting rid of them entirely. No, he does not agree with that. And the rest of America does not agree with that. Caitlin. Two questions for you. As you are going over your reforms and what you think is needed, does the president feel that there is systemic racism in law enforcement? The president's been very clear there are injustices in society. I've noted several for you, for you that he's pointed out as a Republican primary candidate, noting the Sandra Bland video was absolutely horrible. Noting George Floyd, there's a civil rights investigation into that. He definitely believes there are instances of racism, but look, he believes our law enforcement are the best in the world. He believes that by and large, they are good people. The 750 who were injured defending this country from rioters in Antifa in the streets, as to be distinguished from the peaceful pro protesters, those 750 officers who were hurt defending our country were heroes, as was David Dorn, a police officer who lost his life, uh, and Patrick Underwood, who also lost his life in the last week or so. But he doesn't think that there is systemic racism at law. He believes that most of our police officers are good, hardworking people. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence of that, and he has great faith in our police department. Okay, well, my second question. Uh, does he still believe that NFL players who kneel as a form of protest against police brutality should be fired? The president is very much against kneeling um, in general. The president has made clear for years that kneeling is tied to our national anthem, that it does not respect our military men and women across this country. He's not a fan of the kneeling movement. He's made that very clear, particularly because he thinks it's disrespectful to our military as the kneeling originally at the kneeling um, during the national anthem. Do you think they should be fired? I have no comments on that. He is against the kneeling movement, though, as he's noted on Twitter as recently as a few days you ago. Can't say yes, he yes. does still think they should be okay. fired. I have no information on that, and I have not talked to him about that. Is yes. there anything in the Democrats' policing act that the administration supports? Yeah, the, that legislation, first of all, the text of it hasn't even been giving, given to us. Um, I have not talked with the president about that yet. He hasn't reviewed it yet. He's looking at a number of proposals. Um, but there are some non-starters in there, I would say, particularly on the immunity issue. You had A.G. Barr saying um, this weekend he was asked about reduced immunity, and he said, I don't think we need to reduce immunity to go after the bad cops, because that would result certainly in police pulling back, uh, which is not advisable. So he hasn't reviewed the legislation, but A.G. Barr, as a member of the administration, noted this prior to the proposal coming out. Does the administration support the banning of the use of chokeholds? Look, the president, again, hasn't reviewed this piece of legislation. Um, the the president is looking at what's a state issue, what's a federal issue right now. He's currently reviewing proposals, actually, on this very topic about police reform. So I'll leave it to him and not get ahead of him on that. But certainly, we believe that the appropriate amount of force should be used in any police interaction uh, with an individual. But two weeks after all of this civil unrest, why does the White, not, the White House not have a plan? The president said on Friday that his plan for combating racism is a strong economy. How does that work? Look, that's an important part of combating racism, is, is making sure that there's equal opportunity um, for black Americans in this country. This president, you know, we hear a lot of words from Democrats about criminal justice reform, that they wanted this. Well, they got it with President Trump um, reducing racial sentencing disparities via the First Step Act. You know, Democrats talk about economic opportunity for black Americans um, and people in vulnerable communities. And this president um, has done that with opportunity zones. It was a good start, more than 900 places created private investment to uh, help people get on their feet to start businesses in this country. HBCUs, record funding. This president has repeatedly, through his actions, uh, stood up for the black community. And a big piece of that is absolutely economic reform. And I'd finally note on the point of economic reform, uh, the USMCA, these trade deals, the TPP, making sure that didn't take place, that directly advantaged hardworking men and women in Detroit who wanted their auto jobs. So the, his re reformation with trade, reformation with trade, and also opportunities 
zones is helping to um, ensure that Americans of all races have the same opportunity in the economic plane. You're saying he will eventually have a police reform plan. He is looking at various proposals, so I won't get ahead of him. No announcements on that front, but he has been looking at them over the last few days. Yes. Yes. Kaylin, uh, there are reports that the administration is going to be pulling troops from Germany. Can you say how many and when and where are they going? Yeah, what I would say on that is, first, we have no announcements at this time. I know there's reporting out there, but as of this moment, there are no announcements. Um, the president's continually reassessing the best posture for the United States military forces and our presence overseas. I mean, we remain committed to working with our strong allies. Will he consult Angela Merkel before making a final decision? I'll leave that to the president. Again, no announcements at this time. And just one final, uh, the new Lafayette Square fencing, do you have any uh, indication on when that might be removed or, or taken down since the protests have become uh, more peaceful and who, who makes that decision? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have any announcements with regard to the fencing. That's not something that's in White House control um, in terms of securing the perimeter. But what I would say is the president has recognized that the protests have largely been peaceful. Why have they been peaceful? It's because of the actions taken by this administration. If you'll notice, Minneapolis was in chaos until the National Guard came in and then it was secure. You had outside here in Lafayette Park, I noted the 750 uh, law enforcement officers that were in across the country. Well, one fifth of those were in D.C. and the vast majority in Lafayette Park. Um, and once the National Guard came, came in, D.C. was secure. That Monday decision by the president of encouraging governors to surge the National Guard made the difference. And the president's recognized now that the protests are peaceful. He's recommended a winding down of the National Guard, very peaceful protests over the weekend. So with regard to the security of the building, not a decision for the White House, would refer you to Secret Service and Park Services on that. Um, but the president has recognized the peaceful protesting and um, is encouraged by that. Yes, Jen. Uh, Kaylee, on Hong Kong, can you say when will the administration revoke um, Hong Kong's uh, trade status? And also, do you think that that move will be the only thing the administration does? Is there something else planned? And do you think that China will listen? Are you seeing any signs of China relenting on Hong Kong? Yeah, we haven't seen any updates from China thus far. Um, no announcements with regard to the timing of that. But the president has been very clear that China has replaced its promise of one country, two systems with one country, one system, which is what led the administration to make the announcement that it would begin eliminating policy exemptions uh, that were given to Hong Kong, uh, the special treatment that they once had. Kayla? Yes, Steve. Is, is there any, um, a week after what we saw in Lafayette Park last Monday night, are there any people here in this building who believe that, or does the president believe that perhaps things went the way they shouldn't have gone? Uh, is there any regret on the part of the president or anyone here about how people were treated, people who were peacefully protesting and how they were rushed out so violently? No, there's no regrets on the part of this White House because, look, I'd note that many of those decisions were not made here within the White House. It was A.G. Barr who made the decision to move the perimeter. Monday night, Park Police also had made that decision um, independently when they saw all of the violence in Lafayette Square. Um, and when, before these protesters were moved by Park Police and they issued that tactical order, there were three loud warnings. And as I believe it was A.G. Barr on Face the Nation noted, um, that some of those protesters moved back and adhered to the warning, but others of those protesters started hurling objects, and that was unacceptable. And Park Police acted as they felt they needed to at that time in response, um, and we stand by those actions. The, the, the country and the world saw the, the, this violent clash between people who were otherwise peacefully protesting, but really the president is not sorry for the way things went? No, the president is sorry about uh, the fact that Antifa wreaked havoc in our streets and the failure of some members of the media to note that like CNN's Chris Cuomo said, show me where it says protesters are supposed to be peaceful. Um, well, I'd point him to the First Amendment, where it says that you have the right to, quote, peaceably assemble. He should go back and read the Constitution. Um, there are many others out there, like Don Lemon, saying that rioting is a mechanism to restructure our country. <laughs> burning down St. John's, using uh, a pick to, to literally like carve out, as we saw in that video, uh, concrete from the sidewalk to hurl at officers, that's not peacefully protesting. The actions of, actions of the rioters were not in keeping with the First Amendment. And I think the media needs to recognize there's a discernment between the peaceful protesters, many of whom I've seen, and the rioters. And yes, 
America will act against rioters. And yes, under President Trump, he will not allow burning buildings, 150 federal buildings to be defaced, and 750 law enforcement officers to be injured in our country. Can I ask you one more? Yes, Brian. Oh, follow- I like the blue suit. Oh, thank you. That's a really snazzy look. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, um, you, you do know that the burning of St. John's happened on Sunday nights. And a lot of the violence that you're talking about, that happened on Sunday night. What he was asking about was Monday when, as anyone who was down there knows, it was um, almost exclusively peaceful, especially in the moments before um, the chemical munitions were used on those protesters. So do you just want to clarify that about the burning of St. John's? Because that happened on a different day. Yeah, the burning of St. John's is what prompted the decision to move the perimeter. It's what prompted Park Police to say that evening, the perimeter must be moved. It's what prompted, yes, it's what prompted A.G. Barr to agree with that decision um, on Monday morning that the perimeter needed to be moved. Uh, But when you hurl objects at Park Police, when you don't move after three orders are given, uh, Park Police acted appropriately when the shield of Park Police was batted down when one person tried to grab a park police officer's weapon. That's not peaceful by any definition of the word. And one question on yeah. the, the area in front of the White House is now officially known as Black Lives Matter Plaza. Does the president agree with that decision? I haven't talked to him about it. I haven't mentioned that to him. Yes. Well, Kelly, does he agree in general the way that Mitt Romney stated over the weekend he does with the core message of Black Lives Matter? Yeah, Mitt Romney um, can say three words outside on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, but I would note this, that President Trump won 8 percent of the black vote. Mitt Romney won 2 percent of the black vote. I believe President Trump, um, people across the country recognize that while Mitt Romney has a lot of words, notably he said that 47 percent of the nation is dependent upon government, believes they are victims, believes that the government has a responsibility to care for them. Those were Mitt Romney's words not too long ago. The president takes great offense to those words. That's not America. Guess what America is? It's when given opportunity via a Trump opportunity zone, belief that Americans of all races can rise to the occasion and achieve, belief in HBCUs and giving funding, funding record funding to HBCUs, uh, because we need to enable ed- education in our country and school choice. Those kind of actions on the part of the president stand in stark contrast with the very empty words of Senator Romney. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, as you have noted, the president has talked about the protest. He's talked about the death of George Floyd. But he still hasn't given a formal address to the nation. Why is that, and are there plans for him to do that anytime soon? So the president has addressed the nation on this. I know several media outlets chose not to cover it. But um, when he was down at in Florida last Saturday, he said, and I have the whole thing here, um, as he said many times, the death of George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis was a grave tragedy. It should never, ever have happened. He spent several minutes um, going through this. In fact, half of his speech saying, I understand the pain that people are feeling. We support the right of peaceful protesters. We hear their pleas. Um, And he went on and on and on. He said on Monday, I am your president of law and order and an ally of peaceful protesters. So he has said it. Some in the media have chosen not to cover it. Those words are out there and they're documented. Yes. Ebony. Thank you. Obviously, we're hearing a very optimistic message from the president about the jobs numbers and the stock market recovery. But in a executive order on Thursday night, the president said that he had determined that without intervention, the U.S. faced the likelihood of a long economic recovery with persistent high unemployment. I'm just wondering why we're hearing two messages from the president and how the American people are supposed to feel about the economy for the rest of the year. Yeah, well, the president um, sees Friday as a great stride toward what he ultimately wants, which is this rearing economy that we had uh, where paychecks were growing and at the fastest for low-income workers. We were at a very good place before he chose to stop the economy uh, to save 2.1 2.1 million lives, potentially. So he took the action that was necessary at the time. He wants to get us back to that place we were at. He's the one who can do it. He's noted there's going to be a time of recovery. Um, he thinks that you know Q4 will be good. Next year will be great. Monday was a great, um, an unexpected note that um, the market believes in this president, that employers believe in this president, that they, be- they believe they can open their doors in the Trump economy. So it was a note of a great first step of progress. But rest assured, there are many more steps that we 
we have to take uh, to get back to the hottest economy in modern history. But we will get there under President Trump. Yes. Sure, Faye. Yes. Sticking with the economy, New York City began open, reopening its economy today after a very long lockdown. Does President Trump think we need another coronavirus stimulus package? And if so, what would he want to see in it before he signs it? Yeah, he's remained open uh, to a phase four. There was some discussion about this. There was a meeting last week at the White House about that, actually. So um, won't get ahead of him, but he has said there are several things he wants. Um, payroll tax holiday was one of them because that directly advantages low-income workers. Um, several other things that he would like to see in the package. Won't get ahead of him, but he's certainly still open to a phase four. But um, it can't be, as he's noted, just state and local bailouts for blue states that have run their states into the ground because of decades of Democrats policies. Chanel. Thank you, Kaylee. Would President Trump support uh, an actual increase in police funding uh, to help offset some of the damage that's, that could be waged on uh, departments that are defunded across the country? Yeah, so again, um, that would be getting ahead of the president on that exact proposal, but he's been very clear he does not support uh, defunding the police um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, he noted, in fact, um, just a, a little bit ago to me that we have seen violent crime con come down in this country. Um, and why, at the time when violent crime's coming down, uh, why would we defund the police, who are in large part responsible for helping America to get to a place where our streets are safe? So um, he, I would point you to that um, and before getting ahead of the president on a specific policy. Yeah, can I ask a follow-up to that? Uh, Louis. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you about defunding the police movement that's going on. Uh, how does it impact uh, the crime scenario here? You said, sorry, I didn't hear the last word. Defunding the police, how does it impact the crime scenario here? The crimes are, crime rates are going up. Do you think that will impact the crime? Yeah, absolutely. Here? Look, our police officers are the ones who are defending this country um, and making sure that we have law and order in our streets, and there's no more evidence of that than just taking a look at the raw numbers. They, Our police are described as the blue line in American society between peace and chaos, between order and anarchy, and that thin blue line has done quite quite a bit, just looking at 2018 numbers, um, murder arrest 11,970, robbery arrest 88,130, aggravated assault 395,800, violent crime arrest 495,900. That's police officers who are doing the arresting. You eliminate police officers, um, you will have chaos, crime, and anarchy in the streets, and that's something that's unacceptable to the president. Do you think um, this Frank? is political in nature? Yeah. Uh, the Sorry? entire movement is political in nature? Is politically motivated, this movement? This movement? Um, what the president believes is, look, when you look at, I, I would just take at their own words, Black Lives Matter D.C. and Black Lives Matter D.C. said Black Lives Matter means to fund the police. So if that's what the movement means, of course the president stands against defunding the police. Um, all Black Lives Matter, including the life of David Dorn, who perished in the last week and a half, including um, Patrick Underwood, who also lost his life uh, this week. All Black Lives Matter, but in terms of the movement Black Lives Matter, they define themselves as defund the police, and that's something this president stands against. Um, Frank. Yes. Um, blacks are disproportionately arrested and disproportionately incarcerated in this country, and when they they return to society, they are often denied the right to vote, sometimes for the rest of their lives. Is the president concerned about this disparity, disparity and does the president favor restoring the rights of all those who complete their sentences so that they can participate in the 2020 election? So I haven't spoken to him on um, that issue specifically, but what I would note is your question does um, edge on the notion of criminal justice reform, obviously someone who's wrongfully incarcerated, um, that we need to address that situation. And the president has, with the First Step Act, a great piece of legislation that um, says pregnant women can't be shackled when they're having their baby in jail. These are basic common sense human decency reforms that the president put in place, the sentencing disparities that are a play because of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, that crime bill which has been derided and rightfully so um, by civil rights leaders. This president helped in part to rectify that. And I'd note that the First Step Act, the beneficiaries, more than 90 percent have been black Americans. So this is a president who's always stood on the side of justice. But I have not spoken to him about that specifically. Um, is there could, anyone could who I haven't gotten to? Could you ask him about uh, that? Emily. 
Thank you. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of myself and then one from a colleague who couldn't be here. Sure. Uh, so many complaints were made against Derek Chauvin prior to the death of George Floyd. And I was wondering if President Trump believes that disciplinary records and complaints against police, as well as police personnel files, should be accessible to the public. States have differing laws on this, but should there be a minimum national standard on police transparency with respect to these complaints and records? Yes, it's a good question, but again, it would get to what the president's going to propose going forward, so I won't um, address that or get ahead of that. But the particular incidents you reference of George Floyd, it was egregious, and that needs to be looked at and is being looked at, not just at the state level, but at the level of the DOJ as well. Thank you. And uh, from a colleague, does President Trump urge uh, Prince Andrew to comply with his Department of Justice's request for an interview in the case against Jeffrey Epstein? I haven't spoken to him um, about that, so I, I would not get ahead of him on that. John. Uh, Caleb, a couple of questions on coronavirus, if I could. Is there any thought being given to returning to, if not a daily coronavirus briefing, frequent coronavirus briefings? and? On the reopenings, the president said some weeks back that he would continue to monitor the situation and that if any states were doing things that he didn't think were appropriate, he would step in to intervene. Has the president in any of these reopenings, particularly as coronavirus cases are increasing, which could be due in part due to increased testing, is he seeing anything that gives him concern? So I would note this first. Um, I, Dr. Burke sent me some new information before coming out here that new cases have stabilized and many of the new cases are being identified through proactive monitoring and finding asymptomatic cases. Uh, today, we saw the lowest new mortality report since the end of March, less than 500. Um, and testing continues to expand with over 20 million done and more than 6% of Americans being tested and in seven states, nearly 10% of the population. So we are heading in a positive direction even as we begin to safely reopen. But again, has the president seen anything that causes him concern? I would note again the encouraging signs put forward by Dr. Burke. Um, he's seen the country safely reopen. And I would also just note some of the media contradictions here, certainly not referring to you specifically, John, but just a little more broadly, um, that there isn't um, an outcry about social distancing among the protests. And I mean, I saw one network with footage of the Ozarks and um, complaining about social distancing and the Ozarks and then seamlessly transitioning into protest footage and not suggesting that there was a problem with the lack of social distancing. So I think we have to be very consistent um, here. And one note that I, I really wanted to get in, um, should have weaved it in earlier, but I think it's important, is just there's so much focus on our police officers right now. There are absolute cases of injustices. Our heart breaks for those cases, but I just want to note um, some of the great things our police have done last year alone. In Alaska, uh, retired cop Kim Castro jumped in freezing water to help victims to safety after a plane crash. In Idaho, a woman said, he saved my son's life, commenting on a cop who saved her disabled son. In Maine, a detective uh, was killed while helping a motorist in Rhode Island. A baby who was choking was saved by an officer in Maryland. An officer was hailed for intervening in an active shooting incident. North Carolina, police thwarted a mass shooting. In Ohio, police took down a mass shooter at a bar. In Wisconsin, a terminally, terminally ill girl was visited by 40 officers and canines. In New York, officers Bies and Officer Roman of the NYPD responded to an incident involving a homeless man. They bought him new glasses, a haircut, and a new suit, and they helped him to find a job. In Detroit, Michigan, an officer helped a homeless man struggling to shave in the streets. In Virginia, officers could be seen playing with little girls, playing dolls with them on the street. And in Arizona, Charlie called 911 asking for a happy meal, mistakenly, mistakenly, and police delivered. This is who our great law enforcement officers are, um, and we should remember that. Thank you so much. This morning, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is preparing for his first court appearance, facing charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter after the death of George Floyd. Chauvin still declining to publicly comment, the future of the Minneapolis Police Department now uncertain. One day after the mayor was booed for not committing to abolishing the police, a veto-proof majority of the city council pledged to disband the department. 
We're not talking about hitting the eject button on the police tomorrow. We're talking about engaging a plan uh, uh, to create a, a public safety system that works for everyone. Whether it's dismantling departments or reinvesting in other types of programs, growing demands to defund the police are now being heard across the country. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is moving some funds from police to youth and social services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. In Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti is pledging to cut as much as $150 million from the police budget. Critics of defunding say less money won't solve the problem. Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that, for the most part, are already significantly underfunded. All this as more disturbing videos emerge of police arresting black men. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an officer is seen using a stun gun on a man Friday, later hitting him on the head. The officer is now charged with assault. In Alameda, California, police have released this video of an arrest last month, which is also under investigation. The man says he was dancing outside his home. In Minneapolis, a lawyer for another officer involved says Floyd resisted arrest. Earl Gray represents ex-officer Thomas Lane, who had only been a cop for four days. He was doing what he thought was right. Lane is now accused of aiding and abetting second-degree murder. How is it possible that your client stood by and watched for nearly nine minutes? He did not stand by and watch. He was holding the legs because the guy was resisting at first. Now, when he's holding his legs, he says to Chauvin, well, shall we roll him over? Because he says he can't breathe. Chauvin says he, no. Uh, back to this uh, notion about disbanding the police, and that's the vote of the uh, Minneapolis City Council. What would that actually look like? What would the next steps be? Well, Savannah, that is a major question right now. And the city council members say they want input from the public, and it could take up to a year to figure out exactly how much how this will work. The mayor here says that he wants to reform the department, not abolish it. But one of the ideas being tossed around is perhaps hire more counselors to deal with mental health calls instead of relying solely on police. Overnight, chaos in Seattle. Witnesses say a man was shot after a suspect drove through a crowd of protesters. Video showing the driver get out of his car and brandish what appears to be a gun. Authorities say that suspect is now in custody. The 27-year-old victim in stable condition. The growing scenes of unrest coming amid another night of mostly peaceful protests over the killing of George Floyd. His remains now back in his childhood home of Houston. American flags lining the route to the church or a memorial service will be held in just a few hours. Pastor Mia Wright. Our desire and the Floyd family desire is really to see people come together and to heal our nation. The service open to all, but with coronavirus still a threat, masks and social distancing required. On Saturday, a public viewing in Rayford, North Carolina, where Floyd was born, drew thousands. His family's emotions overflowing. I'll never hear his voice, I'll never hear his laughter, I'll never have his hugs, I'll be able to tell him that I love him again. Bystanders eager for a glimpse of the casket of the man whose name has become a rallying cry for justice. We want to give him a good home going and let him know that his death was not in vain, that we will do something about it. With demonstrations stretching into the 13th day in a row. From D.C. to New York, Denver and Los Angeles, even at NASCAR and to stand against racism. The protests, now mainly peaceful, after some early nights of violence. I can't breathe. Also in Houston today, former Vice President Joe Biden planning to meet privately with Floyd's family to offer his condolences in person. Following the public memorial, tomorrow's funeral service will be private. All expenses covered by boxer Floyd Mayweather. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. And as he did in Minneapolis on Friday, the Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy before George Floyd is laid to rest next to his mother, reuniting with the person he so desperately called out for in his final moments of life. A number of politicians and celebrities expected to be in attendance today, including Floyd Mayweather, who is funding that funeral for the Floyd family. In the meantime, tonight, a candlelight vigil will be held on the very football field where Floyd was once a standout player.
his former teammates expected to attend. This morning, for the first time in three months, New York City is cautiously opening back up. We bent the curve. The city hit hardest by the pandemic is entering the first phase of reopening today. Retail stores open for pickups. Construction and manufacturing can resume. And subways return to regular weekday service. You did the hard work to fight back the coronavirus so we could get to phase one. Just weeks ago, the city was at a breaking point. With hospitals overwhelmed and more than 16,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City alone. But after a strict shutdown, widely available free testing, and increased contact tracing, the city has met the criteria needed to start reopening. Phase one may bring as many as 400,000 people back to work in the Big Apple. Companies reopening must limit capacity, frequently clean shared surfaces, screen workers for symptoms, and create social distance markers to help customers and employees stay six feet apart. It's been soul crushing. Mackenzie Farquay uh, shut down her five shops in March. This morning, she's back open for business with hand sanitizer at the ready and items up front so customers can shop from the sidewalk. I hope it'll be super busy. But nationwide, officials worry loosened restrictions have contributed to a new spike in 18 states. And reopening efforts are complicated by the sweeping protests following the death of George Floyd. We're certainly going to see transmission coming out of these gatherings. There's no question about that. In New York, there will be 15 specific testing sites for protesters. If you were at a protest, act responsibly, get a test. Get a test. A city working hard to move forward and find its new normal. So some good news. The governor says that school graduations of up to 150 people will be allowed as early as June 26. But the bad news, one of the most big, one of the biggest challenges the city is still facing is mass transit. Ridership has decreased 90 percent since the pandemic began. And it's still really difficult to socially distance in New York City's enclosed buses and trains. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, President Trump is facing a growing chorus of criticism from former military leaders. We have a constitution and we have to follow that constitution. And the president's drifted away from it. Over the weekend, retired Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell joining that list and blasting the president. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people would not hold him accountable. Powell, a frequent Trump critic who served four presidents, three Republican and one Democrat, and who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, endorsed Joe Biden over the weekend, getting and emotional when talking about how he says the world now views the United people. States. Are we insulting everybody? Are we going after immigrants? Um, they don't understand this. I'm the son of immigrants. I wouldn't be here if my parents couldn't come here in banana boats in the 1920s. This is America. This is who we are. And the world doesn't understand. Mr. Trump fired back, calling Powell highly overrated. As for the 2020 race, in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, Biden leads President Trump nationally by seven points among all registered voters, 49 percent to 42 percent. That's unchanged from April's poll. While Biden is up eight points against the president among voters in the top battleground states, 50 to 42. As for the state of the nation, 80 percent of Americans say the country is out of control amid the aftermath of the the death of George Floyd and the coronavirus pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr out front over the weekend, defending the use of force to clear Lafayette Park last Monday night, which set the stage for President Trump's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church. They were not peaceful protests. But witnesses say the protesters were peaceful. Barr also rejecting what many protesters see as the root of the problem. I think there's racism in the United States still, but I don't think that the uh, law enforcement system is systemically racist. 
Now, overnight, 4,900 National Guard troops started to leave Washington, D.C. at President Trump's order. The president tweeting the troops can, quote, return quickly if needed. The president also saying the protests have been under perfect control, his words. Joining those protests over the weekend, one of his biggest Republican critics, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who told NBC News Black Lives Matter. Romney is also signaling he likely won't support Mr. Trump in the fall. We are listening. I am listening. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is changing the league's message, releasing this video statement late Friday. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. The exact same language star NFL players asked the league to use the day before. We will not be silenced. We assert our right to peacefully protest. It shouldn't take this long to admit. Goodell's message of unity comes after comments made by one of the NFL's biggest stars exposed the league's deep divisions. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Drew Brees apologized twice after he said players shouldn't protest police brutality and racial injustice during the national anthem. I am sorry, and I will do better. The New Orleans Saints quarterback also promising to listen more and be part of the solution. President Trump now weighing in, going after Goodell overnight, tweeting, could it be even remotely possible that Goodell was intimating that it would now be okay for players to kneel? And Brees over the weekend, posting, he should not have taken back his original stance. Breeze hitting back, posting on Instagram, to Donald Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. The president echoing his comments in 2016, when 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick took a knee protesting police brutality. Kaepernick never played in the NFL again after that season. Knees usually taken out of reverence, Former Green Beret and Seattle Seahawks player Nate Boyer is the person responsible for suggesting kneeling as a protest to Kaepernick. Kneeling was born out of a a middle ground, you know, Um, two people that disagreed on a lot, but two people that were willing to just have a conversation and listen. So, Steph, uh, Goodell didn't directly address the kneeling during the anthem, but what do you think is going to happen with the upcoming season and those protests? What will we see? Yeah, Hoda, his statement is vague, although a lot of people have interpreted it as a green light for kneeling. You know, there have been a handful of players who say when they come back, that's exactly what they're do- they're going to do, including running back Adrian Peterson. He thinks that kneeling could potentially save lives and create change. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. Prince Andrew was seen on social media in May when his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson posted this Instagram picture with the caption, so proud of our loving family. But in an interview in December, Virginia Jufri claimed she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and abused by Prince Andrew when she was 17, just days after this picture was taken. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Prince Andrew says he has no recollection of meeting her. His own interview last year was widely criticised for the way he talked about Epstein. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And he would only say he might talk to authorities. If push came to shove and the (coughs) the legal advice was to do so, then I would be duty-bound to do so. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew since he stepped down as a working royal. 
So, so Kier, if Prince Andrew doesn't have anything to hide, why, why not just agree to that interview with authorities here? <laughs> That's a great question, Craig, not least because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give uh, evidence under uh, oath. Uh, but that said, you and I both know that uh, you should be careful when you're talking about legal conversations that are taking place behind closed doors, private conversations. We don't know the details. That said, the optics are terrible for the royal family, aren't they? Uh, one final uh, note, uh, Craig. Prince Andrew's interview, television interview last year, widely believed to have gone really, really badly. Perhaps his legal advisers are concerned about how it would go if he did sit down in front of seasoned prosecutors. Right? Yeah, no. After months of trying to beat back coronavirus, I appreciate you guys. a wave of businesses reopening, beaches buzzing, and most recently protests erupting, are taking a toll. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the large gatherings pose a significant threat. It's a delicate balance because the reasons for demonstrating are valid, and yet the demonstration itself puts one at an additional risk. This morning, 20 states showing an upward swing in cases over the last two weeks. Texas, California, Florida, and Missouri among them. A rise stretching back to a very social Memorial Day holiday. The weather got nice outside, people start to go back outside. We did relax a lot of our social distancing in those states, and here we go. Cases start to pick up. No justice! Massive demonstrations in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death, only heightening concerns. A new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 66 percent of respondents are uncomfortable attending a public gathering or an event with a large group. Even as some health care workers step out into the streets to protest injustice. I don't know that COVID is really in the back of my mind when I'm out there. I'm really thinking about the issue at hand, which is making sure that justice is served and something like this never happens again. A powerful movement sweeping the nation as New York City reopens its economy for the first time today. We're going to open 15 sites that are dedicated just to protesters to get a test so you can get it on an expeditious basis. But please get a test. Testing in college sports also raising red flags as athletes return for preseason training. According to multiple reports, several University of Alabama football players have the virus, and Auburn University acknowledges three of its players tested positive too. An Oklahoma state linebacker even tweeting, after attending a protest and being well protective of myself, he has COVID-19. And that player also tweeting he was completely asymptomatic. Now the University of Alabama is arguably the most prominent football program in the country they have not confirmed yet those cases of coronavirus, but have said the health and safety of student athletes is their top priority, and they're ensuring that those players, student athletes, get the best possible medical care when they return to campus. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. A happy Monday to you. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She has all of the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Uh, Alexa, I will let you kick off the week. Uh, hey, Allison, lots of news today and specifically in this hour. First, former police officer from Minneapolis, Derek Chauvin, appeared in court today by video conference. He is charged with second degree murder in the death of George Floyd. The judge set bail at one point two five million dollars. Now Chauvin's next appearance will be later this month on June 29th. Now, police in Seattle say a man drove into a crowd of protesters on Sunday, then shot a protester. That's the latest from NBC's Linda Givtosh. Officials say the suspect is in custody and the 27-year-old male who was shot is in hospital and is in stable condition. Do you have any sense of whether or not this was some kind of planned uh, attack or was this an individual who was uh, afraid for his life and responded by shooting at protesters? Well, I will tell you this, there were a lot of people out there. It's very difficult to say that this person didn't see the large crowd of people, literally uh, in the thousands, uh, when he drove his vehicle straight into that crowd. 
Now from NBC's Capitol Hill team, congressional Democrats have introduced sweeping legislation to change policing in the United States. This, of course, as Americans across the country protest police brutality following the death of George Floyd. The bill is called the Justice in Policing Act and would ban tactics like chokeholds and no-knock warrants. A number of transparency measures for police departments would also be implemented. Now from NBC's Adam Edelman, Joe Biden's presidential campaign is saying the candidate opposes defunding the police, a movement that has gained popularity recently among protesters. In a statement, a campaign spokesperson said that Biden, quote, does not believe that police should be defunded. But he added that Biden, quote, supports the urgent need for reform, including funding for public schools, summer programs and mental health and substance abuse treatment separate from funding for policing so that officers can focus on the job of policing. Now, health officials in New Zealand say the country has managed to eradicate coronavirus following the recovery of the last known infected person. No new cases have been reported in 17 days, a major victory for the country of 5 million people. Here's New Zealand's Prime Minister. We will almost certainly see cases here again. And that is not a sign that we have failed. It is a reality of this virus. But if and when that occurs, we have to make sure, and we are, that we are prepared. 100 days after its first report, reported coronavirus case, and New York City is starting to come back. That's from NBC's Corky Simasco. The city is reopening today as part of phase one, starting with construction and manufacturing, some wholesalers and partially some retailers as well. But just because the city is entering phase one doesn't mean things go quite back to normal. COVID-19, of course, has taken an unimaginable toll on New York City, and there's certainly a long road ahead there. And that wraps up our headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. All right, Alexa, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. It's been two weeks since George Floyd died in police custody in Minneapolis, inspiring worldwide protests and demands for change. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was in court for the first time. He's charged with second degree murder for kneeling on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Meanwhile, the Minneapolis City Council has agreed to defund and dismantle the city's police department. One thing that all my colleagues agree on is that our police department has failed, uh, and they uh, and they failed on multiple fronts over the course um, uh, of their entire existence. And so we've got to figure out how to address that, and we've got to figure out a way to keep our neighbors safe. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joining us now from Minneapolis. And Gabe, let's start with that court appearance. What happened uh, uh, at Derek Chauvin's court appearance today? Uh, hi, Allison. Well, it happened just uh, behind me in this public safety building. The court hearing was very brief. An arraignment just lasted about 15 minutes. And as you mentioned, uh, Chauvin's bail was set at $1.25 million without, um, without conditions. Uh, $1 million with conditions. Now, it was, again, very brief. He showed up via teleconference. He was wearing an orange jumpsuit. He had handcuffs. He was also wearing a blue face covering. Now, we had not heard from Chauvin's attorney uh, up until now, and that did not change today, actually. As he was walking out of court, we asked him if he had any further comment. He declined to comment. We barely, barely heard from Chauvin himself. He just answered direct questions from the judge uh, and as well as from his defense attorney, responding, yes, ma'am, or yes, your honor. Uh, he was asked if he had a, a, a weapon on his property, um, if, if bail were to be posted, and he said yes, and he'd make arrangements for that weapon to be disposed of if and when bail would be posted. Then we don't know if uh, his family will post bail. Uh, that remains unclear. We asked his defense attorney as he was leaving the courtroom, uh, but so far, no comment. And again, right now, we do not know what his defense might be. Uh, his attorney, Eric Nelson, has repeatedly declined to comment uh, since this all started. But again, uh, Derek Chauvin, for the first time, going before a judge, bail set at $1.25 million, Alice. Gabe, let's talk about the Minneapolis uh, City Council deciding over the weekend to dissolve and dismantle the police. What specifically does that mean? What does it involve? 
Well, certainly, Allison, that is a big question right now and something that's being debated hotly, not just here, but really across the country. The Minneapolis City Council yesterday, nine of its members, a veto-proof majority, agreed and pledged to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Now, your question is one that many people are asking. What exactly does that mean? And we're hearing from those council members, including the city council president, that they're asking for public input to decide exactly what that means. And it could be up to a year before those details are decided. But, Allison, what we're hearing here and also across the country, for example, New York City's mayor saying that he is shifting resources away from the NYPD and uh, investing in uh, youth and social services. The mayor of L.A., Eric Garcetti, saying that he will um, shift 100, up to $150 million in the police budget for other types of programs as well. Here in Minneapolis, there's a lot of talk of perhaps hiring more, hiring more counselors for mental health calls instead of relying solely on police officers for 911. It still remains to be seen exactly how this will look like. The mayor, we should point out, got in some trouble over the weekend with some of the protesters. He was booed when he wouldn't commit to abolishing the police department. Instead, uh, he said he wanted to reform the police department. And so a lot of this is semantics. But of course, as you know, Allison, this is gaining more traction around the country. This idea of defunding police. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? Does it mean dismantling police altogether? Does it mean reforming it? That's still being figured out right here in Minneapolis as well, Allison. Gabe, I know there are still so many questions about what that might look like, what it might entail. Did the city council give any sense uh, of a timeline here when we could start to see changes uh, within the police department or see that police department transform? Well, Jeremiah Ellison, the son of the Attorney General Keith Ellison, he did say that this is something they're going to be taking a look at. They're going to be asking for input from the public, but it could be up to a year before we see some of these changes actually implemented at the Minneapolis City Council. But still, this is an idea that, you know, started to get traction late last week. It's not new, however. Many activists have been talking about this for quite some time, and it took the death of George Floyd for it to really gain traction here in Minneapolis. And now you hear uh, really across the country, really Really examining the larger conversation about the role of policing. But again, few details right now as the Minneapolis City Council works through this. This all came, of course, as you, uh, as we reported, with this first court hearing for Officer Derek Chauvin, bail set at $1.25 million. His next hearing is set for June 29th, so later this month. And we should point out also that we spoke with the attorney for one of the other officers involved in this case. Those three other officers, you'll remember, Allison, are charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and manslaughter. One of them, Thomas Lane, just four days on the job, we spoke with his attorney who said he maintained that George Floyd resisted arrest, and that is why his client took the actions he did. I asked him, how could it be possible for his client to just stand by and watch while this was all going on? And he claims that he didn't just stand by and watch, that it was just his fourth day on the job, and that he was essentially taking the lead from Derek Chauvin, who was a 19-year veteran of the force, and he says his client is not guilty of the charges against him. That is a preview of the defense we could see from those three other officers. But again, with regards to Derek Chauvin, again, his attorney today gave no comment else. Yeah, and Gabe, I know you did have an exclusive interview uh, with Lane's lawyer, and we will be showing uh, that later in the show. So thank you for your reporting here, and thank you for that as well. You bet. New York City reopening today, about 400,000 people heading back to work. It has been 100 days since the city's first coronavirus case. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo congratulating New Yorkers on the progress. We didn't, uh, we didn't just stop the increase. We bent the curve and we brought the spread down dramatically. And you look at where we are today, 100 days later, later we are continuing our decline. The rest of the country is still spiking. How remarkable is that? How remarkable is that? So congratulations to New Yorkers. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis joins me now from Times Square. And Rahima, I have to ask the big question. What does New York City look like today? Are people actually back out and about? There are some people out. I think that it's a slow rollout for many people. You um, get
get an image of it, I want uh, Ronnie, my cameraman, to turn the camera. Uh, there are few people here who might be in the way. But take a look at this, Allison. We're in Times Square. This is 7th wow. Avenue and 42nd yeah. Street, the crossroads of the world. And you could cross the street without any problem today. The roads are clear. Granted, this is an entertainment. This is a, um, a theater area, but it is also a business area. It's a commercial area for lots and lots of, of, of offices. Even 30 Rock, where we are headquarters, is not so far from here. So I think that picture tells you a lot about what it looks like here. Was there some traffic this morning? Yes, there was in other places on the roads. Some traffic reporters actually had some real traffic to talk about. But we're talking about New York City, five boroughs. And this particular area is not as populated as some people may have thought it would be. But folks are coming out ever so slowly. Uh, Rahima, that Allison. image says so much. I walk right past where you are on my way to 30 Rock almost every day. And, and I, I, like most New Yorkers, I'm usually frustrated by all, all the folks you got to weave in and out of to get where you need to go, looking very, very different today. Uh, I know that is, of course, because a lot of people still aren't back at work. A lot of things aren't open yet. What is included in this first phase and what kinds of things are open again today? Part of the first phase includes 32,000 construction jobs, as well as manufacturing and retail for curbside pickup. But look at what some retailers are having to uh, contend with. Just, Ronnie, if you can go over here, here in Times Square, where some businesses have been boarded up, because when there was a shutdown for coronavirus, they knew they weren't going to be around for a while, they put plywood, and then some other businesses boarded up because of the demonstrations. Now that plywood has got to come down if they are going to open up for any kind of curbside pickups. But it's a slow process and uh, retailers are anxious to open. They're anxious to get going. We talked to one woman who said she lost 80 percent of her business while things were shut down. And she just opens that while she is going to be doing curbside pickups that people will come back once she opens up again today. I know Governor Cuomo rode the subway today to show New Yorkers that it's safe. What is the city doing to protect people who need to use the subway uh, and the buses to get around town? One of the things that they're doing is they're requiring everybody to wear a mask. If you don't have one, they're going to provide one for you. They're offering people free hand sanitizer. They're also putting down markers on the, uh, the uh, platforms in the station, encouraging people to social distance. It's kind of hard to do on a New York City subway, but they're encouraging people to do it nonetheless. Take a listen to what one subway rider told us about how they feel getting back on the subway. It was less people. It's very, like, spread out. It wasn't, you know, crowded like it usually is on a normal New York day, which is pretty good. You know, I'm happy about it because everyone's always cramped up on the subway. And I know now they're trying to watch out for COVID and, you know, who's close, how, you know, social distancing and stuff like that. Sometimes I feel like I got to carry a can of Lysol or something. <laughs> I know that's a little bit too much, but, you know, I, I just worry about that. That's So this is the first day, Allison, of the reopening. Maybe a little bit slow going, but people are encouraged that it will pick up as the reopening continues. Allison? A question for you before you go about the protests. I know there are more scheduled in New York City today. There are concerns, of course, that those crowds could lead to more coronavirus cases. What is the city and how is the city trying to reduce that risk? Well, what the city has done all the, all the while, they keep telling people to wear a mask, and a large portion of people are wearing masks, but they're also telling people social distance. And again, that's very hard to do. But the city has opened up another 225 free testing centers around the city. Fifteen of those are located in places where the demonstrations were the largest, and they're encouraging people to go and get tested. So if they were exposed and have become infected, they could then quarantine themselves and hopefully reduce the potential for any kind of spread of the virus that could result as a result of the uh, close contacts that everyone had during these protest demonstrations, Allison.
All right, New York City uh, reopening today. Rahima Ellis in a quieter than usual Times Square. Thank you so much. You're welcome. George Floyd is being remembered in his hometown of Houston today. Thousands of people paying their respects at a public memorial. Texas Governor Greg Abbott was there and said that Floyd's death will not be in vain. This is the most horrific tragedy I've ever personally observed. But George Floyd is going to change the arc of the future of the United States. George Floyd has not died in vain. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Houston. Uh, Morgan, how are people in George Floyd's hometown remembering him today? Hey, Allison, people are coming out because they absolutely want to celebrate his life and also honor the man that has become a, a, really a symbol for a global movement here. He grew up in Houston's Third Ward neighborhood. In fact, I just had a chance to speak to two of his former uh, high school friends. Uh, one of them was a, a, a teammate on that uh, football team where uh, George Floyd was a standout player. And, and, and Allison, you really get the sense when you come here to Houston uh, of just how deep his ties run. And we know that many of the people that he grew up with are coming here to the Fountain of Praise Church uh, to the southwest of the city uh, where they're taking part in this visitation where several thousand people have already made their way through. Uh, but on top of that, we know that people are driving in from all over the state, uh, getting driving hours to get here, Allison, then uh, standing really hours in more than 90 degree heat so they can have a chance and honor yeah. his life. We do know that uh, this started at uh, 1. It goes until 6 p.m. this evening. And there has been just a nonstop stream of people going into the church, everyone with a mask on, gloves on, and maintaining social distancing uh, just to make sure that folks stay safe. Allison? Yeah, Morgan, you can see that in the uh, images there of the lines of people with masks on. Uh, look like they were doing their best to to spread out. Uh, what else are they doing there to make sure, uh, you know, th that they're protecting people while they're mourning, that they're keeping them safe while they're inside? Right. They have one specifically marked entrance and exit point, so nobody... Uh, is having to cross paths with one another, one another. They're keeping a steady stream of people going in, Allison. And there's such a, a large group of people that are coming out to this place uh, that they're shuttling people to and from uh, this church. And that's been going on for several hours now. Uh, in the meantime, you do get the sense from people uh, waiting outside that even if they didn't grow up together, there is now a kind of a shared kinship of sorts in uh, just coming out here uh, to honor the life of George Floyd. One of his former teammates made a, a great point saying that, you know, whenever he was growing up, uh, you know, he just went by, you know, Floyd on the football field. And then, you know, as a young man, whenever mm -hmm. he kind of grew uh, into the figure that he was known as a gentle giant, he was known as Big Floyd. But he says that today, he is now known as George Floyd, and everyone, when they say his name, uh, knows what it really means um, when it is really the catalyst for this entire movement, Allison. And in and, and a very telling post on social media that George Floyd made uh, just a few months prior to his death, uh, his teammate told me that he went on, I believe, Facebook, and he says, I'm going to change the world. And his teammate told me that, of course, nobody at that point in time would have ever wanted this to happen this way. Uh, but he says that in hindsight, you know, George Floyd really did get his wish in that he has absolutely changed the world. Uh, and seeing the response here, everyone coming out to this church uh, is, is just one small example of that. Of course, he'll be laid to rest near his mother in a private ceremony come tomorrow. Allison? Yeah, what can you tell us, Morgan, about that private ceremony uh, tomorrow, that funeral? What do we know about it? Well, we know that it was privately financed by boxer Floyd Mayweather. He uh, will also be in attendance to there uh, at that event. Uh, we do know that it is private, uh, so close friends and family only. Uh, and he'll be laid to rest near his mother. And when you hear that, it's, it's giving a lot of people here pause, Allison, because he'll be reunited with the very woman that he cried out for uh, in his final moments of life. And that's absolutely not lost on anyone here. Uh, the fact that he's now going to be going home uh, to be next to her. Allison. 
Yeah, Morgan, I, I think it's the first thing many of us thought of uh, when you said that, uh, really moving. Uh, we know that former Vice President Joe Biden is also in Houston today. He will not be at the funeral, but he met privately with Floyd's family. What can you tell us? What do you know about that meeting? Yeah, we have been tracking that meeting, Allison. We know that uh, former Vice President did have a chance to meet in private with the family. Uh, we have reached out to representatives for the family and to uh, representatives from uh, the former Vice President's uh, office. Uh, neither one has shared exactly what was said, uh, but we do know that that certainly took place. Uh, in the meantime, the former Vice President keeping a relative, relatively low profile not making any appearance here at the church today. Allison. All right, Morgan Chesky in Houston. Thanks so much. Thanks, Allison. Tropical storm Cristobal, now a tropical depression, bringing torrential rain and flash flooding to parts of the Gulf Coast. Cristobal made landfall over the weekend in Louisiana. NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders joining me now from Biloxi, Mississippi. And my goodness, Kerry, uh, the water uh, where you are. Tell us more about what conditions are like there uh, where you are right now. Well, it certainly has let up, but there is still remnants of this tropical storm. And I positioned myself here in Biloxi on the beach because if you look over my shoulder there, you see the pier. But what you don't see is the rest wow. of the pier because the storm surge that came in tore off a good portion of the pier and washed it down the beach about a half mile to a mile down the beach. And that's because the storm surge here was about four feet. The real concern, of course, right now is that this is moving north and there's the potential for flash flooding as they had here as the water came in and went right over US 90 flash flooding in Tennessee and in Arkansas, Allison. Yeah, Carrie, we've heard the reports over the weekend, flash flooding, even a tornado. Uh, we're showing images now of, of just neighborhoods flooded out. Uh, what is the cleanup looking like today for folks? Well, the cleanup is slow going. I mean, for instance, uh, right here in Mississippi, they're waiting for the State Department of Transportation to get in on US 90 to sort of move the sand that came in. They'll get some front end loaders there. Uh, but you also mentioned the tornadoes. There were some water spouts, uh, tornadoes, one tornado. And you got to remember the size of the storm all the way from Florida over to New Orleans. There was one tornado that touched down in Orlando, and that wow. caused a fair amount of damage, displacing about 50 people. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured. But what you do have there is homes that lost their roofs, uh, trees that came down on cars, cars that flipped over, and of course, the power outages. And so people are dealing with that. And when you've lost the roof to your house, it is a very slow return because, you know, you can't just go back home. Allison? No, you sure can't. Uh, Carrie, we're looking at you standing there wearing a mask right now, which of course brings to mind the coronavirus. Uh, some areas evacuated. The residents were told to seek shelter. Are there concerns that this storm uh, could spread coronavirus cases and, and increase cases of the coronavirus? Well, this is really about, I guess, a practice run for everybody. People were told, for instance, down in Grand Island, Louisiana, that they had to evacuate. And it's a good thing that people who were there sort of as visitors did leave the tourist tour at fish camps because most of that island was washed over. It was a big surprise. But they did not open shelters per se, the public shelters like going to the schools. But this was a good reminder to everybody that in this time of coronavirus, shelters will be very different. In fact, if you go to a shelter in the past, you would find yourself maybe in the gymnasium, cots spread out. Now they're likely to open one classroom, another classroom, another classroom to try and have people socially distanced. But this is not gonna be easy. And one of the things they're saying in Florida, in fact, they had a press conference today at the National Hurricane Center. One of the things they're talking about is that they're going to have to tell some people, think twice about evacuating. And that is the first time we've ever heard that in a hurricane season. It's usually get out. Now they're asking people to consider, do you think the structure you're in can withstand a category one, a category two? If you think so, you might wanna stay put. And finally, they have a lot of those guns that we've seen people shooting to the head to see about the temperature. They've got a lot of them spread out now because 
when they do open shelters, they're going to check people's temperature with those little handheld devices. And if you have a temperature, they're going to direct people to what they call COVID-19 shelters. So there's a lot of complications this hurricane season, Allison. And yeah. unfortunately, the prediction is for 19 named storms. Look at this. We're eight days into the hurricane season. For those who don't yeah. know, hurricanes and tropical storms get their names A, B, C. We're on Cristobal on the eighth right. day. So just consider what we're looking at right now, potentially for a very, very long hurricane season. Yeah, feels very active already. Uh, Carrie Sanders in Biloxi, thanks so much. Sure. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Protesters in D.C. today still demanding police reform. City lawmakers are now considering legislation that would ban chokeholds and speed up the release of body cam footage. The bill is expected to be introduced tomorrow. NBC News reporter Ali Vitale live now from Washington, D.C. And Ali, uh, what are you seeing there today? What are the protesters there demanding? Allison, we were out here this weekend where we saw thousands of Washingtonians and people from this larger area coming to the shadow of the White House, as we've seen them doing for now almost over a week. These protests really, though, show no sign of abating, although today we have people in the hundreds and not the thousands. But I just want to set the scene here with you. Look even what has happened to the fence around Lafayette Square Park. They've got signs all over here that say Black Lives Matter, fund the black community, basically taking this piece of fortification around Lafayette Square Park and instead making it a part of this scene here down in the shadow of the White House. And we've seen people be peaceful. We've seen people coming out here with their kids, with their dogs, many saying that they want to be a part of this moment in time and to show the future generations just how important this moment is. I want to play for you some of the people that we've spoken to about why they're out here and why they're probably not going away anytime soon. Having the paintings on the streets and stuff is amazing, but until we have that written down and... and actual like action i think people need to keep up coming out and showing that they're supporting the cause my my new um role in retirement is activism so i'm gonna i can't i live in i live an hour north so i'll be down here a couple times a week until this fence comes down and then i'll be working other ways whatever i can do to help we need to all come together as a community come together as a whole 
and support each other and stop police brutality and stop racism. Allison, I have to say that middle woman that you heard from there who says that she's retired and activism is now her new job, she really does kind of capture the mood here where people say that they want to make sure this isn't just a short-lived moment in time, but that they're able to keep this momentum going so that they can get the kind of change that they want to see in terms of reforming how police police, as well as seeing how some of communities fund police forces and as well as other parts of the community. And so a lot of the folks out here say, this moment feels different because of the diversity of the crowd. People of all races, all ages coming out here to make sure that they're united in the front of Black Lives Matter at this moment. Something that we've heard from activists and protesters alike who say that's what makes this moment feel different to them. It sure feels that way, Allie. Uh, could you tell us more about the city's police reform proposals uh, that the city council is introducing tomorrow? <clears throat> Right, you're right. That proposal is going to be introduced tomorrow. And you hit a lot of those key points. It's going to be banning chokeholds. It's going to be making sure that complaints against the police department can be adjudicated outside of the police department by an independent investigation force. It's also going to be looking at how these police forces are funded, where that kind of money goes, and if there's any way that they can more creatively use those funds to keep communities safer. Now, it's interesting. The D.C. mayor here, Muriel Bowser, she says that after a preliminary review of that uh, bill, she's going to support it. But at the same time here, over the weekend, we watched that mural that the D.C. mayor commissioned that says uh, Black Lives Matter. Over the weekend, activists added defund the police. She said that she wanted to make sure that it was clear that wasn't an official part of the mural that she commissioned. At the same time, though, she's defending her budget that she released recently, which she says gives not a penny more and not a penny less to police to make sure that communities can stay safe. So, of course, she's coming short of saying defund the police. At the same time, though, she is backing these police reform measures that they're going to have introduced tomorrow in the D.C. City Council, Allison. All right, Ali Vitali in D.C., really inspirational to see all those folks uh, continuing uh, to come out and fight for change. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. House Democrats introducing a sweeping police reform bill today that includes bans on chokeholds and no-knock warrants in drug cases. We want to make America proud again. So do those young people. So I, I believe we're, this is an opportunity. We will miss the opportunity if we didn't take advantage of it and show away racial profiling, chokeholds, uh, the doctrine of, of uh, all of the, the issues that we deal with uh, uh, in the legislation will make a difference, a discreet difference in how we respect people. NBC News correspondent Leanne Caldwell joining me now from Capitol Hill. And Leanne, uh, tell us about this bill. What is in it? Allison, this bill is a direct response to the latest atrocities that have been happening to black Americans at the hands of police. So what is in it? What it includes, it bans chokeholds, which is how George Floyd died. It bans no-knock entries in drug cases, just like how Breonna Taylor died. It also it does both of those things by tying federal funding to police departments implementing these reforms. It also attempts to hold police apart departments accountable and individual police accountable by creating a national database of police misconduct, and it collects data on police use of force as well. There's another interesting thing about this legislation, Allison, is that it does not increase money for police departments in order for them to implement their reforms. It doesn't shrink police department budgets either, like some activists are calling for, but it is an acknowledgement that this defund police movement does have a lot of power and a lot of sway, especially among Democrats who, who acknowledge that it is a local issue to defund the police and with how they want to do what they want to do with their budgets, but also that Democrats completely support uh, funding other programs such as uh, mental health and schools, things to uh, make lives better. Um, for black Americans who have been completely um, disenfranchised in the system. So this is a bill that Democrats tell me is much more narrow than some would have liked. They want to try to get it through Congress, and, they, and Speaker Pelosi called this just a first step. 
Leanne, I have to ask House Democrats introduced it. Does it have any Republican support? <laughs> It has no Republican support at this moment, and it could be difficult to get that, okay. especially since President Trump tweeted just an hour or two before the Democrats unveiled this legislation, tying them to the defund the police movement, calling Democrats crazy radicals, and insisting that he is the law and order president. So he is trying to make this issue a political issue. This is an issue that he ran on successfully in 2016 of law and order, and it looks like he's intending to do that again. But here's what Democrats have to say to that. Now, some Senate Republicans have acknowledged the egregious wrongs, but few have expressed a need for floor action. Too many have remained silent. Maybe they're hoping the issue goes away. I promise them it will not. I think that in terms of the law and order message that the president is spewing out of there, there's nothing new about that message, and I do not believe it will be successful. Democrats, or this bill will pass the Democratic-led House of Representatives, most likely. But the bigger challenge is when it gets to the Republican-led Senate. Now, we haven't had any Republicans who have come out and outright um, panned this legislation, saying that it is dead on arrival. They have not done that. Um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that he's going to take a look. Uh, Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate of South Carolina, he said that he is going to release his own proposal this week as well. So while they might not take up the Democrats' bill wholesale, there could be some room for compromise. But with the president in there, um, you know, tweeting, uh, really trying to make this a wedge issue, it still has a huge uphill battle before it gets to the president's desk, Allison. Leanne, a House Democratic aide confirmed to NBC News that George Floyd's brother, uh, Philanise Floyd, will testify before the House Judiciary Committee on Wednesday. Uh, what do you know and what can you tell us about that hearing? So that hearing is about um, about racial profiling in the police department. It's about uh, community policing and how the police interact with the community. Um, but the fact that George Floyd's brother is testifying is really an opportunity to give him a platform, to give him an ability to speak about his brother, about what happened. And so it's going to be perhaps a very powerful moment um, in this broader picture of Democrats trying to address these issues in, in a legislative way, but also while using the platform they have to uh, give people who are instrumental in this debate the ability to speak, Allison. All right, Leanne Caldwell on Capitol Hill. Great to see you. Thank you. You too. The lawyer for ex-Minneapolis police officer Thomas Lane is previewing his defense plan. Lane is charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. His lawyer, Earl Gray, says that Lane is in solitary confinement. In an exclusive interview, Gray told NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez that there is evidence that proves his client's innocence. Uh, first of all, I mean, tell me, I, I saw your comments uh, late last week after that, uh, the initial court appearance. In a nutshell, why is your client not guilty? Well, um, he's charged with aiding and abetting second degree murder unintentional. He's, and to or, in order to aid and abet, you have to have knowledge what the principal is doing, and that would be Chauvin. And you'd have to have knowledge that he was murdering Mr. George. And you not only have to have knowledge of that, but you have to have an intent to assist him in doing that. That's it's, it, The difference is if you open a door for a bank robber, mm -hmm. even if he's got the mask and you're not paying attention, you're not aiding and abetting the buy, uh, bank robber because you don't have an intent to commit a crime. This is his fourth day as a Fourth day, yes, yes. Yeah. Chauvin came on the scene, 20 years experience. He had four days experience. King had three days. They're partners. Right. They put them together here. It sounds like you're, you're arguing that, you know, he, he didn't know any better, or he was so—he no, was, he was, he was a rookie cop. 
he was relying on his training as a police officer mm -hmm. and following the directions of a training officer. Chauvin was also a training officer. So you're saying, was he following orders? He, he, was, he was doing what he thought was right. He was not ordered to do what he was doing. However, he was, if you want to talk about when uh, the deceased was lying on the, was lying on the ground, handcuffed, my client's down by his feet. Twice, he says, shall we roll him over? Because he's thinking maybe we should roll him over. He says he can't breathe. Well, roll him over. And Chauvin, the 20 year experienced police officer said, no, he'll be all right this way. What do you think his message would be to the family of George Floyd? Well, he's extremely sorry for, um, you know, I, 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 he's sorry the man died, but he, 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 he does, doesn't believe that he had, that he was the cause of the death. He was not the cause. I think he feels good about that, that he was the one that asked to roll him over. He was the one that went in the ambulance. But, to, but to, be, to be clear, um, your client doesn't regret trying to restrain him. He, he does think that Chauvin went too far. I can't say that. I, okay. I, that's, that's my client. Uh, we haven't even discussed that. Yeah. But, but he, does he? And um, yes, I, I wouldn't go there. I don't go there now because mm -hmm. he doesn't know that. He was down at the end. He was following the training officer's mandate. The editor of the New York Times editorial page has resigned. James Bennett stepped down yesterday after publishing a controversial op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton. Many of the Times employees argued it put black staffers in danger. NBC News senior media reporter Dylan Byers joining me now. And Dylan, what happened here? Tell us more, if you will, about the op-ed. What made it so controversial and what do we know about Bennett's resignation? Sure. Well, there are a lot of facets to this, Allison. But what it starts with is this op-ed from Senator Tom Cotton, in which he called for the president to enlist the military to subdue uh, what he referred to as rioters, to effectively go in and help cities and local police forces uh, with quelling the, the, the protests and, and, and the, um, the, you know, uh, the, the demonstrations that are happening in the streets right now. Uh, group of New York Times staffers, uh, uh, ultimately hundreds, if not thousands of them, came out in protest of this decision. And many uh, black employees at the New York Times came out tweeting that this article and the publication of this article in the Times put them in jeopardy, put their, put their lives at risk. What that did was kick off a larger debate between the management at the New York Times and many of these staffers over the role of the New York Times opinion section at a moment when there are such pressing issues of racial injustice, of police brutality, of state power. And that is indicative of a larger debate that we are seeing. We've seen from uh, newsrooms in New York and D.C. to tech platforms in Silicon Valley about whether this is a moment to try and, and bring in the most broad array of, of voices on this issue or to really step up and take a moral stand on, on these pressing and urgent matters. Yeah, Dylan, as you said, this debate is not at all exclusive to The New York Times. So many news organizations are asking what the role of journalists is right now. Where else is this coming up? Yeah, sure. So it's coming. I mean, look, it, it's it's coming up at The New York Times. It's coming up at The Washington Post. Uh, it's even coming up at The yeah. Philadelphia Inquirer, where a number of journalists protested a, a, a rather um, unfortunate headline. And, and that led to the resignation of the top editor, there. And then again, like we said, it's happening at Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, where these tech platforms that, again, have tried to be neutral, have tried to welcome a broad array of voices and sort of keep their hands clean of any sort of political debate, are finding that the debate about an issue like racial justice is one that they cannot ignore and one that many of them have been forced to step up and, and, and take a stand on. And I would say that one of the most interesting aspects of this debate is that it's a lot of the change that is being forced is being forced by the employees, the rank and file employees at this company. So 
for previous generations where, you know, if the editorial page editor made a decision, the staff would have to sort of grin and bear it. That is no longer the world we live in. We are living in a world in which if enough people among the rank and file can sort of protest and protest publicly, what we're seeing is that they are actually capable of forcing some significant change. It is a debate that uh, will no doubt uh, shape the future of journalism. Uh, Dylan Byers, thanks so much. Thank you. Activists calling for change in our country are also pushing Americans to fill out the 2020 census, including actor Don Cheadle and rapper Killer Mike. Learn how to take this energy and organize. Learn how to take this energy and put it into voting, uh, to put it into you know, filling out your census. If you sit in your homes tonight, instead of burning your home to the ground, you will have time to properly plot, plan, strategize, and organize, and mobilize in an effective way. And two of the most effective ways is first taking your butt to the computer and making sure you fill out your census so that people know who you are and where you are. NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Lioto visited a Texas county that's been fighting census undercounts for more than 20 years and fears that it could happen again. Let's get counted! Let's get counted! The census count is probably the most important thing that the federal government does. The 2020 census, a decennial tradition that will decide how the 435 seats in the House of Representatives will be divided among the 50 states. In turn, that determines how more than $675 billion of federal funds will be distributed to states for important public services. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Bye. Ideally, this power and money would be dispersed depending on census figures. But there is a problem. Every census experienced some issues with actual accurate counts. Nowhere has a census undercount been more visible in the United States than in Hidalgo County, Texas. The county drafted a complaint against the Department of Commerce over the 2010 census numbers, saying it severely undercounted the Latino population. With costs in mind, it was never formally filed. Rolando Rios is a San Antonio-based attorney who represented Hidalgo. When you say undercount, you're talking about undercounting minorities, undercounting the poor, undercounting people of color. The 2010 census recorded Hidalgo County's population at 774,769 people. But Rolando says that anywhere from 25,000 to 70,000 people were missed. He shared some aerial photos with us. We printed them out and asked him to go into detail. You see the number in here is a number that is reflected in the Census Bureau. There's six people here, none here, five here. Quite literally, they count yeah. this entire they, street yeah, they, as one uh, person. As one person. In this neighborhood we're talking about, mm -hmm. there was 210 rooftops. Mm -hmm. 210 times 3.5 is 735 po population. That's what it should be. The census population had 66. The Census Bureau says the 2010 census missed about 2.1% of black Americans and 1.5% of Hispanics nationwide, totaling nearly 1.5 million people. In Texas, projections calculated by the Urban Institute show that more than 550,000 Hispanic and black people are at a high risk of being missed in the final 2020 count. They're experiencing more of an yeah. undercount than some other areas. Why is that? Other states are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in outreach. Texas is spending zero. The counties have to take, take it up. We went to Colonia San Joaquin in Hidalgo County to meet one group on the front lines of the census effort there before the pandemic. Months before the census 2020, it's go time for you. Yes, so we're also working with our other community partners to make sure that other colonias in the Rio Grande Valley get counted, especially because the colonias are low income, many times lack infrastructure, like drainage, light. Hace 10 años usted fue censada? No. No tuvo la información para ser censada. A veces te mandan por correo algún folleto, pero no es suficiente. On March 26th, a 24-hour shelter in place went into effect in Hidalgo County due to the coronavirus. We caught up with Abraham, who says the outbreak is a threat to all their previous census efforts and could lead to an undercount similar, if not worse, than 2010. We can't see people face to face, but we are driving back into the colonias with our megaphones and our speakers. Us not being able to be there in person to remind people is making things very difficult. We're still worried about the numbers.
County officials told us a miscount would be a blow to important public services like Head Start, a federal early education program in the community. Our program is strictly for low-income families, three and four-year-olds, and the population is probably 99% uh, Hispanic. Many of our uh, children are uh, recent immigrants, undocumented. Open the jar, take out four jalapenos. One, two, three, four. Teresa says getting federal grants has become more competitive in recent years, but that the funding amounts haven't increased to meet growing demand, in part due to an inaccurate count in 2010. Has this area grown? Have you been able to add more Absolutely. classrooms? Absolutely. It has grown, but it has not grown program-wise. We do not have additional slots available for our children. You're going to say short, tall. We do not have additional facilities. We do not have the means to be able to fund that. One of the questions that's coming up again and again on the opposite side of this issue is why should undocumented people be counted? Well, the fact is that you're here. Whether you like it or not, we have X million of people here. You have to have an accurate count and then you make the decisions of political power and allocation and so on and so forth. But first you have to start with the facts. What are the facts? Well, these are the people that are here. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. 
George Floyd's death and the protests across our country for the last two weeks are driving important conversations about racial injustice and police brutality. Important conversations not only for adults in America, but also our kids. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis has the story. We brought together kids 8 to 14 years old from Massachusetts to California to hear what they're thinking about the death of George Floyd and the protests that erupted. I cried, if I'm being honest. Understandably, there's heightened fear among black kids. I am afraid because I'm afraid of, like, if I go outside, then something will happen to me or my family. But fear even if you're not black. And I'm a bit afraid that these... Like riots and stuff that if they get too big and too out of hand, they could kind of like go into just houses and stuff. The kids also expressed disappointment. People should already know that we have to treat people equally and not judge anybody just because they're black or white. Psychologists say parents should help kids talk about what they're seeing. But it's hard even for me with my son. From the time he was little to now as a teenager, I've struggled to find the right words to tell my black child about how to stay safe when he's not with me. Moments ago, the president led a roundtable with law enforcement officials from around the country. Let's listen in for hosting this meeting and the ability to be able to talk about some very important things to law enforcement. This last year has been very trying to, to law enforcement. My name is Patrick Hills. I'm the National President of Fraternal Order Police. In the last year, we've, or actually the last few months, we've, been, we've dealt with COVID. Uh, we've lost 117 officers across this country who have been exposed to COVID. And I thank you for your leadership in, in recognizing there's not a single thing in a, in a law enforcement profession when we were trying to bring hope to our communities uh, during this, uh, this pandemic that we, were, we did not receive some great uh, assistance from your, from your administration. So thank you for that support. But we're dealing with another crisis now, a crisis that's really pushing us to our limits. I don't know a law enforcement officer across this country who, uh, who is not just appalled by the incident that occurred in Minneapolis. But that one incident certainly doesn't reflect on the 800,000 men and women across this country that go to work every single day and try and make their communities better. So thank you for, for the chance to have dialogue. Uh, looking at us as a profession, uh, we recognize that there's, it's time for us to have a, some good, deep discussion and look within and find ways to improve uh, the, the criminal justice system. And I, I stand here to tell you that we we. We want to sit at the table and have that discussion. So thank you for hosting this. Thank you, Patrick, very much. I appreciate it. Ashley, please. Mr. President, thank you so much for hosting this meeting. First and foremost, we have to ensure before we can collaborate and make progress on areas in the criminal justice arena, we have to make sure we have space to do that and law and order uh, controls. And we appreciate you focusing on what uh, is important that people have the ability to express their opinions and protest in a peaceful way, but we cannot have attacks on law enforcement, looting. This, is, this will dismantle what we have built for so long. In Florida, we are at a 48-year crime rate low. We have not been this low in crime in some time. And I believe it is people like you that have supported law enforcement. And I believe in any administration, in any criminal justice system, in any state, we can always make improvements. And I admire that you are willing to dig in and have these conversations and do that. I think that moving forward, the idea that we would ever dismantle our police uh, administrations coming from not only as the attorney general of the great state of Florida, as a federal prosecutor or as a judge for over a decade, but as the wife of a law enforcement officer, I see what these men and women do for our communities. They rush in to save us when other people rush out. They deliver babies. They charge in when someone's hyped up on fentanyl and just beat his wife and his kids and rescue them. I mean, we expect great things. We have to support them. We have to ensure that they're safe. And at the same time, we must remain committed to improving our system, and I admire that about you, President Trump, that you're willing to do that, and we stand ready, ready to assist you. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. You're doing a great job in Florida. I get the word. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Mr. President and, and the staff here at the White House for, for hosting this meeting. My name is Rob Pride. I'm the National Chairman of Trustees for the Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, and I'm also here today as a, as a sergeant uh, working the streets uh, during this time of crisis in our nation. And 
the reason I'm so happy to be here today to represent the rank and file is because, number one, it is important for everybody to know that there is not one law enforcement officer in the country that I've spoken to uh, with, with friends and colleagues from all over the country that looked at this horrific incident and, and remotely thought that there was anything right about it. The, the great vast majority of men and women in law enforcement uh, are appalled by what happened. But that vast majority is also, as the president has always said, uh, already said, uh, those are the good men and women of law enforcement who work hard every day to make their community safe. Uh, and on behalf of that rank and file, we applaud this meeting and we're glad to be here because there's no doubt in anybody's mind, as uh, General Moody already said, that there's room for improvement. And we know that. And we're happy to be at the table. And we're happy to welcome uh, that input and do what we can uh, to be better, better police in this country, better police for our citizens and our communities. Uh, and we're happy to be a part of this conversation. And that's why we're here. So thank you. Great job. And very Rob. much appreciate thank it. Thank you, Rob. Great job. Thank you. We've known each other a long time now. Really good. Jared, please. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you all for joining. Uh, we've really, over the last three and a half years, have had the opportunity to grow very close with law enforcement. We worked very closely together to bring forward to this country criminal justice reform. The law enforcement community heard the cries from the community, saw the injustices in the system that needed to be fixed, and they responded by coming together to fix it, and it's been a great partnership to do that. Uh, those reforms make our communities uh, safer and have made our system fairer, and that's the type of action that we've been able to accomplish by working together. So uh, what we've seen in the past is that the meetings together and the work together doesn't just result in reports and in uh, nice talking points. It actually uh, results in progress and actual policies that make people's lives better and make communities safer. So it's an honor to work together, and hopefully at this time where there's a lot of people in the country uh, who are feeling uh, different uh, pain and, and feeling different concerns, uh, law enforcement can be a leader in coming together and helping us work towards bringing solutions that can bring this country forward. So thank you very much for the partnership. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. My star. Thanks so much, Mr. President. And uh, thank you to all the law enforcement um, individuals in the room and for the work that you do on a daily basis. Um, you know, when, when I saw what happened with uh, George Floyd, it really made my heart sunk. Um, it, it hit me to my core, uh, as well as a lot of the other lives that have been lost. Um, you know, uh, as, as an African-American, you know, I live in uh, Southeast D.C. and uh, live in a paradox where, you know, my, my wife is uh, sometimes scared to walk the streets by herself. And uh, um, but then on the, in the same vein, um, as an individual, I've also uh, had the fear of being in certain neighborhoods um, or driving certain types of cars. Um, as an African-American, um, just because of um, my relationship with the police. And there's a lot of African-American males uh, across the country that have stories um, like that that they can share. But I think um, law enforcement is there to kind of thread that needle and, and help us and protect us um, and not to be demonized. And uh, it's, it's been very, very uh, tough to see what happened and what's been impacting a lot of families across the country. But I think if we want real reform, like real reform that can change communities, it starts with law enforcement and partnering with them, um, not demonizing. Because uh, I have a lot of law enforcement individuals in my life, and they're some of the greatest people I've ever met. Um, and we can't let uh, some, some bad apples uh, uh, represent uh, something that's a core of any community. And so we look forward to continuing to partner with you all to find solutions. Um, because that's one thing I've learned with working under President Trump's leadership, that we're not just about talk, we're about action. And uh, communities leading um, on your leadership, sir, um, for you to take action. And it's been, it's been an honor to serve, and I look forward to the discussion. Great to have you with us. Great job you're doing, too. Thank you. Please, Chief. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. Again, thank you for uh, putting this important meeting together. Probably. One of the most important meetings in our profession in my 43 years as a law enforcement officer. And, uh, you know, I, I won't echo some of the things that have been said about the horrific incident that brought us here today, but what I will say is this. Um, what it's going to take to make uh, the appropriate changes in law enforcement is courageous leadership. And there are countless courageous leaders in law enforcement across this nation 
that, uh, that are willing to step up to the plate and look at new ideas to, uh, to make our profession better and how we connect with our community. And I think one of the most important things, Mr. President, that you have done is you've listened to IACP and something we've wanted and asked for for two decades, and that's the National Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. And I want to thank you for establishing that, because now more than ever, that commission is incredibly important. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Mr. VP, please. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, we're here to listen. I want to thank the attorney generals who are here, but most especially, Sergeant, Chief, others, thank you. Thanks for what you represent, which is really the best of America. I, I told uh, Chief Cass Stevens that my uh, uncle was a police officer in Chicago for 25 years. Um, and I, I grew up with my three brothers and two sisters with great memories of visiting my grandparents in Chicago, seeing my uncle in his uniform, seeing him walk out the door, put his life on the line to protect and serve. And I want to promise you that you have a president, you have an administration that is always going to stand with men and women who serve and at great risk and great sacrifice uh, protect our communities. Um, I'm also, though, very grateful, Mr. President, to hear this afternoon a desire to have a conversation about how we can improve. As Jared just shared a moment ago, this president has already demonstrated his willingness to improve our justice system in this country, passing historic criminal justice reform. And I want to express my appreciation to the law enforcement officials who are here at this table today, who were with us when we brought that bipartisan legislation forward, Mr. President, at your direction. We're always about the business of making a more perfect union, and, uh, uh, and we're going to be about that now. In the wake of the tragic event of now, now almost two weeks ago, um, we want to hear from you about how we can improve, but, but improve in a way that, that builds on that foundation of really the finest men and women in our country, the bravest men and women in our country, the men and women of law enforcement, how we make sure that the men and women who dedicate their lives to law enforcement, who take risks every single day to keep our community safe, are properly supported, and that the, and that the, the resources from the federal government, the support from state and local authorities is going to continue to hold up those honorable men and women who serve and protect every day. So thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to all of those who are here. Thank you, Mike, very much. Mr. President, it's an honor to be here with you. Obviously, I've been part of your team for now more than two years, uh, taking over the Domestic Policy Council just about a month ago, uh, but running the Office of American Innovation before that. What I want to say very briefly is this. Uh, three months ago, on this side of the White House, we gathered almost 1,000 black uh, leaders from around this country as we were celebrating Black History Month. And in that celebration, you talked about having the lowest unemployment, the lowest poverty rate this country had ever seen. It was a remarkable feat that deserves such great celebration. But here we are three months later, and it is a different time for our country. But on Friday, we had another major announcement two and a half plus million jobs created in a time of such darkness and destruction. And it reminded me that while we are in the midst of the great American comeback, while we are going to be renewing and rebuilding and restoring this country, that none of it is possible without our law enforcement, that none of it is possible without real safety and real security in this country. So really for the great American comeback with your leadership, Mr. President, as we cut poverty rates again and we slash unemployment again and we build a country where every man, woman and child has a real shot at the American dream, it begins today. I believe it begins with the people in this room. It begins with a, a law enforcement that is supported, that is stood up, and that I know you and the Vice President, all of us stand beside as we move forward. So thank you so much. It's thank an honor to be here. Much. Great job. Mr. President, thank you very much. I'm uh, really uh, pleased to, to work very closely with folks like Sheriff Childress and Attorney General Cameron and Attorney General Moody, who uh, took their time to come up here to be a part of this very important conversation. As somebody who has law enforcement in my family as well. It's a very important conversation. 
Um, and, and again, everybody that I've talked to at the elected uh, leader level, but also at the rank and file level, um, was just appalled by what happened in Minneapolis. But out of that, it comes a commitment, a redoubling to, to make improvement across the country at the state and, and local and federal level. And really pleased to have such strong partners uh, in the Intergovernmental Affairs Office to work with to help make that progress under your leadership, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark? Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership, and thank each one of you for being here today. Um, when the cameras are not rolling and when there's no reporters around, there's unbelievable work that has been going on and will continue to go on to make sure that it's not just words, that it's action. Mr. President, you've been a president of action. And for such a time as this, uh, action, again, will speak louder than words. And uh, all of you that are gathered around this table today, we thank you for your action to be here and for the action that will come from this. So it's a pleasure to serve you. Thank you, Mark, very much. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, and the administration for allowing us to sit down with you once again today. Um, we just want you to know that you are a friend, you have been very supportive of law enforcement. As a matter of fact, uh, I've been uh, 29 years with Livingston County Sheriff's Department. Uh, Tony Childress is my name, and I am the sheriff of Livingston County, uh, which is the fourth largest county in the state of Illinois. We're 90 miles south of Chicago. Um, I call it rural central Illinois, and we have an ideology that I feel and many others feel works very well. And that ideology is being a friend of the community, supporting the community with programs like shopping with the sheriff, like Halloween with the children, um, always being there as a listening ear for the community and working with the community. And Mr. President, we are happy to sit down with you and to try and do everything we can to make this nation better by keeping the community safe and by working with you and the nation and making a better place. Some of the things that we uh, feel in Livingston County will be very important is uh, mandatory de-escalation training for all officers, uh, prohibition, of all physical restraint maneuvers on or above the neck and any physical acts that restrict the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain, requiring all officers to render medical aid to all people and requiring officers to intervene when physical forces are being applied uh, to either stop or attempt forces that are being in inappropriately applied and is no longer required. So we look forward to working with you to hopefully get legislation involved in making these things um, true and making them law. And we just thank you again for allowing us to be here and know that you have a friend in Illinois and anything you need, just let us know. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Tony. You do a great job, too. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bill, please. Thank you, Mr. President, for convening uh, this session. It's good to join with uh, all my friends and colleagues from the law enforcement community, many of uh, whom I've worked with uh, over the years. The, um, I think law enforcement fully understands and has understood for some time the distrust uh, that exists in the African-American community toward the criminal justice system. And uh, as I've been reflecting on this over the past uh, few uh, days and weeks, uh, it struck me that uh, for most of our history, in fact, maybe just up to 60 years ago, the law was explicitly discriminatory and did not provide equal protection. It's only been since the early 60s that our law has actually provided equal protection to African Americans. 
And what we've had over the past 50 years or so is reform of our institutions so that they reflect those values, the values upon which our country was founded. And some institutions, uh, such as the military, is, have done an excellent job of, of reforming. And law enforcement has too. That's one thing I understand from being attorney general 30 years ago. And what makes me very uh, optimistic today is that the law enforcement leaders that we deal with, and, and you all know this, no one is more committed to reforming the criminal justice system and the profession of policing today. And there hasn't been a president recently who has been more committed. He didn't require the crisis we have today to get started with the First Step Act and with establishing a commission uh, which has been looking at the very issues we're dealing with today. And I know there's a lot of interest uh, among uh, police leaders for clarity and guidance on the use of force and some of the issues you were just talking about, Sheriff. Making sure the standards are out there, making sure they are trained, and, and making sure they adhe are adhered to. And we're looking forward to uh, working with you uh, to get that done. The, the time for waiting is over. It's now uh, incumbent on us to bring good out of bad. And we can do it, and the commitment is there in law enforcement to do it, so let's get it done. Finally, just let me say that the other aspect of this is uh, the rule of law and the need for law and order. Above the Department of Justice's main entrance is the uh, Latin phrase that from law and order, everything else comes. It's the foundation of civilization. And uh, we have to make sure, it's our responsibility to make sure that our country is ruled by law and not by violence. Thank you, Bill. Well said. Thank you very much. And Daniel, I got to know Daniel in Kentucky. He is a, a superstar in the making, if he's not already a superstar, but he had an incredible race. And we watched it together, and uh, congratulations on that. That was some, that was some evening, right? Thank you, Mr. President. It was, ahead, and obviously please. was grateful uh, for your support and grateful for your leadership uh, on this current issue. We obviously have had the challenges with COVID-19, uh, and now we are starting to see civil unrest in our society uh, as it relates to some of the challenges that, uh, frankly, black and brown communities have had, as, as General Barr so eloquently stated it. We have a responsibility in this room with all of our law enforcement partners uh, to look for ways as we move forward to do it better, to become better citizens, to become uh, better neighbors. And I'm so thankful for the men and women of our law enforcement community that recognize the importance and sincere, sincerity of that need and have the interest not only to protect and serve, uh, but also to demonstrate understanding of the challenges and look for ways to heal the fabric of this nation. Uh, we, as General Barr said, uh, cannot allow for chaos in our streets. We can allow for peaceful protests. We cannot allow for chaos. We cannot allow for violence. Those in this room that know, know that, uh, those that have been peacefully protesting know that. Uh, but our challenge today is how can we move together to better our communities, to better our society in a meaningful way. I'm honored to be a part of that discussion as somebody from the Commonwealth of Kentucky who represents Kentucky and understands some of the symbol unrest that we are seeing there. So I appreciate you assembling this roundtable. I appreciate all of you all that are here uh, to be a part of this conversation, and I look forward uh, to working with you all and collaborating uh, to better our communities and our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Dan. Proud of you. So it's uh, very interesting because I just see in uh, some of the papers, they want to end the police department, quote, end the police department in Minneapolis. End it. What does that mean, end it? Uh, they had a couple of very rough nights, and they had a third night, which was not good. Uh, they abandoned their police precinct, something I've never seen before. You had a mayor that asked them to abandon, and now they've abandoned the mayor, it looks like. Uh, very... Uh, the opposite of far thinking. You know, you say far thinking. Is that far thinking? So they had three really bad nights. And then we, we, I insisted on bringing in the National Guard. 
And all of a sudden, it was like magic. It was in good shape. They helped with the police, but the police were told to leave their posts. I, nobody's ever seen anything like that. But we insisted on having protection for that great city or that great state. A great state, Minnesota. What a horrible thing. That's where it started. And we ended very strong there once we got involved. We got involved right from the White House, and we weren't going to let that happen to that city or that state. And uh, I think a lot of people took notice. The police are doing an incredible job. As I said, their records are being broken in terms of lack of crime, the lack of crime. We had a tremendous year, tremendous 12 months, a tremendous uh, 36 months, I think you can say, during the term. Then you add six months to that. Three and a half years, it's gone by very quickly, but we've had a tremendous record on crime. And we're going to work and we're going to talk about ideas, how we can do it better and how we can do it, if possible, in a much more gentle fashion. A thing like happened should never have happened. And plenty of things shouldn't have happened. But uh, we can't give up the finest law enforcement anywhere in the world. There's nothing like it. Uh, few people, few countries have our record. And I'm talking about the positive record. So we're going to be discussing some ideas and some concepts and some things. Uh, but we won't be defunding our police. We won't be dismantling our police. We won't be disbanding our police. We won't be ending our police force in a city. I guess you might have some cities that want to try, but it's going to be very, uh, very sad situation if they did, because uh, people aren't going to be protected. These people do a tremendous job of protecting citizens of our country, and that's what that's what they're paid for. But whether they were paid or not, that's what they do. And, you know, somebody put it very beautifully before where they said they protect people, risk their own lives for people they've never seen before. People, in many cases, they don't know. You're protecting the lives of people you don't know. And it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. It's a great honor to be with you all. And we'll have a little discussion now. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. A happy Monday to you. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She has all of the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Uh, Alexa, I will let you kick off the week. Uh, hey, Allison, lots of news today, and specifically in this hour. First, former police officer from Minneapolis, Derek Chauvin, appeared in court today by video conference. He is charged with second-degree murder in the death of George Floyd. The judge set bail at $1.25 million. Now, Chauvin's next appearance will be later this month on June 29th. Now, police in Seattle say a man drove into a crowd of protesters on Sunday, then shot a protester. That's the latest from NBC's Linda Givtosh. Officials say the suspect is in custody and the 27-year-old male who was shot is in hospital and is in stable condition. Do you have any sense of whether or not this was some kind of planned uh, attack or was this an individual who was uh, afraid for his life and responded by shooting at protesters? Well, I will tell you this, there were a lot of people out there. It's very difficult to say that this person didn't see the large crowd of people, literally uh, in the thousands, uh, when he drove his vehicle straight into that crowd. Now from NBC's Capitol Hill team, congressional Democrats have introduced sweeping legislation to change policing in the United States. This, of course, as Americans across the country protest police brutality following the death of George Floyd. The bill is called the Justice in Policing Act and would ban tactics like chokeholds and no-knock warrants. A number of transparency measures for police departments would also be implemented. Now from NBC's Adam Edelman, Joe Biden's presidential campaign is saying the candidate opposes defunding the police, a movement that has gained popularity recently among protesters. In a statement, a campaign spokesperson said that Biden, quote, does not believe that police should be defunded. But he added that Biden, quote, supports the urgent need for reform, including funding for public schools, summer programs and mental health and substance abuse treatment separate from funding for policing so that officers can focus on the job of policing. Now, health officials in New Zealand say the country has managed to eradicate coronavirus following the recovery of the last known infected person. No new cases have been reported in 17 days, a major victory for the country of 5 million people. Here's New Zealand's prime minister. We will almost certainly see cases here again. And that is not a sign that we have failed. 
It is a reality of this virus. But if and when that occurs, we have to make sure, and we are, that we are prepared. 100 days after its first report, reported coronavirus case, and New York City is starting to come back. That's from NBC's Corky Simasco. The city is reopening today as part of phase one, starting with construction and manufacturing, some wholesalers and partially some retailers as well. But just because the city is entering phase one doesn't mean things go quite back to normal. COVID-19, of course, has taken an unimaginable toll on New York City, and there's certainly a long road ahead there. And that wraps up our headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. All right, Alexa, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. It's been two weeks since George Floyd died in police custody in Minneapolis, inspiring worldwide protests and demands for change. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was in court for the first time. He's charged with second degree murder for kneeling on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Meanwhile, the Minneapolis City Council has agreed to defund and dismantle the city's police department. One thing that all my colleagues agree on is that our police department has failed, uh, and they uh, and they failed on multiple fronts over the course um, uh, of their entire existence. And so we've got to figure out how to address that, and we've got to figure out a way to keep our neighbors safe. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joining us now from Minneapolis. And Gabe, let's start with that court appearance. What happened uh, uh, at Derek Chauvin's court appearance today? Uh, hi, Allison. Well, it happened just uh, behind me in this public safety building. The court hearing was very brief. An arraignment just lasted about 15 minutes. And as you mentioned, uh, Chauvin's bail was set at $1.25 million without, um, without conditions. Uh, $1 million with conditions. Now, it was, again, very brief. He showed up via teleconference. He was wearing an orange jumpsuit. He had handcuffs. He was also wearing a blue face covering. Now, we had not heard from Chauvin's attorney uh, up until now, and that did not change today, actually. As he was walking out of court, we asked him if he had any further comment. He declined to comment. We barely, barely heard from Chauvin himself. He just answered direct questions from the judge uh, and as well as from his defense attorney, responding, yes, ma'am, or yes, your honor. Uh, he was asked if he had a, a, a weapon on his property, um, if, if bail were to be posted, and he said yes, and he'd make arrangements for that weapon to be disposed of if and when bail would be posted. And we don't know if uh, his family will post bail. Uh, that remains unclear. We asked his defense attorney as he was leaving the courtroom, uh, but so far, no comment. And again, right now, we do not know what his defense might be. Uh, his attorney, Eric Nelson, has repeatedly declined to comment uh, since this all started. But again, uh, Derek Chauvin, for the first time, going before a judge, bail set at $1.25 million, Alice. Gabe, let's talk about the Minneapolis uh, City Council deciding over the weekend to dissolve and dismantle the police. What specifically does that mean? What does it involve? Well, certainly, Allison, that is a big question right now and something that's being debated hotly, not just here, but really across the country. The Minneapolis City Council yesterday, nine of its members, a veto-proof majority, agreed and pledged to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Now, your question is one that many people are asking. What exactly does that mean? And we're hearing from those council members, including the city council president, that they're asking for public input to decide exactly what that means. And it could be up to a year before those details are decided. But, Allison, what we're hearing here and also across the country, for example, New York City's mayor saying that he is shifting resources away from the NYPD and uh, investing in uh, youth and social services. The mayor of L.A., Eric Garcetti, saying that he will um, shift 100, up to $150 million in the police budget for other types of programs as well. Here in Minneapolis, there's a lot of talk of perhaps hiring more, hiring more counselors for mental health calls instead of relying solely solely on police officers for 911. It still remains to be seen exactly how this will look like. The mayor, we should point out, got in some trouble over the weekend with some of the protesters. He was booed when he wouldn't commit to abolishing the police department. Instead, uh, he said he wanted to reform the police department. And so a lot of this is semantics, but of course, as you know, Allison, this is gaining more traction around the country, this idea of defunding police. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? Does it mean dismantling police altogether? Does it mean reforming it? That's still being figured out right here in Minneapolis as well, Allison. 
Gabe, I know there are still so many questions about what that might look like, what it might entail. Did the city council give any sense uh, of a timeline here when we could start to see changes uh, within the police department or see that police department transform? Well, Jeremiah Allison, the son of the Attorney General Keith Allison, he did say that this is something they're going to be taking a look at. They're going to be asking for input from the public, but it could be up to a year before we see some of these changes actually implemented at the Minneapolis City Council. But still, this is an idea that, you know, started to get traction late last week. It's not new, however. Many activists have been talking about this for quite some time, and it took the death of George Floyd for it to really gain traction here in Minneapolis. And now you hear uh, really across the country, really Really examining the larger conversation about the role of policing. But again, few details right now as the Minneapolis City Council works through this. This all came, of course, as you, uh, as we reported, with this first court hearing for Officer Derek Chauvin, bail set at $1.25 million. His next hearing is set for June 29th, so later this month. And we should point out also that we spoke with the attorney for one of the other officers involved in this case. Those three other officers, you'll remember, Allison, are charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and manslaughter. One of them, Thomas Lane, just four days on the job, we spoke with his attorney who said he maintained that George Floyd resisted arrest, and that is why his client took the actions he did. I asked him, how could it be possible for his client to just stand by and watch while this was all going on? And he claims that he didn't just stand by and watch, that it was just his fourth day on the job, and that he was essentially taking the lead from Derek Chauvin, who was a 19-year veteran of the force, and he says his client is not guilty of the charges against him. That is a preview of the defense we could see from those three other officers. But again, with regards to Derek Chauvin, again, his attorney today gave no comment else. Yeah, and Gabe, I know you did have an exclusive interview uh, with Lane's lawyer, and we will be showing uh, that later in the show. So thank you for your reporting here, and thank you for that as well. You bet. George Floyd is being remembered in his hometown of Houston today. Thousands of people paying their respects at a public memorial. Texas Governor Greg Abbott was there and said that Floyd's death will not be in vain. This is the most horrific tragedy I've ever personally observed. But George Floyd is going to change the arc of the future of the United States. George Floyd has not died in vain. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Houston. Uh, Morgan, how are people in George Floyd's hometown remembering him today? Allison, people are coming out because they absolutely want to celebrate his life and also honor the man that has become a, a really a symbol for a global movement here. He grew up in Houston's Third Ward neighborhood. In fact, I just had a chance to speak to two of his former uh, high school friends. Uh, one of them was a, a, a teammate on that uh, football team where uh, George Floyd was a standout player. And, and, and Allison, you really get the sense when you come here to Houston uh, of just how deep his ties run. And we know that many of the people that he grew up with are coming here to the Fountain of Praise Church uh, to the southwest of the city uh, where they're taking part in this visitation where several thousand people have already made their way through. Uh, but on top of that, we know that people are driving in from all over the state, uh, getting driving hours to get here, Allison, then uh, standing really hours in more than 90 degree heat so they can have a chance and honor yeah. his life. We do know that uh, this started at uh, 1, it goes until 6 p.m. this evening, and there has been just a nonstop stream of people going into this church, everyone with a mask on, gloves on, and maintaining social distancing uh, just to make sure that folks stay safe. Allison? Yeah, Morgan, you can see that in the uh, images there of the lines of people with masks on. Uh, look like they were doing their best to to spread out. Uh, what else are they doing there to make sure, uh, you know, th that they're protecting people while they're mourning, that they're keeping them safe while they're inside? Right. They have one specifically marked entrance and exit point, so nobody... Uh, is having to cross paths with one another, one another. They're keeping a steady stream of people going in, Allison. And there's such a, a large group of people that are coming out to this place uh, that they're shuttling people to and from uh, this church. And that's been going on for several hours now. Uh, in the meantime, you do get the sense from people uh, waiting outside 
that even if they didn't grow up together, there is now a kind of a shared kinship of sorts in uh, just coming out here uh, to honor the life of George Floyd. One of his former teammates made a, a great point saying that, you know, whenever he was growing up, uh, you know, he just went by, you know, Floyd on the football field. And then, you know, as a young man, whenever he kind of grew uh, into the figure that he was known as a gentle giant, he was known as Big Floyd. But he says that today he is now known as George Floyd. And everyone, when they say his name, uh, knows what it really means um, when it is really the catalyst for this entire movement, Allison. And in and, and a very telling post on social media that George Floyd made uh, just a few months prior to his death, uh, his teammate told me that he went on, I believe, Facebook, and he says, I'm going to change the world. And his teammate told me that, of course, nobody at that point in time would have ever wanted this to happen this way. Uh, but he says that in hindsight, you know, George Floyd really did get his wish in that he has absolutely changed the world. Uh, and seeing the response here, everyone coming out to this church uh, is, is just one small example of that. Of course, he'll be laid to rest near his mother in a private ceremony come tomorrow. Allison? Yeah, what can you tell us, Morgan, about that private ceremony uh, tomorrow, that funeral? What do we know about it? Well, we know that it was privately financed by boxer Floyd Mayweather. He uh, will also be in attendance to there uh, at that event. Uh, we do know that it is private, uh, so close friends and family only. Uh, and he'll be laid to rest near his mother. And when you hear that, it's it's giving a lot of people here pause, Allison, because he'll be reunited with the very woman that he cried out for uh, in his final moments of life. And that's absolutely not lost on anyone here. Uh, the fact that he's now going to be going home uh, to be next to her. Allison. Yeah, Morgan, I, I think it's the first thing many of us thought of uh, when you said that uh, really moving. Uh, we know that former Vice President Joe Biden is also in Houston today. He will not be at the funeral, but he met privately with Floyd's family. What can you tell us? What do you know about that meeting? Yeah, we have been tracking that meeting, Allison. We know that uh, former Vice President did have a chance to meet in private with the family. Uh, we have reached out to representatives for the family and to uh, representatives from um, the former Vice President's uh, office. Uh, neither one has shared exactly what was said, uh, but we do know that that certainly took place. Uh, in the meantime, the former Vice President keeping a rel relatively low profile not making any appearance here at the church today. Allison. All right, Morgan Chesky in Houston, thanks so much. New York City reopening today, about 400,000 people heading back to work. It has been 100 days since the city's first coronavirus case. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo congratulating New Yorkers on the progress. We didn't, uh, we didn't just stop the increase. We bent the curve and we brought the spread down dramatically. And you look at where we are today, 100 days later, later, we are continuing our decline. The rest of the country is still spiking. How remarkable is that? How remarkable is that? So congratulations to New Yorkers. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis joins me now from Times Square. And Rahima, I have to ask the big question. What does New York City look like today? Are people actually back out and about? There are some people out. I think that it's a slow rollout for many people. You um, get an image of it. I want uh, Ronnie, my cameraman, to turn the camera. Uh, there are few people here who might be in the way. But take a look at this, Allison. We're in Times Square. This is 7th wow. Avenue and 42nd yeah. Street, the crossroads of the world. And you could cross the street without any problem today. The roads are clear. Granted, this is an entertainment. This is a, um, a theater area, but it is also a business area. It's a commercial area for lots and lots of, of, of offices. Even 30 Rock, where we are headquarters, is not so far from here. So I think that picture tells you a lot about what it looks like here. Was there some traffic this morning? Yes, there was in other places on the roads. Some traffic reporters actually had some real traffic to talk about.
but we're talking about New York City, five boroughs, and this particular area is not as populated as some people may have thought it would be, but folks are coming out ever so slowly. Uh, Rahima, that Allison? image says so much. I walk right past where you are on my way to 30 Rock almost every day. And, and I, I, like most New Yorkers, I'm usually frustrated by all, all the folks you got to weave in and out of to get where you need to go. Looking very, very different today. Uh, I know that is, of course, because a lot of people still aren't back at work. A lot of things aren't open yet. What is included in this first phase and what kinds of things are open again today? Part of the first phase includes 32,000 construction jobs, as well as manufacturing and retail for curbside pickup. But look at what some retailers are having to uh, contend with. Just, Ronnie, if you can go over here, here in Times Square, where some businesses have been boarded up, because when there was a shutdown for coronavirus, they knew they weren't going to be around for a while, they put plywood, and then some other businesses boarded up because of the demonstrations. Now that plywood has got to come down if they are going to open up for any kind of curbside pickups. But it's a slow process and uh, retailers are anxious to open. They're anxious to get going. We talked to one woman who said she lost 80 percent of her business while things were shut down. And she just opens that while she is going to be doing curbside pickups that people will come back when she opens up again today. Think down markers on the uh, the uh, platforms in the station encouraging people to social distance. It's kind of hard to do on a New York City subway, but they're encouraging people to do it nonetheless. Take a listen to what one subway rider told us about how they feel getting back on the subway. It was less people. It's very, like, spread out. It wasn't, you know, crowded like it usually is on a normal New York day, which is good you know I'm happy about it because everyone's always cramped up on the subway and I know now they're trying to watch out for COVID and you know who's close how you know social distancing and stuff like that. Sometimes I feel like I gotta carry a can of Lysol or something <laughs> I know that's a little bit too much but you know I, I just worry about that that's So this is the first day, Allison, of the reopening. Maybe a little bit slow going, but people are encouraged that it will pick up as the reopening continues. Allison? A question for you before you go uh, about the protests. I know there are more scheduled in New York City today. There are concerns, of course, that those crowds could lead to more coronavirus cases. What is the city and how is the city trying to reduce that risk? Well, what the city has done all the, all the while, they keep telling people to wear a mask, and a large portion of people are wearing masks, but they're also telling people social distance. And again, that's very hard to do. But the city has opened up another 225 free testing centers around the city. Fifteen of those are located in places where the demonstrations were the largest, and they're encouraging people to go and get tested. So if they were exposed and have become infected, they could then quarantine themselves and hopefully reduce the potential for any kind of spread of the virus that could result as a result of the uh, close contacts that everyone had during these protest demonstrations, Allison. All right, New York City uh, reopening today. Rahima Ellison, a quieter than usual Times Square. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Tropical storm Cristobal, now a tropical depression, bringing torrential rain and flash flooding to parts of the Gulf Coast. Cristobal made landfall over the weekend in Louisiana. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders joining me now from Biloxi, Mississippi. And my goodness, Carrie, uh, uh, the water uh, where you are. Tell us more about what conditions are like there uh, where you are right now. Well, it certainly has let up, but there is still remnants of this tropical storm. And I positioned myself here in Biloxi on the beach because if you look over my shoulder there, you see the pier. But what you don't see is the rest wow. of the pier because the storm surge that came in tore off a good portion of the pier and washed it down the beach about a half mile to a mile down the beach. And that's because the storm surge here was about four feet. The real concern, of course, right now is that this is moving north and there's the potential for flash flooding as they had here as the water came in and went right over US 90 flash flooding in Tennessee and in Arkansas, Allison. Yeah, Carrie, we've heard the reports over the weekend, flash flooding, even a tornado. Uh, we're showing images now of, of just neighborhoods flooded out. Uh, what is the cleanup looking like today for folks? Well, the cleanup is slow going. I mean, for instance, uh, right here in Mississippi, they're waiting for the State Department of Transportation to get in on US 90 to sort of move the sand that came in. They'll get some front end loaders there. Uh, but you also mentioned the tornadoes. There were some water spouts, uh, tornadoes, one tornado. And you got to remember the size of this storm all the way from Florida over to New Orleans. There was one tornado that touched down in Orlando, and that wow. caused a fair amount of damage, displacing about 50 people. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured. But what you do have there is homes that lost their roofs, uh, trees that came down on cars, cars that flipped over, and of course, the power outages. And so people are dealing with that. And when you've lost the roof to your house, it is a very slow return because, you know, you can't just go back home. Allison? No, you sure can't. Uh, Carrie, we're looking at you standing there wearing a mask right now, which, of course, brings to mind the coronavirus. Uh, some areas evacuated. The residents were told to seek shelter. Are there concerns that this storm uh, could spread coronavirus cases and, and increase cases of the coronavirus? Well, this is really about, I guess, a practice run for everybody. People were told, for instance, down in Grand Island, Louisiana, that they had to evacuate. And it's a good thing that people who were there sort of as visitors did leave, the tourists who were at fish camps, because most of that island was washed over. It was a big surprise. But they did not open shelters, per se, the public shelters like going to the schools. But this was a good reminder to everybody that, in this time of coronavirus, shelters will be very different. In fact, if you go to a shelter in the past, you would find yourself maybe in the gymnasium, cots spread out. Now, they're likely to open one classroom, another classroom, another classroom, to try and have people socially distanced. But this is not gonna be easy. And one of the things they're saying in Florida, in fact, they had a press conference today at the National Hurricane Center. One of the things they're talking about is that they're going to have to tell some people, think twice about evacuating. And that is the first time we've ever heard that in a hurricane season. It's usually get out. Now they're asking people to consider, do you think the structure you're in can withstand a category one, a category two? If you think so, you might want to stay put. And finally, they have a lot of those guns that we've seen people shooting to the head to see about the temperature. They've got a lot of them spread out now because when they do open shelters, they're gonna check people's temperature with those little handheld devices. And if you have a temperature, they're gonna direct people to what they call COVID-19 shelters. So 
there's a lot of complications this hurricane season, Allison. And yeah. unfortunately, the prediction is for 19 named storms. Look at this. We're eight days into the hurricane season. For those who don't know, yeah. hurricanes and tropical storms get their names A, B, C. We're on Cristobal on the eighth right. day. So just consider what we're looking at right now, potentially for a very, very long hurricane season. Yeah, feels very active already. Uh, Kerry Sanders in Biloxi, thanks so much. Sure. Protesters in D.C. today still demanding police reform. City lawmakers are now considering legislation that would ban chokeholds and speed up the release of body cam footage. The bill is expected to be introduced tomorrow. NBC News reporter Ali Vitale live now from Washington, D.C. And Ali, uh, what are you seeing there today? What are the protesters there demanding? Allison, we were out here this weekend where we saw thousands of Washingtonians and people from this larger area coming to the shadow of the White House, as we've seen them doing for now almost over a week. These protests really, though, show no sign of abating, although today we have people in the hundreds and not the thousands. But I just want to set the scene here with you. Look even what has happened to the fence around Lafayette Square Park. They've got signs all over here that say Black Lives Matter, fund the black community, basically taking this piece of fortification around Lafayette Square Park and instead making it a part of this scene here down in the shadow of the White House. And we've seen people be peaceful. We've seen people coming out here with their kids, with their dogs, many saying that they want to be a part of this moment in time and to show the future generations just how important this moment is. I want to play for you some of the people that we've spoken to about why they're out here and why they're probably not going away anytime soon. Having the paintings on the streets and stuff is amazing, but until we have that written down and... and actual like action. I think people need to keep up coming out and showing that they're supporting the cause. My, my new um, role in retirement is activism. So I'm going to, I can't, I live in, I live an hour north. So I'll be down here a couple times a week until this fence comes down and then I'll be working other ways, whatever I can do to help. We need to all come together as a community, come together as a whole and support each other and stop police brutality and stop racism. Allison, I have to say that middle woman that you heard from there who says that she's retired and activism is now her new job, she really does kind of capture the mood here where people say that they want to make sure this isn't just a short-lived moment in time, but that they're able to keep this momentum going so that they can get the kind of change that they want to see in terms of reforming how police police, as well as seeing how some of communities fund police forces and as well as other parts of the community. And so a lot of the folks out here saying this moment feels different because of the diversity of the crowd, people of all races, all ages coming out here to make sure that they're united in the front of Black Lives Matter at this moment, something that we've heard from activists and protesters alike who say that's what makes this moment feel different to them. It sure feels that way, Allie. Uh, could you tell us more about the city's police reform proposals uh, that the city council is introducing tomorrow? Right. You're right. That proposal is going to be introduced tomorrow. And you hit a lot of those key points. It's going to be banning chokeholds. It's going to be making sure that complaints against the police department can be adjudicated outside of the police department by an independent investigation force. It's also going to be looking at how these police forces are funded, where that kind of money goes, and if there's any way that they can more creatively use those funds to keep communities safer. Now, it's interesting. The D.C. mayor here, Muriel Bowser, she says that after a preliminary review of that uh, bill, she's going to support it. But at the same time here, over the weekend, we watched that mural that the D.C. mayor commissioned that says uh, Black Lives Matter. Over the weekend, activists added defund the police. She said that she wanted to make sure that it was clear that wasn't an official part of the mural that she commissioned. At the same time, though, she's defending her budget that she released recently, which she says gives not a penny more and not a penny less to police to make sure that communities can stay safe. So, of course, she's coming short of saying defund the police. At at the same time, though, she is backing these police reform measures that they're going to have introduced tomorrow in the D.C. City Council, Allison. All right, Ali Vitale in D.C., really inspirational to see all those folks uh, continuing uh, to come out and fight for change. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
The lawyer for ex-Minneapolis police officer Thomas Lane is previewing his defense plan. Lane is charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. His lawyer, Earl Gray, says that Lane is in solitary confinement. In an exclusive interview, Gray told NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez that there is evidence that proves his client's innocence. Uh, first of all, I mean, tell me, I, I saw your comments uh, late last week after that uh, the initial court appearance. In a nutshell, why is your client not guilty? Well, um, he's charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder unintentional. He's, and to or, in order to aid and abet, you have to have knowledge what the principal is doing, and that would be Chauvin. And you'd have to have knowledge that he was murdering Mr. George. And you not only have to have knowledge of that, but you have to have an intent to assist him in doing that. That's it's, it, The difference is if you open a door for a bank robber, mm -hmm. even if he's got the mask and you're not paying attention, you're not aiding and abetting the buy, uh, bank robber because you don't have an intent to commit a crime. This is his fourth day as a Fourth day, yes, yes. <laughs> Chauvin came on the scene, 20 years experience. He had four days experience. King had three days. They're partners. Right. They put them together here. It sounds like you're you're arguing that you know he he didn't know any better, or he was so no, he, he was, was relying, he was a rookie cop. He was relying on his training as a police officer mm -hmm. and following the directions of a training officer. Chauvin was also a training officer. So you're saying was he following orders? He he was. He was doing what he thought was right. He was not ordered to do what he was doing. However, he was, if you want to talk about when uh, the deceased was lying, on, was lying on the ground, handcuffed, my client's down by his feet twice. He says, shall we roll him over? Because he's thinking maybe we should roll him over. He says he can't breathe. Well, roll him over. And Chauvin, the 20-year experienced police officer, said, no, he'll be all right this way. What do you think his message would be to the family of George Floyd? Well, he's extremely sorry for, um, you know, I, 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 he's sorry the man died, but he, he, he doesn't believe that he had, that he was the cause of the death. He was not the cause. I think he feels good about that, that he was the one that asked to roll him over. He was the one that went in the ambulance. But to, but to, be, to be clear, um, your client doesn't regret trying to restrain him. He, he does think that Chauvin went too far. I can't say that. I, okay. I, that's, that's my client. Uh, we haven't even discussed that. Yeah. But, but he, does he... And... Um, Yes, I, I wouldn't go there. I don't go there now because mm -hmm. he doesn't know that. He was down at the end. He was following the training officer's mandate. George Floyd's death and the protests across our country for the last two weeks are driving important conversations about racial injustice and police brutality. Important conversations not only for adults in America, but also our kids. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis has the story. We brought together kids 8 to 14 years old from Massachusetts to California to hear what they're thinking about the death of George Floyd and the protests that erupted. I cried, if I'm being honest. Understandably, there's heightened fear among black kids. I am afraid because I'm afraid of, like, if I go outside, then something will happen to me or my family. But fear even if you're not black. And I'm a bit afraid that these like riots and stuff that if they get too big and too out of hand, they could kind of like go into just houses and stuff. The kids also expressed disappointment. People should already know that we have to treat people equally and not judge anybody just because they're black or white. Psychologists say parents should help kids talk about what they're seeing. But it's hard even for me with my son. From the time he was little to now as a teenager, I've struggled to find the right words to tell my black child about how to stay safe when he's not with me. 
Dave Juan. I'm Allison Mars. We're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what have you got? Hey, Allison, thank you. We're starting off our headlines this hour at the White House. President Trump met with federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel today, of course, as protests against police brutality continue around the country. Some have called for the defunding of police departments. Here's what the president had to say. This has been a very strong year for uh, uh, less crime. Let's put it that way, less crime. And there's a reason for less crime. That's because we have great law enforcement. I'm very proud of them. Uh, there won't be defunding. There won't be uh, dismantling of our police. Now from our NBC station in New York, the NYPD officer seen shoving a woman to the ground in a video that went viral could face criminal charges as early as tomorrow, according to four senior officials. The incident took place near the Barclays Center on May 29th. The woman said she approached the officers, that they told her to move aside and that she did, but asked why, and then she was pushed. The woman went to the hospital with a seizure and a concussion. Now, NBC News is not aware of the events before the recording began. The Brooklyn District Attorney's Office said the investigation was ongoing, but declined to comment further. Now, some new analysis on how coronavirus is actually spreading. The World Health Organization says that asymptomatic carriers are not the primary drivers of COVID-19 transmission. In fact, they say it's pretty rare. Of course, all of this research is continuously evolving, but take a listen to Dr. Maria Van Kirkhoff, the head of WHO's Emerging Diseases Unit. We have a number of reports from countries who are doing very detailed contact tracing. They're following asymptomatic cases, they're following contacts, and they're not finding secondary transmission onward. It's very rare. Texas is reporting a record number of hospitalizations from COVID-19 today, following the state being one of the earliest to reopen. That's from CNBC's Noah Higgins Dunn. According to the state's health department, more than 1,900 people are hospitalized across the state, a jump from the previous high of 1,888 patients back in early May. Coronavirus has infected nearly 75,000 people in Texas so far. That's according to a count by Johns Hopkins University. And those are the latest headlines, Allison, for this hour. Uh, as always, keeping everybody informed at home. Back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. George Floyd's family is speaking in Houston ahead of his funeral tomorrow. Let's listen in. And uh, I want to thank everybody who came out to see my brother and cheer him on the victory for his last lap. Uh, just being here, thinking about my brother, he's a gentle giant, and uh, he had his life taken away when he shouldn't have been. He should have been here speaking on somebody else's behalf right now. As I told you, we grew up together, eat bananas, mayonnaise sandwiches, <laughs> and uh, seriously, just having fun in a house full of love. Brothers, sisters, we all loved each other. My mother, I wish she was here to see this, but under the circumstances, she's not. My brother was a huge role model for a lot of people. He was the first person who everybody looked up to in our neighborhood because he was the first one to get a scholarship to go and play basketball or football, what he wanted to do. A lot of people didn't have the money, and he was one of the ones that say, hey, you can do it. You can do it. He will help you do a lot of things. Whatever you wanted to, he would take you to people who could help you do it if you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, right now, I'm appreciative of everybody coming out. It just hurts a lot just, just being here, just talking, just pain. I, I just I thank y'all so much for coming out to support us. And all the families that are here with me today, Michael Brown, yeah. Eric Brown, we here with you, we here with you, we have a table to everybody. Stay strong, I love you. Thank y'all. We will get justice. We will get it. We will not let this door close.
How y'all doing? I'm Rodney Floyd, Floyd's younger brother. And I would like to thank everybody that's here. And thank you to all the people around the world watching for the support. And, and y'all been amazing. The love has been amazing. It's, it's, and it's such a beautiful thing to see everybody you named as one. We all getting tired of all this, seeing the same routine play out daily by the police in every state. And I'm so happy we're united on that front. And it's gonna be a marathon. And of course, Mr. Eve is my brother's funeral. And we all emotional state is for the family. And you guys are feeling our pain as well. And again, I love you guys. And I'd like to give big thanks out for the major support that we have from the Gardner family, Aubrey family, Brianna Taylor family. And I know I'm getting some other people, Delta Jones, Mike Brown, and, and such support for these, these beautiful fellas, Trayvon Martin. And again, and about my brother George. Oh, he's the third ward, Texas, we say cutie hoes. Loving, beautiful dude, beautiful soul. I know the older people heard of him because he was real famous in sports as well. The local community in Third Ward know him as Big Floyd, the family know him as Perry. And he's such a wonderful man, father, human being. And I mean, he gives the best advice on anything. I mean, he's very understanding in life. And and, and I'll tell you what, if he was told, told he, he would have to sacrifice his life to bring the world together. And not knowing him, I knowing he would have did it. And I mean, I, again, I love his love, and we all hurting as a family. And, the, you know, the George we know, unfortunately y'all wouldn't know, but to give you one thing about him, again, he's a family man, great man. He stands for the definition of a man, because we didn't have no father people growing up. And my brother, all the steps he did as a human being, as a young teenager, and it makes so much sense now to me as I'm older and understood that the stuff he was doing was teaching us lessons. And you know, and I love those lessons he taught me. I got so much wonderful things and advice for him. And I'm, you know, it seems unreal because every day is like waiting on that phone call. I'm still calling his phone number. And you know, and not to take a lot of my brother, but I'm fortunate enough to see a FaceTime message from my nine year old daughter. And it hurts me. Carver said, Dad, I'm sorry for your brother FaceTime. Why would these police kill your brother? It has been very hard to explain to a nine-year-old. And I had to explain that conversation to some of his kids. And you know, and it hurts dearly. And my daughter just, who am I supposed to tell her? And she's nine years old about police officers, the way they act. And you know, we need to, and, you know, we're working on this together. Thanks to Reverend Al Sharpton, Mr. Crump, and the and then the people of America that's united. Love all y'all and thanks for the support. Thank you for it, man. A public memorial in Houston today for George Floyd. Thousands of people turning out, including his classmates, teachers, and public officials. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson live now in Houston. Uh, Priscilla, I know it has been hot there today, but that has not discouraged people. Tell us how they're remembering George Floyd today. Well, more than 90 degrees here today, Allison, but to your point, it has not stopped a steady stream of folks from coming out to view George Floyd's body and to pay tribute to him. Right now, uh, you probably see a large crowd of folks gathered to listen to Reverend Al Sharpton and Ben Crump, but also the family members of George Floyd. You just played some sound from that with his brother getting uh, somewhat emotional there as he described uh, his relationship with his brother. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what we've seen throughout the day here today. You know, it was a public viewing, so anyone could come. And you've seen folks who both knew George Floyd and didn't know him at all, but wanted to be here to pay respects to him. And, you know, the common theme that I've heard at a lot of these services is that we don't want his death to be in vain, and people want to have their presence known here and to show that they do care and that this could be a turning point. And, you know, today we spent the day speaking to some of the folks who knew George Floyd best. We actually spoke with his second grade teacher who talked about his aspirations for life as a young man. Take a listen to what she, uh, she told us. She actually read one of his projects uh, to us. Take a listen. He wrote that he wanted to be a Supreme Court judge, just like Thurgood Marshall. He doesn't say that, but I know that's what inspired him. He's worldwide famous now, and or famous worldwide now. And 
I was listening this morning about things happening in France and Germany, and I thought, oh, we could never have predicted when we were in that classroom with that what the impact that this eight-year-old was going to have on justice. He wanted to work in the area of justice, and he has certainly fulfilled his dream. And Allison, that's a common theme that we've heard throughout our time here today, just that folks feel like this fight is not over. Uh, you know, George Floyd, his classmates said he wanted to change the world and that they're going to continue on this fight for justice for him and a fight for change and that his death will not be in vain. He will have changed the world, Allison. Uh, Priscilla, it's just incredible to hear the stories uh, of how often he said he wanted to change the world and the ways he did it, e even as a young child. Uh, you are, of course, talking to us wearing a mask today. People have been lining up uh, wearing masks. A reminder that we are, of course, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, what safety precautions are in place there today? Yeah. Well, the idea that we're in the middle of a pandemic is certainly not lost upon folks here. Uh, the teacher that you just heard from actually came and spoke with us, but she did not attend the actual viewing because she is older. She has some underlying health conditions and she was concerned about that. But the church is taking a number of precautions to keep folks safe. They're doing temperature checks as everyone walks in and everyone is required to wear a mask. There are markers all throughout the church uh, designating that six foot distance. And folks are also being asked to stay six feet away from the casket just to continue to promote that distancing. And they're going in one door and out a completely separate door to, again, keep people apart. Um, but the other thing here is, is something we talked about a little earlier, which is just how hot it is here. And so there are EMTs who are here on site because obviously folks are waiting in long lines out here. They're walking uh, blocks to get here, parking sort of far away and walking over. And so the EMTs are here handing out water and just checking on folks to make sure that there aren't any issues around heat exhaustion or anything like that as well, Allison. Uh, Priscilla, I, I know that you mentioned the Reverend Al Sharpton, the family behind you. Uh, I know that former Vice President Joe Biden, Texas Governor Greg Abbott met with the Floyd family today. What are you hearing about that meeting? What do we know about it? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, we know that Reverend, Al, uh, excuse me, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden met with the family for more than an hour. Um, and, you know, part of what he did was just listen as they sort of shared with them their feelings and emotions around all of this. And Reverend Al Sharpton actually just mentioned that. And he said, you know, tomorrow isn't meant to be a political rally. And so that was part of the reason why Joe Biden met with the family in private today, because tomorrow is really going to be about George Floyd's life and this family saying their final farewell before they lay him to rest. Um, and you mentioned Greg Abbott was also here and he talked, he described the death of George Floyd as one of the most tragic and horrendous things that he has ever seen. And he said that he is going to be meeting with the family and working with the family to uh, pass legislation to ensure that something like what happened to George Floyd doesn't happen in Texas. And we've seen a number of other congressmen and women. Sheila Jackson Lee was here. We know that uh, the Houston mayor, Sylvester Turner, uh, will be here. And also the police chief, Art Acevedo, was here today, all to pay their respects for George Floyd ahead of that private ceremony that's going to take place with just the family and close friends tomorrow. All right, Priscilla Thompson in Houston, thanks so much. Thanks, Allison. Derek Chauvin, the ex-Minneapolis police officer charged with second degree murder in the death of George Floyd, was in court for the first time today. Chauvin's bail set at one and a quarter million dollars. He was seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. NBC News reporter Shaq Brewster joining me now from Minneapolis. And uh, Shaq, what happened in court today? I know he appeared uh, by video conference. That's right, Allison. It was the first time we saw Officer Chauvin since that video that you just mentioned where he had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for over nine minutes until he was unresponsive and pulseless. And as you mentioned, uh, Officer Chauvin appeared via video conference, but we did see he was in an orange jumpsuit. He was handcuffed and was wearing a blue surgical mask. The entire hearing was really quick, less than 15 minutes that it went on for. The judge set the bail at that $1.25 million dollars. Without conditions, it could be $1 million if some conditions are agreed to. But 
We didn't hear much from Officer Chauvin or his attorney. They didn't even object to that bail amount that was being set. We do know that they also have an agreed on a hearing date later in June, so we'll expect to see him then. But the, we didn't hear any plea from the officer. We didn't hear any comment from the attorney as they were walking out. Uh, so it was a very quick hearing. Again, Officer Chauvin, it was the first time that we saw him since that video and since George Floyd died two weeks ago. Allison? Shaq, the Minneapolis City Council's move to defund and dismantle the city's police department. There are so many questions about what that means and what that process will look yeah. like. What do you know so far? Well, that has been a call from activists and protesters since George Floyd died. It's something that has been increasing not only here in Minneapolis and in Minnesota, but really all across the country. And you've seen the hashtag defund mm -hmm. the police. And really what people have been calling for here on the ground is reallocating resources that go towards the police department right now, putting them into more community-based solutions, education, healthcare, things like that. What the city council did yesterday, and this was something that was a pretty big surprise for many of us, a majority of city council members appeared on stage at a protest advocating for the Minneapolis Police Department to be defunded. They appeared on stage and they all committed, or majority of them committed, to supporting a move to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. I spoke to a council member who helped lead the charge to get those council members and the council to support this move. And he warned, it does not mean you're going to see a situation where Minneapolis Police Department officers are removed from the street immediately. They're not leaving their posts. Instead, he says this begins a one-year conversation, a year-long conversation about how best to reallocate those resources how best to achieve that goal of community policing, because he says it's very clear, and even those council members who don't agree on disbanding the department, he says it's very clear that what the police department has done has been failing, and you see that in the death of George Floyd. So that's the move that you're hearing. That's the push. I'll tell you that Governor Tim Waltz, he just actually uh, was speaking earlier today. He was in, in St. Paul, just across the river, and he was touring some damage from looting, and he was asked whether or not he supports this push to disband the police department. He said it gets really complicated, but he supports the change that the community members have been calling for uh, because he sees that things have been failing. So you see people using that term. It means a lot of different things for different people. I want you to see an example of what I mean by that. When I was here at the vigil and I asked someone about whether or not he supported uh, disbanding the police department. Listen to what this gentleman told me. Disbanding, I'm a little bit uncertain about. Uh, Is that too far cu for you? Cutting, yeah, yeah. Cutting funding, yeah, maybe, um, because it might be that uh, government or whatever private funding might be better served with community programs and, and the like. And Allison, you might have seen a video over the course of the weekend of the mayor, Jacob Fry, going into a protest on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And he was asked directly, point blank, do you support defunding and disbanding the Minneapolis Police Department? He said no. He supported the current police chief and the reforms that the police chief, who is newer, uh, that the police chief was advocating for and changing the culture. He was booed from that, uh, that, that protest. You heard protesters saying shame to him as he walked out by himself and left that protest group. You see, the tensions are high, the emotions and passions are high, but that is something that is growing support and gaining support, that idea of disbanding or defunding the Minneapolis Police Department. Allison? Yes, yeah, Shaq, people still have a lot of questions about it, but support is growing for sure. Shaq Brewster in Minneapolis, thanks a lot. Thank you. New York City getting back to business today. The city, once considered the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic, is now in phase one of its reopening. About 400,000 people are back at work in sectors like retail and construction. The reopening happening, though, while there are still protests in the city, raising concerns that we could see a new spike in coronavirus cases. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joining me now from Brooklyn. And Ellison, you're at a protest right now. Uh, looks calm. What's it like there? 
Yeah, hey, Allison, I'm actually standing where one of the largest protests this weekend started. Thousands then marched across the Brooklyn Bridge. Right now, you can hear and see behind me, there is a rally happening right now, a protest of sorts. At least 200 people are here taking a part in a drum circle. We saw another group protest uh, just a couple hours ago. That protest seemed to largely be led by college students. We spoke to one a professor attending that rally. Here's a little of what she had to say. We don't want to be arrested. We want to speak and have a voice in what happens to our community. And the elected officials have done nothing. And I hope that they do vote them out. They got one year to do their job and vote out the incumbent because they had a long time. Letitia James, the attorney general, she was first public advocate. She didn't know about police brutality. She didn't know what was going on in our community. They arrested me, arrested us for speaking up and asking for a voice at the table. That woman went on to say you can talk about banning chokeholds, but it doesn't matter if people do not enforce them. She had a lot of criticism for the governor of this state, as well as Mayor Bill de Blasio. At least two other protests are set to take place in Brooklyn this evening. This is the second night where there has not been a curfew. Mayor Bill de Blasio lifted the curfew a night early. Last night, protests without that curfew remained relatively calm and peaceful. Allison. Ellison, those protests happening, of course, as the city reopens. What are city leaders trying to do to reduce the risk uh, of a spike in cases here? Well, among protesters, they are telling them what we have heard so many people say before, that they uh, want people out here to wear face masks, to wash their hands, to social distance. When it is possible, uh, they have also told people, encouraged people that it is their duty, their responsibility to go out and get a COVID-19 test. Governor Cuomo has said that he added uh, 15 new testing sites in the city specifically for people who have been out protesting to go and get a test for COVID-19. Allison. Allison, let's talk about commuting for a second before you go. It is just about impossible to keep six feet away from people on public transportation in New York City. What is the city doing about that? Yeah, I mean, they're doing some of the things that we've seen taken place in so many other states when they start to reopen. They're putting out markers for people to social distance, again, encouraging people to always wear a face mask to keep distance when possible. But if the subway is operating at full capacity, that would be pretty hard to do. Now, officials have said that they do not expect the subways to be at full capacity for quite a while, but they are also expanding uh, bus routes. The, gov uh, the mayor says that he is adding 20 miles of new busway lanes and, and adding to the routes so that people have more options for commuting so they can spread out and be a little bit safer. That being said, MTA asked for uh, three times that amount of new busway uh, lanes and miles, and they have not gotten that so far. But uh, some people have said that it is a step in the right direction as the city moves towards reopening and hopefully getting things back to normal. Allison. All right, Allison Barber in New York City. Thank you so much. At a roundtable discussion with law enforcement officials this afternoon, the president praised the police for doing, quote, an incredible job. Our police have been letting us uh, live in peace, and we want to make sure we don't have any bad actors in there. And sometimes you'll see some horrible things like we witnessed recently. But uh, 99, I say 99.9, .9, but let's go with 99 percent of them are great, great people, and they've done jobs that are record setting. NBCnews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joining me now. And Shannon, uh, tell us what came out of this meeting. We heard a little bit from the president there. Well, Allison, two weeks into these demonstrations, really, this is the first time we've seen the president talk at length about the underlying issue here that the demonstrators are raising. And, and I mean, he didn't propose any plans or any specifics, but having a meeting to talk about law enforcement issues uh, is really the furthest we've seen him go. He has um, talked a bit about George Floyd. He's called the Floyd family. But, you know, every attempt we have made to ask the president over the past week about what he is doing about this issue of, uh, of police brutality, of, of racism, um, he has 
either declined to take our questions or not really had a full response. So this is really the first event the White House has done to get to this underlying issue. Uh, but, you know, of course, here, uh, you know, the president, you could see him defending police officers, uh, talking about a few bad actors here. That was a message that was echoed um, earlier in the day by the press secretary, who was asked if, you know, the president believed there was systemic racism uh, in the police force. And, and she said that she believed there were a few bad actors, a few bad apples here and there, but essentially know that there is not a, a systemic problem. Um, we do expect to hear more from the president on this issue this week, this sort of broader issue of policing and police reform. I was told um, by an administration official that that was something they discussed over the weekend and how the president could um, start uh, way more into that uh, issue. But I think the comments we saw today of a strong defense of the police force is what we're going to continue uh, to hear from the White House going forward with ever, whatever proposals they have. But Shannon, the president meeting with law enforcement officials while former Vice President Joe Biden was in Houston meeting with George Floyd's family. Are the president really leaning into this message of law and order? Uh, what is he trying to achieve with that? Well, the law and order message is something that is very uh, traditionally has done very well with conservative voters, uh, with older voters, mm -hmm. with white male voters, uh, you know, historically going back decades. Uh, that has been law and order has been a, a key message in conservative politics. Uh, the president needs to shore up his support among uh, among his base, really, among even you know, non college educated white males, uh, you know, white males in general, uh, seniors, uh, you know, even even Republicans who support people who identify as Republican at least to support slipping there a little bit. So this is a message that fits strongly in line with that. And last week it was a theme we heard over and over again: him talking about sending in the National Guard, um, sending the military to U.S. cities, um, talking about that being the solution to the problem. You know, instead of. Uh, suggesting some policing reforms or having a conversation about racism or instead of the underlying issue. His solution to this has been a law enforcement and at times military response. Um, and, you know, partly because that is something that plays strongly with conservatives and conservative voters. Shannon, uh, we know that House Democrats unveiled a police reform bill. We have not heard a whole lot of support from Republicans. Any chance that the president will back this bill? Uh, we were told no, uh, that this is something the president is not likely to support. Of course, the White House has not put forward any of their own proposals. That's something that we may continue to see from them, but no counter proposal from the White House at this time uh, and no support of this Democratic proposal uh, from the White House at this time as well. Shannon, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, who served under President George W. Bush, is the latest military leader to condemn the president. Uh, here's what he told CNN over the weekend. The one word I have to use with respect to what he's been doing for the last several years is a word I would never have used before. I never would have used with any of the four presidents I've worked for. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people would not hold him accountable. President Trump's losing support from a growing list of prominent Republicans, including Senator Mitt Romney. A former president, George W. Bush, reportedly won't be backing Trump's reelection. How concerned is the White House about the president's reelection, especially with the latest polls showing him trailing Biden? Well, the, there is a lot of concern about about these poll numbers. Uh, you know, when the campaign would see the president down three points, they would say, OK, it's in the margin of error. It's a national poll. When you see him down seven points, like we're seeing in this poll, you're you're putting up uh, in front of us. And when you're seeing him down in the key swing states, places like Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, you know, not just neck and neck, not just within the margin of error, but significantly down, there's some very troubling signs uh, that the campaign has seen in some key states. So there is concern about that. And uh, NBC News is reporting now that the campaign plans to begin resuming rallies, potentially as early as the end of June. Um, there are some proposals that are supposed to be presented to the president, but there is a, a real sense of urgency of wanting to get the president out there and, if nothing else, shoring up his base, like I was talking about a moment ago, those uh, senior voters, white male voters, um, you know, uh, your, your traditional blue-collar voters. 
his numbers have been slipping there as well. So shoring up that base, if nothing else, is what the campaign is really trying to focus on, and because there is genuine concern about these numbers, Allison. All right, Shannon Pettypiece, thanks so much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. If the presidential election happened today, Joe Biden would beat Donald Trump by seven points. That's according to the latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. NBC News senior political correspondent Steve Kornacki breaks down the numbers. All right. So the bottom line in our NBC Wall Street Journal poll here is Joe Biden continues to lead over Donald Trump. It continues to be a significant lead here. Seven points in our poll. Biden, 49. Trump, 42. Also notable, by the way, you know, there are some undecided voters here. Biden already very close to 50 percent. That could be important, too. We don't have third party candidates yet like we did in 2016. Biden up there near 50 percent. By the way, there are a lot of polls out right now and they are showing a similar result. In fact, some of them have Biden up by even more. If you take a look at this, this is the average of all the polls that are out there right now. The average of them shows Biden leading Trump by nearly eight points, 7.8. By the way, that is a larger margin than we've seen at this same point 
in any of the past four presidential races. You see it right here. Not all these candidates went on to win, but no one at this point in the previous four races led by the kind of margin Biden does right now. Why is Biden ahead? Big shift we're seeing in our poll from 2016 among white voters. Trump leads, yes, but Trump won this group by 20 points in 2016. Now, just six among black voters, very similar. There is a shift here a little bit to Trump doing a little better with Hispanic voters than in 2016. That's giving him a little boost, but again, that big change among white voters. And by the way, specifically, white non-college, no college degree, Trump by nearly 20 points, but look at this. White college educated voters, Biden by 13, the exit poll in 2016, Trump won this group. Now trails by 13. Big part of the story. More signs of trouble for President Trump in the latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. Eight out of 10 voters in that poll believe things are out of control in America. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joining me now. And Mark, what were the biggest issues of concern for the Americans surveyed in this poll? And what should the president be most worried about here? Yeah, Allison, it really kind of reflects a very turbulent last three months in American politics, American society, and of course, American history, where you end up having strong majorities in our country, 63% of people who say that they're worried that someone in their family might end up uh, getting uh, the coronavirus. We have 54% who don't think the economy is going to recover within the next year or before the end of the next year. And you end up having a situation where obviously the George Floyd death and the protests have just kind of created a very unsettling environment, which is never good for an incumbent president. And as the numbers show that Steve Kornacki was just displaying to you, that is one of the big reasons why he's down right now. Uh, Mark, let's stick with the economy here. Now, this survey happened before Friday's surprisingly good jobs report. We saw two and a half million new jobs added in May. The Trump campaign put out an ad this weekend touting those numbers. But the unemployment rate is still over 13 percent. Today, the National Bureau of Economic Research said we officially entered a recession in February. Uh, what kind of a challenge does that pose for President Trump, who has based uh, both his presidency and his campaign strategy on a strong economy? Yeah, Allison, just three or four months ago, the entire game plan for the Trump campaign was to be able to tout an unemployment rate of about 3.7 percent or 3.6 or 3.5. And now we're actually talking where 13.3 is in an improvement for them. This is a radically different economic environment. Let me just run some other numbers on our NBC Wall Street Journal poll that came out yesterday, where you end up having nearly half of all voters, 46%, who rate the economy as poor right now. That is a huge change from just a few months ago. And it's the worst number in our poll on that question since September of 2012. And of course, Barack Obama was able to win re-election as the incumbent president in September of 2012. 2012, but certainly the economy wasn't seen as a strength. It was other issues that he was trying to win on. So uh, that this is yet another challenge for President Trump. Mark, some interesting stats on the gender gap between Trump and Biden in this poll. What did you find there? And what does it say about the president's chances of reelection? Yeah. So, Allison, we ended up finding that uh, the gender gap, women end up favoring Joe Biden over President Trump by more than 20 percentage points. Uh, conversely, Donald Trump ended up having an eight point lead among men. But to put that uh, 20 plus point lead into perspective, uh, Hillary Clinton had a 12 point lead in her two point national popular vote win in 2016. And so the fact that Joe Biden is doing much better than that, I think I think is what we kind of reflects the difference between a two point national poll race uh, in 2016 versus one where Joe Biden is ahead by our, in our poll by seven points and other national polls by even a greater margin. Uh, Mark, something interesting as well, whether people wear a mask telling a lot uh, about how they'll vote, as you've mentioned, of course, the coronavirus top of mind for a lot of folks. What did the poll find there? Yeah. And again, things like masks becoming indicative of your voter preference. You I, in a million years, three months ago, I don't think anyone would have thought that. But Allison, in our poll, we end up having 63 no. <laughs> percent of all voters who say that they always end up wearing a mask. And Joe Biden leads among those 63 percent of voters by a whopping 40 point margin. 
Conversely, we end up having 15% of the electorate who say that they rarely or never wear a mask. And Donald Trump is ahead by 76 points. So just like two huge different sets of numbers. And again, when you're at your grocery store or elsewhere, ha having a mask probably is a very good indication of where your voter preference is, fortunately or unfortunately, according to our poll. Yeah, maybe giving away uh, your personal uh, political preferences just by wearing a mask. But I, I, Mark, I know we have said this so many times before, but, uh, you know, so many of these issues, things we never thought we would be talking about in the 2020 election. But uh, this, is, this is an unprecedented time. Unprecedented times. And we still have five months to go, Allison. Oh, it's going to be interesting. Mark Murray, thanks so much for hanging out with us this evening. We always appreciate it. Thank you. A funeral procession through the streets of downtown Los Angeles, a hearse leading protesters in tribute to George Floyd, one of several services like this in Southern California today. NBC News correspondent Jacob Soboroff is in Los Angeles. And Jacob, I can see folks behind you. What's it like in L.A. today? It's very peaceful. And in fact, this is an interfaith memorial service uh, in honor of George Floyd. And Allison, I'll just give you a quick look at it. Um, what's going on here right now is the same thing we've been seeing going on uh, over the course of the last two weeks. People coming together with a specific call to action. In that case, uh, in this case, I should say, it is to defund the police. And when you want to take that from theory to practice, as it were, where that is going to take place, if that is going to take place, is in this building right here, Los Angeles City Hall, where today there is a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council's Budget Committee. What the activists on the ground here want to see from the politicians in the building behind me is a reallocation of funds from the Los Angeles Police Department into city services that benefit Af the African American community and other communities of color, particularly around issues of social justice, of inequality. And you know what? Those issues of inequality are in stark contrast right here on the street. Take a look. Without getting too close, you can see a homeless encampment just below Los Angeles City Hall. And that's one of the issues, homelessness, that we're hearing the speakers up here from the stage uh, this afternoon uh, talk about. So when you talk about systemic racism, racism and police brutality, it's all interconnected. That's what they're saying up there. Now the question is, how are you going to get the work done? Take it from the streets into the halls of power. And that's what this movement is all about. You're seeing it happen in real time, Allison. Uh, Jacob, I know one thing that we spoke about uh, quite a few times last week, the National Guard and the National Guard presence there in L.A. The National Guard is leaving after several days of demonstrations. Why now? Well, they've left. I mean, they've already left. There's some station nearby until June 10th. But the National Guard that you might have seen over the course of the last couple of days at any one of these buildings in the Civic Center are nowhere to be found. And the reason is, according to city leaders, the peaceful nature of the demonstrations. When you talk about the peaceful nature of the demonstrations, look no further than where I'm standing right here, where members of different faiths, yep. from different parts of the city, from different demographics have all come together uh, to call for change and to call for it as peaceful as can be. Great to hear, great to see. Uh, Jacob Soboroff in Los Angeles, thanks so much. George Floyd was killed in police custody two weeks ago today. The ex-officer charged with second-degree murder in Floyd's death, making his first court appearance today. Derek Chauvin pressed his knee into Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. He was arraigned today, appearing in court by video conference. His bail set at $1.25 million. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joining me now. Danny, great to have you with us. Uh, what were the biggest takeaways from today's proceedings, in, in your opinion? There aren't a lot of takeaways to have from this proceeding. It was very pro forma, just a procedural event where bail was adjusted. Actually, it appears to have been increased. And uh, in this case, he didn't even enter a plea. Uh, so the next uh, phase is another hearing in June. And these early hearings aren't going to tell us a whole lot about the evidence that okay. we're going to see later at trial. Uh, Danny, George Floyd's family wants Chauvin to be charged with first degree murder. His charges have already been upgraded to second degree murder from third. Is it likely that prosecutors will go even further here? Respectfully, it's not only not likely, it seems completely impossible. I understand the sentiment of wanting okay. the most serious punishment, but it's not simply a case that 
uh, sure. d different degrees of murder or other crimes are simply a reflection of murder one being the worst and murder three being less worse. In fact, Minnesota's murder one statute has very specific aggravating situations. So you can look up the statute online and go down the checklist and you'll see that uh, for each one, uh, is it a killing of a law enforcement officer? No. Is this a killing that occurred during a sexual assault? No. Is this a killing uh, that happened during a domestic abuse uh, call or a situation? No. So you go through all those checklists, and the only thing that could possibly remain mm -hmm. under the statute appears to be premeditated intentional murder. Now, the family may say, well, that's what this was, premeditated, premeditated intentional murder. But the challenge there is that that would be completely inconsistent with every other charge against Derek Chauvin because each of those are conditioned or uh, concede that this was an unintentional killing. So it really wouldn't make a lot of sense to then charge him with an intentional, and not just intentional, but premeditated killing, mm -hmm. and also charge him with murder two and three based on the unintentional killing. So as much as I sympathize with the family's uh, uh, sure. desire to see the most serious charge brought against Derek Chauvin, uh, you have to look at the statute. And everything in criminal law is governed by the elements of the statute, and they just don't be, appear to be here in this case. Danny, three other officers were involved in George Floyd's death. In an exclusive interview with NBC News' Gabe Gutierrez, the lawyer for ex-officer Thomas Lane uh, previewed his defense. Listen to this. It sounds like you're, you're arguing that, you know, he, he didn't know any better or he was so— No, he, he, was, was, he was a rookie cop. He was relying on his training as a police officer mm -hmm. and following the directions of a training officer. Chauvin was also a training officer. Was he following orders? He, he, was, he was doing what he thought was right. Danny, you're a defense attorney. What do you make of that argument? Look, I'm a defense attorney, so there's a degree of bias there. But I absolutely think that argument has some power, and it may result in the acquittal of these officers. That fact that I did not know before today, that they, they were rookies, but I did know that Chauvin was a training officer, but that combined with the fact that they were rookies, that's a tremendous gravitational pull uh, or influence as an officer to rely on not just a superior officer, not just somebody with a few years uh, ahead of you. We're looking at, uh, I believe, 15, 16, maybe 17 years experience ahead of these other officers. And he's a training officer. I mean, these are huge factors. It's not just a case of uh, that the officers are going to claim they didn't know what they were doing. Rather, the opposite. They believed that what they were doing was at least uh, authorized. And to the extent they felt concerned with it, some of them apparently, at least uh, at this stage, apparently voiced those concerns. So I think these facts really make a compelling defense for the other officers, uh, even though the prosecution mm -hmm. will put out evidence that, look, I can't get away from the fact that seven, eight minutes while they're standing around with a, a knee on someone's neck, that's going to be really hard to overcome, uh, no matter whether you're Derek Chauvin or the other defendant. Danny, the Minneapolis Police Department is under an investigation. Uh, it's going to go back 10 years to see if the department engaged in discriminatory practices. Will that or how will that factor into these cases? Well, the, the, what we're going to see with these cases, they're going to look back statistically at whether or not there were uh, unreasonable uses of force, which is always an interesting uh, investigation because they're going back on investigations of force that someone else may have already signed off on, but they're looking at it with fresh eyes. And this mm -hmm. may result in some consent decree where the police department usually agrees to do more training or do something else to acknowledge uh, if it is found to have done uh, to have been involved in uh, discriminatory practices or uh, a, a habitual excessive use of force. We've seen this in the past with other cases that police officers with, uh, with their own internal investigations get investigated again by an outside agency, usually the federal uh, DOJ. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Always appreciate your legal expertise here. Thank you. U.S. prosecutors want to formally speak with Britain's Prince Andrew as part of their criminal investigation into Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sex trafficking ring. Prince Andrew's legal team now pushing back, denying claims that he refused to cooperate. NBC senior international correspondent Keir Simmons has the latest. 
Hey, Alison, a sensational front page to the British Sun newspaper here in the UK today. Yanks hand Andy over. This being a British tabloid, inevitably that headline is a little exaggerated, but this is a formal request from US authorities to speak to Prince Andrew. And for such a high profile figure, particularly a member of the British royal family, that is rare. This morning, Prince Andrew facing a formal request to speak with New York federal prosecutors as part of their investigation into sexual abuse by Andrew's late friend, Jeffrey Epstein. The Queen's son would be interviewed as a witness, British media reports say. He stayed with Epstein in New York and the US Virgin Islands. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News the application has been made under a US-UK mutual legal assistance treaty. A source close to his legal team telling NBC News legal discussions with the DOJ are subject to strict confidentiality rules, which is why we've made no comment. And this morning, no word from Buckingham Palace, which no longer represents Prince Andrew, since he stepped down as a working royal. Among the many questions, Alison, why won't Prince Andrew simply give an interview, particularly because legal experts tell us that he would not have to give that interview under oath. Now, of course, experience tells us to be careful trying to read what might be happening in legal conversations behind closed doors between authorities. But it does look terrible for the British royal family, doesn't it? Perhaps one of the issues is this. That interview that Prince Andrew gave to British television last year roundly seemed to have been a disaster. Perhaps his legal advisers are worried about what would happen if he sat down in front of seasoned prosecutors. Alison? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. We're talking about inequality a lot more these days, racial and socioeconomic. George Floyd's death and the coronavirus pandemic shining a light on both. A big issue for low-income students, access to the Internet, especially when they're learning from home. NBC News Now's Dasha Burns spoke to one mother trying to keep her child from being left behind. Everything went supposedly virtual and um, school went virtual. This is Victoria Bates. 
I'm from a very small town, Marion, Alabama, and it's a rural area. Like the rest of the country, COVID-19 meant Marion residents had to connect from home. A lot of the children didn't live or don't live inside the city limit or in an area that's conducive to having proper internet services. No matter which direction you go, you'll um, start to experience, you know, the internet issues. According to the 2018 American Community Survey, 52.9% of households in Perry County do not have an internet subscription. So now I'm homeschooling with my son and we're in a situation where the internet service is very poor. Since her home internet couldn't handle her son's schoolwork, Victoria drove them out to her beauty salon in order to use her business's Wi-Fi. We were here um, just simply for Zoom services so he could be able to do his work. With Alabama reopening, Victoria is beginning to see clients in her salon again. And her son did his schoolwork in the back office to try and stay safe. And that's to keep him separate from um, coming in contact with my clients. The digital divide is not a new problem, but as schools around the country close, possibly until the fall, it's definitely become a more pressing one. Technology can and should be a great equalizer, but it's only an equalizer if it's distributed equitably. Studies show that students suffer learning losses when they're out of school for long periods of time. It's called the summer slide. Kids can lose up to 30% of what they learned in a year. Low income students are hit the hardest. There's basically a whole generation of children right now who are going to have a significant chunk of their education impacted by this crisis. What is that going to mean long term for these kids? I think what you'll see more than ever is you'll see a wider spread of how kids are doing. There'll be certain kids with, you know, amazing teachers and probably more resources at home that actually their learning might accelerate. But many kids are going to struggle. I would I would argue, honestly, the majority of kids might, might struggle here. And so either we you know, perpetuate those inequities or we fix them. Without the salon, school would be a lot harder for Victoria's son. We will probably have to result to paper packages. But when given the option of having schools reopen? I think that I would rather deal with the internet versus him going back to school and being exposed. There are challenges. In the middle of your Zoom, your system goes down. For him in schooling, it made it somewhat difficult or challenging. From New York to Los Angeles and across the pond to London and Berlin, protesters around the world demanding change in the wake of George Floyd's death. NBC News farm correspondent Molly Hunter reports. Hey, Allison, that's right. The protests on this side of the Atlantic have not stopped. Now, the first one we saw in London, the first uh, big Black Lives Matter solidarity protest was last Sunday. Uh, I was at that one. I was at another big one on Wednesday in Hyde Park. And since then, we've seen a bunch, not just in the UK, but all over Europe. So uh, in Budapest, Hungary, we saw protests this weekend. In Berlin, tens of thousands of people uh, turned out. In Rome, Italy, in Brussels, even down uh, in Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, now, Allison, take a look at all this video of those marchers, you'll hear a lot of familiar chants. Now, take a listen to some of the protesters interviewed about why they're out there and why they think it's important to stay. Ici, on n'a pas les mêmes les mêmes droits que les autres. Donc ça, c'est 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 ça que représente Black Lives Matter. Ce n'est pas uniquement les violences policières, c'est toutes les discriminations autour de la race noire. Uh, we are here so, showing solidarity, uh, in sending a strong message, uh, saying that uh, black lives of black people it's uh, important. Uh, it mustn't be taken for granted. And and uh, what is happening in America and global should stop as a matter of agents. Now, the protests here in the UK, up and down the country, largely peaceful. Uh, there was a little incident over the weekend here in London, right in front of the prime minister's residence, number 10. Uh, take a look right there. A little bit of a skirmish. Uh, but honestly, Alison, everything was super peaceful in Bristol, uh, in a city just west of London. A statue uh, of a slave trader was ripped off its monument and actually dumped into the harbor. Now, the Health Secretary
Secretary here, Allison, is addressing the other big topic that everyone here and in the U.S., of course, is talking about, um, coronavirus and protesting. It's nearly impossible to socially distance while you're protesting. And Matt Hancock, the health secretary here, uh, warned everyone just to be really careful, especially as the U.K. Uh, starts to open up uh, this week, a little past its other European neighbors. But honestly, protests here in the U.K. and across uh, Europe are still continuing. A multi-million dollar treasure chest hidden in the Rocky Mountains a decade ago isn't hidden anymore. An art dealer from New Mexico put it there, leaving clues about its location in his memoir. That chest filled with gold coins, diamonds and emeralds found just a few days ago. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz has the details. Somewhere deep in the mountains north of Santa Fe, an 11th century treasure box filled with millions worth of gold, emeralds, and antiquities has finally been found. And online, a community of treasure hunters is going wild. The unfindable has been found. Forrest Finn is an 89-year-old art collector who stashed the treasure more than 10 years ago in an effort to get people off their couches and into the great outdoors. Now telling me over the phone, a man from back east has finally deciphered the secret clues he left in a poem. From there is no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. But so far, Forrest has been mum on the man's identity, saying he learned the search was over when the man emailed him a picture of the treasure and in a post describing the secret location under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. The discovery coming after years of hundreds of thousands of people trying to find the chest that for me started as a local reporter nearly a decade ago in Santa Fe as one of the first to cover the modern day treasure hunt. Since then, thousands have shared their own quests, like Ray and Chloe Harp, who say it's brought them closer as a family. It's brought us together out in nature, out in sunshine. I mean, I think that was what Forrest wanted, and it gave us a perspective of, of the world that our children will never forget. And Today, hearing the news is bittersweet. It yeah. feels like the last page of our favorite book. <laughs> but the story hasn't been without significant danger. There have been countless rescues, and at least five people have died while searching in treacherous terrain. Authorities long urging Finn to call off the search, despite Finn's insistence the treasure was hidden in a spot that a 70-year-old man would be able to reach. But today, that exact location, still a mystery. Finn saying the treasure hunter wishes to remain anonymous, and now it's his secret to keep. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. We are watching NBC News Now. A happy Monday to you. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has all of the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Uh, Alexa, I will let you kick off the week. Uh, hey, Allison, lots of news today, and specifically in this hour. First, former police officer from Minneapolis, Derek Chauvin, appeared in court today by video conference. He is charged with second-degree murder in the death of George Floyd. The judge set bail at $1.25 million. Now Chauvin's next appearance will be later this month on June 29th. Now, police in Seattle say a man drove into a crowd of protesters on Sunday, then shot a protester. That's the latest from NBC's Linda Givtosh. Officials say the suspect is in custody and the 27-year-old male who was shot is in hospital and is in stable condition. Do you have any sense of whether or not this was some kind of planned uh, attack or was this an individual who was uh, afraid for his life and responded by shooting at protesters? Well, I will tell you this, there were a lot of people out there. It's very difficult to say that this person didn't see the large crowd of people, literally uh, in the thousands, uh, when he drove his vehicle straight into that crowd. Now from NBC's Capitol Hill team, congressional Democrats have introduced sweeping legislation to change policing in the United States. This, of course, as Americans across the country protest police brutality following the death of George Floyd. The bill is called the Justice in Policing Act and would ban tactics like chokeholds and no-knock warrants. A number of transparency measures for police departments would also be implemented. Now from NBC's Adam Edelman, Joe Biden's presidential campaign is saying the candidate opposes defunding the police, a movement that has gained popularity recently among protesters. In a statement, a campaign spokesperson said that Biden, quote, does not believe that police should be defunded. But he added that Biden, quote, supports the urgent need for reform, including funding for public schools, summer programs and mental health and substance abuse treatment separate from funding for policing so that officers can focus on the job of policing. 
Now, health officials in New Zealand say the country has managed to eradicate coronavirus following the recovery of the last known infected person. No new cases have been reported in 17 days, a major victory for the country of 5 million people. Here's New Zealand's Prime Minister. We will almost certainly see cases here again. And that is not a sign that we have failed. It is a reality of this virus. But if and when that occurs, we have to make sure, and we are, that we are prepared. 100 days after its first report, reported coronavirus case, and New York City is starting to come back. That's from NBC's Corky Simasco. The city is reopening today as part of phase one, starting with construction and manufacturing, some wholesalers and partially some retailers as well. But just because the city is entering phase one doesn't mean things go quite back to normal. COVID-19, of course, has taken an unimaginable toll on New York City, and there's certainly a long road ahead there. And that wraps up our headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. All right, Alexa, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. It's been two weeks since George Floyd died in police custody in Minneapolis, inspiring worldwide protests and demands for change. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was in court for the first time. He's charged with second-degree murder for kneeling on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Meanwhile, the Minneapolis City Council has agreed to defund and dismantle the city's police department. One thing that all my colleagues agree on is that our police department has failed, uh, and they uh, and they failed on multiple fronts over the course um, uh, of their entire existence. And so we've got to figure out how to address that, and we've got to figure out a way to keep our neighbors safe. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joining us now from Minneapolis. And Gabe, let's start with that court appearance. What happened uh, uh, at Derek Chauvin's court appearance today? Uh, hi, Allison. Well, it happened just uh, behind me in this public safety building. The court hearing was very brief. An arraignment just lasted about 15 minutes. And as you mentioned, uh, Chauvin's bail was set at $1.25 million without, um, without conditions. Uh, $1 million with conditions. Now, it was, again, very brief. He showed up via teleconference. He was wearing an orange jumpsuit. He had handcuffs. He was also wearing a blue face covering. Now, we had not heard from Chauvin's attorney uh, up until now, and that did not change today, actually. As he was walking out of court, we asked him if he had any further comment. He declined to comment. We barely, barely heard from Chauvin himself. He just answered direct questions from the judge uh, and as well as from his defense attorney, responding, yes, ma'am, or yes, your honor. Uh, he was asked if he had a, a, a weapon on his property, um, if, if bail were to be posted, and he said yes, and he'd make arrangements for that weapon to be disposed of if and when bail would be posted. Then we don't know if uh, his family will post bail. Uh, that remains unclear. We asked his defense attorney as he was leaving the courtroom, uh, but so far no comment. And again, right now we do not know what his defense might be. Uh, his attorney, Eric Nelson, has repeatedly declined to comment uh, since this all started. But again, uh, Derek Chauvin, for the first time, going before a judge, bail set at $1.25 million, Allison. Gabe, let's talk about the Minneapolis uh, City Council deciding over the weekend to dissolve and dismantle the police. What specifically does that mean? What does it involve? Well, certainly, Allison, that is a big question right now and something that's being debated hotly, not just here, but really across the country. The Minneapolis City Council yesterday, nine of its members, a veto-proof majority, agreed and pledged to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Now, your question is one that many people are asking. What exactly does that mean? And we're hearing from those council members, including the city council president, that they're asking for public input to decide exactly what that means. And it could be up to a year before those details are decided. But Allison, what we're hearing here